Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. If the chimes shudder a little on Sunday afternoon, well, they know there's mystery in store Sunday with men of action like Mike Waring, better known as the Falcon, who brings his fearless and romantic touch to the solution of another mystery. After the Falcon, it's high adventure. Then the big guy steps in. The new private eye, Charlie Wilde, concludes with a few casual homicides. The chimes mean mystery and action this Sunday afternoon on NBC. Transcribed. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolfe. It's the adventure of Stamped for Murder with that brilliant, eccentric, private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Instructions for this morning, Archie. Your notebook, please. First, Mr. Salensback. Inform him that the Long Island peafowl he sent were most unsatisfactory. Peafowl's breast flesh is not sweet and tender unless it is well protected from all alarms, especially from the air, to prevent nervousness. Long Island is full of airplanes. Look, Mr. Wolf, I... I shall uh... want a dozen chickens that have been raised on blueberries and a fresh-killed lamb for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Wolf, please listen, there's... Uh... Mr. Goodwin, be quiet, and then dinner on the following day becomes a problem. Mr. Wolf, dinner any day is going to be a problem if we don't pay Sausenbach's bill. And pay it. With what? The bank account's empty. Ridiculous. They were $4,000 yesterday. But you bought that shipment of orchid bobs from wine old Gluckner. Mr. Wolf, we need money. You've got to stop eating and drinking beer long enough to earn some... Phew. You're an alarmist. Will you, for the love of heaven, stop turning down clients and turn an honest dollar? I've got a couple of prospects right outside the door. Send them away. No, sir. Send them away. Tell them I've gone to Egypt. Nothing doing, sir. Confound you, Archie. Obey order. Send them away. Miss Kent, Mr. Rodman, come in, please. Thank you. Confound you, Archie, you're mutinous. Yes, sir, and you're stuck with it. This is Miss Gloria Kent and Mr. Rodman. They arrived as advertised with a pressing problem. Good morning. You people are here by sufferance only. I shall speak to Mr. Goodwin about it later. Yes, indeed. I don't like pressing problems, Miss Kent. What are yours? My father. Indeed, I'm on the court of domestic relations, Miss Kent. What did your father do? Beat you? Withhold your earnings? Discourage your suitors. Mr. Goodwin should have informed you this office does not undertake cases involving marital or family problems. But that's not... If Mr. Goodwin had not been beguiled by your pretty face, he might have warned you and avoided this embarrassment to you and annoyance to me. Now, 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 take it easy, take it easy. How many times have I told you you don't know how to handle women? Then suppose you let Miss Kent handle me. Well, it's simply this, Mr. Wolfe. I had some money my mother left me. My father's just spent it without my permission. I want it back without a scandal. Thanks, Miss Kent. How much? How spent? Ten thousand dollars. Father bought a treasure map. Indeed? From whom? A pair of swindlers named Cross and Halleck. They've driven him crazy, talking about fortune salvaged from the SS this and the SS that. He's got a map and old letters he studies. He's childish. Many fortunes have been recovered. Many more are weight on the sea bottom. How do you know your father has been duped? Well, I know. You do, Mr. Rodman. Yes. Cross and Halleck bought some old letters for me, written by my grandfather from Hawaii. They used them to manufacture the map and evidence. And that's what they sold to Kent. Father thought he was being so clever. He had the paper analyzed. Of course, the document research laboratory said the letters were genuine. They were. But something new had been added. I'd have never known if Mr. Rodman hadn't told me. You are a party to the swindle, Mr. Rodman? I was not. I never knew what they were up to. Mr. Wolf, you've got to help me. I can't do anything with Father. I can't convince him. Even Mr. Rodman can't. Do... No, Miss Kent, I'm sorry. This is not for me. Oh, but you must. You must, Not I... in my office, madam. No tears. Please, please, Archie, stop her. Okay, okay, okay. Archie, when Miss Kent has finished her disgraceful exhibition, show them out. How dare you walk out on us Easy, like easy, were... easy. I know him, I know him, you don't. He gets into a panic when women cry, or else he's curious about what Fritz is cooking for lunch. Now, just uh, wait a minute, please. 
Oh, aren't you ashamed of yourself walking out like that on that poor kid? That hysterical gamma. <laughs> She's lost all of her money. She needs help. I charge high fees, Archie. So charge a small fee. Do you want her to starve? Good heavens. Starve? How monstrous. I'm not kidding. While you'll be in here smelling your dinner, she and her father will be starving. I thought you were bringing me a paying client. Well, this is different. She's, uh... You're beautiful. Archie, you're impossible. Oh, very well. Go back into them. Get names, addresses, facts. I am not committed to Miss Kent's case, but we'll see. Be a tribute I pay for your weakness for a pretty face. <laughs> Rodman and Gloria Kent were gone, however. So all I had were the few facts they'd given me before they met Wolf. I felt guilty about that when he came back into the office and sat down in his specially built chair. He closed his eyes and I glared at him. Well, how much of you is awake? Mr. Wolf? Uh. Well, they disappeared. Did you tell me you were going to help this girl just to get her out of the office or did you mean it? You're a gadfly. No, sir. No, sir. You made a promise and you're stuck with it. What did you get from Rodman? Name, address, occupation. He's a librarian, that's all. Very careless, Archie. You missed a significant point. Such as, uh... How did Rodman discover the letters he sold were being altered by forgery? And used for swindle. How did he locate the dupe, Mr. Kent? Uh, I guess you're right. I'll ask him next time. But uh, what about now? Are you going to get Gloria's money back? I assume you call Miss Kent Gloria solely in order to annoy me. It does. Stop it. Get Cross and Halleck. On my way. You'll find them at the Hotel Bogart. <laughs> Wrong, sir. According to my notes, their address is... Never mind their address. The Hotel Bogart is the headquarters for successful confidence tricksters. They celebrate their victories there while the money lasts. You will possibly find Cross and Halleck drinking whiskey or lunching... Probably both. I located Cross and Halleck in the hotel bar and lured them back to our place on 35th Street. Wolf was sitting behind his desk with his hands crossed on his impressive middle, at peace with his lunch and the world when I ushered them in. He sat bolt upright and scorched me with a look. Good afternoon, Mr. Wolf. The tall one's name is Cross, the short one is Halleck. They uh, want to help me invest my money. Gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Huh? Who? Nero Wolf? Hey, what is this? Confound you, Archie. How drunk are they? Not too drunk for business. Let's get out of here. Come on. Wait a minute. Chill, duck, decoy. You want me to keep him here, Mr. Wolf? Not by violence, Archie. Come back here, gentlemen. Unless you want seven years in the state penitentiary. Unless what? You got nothing on us, Wolf. Nothing. I have the Kent case. The Kent case? That's a laugh. We're sitting pretty, sitting pretty. You are not, sir. You imagine you possess legal immunity. Mr. Kent believes you are grotesque balderdash and will not sue for fraud. Miss Kent cannot sue because she is reluctant to accuse her father of wrongfully obtaining her money. Ergo, you think you are invulnerable. Now, listen. But you forget me. I'm a detective with a fee to earn. A big fee. Quiet, Archie. I am determined to get that fee. Therefore, as Miss Kent's agent, I can and will bring action against you. I'm indifferent to her tears or her father's disgrace. I'm indifferent to anything outside of money. You will return the $10,000 to me at once, sir, or you'll be in jail by morning. You mean that? I do, Mr. Cross. Alex, come here. Come on, honey. Uh, okay. Here, Mr. Wolf. Alec and I have decided we don't want to get in any trouble with you. Here's your ten grand. Uh, let's have it. Give the dough to Kent, Mr. Wolf, and get the letters and map back for us. You've got a reputation for being tricky, but honest. We trust you. Come on, Alec, let's go. <laughs> well, how about that? Preposterous. No, sir. Take a look. Ten thousand dollars. Genuine coin of the realm. That man crosses a fool. Does he imagine I am to be fooled so easily? What do you mean he left the money? He surrendered too quickly, Archie. Too easily. And that money in the envelope he was carrying all ready to refund. Why? Well, maybe he's got a better sucker. I heard him mention a Ben Sanford. Nonsense. Does he need Kent's forged letters and map to cheat this Ben Sanford? Couldn't he prepare another set? Uh, I guess you're right. Something's fishy. 
In any event, it's no concern of mine, thank heaven. Uh, why not? I'm not committed to Miss Kent in any way. As a favor to you, I undertook to regain her money. I have done that. You may take it back to her and obtain the forged papers in return. But, uh... Silence, Mr. Goodwin. Go to your redhead charmer. Leave me in peace. I intend to spend this afternoon with my new world atlas. I left him 3,000 miles up the Amazon with his magnifying glass and drove up to East 69th Street. The Kent house was a broken-down little brownstone, and as I went up the stoop, the door opened and Gloria Kent burst out like a skyrocket. Hey, Miss Kent, easy, easy. Let go of me. Let go. What's wrong? What's wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Nothing is wrong. Nothing at all. Well, how about seeing your father? You want to see my father? Come inside. Oh, for the love of heaven. Come inside, Mr. Gooden. I'll introduce you. He's in a back room. Come right through the living room. What else came through this living room? A hurricane? No, Mr. Goodwin. Something else. There's my father, Mr. Goodwin. What in the devil? He's dead. His throat's cut. Father, this is Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. He and his boss refused to help while they could. Maybe he can help you now. Stop it. All I'm good for now is revenge. That's all. Stop Archie. it. Stop it and look at me. When did it happen? I don't know. When did you find him? Just now. Keep looking at me. Who went through this house like a hurricane? You? No. Where did you go after you left the office? To the laboratory. What lab? Document research. The place that checked the map. How long were you there? Until an hour ago. I was with Mr. Rodman. Keep looking at me. Uh, and then? I had lunch. With Rodman? Alone. And then I came home. All right. All right, now listen to me. I want you to go to Mr. Wolf's uh, house right now. Uh, Have you got cab there? Yes. All right, take a cab. I've got to stay here, but I'll call Mr. Wolf and tell him you're on the way. Now get. I called Wolf. Told him everything, and he instructed me to advise Inspector Kramer, who arrived with the homicide squad. I gave the inspector everything while the squad photographed and measured, print dusted and detected. At 3.30, Kramer took me back to the house on 35th Street for a fight with Wolf. It's a great story, Wolf. Great. Kent buys a phony treasure map. Everybody knows it's phony except Kent. But Cross and Halleck try to buy it back, and Kent gets himself murdered. Did you find the map and letters in the house, Inspector? No, no, I didn't. The killer was after the map. The phony map? Certainly. Why? Well, if we knew that, we would know why Cross and Halleck so willingly paid back the money and why Kent was murdered. Maybe it's not phony. I'd better see the girl now. Oh, you fancy her for the murder? Well, I'll know after I ask a few questions. Tonight. She's had a shock, Mr. Kramer. She needs rest. Look, Wolf, I want her. Why bother with her when there's so much to be done? Yes, yeah, such as? Cross and Halleck, find them. And the mystery man they spoke of, Ben Sanford. These are the men you want now, not this poor, overwrought girl. Yeah. All right. The girl will be here for questioning tonight, though, huh? Tonight, Mr. Kramer. Okay. You'll hear from me later on. <laughs> Well, you buffaloed him out of that, okay. Say, uh, why don't you want her questioned? Is she guilty? I don't know. Well, what did she say when she got here? She said nothing. She never arrived. She never what? She never arrived. Well, then why did you tell Kramer she was resting? Would he have believed the truth? <laughs> she must be found. More important, we must learn why forge letters and forge map of produces turmoil. Find the killer and you find the map. You said so. I said the reverse, which is an altogether different statement. Archie, I want a photograph of that map. Get it. Oh, sure, sure. Any particular camera you want me to use? You'll find a photograph of 200 Vanderbilt Street. Are you kidding? The lab cannot check the authenticity of old papers without photographing them in ultraviolet light, infrared light, and so on. If this document research lab has examined those papers... They will have photographs. Get them. He got out of his chair and waddled back to the house elevator. It was four o'clock and time for his regular afternoon session with the orchids. I drove down to the document research laboratory on Vanderbilt and got such a shock that I grabbed the office phone and dialed Wolf at once. This is 
Near a wolf. Mr. Wolf, Archie here. What's the matter? Are you lost? No, sir. No, sir, but I found something. Photographs? No, Mr. Wolf. I don't think you'll ever see any photographs of the Kent map. I don't think any were taken. Indeed. But uh, guess who runs the document research laboratory? No, 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 no. Don't guess. You probably know. A man named Ben Sanford, and he's sitting right here looking at me. Bring him home with you. Home? But it's four in the afternoon. This is the sacred hour when you pray over your orchids. Then Mr. Sanford can join the ceremony. Hey, how about this place? How about it? There must be a million flowers up here. (laughs) No, not flowers. Orchids only. Mr. Wolf has 10,000 plants. Never saw anything like it. And you never will again, brother. Hey, uh, what, uh, what kind is that on the bench? Oh, that, that's our pride and joy. Oh, don't it grow some Harianum? Above them, the Van Peterserana, and the pink ones are the Silogiani uh, Pandoratas. Now, the large object, mulching flower pots, is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, Ben Sanford. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. I came along to be obliging. I've got nothing to say about anything. How much have you offered Cross and Halleck for their treasure map? No comment. Mr. Sanford, I'm going to make some assumptions. I assume that you are not, in fact, a document expert, but an accessory to the fraud of Halleck and Cross. No comment. That you actually prepare fraudulent maps for those swindlers, and then in the guise of an expert, guarantee their authenticity. No comment. For this you must answer. You did guarantee the authenticity of the map and letters can't bought. It's on record. All right, I did. Then will you admit they were forged? What, are you, a comic? No. You guarantee the value of the Kent map? Yes. As an expert? Yes. Then you've convicted yourself of murder. Murder? What is this? Mr. Kent was murdered, sir. Evidently for the map and letters he bought. But of all persons involved, you alone believe in the value of the map. No one else does. Therefore, you alone would have murdered Ken for the map. Well, for the love of... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Chew it over, brother. Chew it over. Either way, he's got you. Okay. Okay, you... You want me to level? Here it is. Level, Archie? Okay, boss. Thief-type talk. It means tell the truth. It's like you say. The letters were bought from Rodman. I forged the map and evidence on them. I guarantee them to Kent. The swindle. The letters are without value? Oh, sure, they're old, that's all, from 1851. Just tired family gossip and stuff. Indeed. There we have the problem again, Archie. Mr. Kent is swindled with a map and letters that are known to be worthless. He alone believes the fantasy of the treasure. There isn't any treasure, never was. Yet Cross and Halleck refunded the swindle money so eagerly. It is obvious they want those worthless documents back badly. Someone else wants them so bad, he murders Mr. Kent. Why? I don't know. Ah, uh, gee, we must find the girl. There's a chance she turned to Mr. Rodman for refuge. I'm sorry, you'll have to go there at once. If the girl isn't there, bring Rodman. Yes? Hello, Rodman. Remember me? I'm Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Oh, Oh, yes, of course. I came to get Gloria Kent. There's been a change in plans. Tell her to come out, please. Gloria? Well, she's not here. Why should she be? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Well, I guess you'd better come down and see Wolf. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, I'm afraid I can't. I'm rather busy. Look, Rodman, maybe you ought to know. Old man Kent was murdered. What? Yes, yes, just after you and Gloria left us. Kent murdered? Well, well, this is awful, Mr. Goodwin. You want to see Mr. Wolf now? Get your hat. Murder. Well, believe me, I never wanted this. I, I'm going to tell Nero Wolf the whole mess. Every word of it. Okay, then. Come on, let's go. Yes, of course. Just a minute. I'll get my hat in the bedroom. Murdered? Kent, I never dreamed. Oh. Come on, Rodman. Come on, Rodman. Come on. What? I didn't hear you. Oh, Rodman. What the... Oh, Rodman. What next? Come on, come on. Is it near a wolf? Archie here. We've had a tough break. 
Yes? While I was waiting for Rodman at the front door, he went into the bedroom for his hat. The killer was there. How do you know? He cut Rodman's throat. Kill. The back window was open. It's a ground floor apartment. He was out and gone before I had a chance. Archie, where were your wits? Let me alone. I've had a man murdered 20 feet from me. You think I'm cheering? Mr. Kramer is here, and he has news for us, Archie. He could not locate Cross and Halleck in their apartment. They had not been home all day. The maid informed him that she was waiting for her weekly salary. Well, so what? She was most angry and peppery, Mr. Kramer informs me. Red pepper? Exactly. Okay. Okay, maybe I know what you mean. I'll try to deliver the goods this time. Goodbye. I drove down to the apartment house on Gramercy Square where Cross and Halleck lived, took the elevator up to the 10th floor, found the right door, and slipped in with a pass key. Come on out. Come out wherever you are. I know you're in here. You fooled Kramer pretending to be the maid, but you didn't fool Wolf. You'd better... Gloria! Cut it out! Cut it out, you idiot! Lay off! No. Archie, Archie, you don't... Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Remember me? Go. Give me the gun, Gloria. Give it to me. Oh, that's right. Who, uh, Who did you think I was? Alec. Oh, brilliant. So Wolf figured you out, huh? Oh, you are a brave girl. They killed your father. You came up here and waited for them. You were going to kill them right back, huh? Oh, that red-headed temper. And you bluffed Kramer into thinking you were the maid. I had to do something. It was the only thing I could think of. To come here and kill him. Well, you're coming home with Archie. And just remember one thing. When Wolf's working for you, don't try to do any thinking. It only gets in Wolf's way. I got Gloria Kent back to the house at 7 o'clock. I parked the car, brought her into the office, and got the shock of my life. There was a convention on. Wolf was there with Inspector Kramer representing the cops. Cross, Halleck, and Sanford were there representing the crooks. When Kramer saw Gloria, he scowled first at her... And then at Wolf. So it was a slick one after all, Wolf. You didn't have the girl. You had no intention of producing her. Please, Mr. Kramer, I can wait. There are other matters more important. I dine at eight. That leaves me one hour to solve your murders. Murders? More than one? Yes, two. Elmer Rodman. But I haven't good one if you... Please, Mr. Kramer, not now. First, Miss Kent. Good evening, Miss Kent. I presume you have met these gentlemen, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford. I... Yeah, I'll take your purse, please. Huh? Well, why? I... Uh, don't think me as naive as Mr. Goodwin, miss. When you left your home after the murder of your father, you took the map and letters with you. They are in your purse well, now. That's true. Archie, the purse. Thank you. We have here an interesting situation. There exists some old letters and map, forged and fraudulent. They're worth $10,000 and more to Cross and Halleck and worth two murders to a killer. Why? There must be something of great value in the letters. Yes, such as? Something which Mr. Sanford could not see, although he worked on the document closely. Yet something which could be made manifest. What is the answer, Miss Kent? You know it? I swear I don't. Secret writing, Archie. Bring the chafing dish from the dining room. Right. Secret writing? I saw nothing when I worked on those letters. Naturally, Mr. Sanford, the writing is invisible. The heat is an agent. Makes most forms of secret writing visible. The chafing dish, boss. Thank you, Archie. Place it before me and light it. Right. Now I open Miss Kent's purse. From it, you see, I withdraw these ancient letters which he took from her house after her father's murder. That's not true. Archie. That's enough, Gloria. That's enough. From now on, you just listen. We remove the letters from the envelope and toast them gently. Secret Ink Vintage, 1851, will easily succumb to the agency of heat. Careful. Those envelopes will catch fire. Uh, Hey, 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 they're caught. Don't be upset, Mr. Cross, Mr. Halleck. The envelopes! Uh. They'll burn safely in the dish. We can concentrate on the writing. Watch closely. I don't want to be accused of trickery. You fat fool. The envelopes are everything. Put them out, Sanford. Don't sit there. Put them out. Why, Mr. Halleck? Well, the stamps, the missionaries, they're worth a fortune. The missionaries? Of course. You know that. 
Mr. Cross knows. So does Mr. Sanford, right? Yeah, yeah. Cross Sanford knows, you old fool. Let me... Uh, Mr. Sanford is not alarmed. Why not, sir? I don't know what you're talking about. Fifty or a hundred thousand dollars is burning before your eyes, Mr. Sanford. Cross and Halleck are burning their fingers, putting out the flaming envelopes. And you sit there quite indifferently. Why? Well, I've... Uh... I, you know the value of the missionary stamps on the letters you bought from Rodman. But you know these aren't the real letters. Isn't that it? Not the real letters? I told you I'm tough to crack, Wolf. You didn't fool me with those dummies. Dummies? How do you know? Mr. Cross didn't know. Mr. Haddock didn't know. How did you? Well, I... Uh... I'll tell you, sir. Only one man could know I was framing Miss Kent as a decoy. Only one man could know I prepared these dummy letters and pretended to take them from her purse. And that is the killer. The man who murdered her father and stole the map and letters this morning. You, sir, Mr. Sanford. Well, I'll be... Mr. Kramer, there's your killer. You'll find the missing map and letters on him or concealed in his home or office. You won't need the evidence anyway. Look at his face. He's self-confessed. Self-confessed like fun? He was booby-trapped. No, Mr. Crane. Not a complicated case, really. Very simple. Elmer Rodman sold a packet of old family letters to the swindlers for a small sum. They used the letters to perpetrate their fraud on Miss Kent's father. And the stamps on the letters were valuable? They were a special Hawaiian issue 1851, Miss Kent. Nicknamed missionaries, because missionaries used them for writing home. They are extremely rare stamps worth upward of $25,000 each. Hey, no wonder they were worth two murders. We found five of them on Sanford. Excellent. Somewhere or other, Rodman discovered the value of the stamps after he sold the letters. In his effort to get them back, he communicated his discovery to the swindlers, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford. So that's why they refunded the money so fast. Precisely. In an effort to have the sale rescinded. Rodman sought out Kent and tried to convince him of the fraud. Alas, he would not listen to the truth, Mr. Kramer. Oh, I get it. And while the others were hassling around, Sanford tried to steal a march and quietly resorted to murder. Ah, uh, there you have it. Ha-ha! Great job, boss, great job. So Gloria not only gets her ten grand back, but uh, five times twenty-five, which is about a hundred and twenty-five thousand worth of goodies... Now, figuring your rates by the hour, that means you've done a gratis job worth about... Yes, um... Ken. I did not know what I demand a large fee for what I've done. I will not go back on my word. But I can beg for a favor. I'll only be too happy to... Wait, wait, wait. I asked something that would not be easy to grant. What is it? Will you use your red hair, your pretty face, your admirable figure, and your ample fortune to lure Mr. Goodwin away from this house tonight... I would like to enjoy my dinner in peace. That won't be difficult, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Let's have an understanding right now, Gloria. Difficult for you or for me? I'll be delighted. <laughs> Indeed. To spend an evening with Mr. Goodwin, there is only one word for you, Miss Kent. Intrepid. Oh, You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story by Alfred Bester was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout, produced by Edwin Fadiman, and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Wally Mayer as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Howard McNair, Jay Novello, Larry Dobkin, Bill Johnstone, and Herb Vigran. Music by Joseph Enos. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Careworn Cup. Don Stanley speaking. The preceding was transcribed. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes ring for Dennis Day and Judy Canova tomorrow night on NBC. Also, Judy Canova prepares to go operatic tomorrow because her special guest is Itzio Pinza. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The Man Called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. Saturday Night Chimes on NBC mean a full hour of fun with Dennis Day and Judy Canova. Dennis always appears perplexed and bewildered. 
But one thing that doesn't perplex him is how to make a popular ballad come to life in his thrilling tenor voice. And there's music also on the Judy Canova show, plus comedy in the mischievous Canova manner. That's Judy Canova and Dennis Day, tomorrow night over most NBC stations. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. <laughs> It's the transcribed adventure of The Case of the Careworn Cuff with that brilliant, eccentric private detective, orchid fancier, and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> The place is Nero Wolfe's office. At the moment, the world's greatest motionless detective is sitting in the chair which was built especially to support his 300 pounds. His eyes are closed, and he's making sounds through his nose. Archie. Archie. Archie! Yes, Mr. Wolf, what is it? The phone, if you please, Mr. Goodwin. Well, it's on your desk, only eight and three-quarter inches from your left elbow. All you have to do is lean forward. Found it, Archie. What do you think I am, an athlete? Hello. No, wrong number, mister. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, if that old phone awakened you. Wrong number, and I was not asleep. I was merely uh, concentrating. On what? We're out of work. There's nothing to concentrate on. May have escaped your errant attention, Archie. But there are other subjects for thought besides murder. Mm-hmm. Sure, blondes. And blondes. You're right at that, brunettes. Phooey. That's not a nice thing to say about any girl, even if she does happen to be a brunette. Archie. Yes, sir? Go away. You annoy me. Suppose I did. Who'd get your beer for you? Fritz. Tonight happens to be Fritz's night off. However, you can always get your beer for yourself. Don't be an idiot. There are exactly 23 steps between here and the kitchen. As you very well know, I abominate strenuous physical activity. 23 steps times two is 46. You could walk very slow. Nonsense. Now that you mention it, to... <clears throat> I happen to be mildly thirsty, Archie, would you? Now that I mention it, you'd better let the beer go for tonight. Why? Our stock is running low. You mean careless? I've been careful, because something else is also running low. What? Money? Fiddle sticks, there's plenty in the bank. Sure, but very little of it is yours. Mr. Wolf, do you remember that batch of orchids you bought last week? Of course I do, magnificent and very rare specimen. I got a magnificent bill for him this morning, too. It was uh, large? It was large. Hmm. Confound it, Archie, I shall have to do some work. You turned down half a dozen cases in the last few weeks. One of them may still require me. Most of them hired other detectives. However, there is a Mr. Wenceslas who might still be in need. His problem is what? As I remember, he's being followed by midgets. <laughs> he wanted you to do something about it. Not, not that he minded the midgets so much. It was the elephants they were riding. The man needs a psychiatrist, not a detective. Anyone else? I can check my files, but I don't think... Ha <laughs> ha! Saved by the bell. Another cliche like that, and I shall sure... answer the phone yourself. Assassinate! You see what it is. Okay. Hello. Yes, Mr. Wolf is in. Yes, he'll be in. He always is. What? But. Hmm. That was a Mr. Charles Porter. He was in a hurry. He's on his way over right now. Should be here in ten minutes. Prospective client, I trust. A thousand dollars worth of prospective client. Splendid, Archie, my beer. Okay, but, uh, <clears throat> look, I'm not sure you're going to accept his offer. Indeed, what does he want me to do for his paltry fee? That's the point. If I heard him right, he wants you to do nothing. The door, Archie. Yes, sir. I hear it. Mr. Porter? Naturally, I'm Charles Porter. Who else would I be? It's a large field. Uh, never mind. Come on in. I'm Archie Goodwin. Where is Wolf? Mr. Wolf is in here. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Porter. 
Good evening. Fat, aren't you? It's moderately noticeable. Out to your chair for Mr. Porter. Don't bother. I'm too impatient to sit. When I have business to take care of, I take care of it quickly. Very well. Send him out of the room. Mr. Goodwin, nonsense. He's my assistant. He remains. I don't like it. Archie, show Mr. Porter out. Now, wait. There's no need to get temperamental. Perhaps I'm a little abrupt. Rude. I'm a worried man. And impatient. You're wasting time, Mr. Porter. I suppose I am. The reason I came to you... Young man, what are you doing with that notebook? Getting ready to make marks in it. But... No, never mind. Mr. Wolfe, you have a client named Dorothy Spencer. Have I? There's no need to be coy about it. I happen to know. Then you know. I want you to drop her. Drop her? Refuse to handle her case. Close the books on her. You know what I mean. Why should I? The girl has no money. I have. That doesn't answer my question. Perhaps this will. Appear to be a small package of dollar bills. It happens to be a thousand dollars. Archie, will you? I will. It is a thousand dollars. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Yes? You're paying me a thousand dollars in order that I refuse to act for Miss Spencer. Nothing more. That's right. What does she suspect you of? I said nothing about... Well, that is... You must know that as well as I do. Possibly, and nevertheless, what does she suspect you of? Uh, being a blackmailer. Whereas your occupation really is... I'm a musician. Pianist. I'm appearing nightly at the Windsor Hotel. Archie, have you made out a receipt for Mr. Porter? Yep. Give it to him and show him to the door. Okay. Mr. Porter? Mr. Wolf, I want your assurance that the entire affair is definitely finished. My association with Miss Spencer, you mean. You have my assurance that it is. You will forgive a classical illusion. The cover. Thank you. Good night. Mr. Wolf, I have a secret about Mr. Porter. He <laughs> smells. Some perfume or other. More important, his right coat cuff is more worn than his left cuff. And a cop happens to be a musical term, meaning start again from the beginning. Oh, Porter thought it meant finished. Therefore, Mr. Porter is a liar. His ignorance of common musical term indicates that he's not a musician. The worn right coat cuff, that he is an office worker. That's kind of leaping to a deduction. But even if Porter's a liar, Mr. Wolf, there is something else. He, uh, he paid you a thousand dollars to drop a client named Dorothy Spencer... Mr. Wolf, you never had a client with that name. Well, that's that. Dorothy Spencer is not in. Anyway, she's not answering her phone. Mr. Wolf, I said... I know what you said. Ah. That a comment? I'm worried. Mr. Porter may have assumed erroneously that Dorothy Spencer had employed or was intending to employ me. That does not explain why he lied about his occupation. Maybe he didn't lie. After all, your deductions could be wrong. Phew. Okay. Take care of that. Right now. I'm phoning her. Hello. Uh, Windsor Hotel? Get me the manager's office. Thank you. Ah, uh, could, could, could you tell me if a Charles Porter plays the piano, it's... Uh-huh. She sounds blonde. I see. Thanks a lot. What do you do after work? You... Oh, oh, so long. She goes home and beats her husband. About Porter, Archie. Bad news. He does play the piano at the Windsor in the move room. So where does that leave your deductions? Untouched, of course. Let me think. Hmm... Yes, naturally. Naturally what? I came to the conclusion that Mr. Porter was an office worker. We have just discovered that Mr. Porter is not an office worker, therefore... You were wrong. I am never wrong. Therefore, the man who is here is not Charles Porter. Mr. Wolf, do you think a man of your weight should climb out on a limb like that? Fiddlesticks. Look up Porter in the phone book and call him. Okay. I'll take a second. Uh-huh. Archie, the phone company's best friend. <clears throat> yep, here he is. 
What do I ask him? Um, there'll be no need to ask Mr. Porter anything. Just phone. You're the boss. Well, have to say something to the guy. Hello. I'd like to speak to Charles Porter. So would you. Who's... Oh, Steppens, huh? Yeah, that's right, Archie. Oh. No, no, don't, don't, don't bother why I call it a coincidence. Goodbye. You know who that was? No. That was Sergeant Stebbins, Sergeant Pearly Stebbins. I might add, as though you didn't know, that Stebbins happens to be a sergeant in homicide. Indeed. You expected this. I still don't know what your conversation was about. It was about Charles Porter, who maybe was a liar, but who isn't going to tell any more lies, on account of he was just shot to death. Well, well, if it ain't Archie Goodwin. Come in, Goodwin. Thank you, Sergeant Stebbins. I've been expecting you. Oh, that's sweet of you to say that, Pearlie. <laughs> Why did you phone Porter? His right coat cuff was more worn out than his left. So for that, you had to kill him? No, actually, I killed him because he didn't know his duck couple. Hey. Yeah, hey. He don't look good anymore, eh? Guys who stop bullets with their face never look good. Pearlie, you've been robbed. I did. Hmm. That corpse is not Porter. <laughs> now, relax, Goodwin, relax. His fingerprints were on file and they check. His girlfriend says he's Porter. If he could get up and talk, he'd tell you he was Porter. And what makes you think he isn't? Well, because when he visited us earlier tonight, he looked different. Not much, but... You said girlfriend? Yes, I said girlfriend. She's in the next room mopping up. She kind of broke down when we brought her here. You brought her here? Now, don't tell me what her name is. Why shouldn't I? It's Spencer. Dorothy Spencer. Ooh. That's what I was afraid of. Sergeant, I... Oh. Ignore him. He comes with the woodwork. His name is Goodwin, Miss Spencer. Archie Goodwin. Find what you were looking for? What I was looking... Somebody's gone through this place like a minor league hurricane. You? What business is it of Of mine? None, maybe. On the other hand, Nero Wolf might have other ideas. Matter of fact, I'm sure he'd have. Miss Spencer, why don't you go see him? The address is 601 West 35th Street. I don't see why... You want your boyfriend's murderer found, don't you? Now listen, Goodwin, the police are working on this. Sure, they'll see to it nobody harms a corpse. Goodbye, Miss Spencer. Don't forget that address, 601 West 35th Street. Believe it or not, you used to be a client of ours. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you're getting to be so brilliant, it's boring. Boy. <laughs> That is, um... Uh... All right, tonight you deserve it. I'll get you another can of beer. But this is the last one. Unless you promise to do some exercise, like, uh... Like maybe standing up and sitting down five minutes a day. Thank you. <sighs> and why should I indulge in such idiotic behavior? Well, after a while, you might be able to see your shoes. I've already seen them. Oh, that was 20 years ago. Things have changed. No more buttons. Hey, that must be Dorothy Spencer. Hmm, she's undoubtedly young and beautiful. You deduced that from the way she pressed the buzzer? I deduced that from the gleam in your eye, bah. Bah, all you want. I'm going to keep that gleam shining. Hello, Miss Spencer. Come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Is the large sitting down gentleman behind the desk? This is Dorothy Spencer, Mr. Wolf. You will forgive me not rising. It is due to a necessary conservation of energy rather than rudeness. Archie, a chair. Sure. Here you are, Miss Spencer. Thanks. Now then, Miss Spencer, have the police found anything but dust in Mr. Porter's closet? I... no. You were engaged to Mr. Porter? I was. That ring you're wearing, he gave it you? Yes. May I see it? Well... All right. Here. Thank you. Hmm, expensive. Very expensive. You may have it back. Miss Spencer, why are you marrying Charles Porter? I, I loved him. Hooey. Mr. Porter, according to Archie's description, was twice your age with considerably less than half your attractiveness. Love may perhaps be blind, but it is not astigmatic. I, I don't know what you mean. What were you searching for under the nose of the police? Nothing. Nothing how, at all. How did your fiancé earn his money? He played the piano at the... Boy, what he earned there in a year wouldn't begin to pay for the ring he gave you. Would you like to try again? 
I don't know how he made his money. I suggest that you do. I suggest that he earned money by the same method that he induced you to consider marrying him. Blackmail. Oh, but... Why was he blackmailing you? Old letters I'd written when I was too young to know any better. Your motives for murdering Porter would be twofold, then. Recovery of blackmail material and the avoidance of marriage to a man you dislike. I didn't kill Charles. Good doorbell, Archie. Get Miss Spencer into the kitchen once. Must be the police. Yeah, let's go, Miss Spencer. Right through that door. And stay there until I call you. Front door, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf, do I know Dorothy Spencer's here? You know nothing. A simple role for you to play. Uh, I haven't got time to resent that insult right now, but wait until the next time you drop a collar button. Well, bless my soul, if it isn't dear old Inspector Kramer. How is the homicide department? Where's Wolf? Big surprise. He's sitting. Mr. Wolf. Good evening, Inspector. Where's Dorothy Spencer? This is not the Bureau of Missing Persons. The district attorney would like to talk to her. I shall tell her so the next time we meet. Yeah, that could be right now. She's in this house. I don't see her. Mind if I look around for myself? You have a search warrant, of course. Well, it so happens, no, but... Uh... Archie, the inspector's leaving. Okay, I'm leaving. I suppose by the time I get back with a warrant, she'll be in Hoboken. Hoboken? Where's that? Look, Wolf, you can go too far. One of these days, you won't be able to talk yourself out of a... I... Ah... Trail me to the door, Goodwin, to show what a good detective you are. Oh, Inspector Kramer doesn't love us anymore. Unfortunate. Archie, take Miss Spencer to a respectable hotel. Register her under an assumed name. She is to stay there until notified otherwise. Luckily, the good inspector neglected to inform us that she was the leading suspect in a murder case. Hence, we're not accessories after the fact. And I don't want her arrested for murder as yet. Her beauty has won you over. Oh, you will then return here immediately. Okay. What are you going to be doing in the meanwhile? I, Archie, uh, shall be thinking. <laughs> Archie? No. No, not Archie. Ah, our impatient and non-musical friend came in through the window. How are you, Mr... Not Porter, of course. Where's the girl? Question is beginning to bore me. I don't know. I think she's here. So did the police. I might add that they were slightly closer to the truth. Incidentally, what makes you think she was Porter's accomplice? She must have been. Nonsense, she wasn't. Porter was blackmailing her. Just as he was blackmailing you. In her case, it was letters. In yours, a previous criminal record, perhaps, that your employers might be interested in. I want to know where she is. Maybe this would help you remember. Good heavens, don't find a pistol at me. It annoys me. Ah, the police, I should think, open the door for them like a good fellow. Oh, no. I'm leaving. But if I don't find that girl, I'll be back. Knock the bastard thing down if it isn't open. All right, well, I've got the search warrant. Also, no doubt, a fine tooth comb. Bah. By the way, Inspector. All right, boys, cover the house. All right, Inspector. Well, yeah, what did you want? As your men go through the house, will you have one of them shut the back window? I've just had a burglar, and I suspect he left it open. Unless the matter is attended to, the house might be filled with <laughs> fresh air. Yeah, what's the matter with that? Fresh air, deadly poison. It clogs the lungs. And may I point out that the warrant you're clutching in your hot little hand is not a lease on the house. Finish your search quickly, if you please, and then... Uh, <laughs> why not try Hobo? So I just missed the inspector, huh? You did? That I can stand. I'm sorry about the burglar, though. Perhaps we can arrange to have you meet him in the morning. He left his calling card with name and address on it? He dropped his handkerchief here on my desk. Oh. Hmm. It's a handkerchief. It smells. <laughs> so it does. But, um... All of our unknown friends' clothes carry the odor. Therefore... Yeah? You will go out immediately to the nearest drugstore, buy a specimen of every cake of soap manufactured in this country. Miss 
Mr. Wolf? He's there. No. I never realized just how many different brands of soap are made in this country. You should listen to the radio more often. So far, we've sniffed at 37 cakes. None of them smell like porter. Uh, let's see. 38. Hey, let me have it, Archie. Yes, the soap. Ah, it's labeled orchid ovals. I should say basically mislabeled. Orchids have no odor. Our task for the evening is finished. Why? All we know is the guy washes with a basely mislabeled soap. No, the odor would not have been so persistent in that case. Unquestionably, our visitor works for a soap company that makes orchid ovals. Every employee of a plant in which perfume in large quantities is used inevitably carries the odor on his clothes. Oh. And you already deduced he works in an office. Uh Uh-huh. Ah, I, I go see him in the morning? You do? <laughs> you know, Mr. Wolf, what with hiring rooms for girls and paying visits to a perfume factory, I'm beginning to feel like a maiden aunt. No one would ever mistake you for a maiden aunt, Archie. Thanks. Is that another deduction? Maiden aunts rarely need a shave. <laughs> Can I do anything for you, sir? Yeah. That is, uh, <clears throat> let's postpone that question and slip in another one. I'm, I'm looking for one of your office people. He's in his 40s, 5 foot 10, brown hair and eyes, speaks in a sharp, quick voice. He owes and... you money, too. Uh, who owes me money? Mr. Wheeler, the man you were describing. He owes everybody money. In spite of the fact that he's office manager and makes lots and lots of money. How much does he owe you? Hmm? Oh, not, not an awful lot. It won't break me if I don't get it. Is he in yet? Well, he was, but he went home. He was sort of sick. Sort of? Mm. He got a phone call from somebody and rushed out. Mm, too bad. Well, I'd better scram. Well, you didn't answer my question yet. I'm off at five. My name's Gwen. Goodbye. Wolf speaking. Archie here. Our unknown's name is Wheeler. He left the office this morning sick after he got a mysterious phone call. Bad, probably. Get to Dorothy Spencer at once and bring her here. Right. I'm at Wheeler's house now. Thought I'd better check. His wife's here, too. Blonde? Uh-huh. How could you tell? Fetch your smirk in your voice. Get out of there fast and don't stop to console Mrs. Wheeler. <laughs> Behind you, Goodwin. Uh, never mind pulling triggers. I'll shut it. Oh, Archie. I would prefer silence. Keep your hands high, Goodwin. It's unhealthy. All the blood had run into my head. Archie, he murdered Charles. He did. Tut, Mr. Wheeler. You really shouldn't have. It's against the law. Get into the bathroom, both of you. I already shaved. I phoned him. I thought maybe he had my letters. Porter couldn't keep his mouth shut about his other victims. He was going to force Dorothy to marry him. Did you find his material, Wheeler? Yes. In an office, he read it as a front. It's all burned. And why all the melodrama? You know about me, so does she. I can't trust anyone. Get into the bathroom, I said. Look, let's not lose our heads about this. Get moving, Goodwin. I like it here. All right, then. Here is where you'll get it. Hey, hey, hey wait, wait, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I got shot and Wheeler fell down. I shot him, Goodwin. Stebbins. Dear Sergeant Stebbins. Oh, you little flat-footed angel. <laughs> it's lucky for you my flat feet got staked out here in time. Just for that, I'll buy you a pair of arch supports for your next birthday, but... I'm beginning not to believe this. You had it all figured out? Well, not exactly. Well, that is... Ah, I, uh... Wolf sent you here. Well, he kind of phoned in and suggested one of us shoot down here and do some rescue work. <laughs> that old devil. Hey, you're not kidding. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> Wolf wasn't sure whether you'd need rescuing from Wheeler or... <laughs> Stop killing yourself with your own jokes. <laughs> or whether Miss Spencer would need rescuing from you. <laughs>
You've been a very foolish young woman, Miss Spencer. I suggest that in the future you exercise more care in your correspondence. Oh, I shall, Mr. Wolf, but how can I ever thank you? Well, one one way would be to listen wide-eyed while he explains how he solved the case. I have no intention Oh, of... come on, Mr. Wolf, stop stalling. Please, mm. Mr. Wolf. Well, uh... I'd be very happy to. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see anyone try to stop me. <laughs> a man came to me, offered me a thousand dollars to drop a client I didn't have. Why? Because obviously he wished to direct my attention to that client. Me? You, Miss Spencer. Now then, he identified himself as Charles Porter, a musician. But I tested him and discovered that he knew nothing of music. Ah! The da capo routine. Precisely. Therefore, he was an imposter. His purpose? Yeah? To indicate by no means subtly that enmity existed between Porter and Dorothy Spencer. Huh? Thus, when Porter was found murdered, I would presumably be convinced that Dorothy Spencer, balked in her effort to enlist my aid against Porter, had resorted to most foul and bloody murder. Most foul and bloody murder is very fancy, Dorothy. Shows he likes you. Oh. I thereupon ask myself, why should an unknown seek to convince me that Dorothy Spencer was Porter's murderer? And you answered yourself? One reason only, because he himself intended to murder Porter, as he did. For which peccadillo he has, thanks to Sergeant Stebbins' accuracy with a revolver, already paid with his own life. Quadiat ap demonstrandum. Latin for that's what you wanted to know. I think you're wonderful, Mr. Wolf, and I'm going to... Ah, be careful. Kiss you. Hmm, Archie, Miss Spencer is a very dangerous young woman. Today I feel brave. Do you, Archie? Very brave. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Let's do it together. Bah. Oh, is that Mr. Wolf? I said bah. Would you very much mind conducting your romance elsewhere? I would not. And do so at once. I have a very important matter to attend to. Goodbye, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Night, sir. Very important. Very been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Lamont Johnson as Archie Goodwin, and Jane Webb, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, and Wilms Herbert. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Dear Dead Lady. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The NBC chimes are excited about the big show. An hour and a half every Sunday night with Tallulah Bankhead as Femme C. Comedy with stars like Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Groucho Marx, and a host of others. Music with Meredith Wilson, Mindy Carson, and many more. It presents drama with Mr. Jose Ferrer and many more leading stars of Broadway and Hollywood. It's the big show. Starts Sunday, November 5th on NBC. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The Man Called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. This Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. The best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. 
Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's the big show. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of the case of the dear dead lady with that brilliant eccentric private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Nero Wolf had just come downstairs, having tended to his precious orchids. He was, as usual, seated in the library, which served as the office. He had just dialed a phone number, and with his eyes closed, was leaning back in his specially built chair, which was big enough for two, but not two of him. Market, domestic and imported delicacies. Mr. Halsberger, this is Nero Wolf. Oh, oh, yeah, Mr. Wolf. I was just about to ring you. Oh, when... I have need of two pounds of duck liver. Ah. I do not, of course, refer to the commercialized Strasbourg pate. Well, I appreciate the order, Mr. Wolf, but. Uh... Next, my cook Fritz informs me that we would require three fine fat geese. Look, Mr. Wolf. There's a little matter of an unpaid You bill. might add 12 cases of beer, a bushel of Vermont apples, green for stuffing, and a gallon of Marquisa Patrisa Roman oil. Mr. Wolf. In addition, I... Fritz has listed six dozen eggs, four braces of Sussex woodcock, and a few pounds of Westphalian ham. You have all that? Well, I, I can get it, Mr. Wolf, but my bookkeeper... Thanks te- very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Yeah. <clears throat> Now then, Archie. Yes, boss? You seem to be worried. Oh, I am. This means naturally that I'm supposed to handle Haltzbrecher's delivery boy when and if he shows. I had thought of leaving that simple matter to you. And what about the simple matter of the money? Money? I I hate to bring up a vulgar subject, but where is it coming from? Oh, of course. You're right, Archie. I should have said... Said what? Charge it. Boss, look, you don't realize, I know, but we're into that truffle broker for 500-odd bucks and change. All right, all right, then give him a check. Okay. Okay, I will give him a check. And I hope they'll let you keep the orchids in your cell. You're a wit, Archie. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I'm on the bank's mailing list. We got a notice this morning. You don't mean... Oh, but I do. Again? Yeah, you just can't take money out of an account, boss. Sometimes you got to put some in. This is the only way to deal with the man I work for, and if I hadn't thrown him that scare, he wouldn't have been willing to listen when the door buzzer rang, and a prosperous-looking young guy in the kind of clothes that don't grow on trees came in and stood in front of the boss's chair, fiddling with the brim of his pork pie. My name is Oliphant, Mr. Wolf. Oliphant? Uh, yes, sir, Oliphant. I am the spiritual leader and guiding head of a small religious group known as the Seekers of the Inner Power. Ah, I see. Also a man addicted to marrying neither wisely nor well, but often. You read the papers. I do. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I am as aware of my sin-ridden past as anyone else is. The point is that I'm no longer that kind of man. Even a person such as I can see the light in time. Good. Might I ask why you've come to see me, Mr. Oliphant? I need your help, Mr. Wolf. Concerning? A certain young lady with whom I'm deeply in love. Oh, I beg you not to confuse the present emotion with any of my earlier escapades. What I feel for Miss Dana is the pure and righteous glow of an upright seeker of the inner power. I promise to look on you as thoroughly redeemed, Mr. Oliver. Proceed. Oh, by the way, do I recognize the name of your young lady as a Park Avenue socialite, an amateur swimming champion? Yes. But she's sweet, wonderful, beautiful. I've asked her to marry me, and she's given me some hope. In time, I fully expect to make her my wife. Well, then where's the problem? The problem is the presence of another man in her life. 
I'm sorry, sir. I'm a detective, not a matchmaker. This isn't a question of making a match, Mr. Wolfe. I have much too much respect for your talents to think of offering you such an assignment. Exactly. What do you want me to do? I want you to save Ilsa Dana's life. Her life? Mr. Wolf, this other man I spoke of is insanely jealous. Not only of Ilsa's present, but of her past as well. He has threatened to kill her. I don't doubt your earnestness in this matter, Mr. Oliphant, but how would you know? I was listening on an extension in Miss Dana's apartment a few days ago when Hunter called. Hunter? Yes, sir. Jack Hunter. Known as Jack the Babe Hunter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know that canvas back. Huh? Sure, he's a coffee and cake prelim waltzer. Oh, no, he's not. He's a boxer. Archie is being fancy. Overlook it, Mr. Oliphant. Is Hunter in love with this lady of yours? I doubt it. He's a man of complete moral and spiritual corruption, I believe. Naturally, you would. But what are the facts? In my opinion, he's after her for her money. She has money? To burn. And you, Mr. Oliphant? Me. Can you also afford to burn? How much do you want? The answer to that would be astronomical. However, if you leave a check for, say, $7,000, I shall look into your matter the very moment I have completed a little research into the nutrition of the Polynesian orchid. Elephant's check gave our bank account a slight blood transfusion. I think it was the boss's plan to spend a week or two in the plant room before he got busy on the case. And he'd have done it, too, if that phone call hadn't come in about a little after nine, just after Wolf had polished off one of Fritz's dinners and was settling back with a stein of beer in his hand. Don't disturb yourself, Archie. I'll get it. Now, well, look out. You don't strain yourself, boss. You got to straighten out an elbow to reach that receiver. You have an unfortunate flair for mixing humor with impertinence, my friend. Hello, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Elsa Dana, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, Miss Dana? We were discussing you only this morning. So I've heard. Through whom? Ted Oliphant. I see. The young man seemed to be quite worried about you. The young man should tend to his own affairs. He said you were in some danger. I know what he said. And not one word of it was true. Oh? Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure it'll be an immense pleasure. Where do you live? I have an apartment at uh, 22 Blanton Street. Could you be here soon? I could be there in a quarter of an hour, Miss Dana. By proxy, of course. The proxy, naturally, was yours truly. Ten minutes later, at twenty past nine, I walked up to Ilsa Dana's door with a nosy elevator boy giving me the double O. The reason for his interest was that her door was open and the room inside was empty except for a little twisted pile of pale pink satin, which at close range turned out to be a woman. Which woman turned out to be Ilsa Dana? And Ilsa Dana was dead. She used to be pretty. She isn't now. Yeah, strangulation doesn't help any girl's looks, son. Make anything of it? Well, the position of her body and the bloodstains on her pointed fingernails tells me that she put up a tough struggle before somebody succeeded in smothering with a pillow from the sofa over there. Yeah, that figures. When did it happen, I wonder? Yeah, the last 15 minutes, I'd guess. Say, who's been up in the elevator this evening? Nobody for her. Well, somebody came up. Well, who says not? They could have used the stairs, you know. Yeah. How well do you know Miss Dana? I know exactly zero about Miss Dana. How could you write her up and down every day and know nothing about her? It's a rule at a house to keep your mouth shut. The rule also goes when being questioned by a cop. A cop? Who's a cop? Oh, I guess you're a cello player from the Philharmonic. Look, I happen to work for a guy named Nero Wolf. Oh. Heard of him? Maybe. Well, if your memory comes alive, son, I might see my way clear to uh, spend a few dollars with you. You understand? I'll keep you in mind. Going down, mister? I spent time trying to get sense out of the superintendent and a set of chambermaids, but they were as quiet as a ballpark on Christmas Eve. Then I called the cops and told them about Oliphant and Hunter. By the time I got home, the house was dark and Nero Wolf was sleeping. Next morning, I gave him the details while he drank three bottles of beer. When I finished, he sat for a long time and then started another bottle. The prize fighter. What about the prize fighter, Archie? Hunter? Well, I, I phoned the hotel he lives in before you got up. And? They told me he wasn't in. Hmm. 
You know, I begin to think that Mr. Oliphant brought us a more absorbing case than he suspected. You know, I'm glad you like it. I don't like it. I don't like work of any variety. But this thing has its points. Well, what do we do next? Next, we investigate my client. What? Merely because a reformed playboy employs a detective doesn't exempt him from suspicion action. Oh, now who's that? I'm afraid we have no choice but to open the door and see. My name is Young. Basto Young. It's nice meeting you, Mr. Young. What do you want? I want to see Nero Wolf. About? Uh, about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. What? Will you repeat that? I want to see Mr. Wolf about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. Mm -hmm. Her name, please? Ilsa Dana. Is it possible that you entertain plans of making her your wife? Why, well, uh, Yes, but uh, there's a problem involved. Another man? Uh, yes. Well, and... do come in. Do come in. I think we've been waiting for you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Here's another one. Ah, Mr. Wolf. You've come to me about Miss Ilsa Dana, sir? I have come to you, more specifically, about a man who has threatened her life. Hmm. How unusual. He's the treacherous kind. Mild-mannered, you know. As we say in my profession, he underplays it. Your profession, then, is the stage. It is, sir. Go on, you interest me deeply. I was present recently when he told her that he would certainly kill her unless she mended her sinful ways. Sinful? No one denies that Ilsa has had... Uh, Shall we say a checkered career? But the man's attitude is totally fanatical. What's his particular brand of fanaticism, Mr. Young? Theodore Oliphant is a religious maniac. Well, what do you know? He's come to give Theodore a bad report card. I don't understand. I, I've come to ask Mr. Wolfe to prevent his murdering Miss Dana. Am I allowed a direct question, sir? Why, of course. Where were you between 9 and 9.20 p.m. last night? 9 and 9.20... Why do you ask? You said I was permitted a direct question. Oh, well, I was walking in the uh, park, as I remember. Do you make a habit of walking in the park? I have lately. I'm preparing for an important role in the forthcoming production. What's so important about last night? From your point of view, a great deal, sir. Well, what do you mean? Last night, Miss Ilsa Dana was murdered. What? Mr. Goodwin here discovered the body. No. I'm afraid I must insist, Mr. Young. Uh, oh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, are you accusing me of... A, I a... have accused you of nothing, my dear sir. Well, now, look, you're making a mistake. Oliphant killed her. You may be sure of that. I have your word. I know him. He was trying to reform her. Wanted to make her a devout follower of his cult, the Seekers of Power. I heard him tell her to her face... That if she refused redemption, he would see to it that she didn't live on in her wickedness. You could produce other witnesses? Do you know, in your own smug way, you're as detestable a character as I have ever had. All right, all right. Let's everybody take five. Yeah? Nero Wolf? He's busy. This is Archie Goodwin. You'll do, Goodwin. This is Jack the Babe Hunter. Oh? Uh, how are you? Great. Except the cops seem to want to talk to me about some murder fandango because, as I get it, you named my name. You got it wrong. I doubt it, and I'm coming over there to set you straight. Why'd you ring me in on this mess, Wolf? You knew the girl pretty well. Me and how many more? Besides, what time was she murdered? Last night, between 9 and 9.20 see. So if you will inform the police where you were at the time, that should be that. Yeah. By the way, Mr. Hunter, where were you at the time? I don't see your badge, Wolf. I was only wondering. I haven't been near the Dana woman for over a month. But if you're really interested, I'll give you the name of the killer. Please do not keep us in suspense, Mr. Hunter. A couple of years back, Ilsa financed a guy in a big and lousy Shakespearean play that closed like a clam and nothing flat. Go on. It was money down the drain. The guy's got nerve. And he was in love with her, and he figured she'd do anything for him. So he comes back to her to finance him again. This time in Hamlet, no less. I see. I don't have to tell you what a flop that would be. You needn't tell me the actor's name either. You know? Mr. Barstow Young just left here. 
Yeah? Well, he's your man, Wolf. He got so sore when she told him she wouldn't toss any more moolah into his broken-down career, he went off his rocker and tore it down. Your reason for thinking so? I met him on the street one day, and he started beefing to me with blood in his eyes. So I could do not to punch him. The results might have been less fatal if you'd followed your instincts, sir. Ugh, I couldn't. Guy's built like a broomstick. He's weak as a cat. Hit him once, he'd crack like dry plaster. I see. Hmm, hmm. What's on your mind? This man you're accusing of Miss Stainer's murder, Mr. Hunter, he was very much in love with her. She was thinking about marrying him, he said. He said? Yes, he did. I heard him, too. He was talking through his skullcap. Ilsa wasn't going to marry anybody. No? No, she couldn't. Why couldn't she? Well, but she just couldn't, that's all. So long. Well, now we got a perfect circle with everybody pointing at everybody else and nobody able to prove a thing. What Hunter says isn't impossible, Archie. You think Young did it? I don't think at all yet. But if there's anything more dangerous than a woman scorned, it's an actor scorned. We have another visitor. Yeah, who are you expecting? At this point, anybody. Hi. Oh, you. Yeah, I told you you might hear from me. Come on in. Who's this? A uh, fellow runs the elevator at 22 Blanton Street. What do you got for me, kid? Postcard. Postcard? Yeah, the cops missed it, but I spotted the edge stuck under a rug. Nice of you to have delivered it. Well, maybe he was just being curious. Curious? It's not every elevator boy who has a chance to see Nero Wolf in the flesh. Oh, him? <laughs> Come off it, High Pockets. I'm here because you mentioned something about spending a few bucks. Oh. I wouldn't cross the street to see the best gumshoe that ever breathed. Look, gumshoes don't breathe, and how would you like a sock Archie, the... pay him and let him go. Yeah, pay me and let me go. Sure, Mr. Wolf. Here you are. Thanks. Don't mention it. Anytime, pal. Anytime. How do you like that fresh little punk? Archie, the lad has done us nobly. Yeah? Typewritten card addressed to Miss Ilsa Dana. Well, what's it say? Rather peculiar message. Have you prayed tonight? It's signed with the single letter O. Have you prayed tonight? Yes. Signed O? Exactly. Weird, isn't it? Well, what's weird about it? What could be plainer? Have you prayed tonight? Now, I ask you, who is the man in this deal who's interested in praying? All of us, I hope, are God-fearing. All right, all right. But I ask you again, what does O stand for? It could stand for O'Brien, Obituary, Omaha. What about Oliphant? All of them, too. Look, what, what's with this indifference? The case is cracking and you slough it off. You remember what Young said? Oliphant threatened to kill her because she wouldn't join that cockeyed movement of his. Don't exhaust yourself, Archie. We have a hard night ahead. Yes, but I don't understand. But I don't mean to stifle your imagination, my friend. But if you'd reserve your deductions for a little while, you could lend me some much-needed assistance. What do you want? I want you to become a burglar. A burglar? I want you to hurry over to the dead woman's apartment on Branton Street and ransack it. For what? How do I know? We need help. Anything may help us. Go through the place with a fine tooth comb. I tore the late Miss Dana's apartment to shreds, but I saw nothing. Then, just as I was about to give it up as a bum job, I noticed a little writing desk in the living room. Pride loosed the lock and spotted something among a pile of papers that belonged in no well-to-do flat. It was a pawn ticket, lot 8N046, and the address was a pawn shop around the corner on 6th Avenue. It wasn't more than 90 seconds later that I walked into the joint and tossed the ticket across the counter. Oh, oh yeah, this, uh, want to redeem it. And fast, up, Pops? Yeah, it's nothing that's worth much, mister. No? No. Oh, what is it? This... Small steel filing box. Oh. Anything in it? I don't know. Come to me locked. Never been able to get it open. We got it open, Wolf and I. Smashed the front end with a poker. There were some odds and ends inside. Old earrings, some thumbtacks, a cigarette lighter. Just trash. Then the boss stuck his fingers in and pulled out a plum. This is it. What do you mean, this is it? You fail to recognize this classic document? Huh? 
A marriage license, Archie. A marriage license. Yeah, well, whose marriage license? The wording is self-explanatory. Listen. This is to certify, etc., etc., thus licensing on this third day of May, 1946, the marriage of Miss Ilsa Dana to Mr. Johan Jaeger. Johan Jaeger? Exactly. Well, who in the world is Johan Jaeger? We'll soon see. I don't get it. I can understand. It's a befuddling little puzzle. It would be very easy for one to make a fatal mistake here. But, of course, you won't. I won't. Three hours later, I'd herded all the suspects into the office, and he sat in his chair and glared at them. Oliphant, Young, and Hunter. It was tense and tight, and the boss let it stay that way, saying not a word to anybody while he calmly sipped his beer. It was Oliphant who cracked first. I didn't kill Ilsa. I couldn't have. Jealousy is a very compelling motive, Mr. Oliphant. And you came to me, remember, complaining that there was another man in Ilsa Dana's life? Whatever I complained about, and, and jealous as I was, I didn't kill her as the sacred power is my holy judge. Being unacquainted with your sacred power, I'd have to ask you for a better authority. Sacred power? Oh, it simply wouldn't have been possible for me to have done it. Why not? Yeah, why not? Because I... I was at Mickey's Night Owl Club last night from 7 until 4 a.m. Contemplating the sacred power, no doubt. That can be proved, Mr. Oliphant? Well, let me call now. Let the head waiter tell you. Hmm. Well, you take your embarrassment as an indication that you're telling the truth. Hey, wait a minute. You you can't let him off like that. Don't be bothersome, Archie. Yeah, but we got that card he wrote, the one about have, have you prayed tonight, signed with his initial. He didn't write that card, Archie. Now, look. And the O is not his initial, is it, Mr. Barstow Young? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand. On the contrary, I am afraid you do. But for the record, I'll explain. Oh, Archie. Yes, boss? Hand Mr. Young that large red volume off the shelf behind Mr. Hunter's head. This one? That one, thank you. Now then, Mr. Young, you will favor me by opening the volume to page 1133. But why? Open it, sir. Good. You will now count six lines down from the top and read what you see. Have you prayed tonight? Thank you, Mr. Young. What the devil is going Mr. on? Mr. Young has just given us a reading from a tragedy. The line, have you played tonight, is spoken by the hero to the heroine just before he murders her. The name of the heroine is Desdemona. And the hero, as I'm sure you all know, is Othello. Othello? Yeah, the O was not Oliphant, Archie. Othello, I think, was a Shakespearean play which Miss Dana financed for our Mr. Young. And knowing she would recognize the quotation as well as the threat behind it, he sent it to her to warn her that he meant to murder her. You won't have the unmitigated gall to deny that, will you, Mr. Young? No. No, I don't deny it. Do I call the police? But I didn't kill her. The fact that I sent the car doesn't mean I killed her. Well, it'll do for my money. But not for mine, Archie. What? Mr. Young couldn't have killed Miss Dana. Why not? Because he lacks the strength to strangle such a healthy young woman, a champion athlete. Wide awake and full of fight. He's rather a frail person, as we know. And smothering Miss Dana with that pillow was no easy task. She struggled. Therefore, she clawed the wrists of the murderer. I'm sure that if you examine Mr. Young's wrists, you will find no scratches or scars. Here, let me see that. Go ahead. Well, Archie? Ah, you're right. Nothing. I was sure there wouldn't be. The person who actually killed Miss Dana was a powerful physical specimen. Yeah? Yes, Mr. Hunter. In all probability, a professional athlete. A muscular man in good condition. You pointing at me? Seems quite likely, doesn't it? You're out of your head. Am I? Yeah. Yes, Adina. Var ihr Frau? Nicht wahr? Jawohl. I... I mean... You said yeah, Mr. Hunter. And you meant yeah, yes. I asked you in German if Elsa Dana was your wife. And you, in the heat of emotion, answered me yes in your mother tongue. Look, what's going on here? Allow me to present Mr. Johann Jaeger, Archie. Him? I've known it since we first saw that marriage license. You see, Jack Hunter is the English translation of our friend's real name back in Germany. Where he comes from, Mr. Johann Jaeger. Oh, what do you know? So you proved nothing. Yeah, I was married to Ilse. That's why I said she couldn't marry anybody else. But I didn't kill her. She was my wife. I loved her. Oliphant told us you were insanely jealous of her. What if he did? You know better. Do we? Sure you do. 
You also told yourself over the phone that every word Oliphant said was a lie. Interesting. What is? How you could possibly know what Ilsa Dana told me over the phone. I hadn't mentioned it to you or anybody else. Oh, well... Well, you see... It... I see most clearly, Mr. Yeager, that you must have been in the apartment with her listening on the extension phone, or you couldn't possibly have that information. And it was only a few minutes after that telephone call... That Ilsa Dana was smothered to death. And I see it's about time I said good night. Wait a minute, Jaeger. Wait a minute. Good work, Archie. I advise you to sit still, Mr. Johan Jaeger Hunter. I was right. I told you he threatened the killer. But why? I've only guessed at the story. Reconstructed it, so to say. But I think you and Mr. Young are to be congratulated. On what, sir? On not having won your fair lady. You've always thought of her as a sweet, demure society girl. But actually, she was a vicious person, as bad as the man who killed her, if not worse. She tortured him cruelly for four long years. How can you say that about her? How can you doubt it, Mr. Oliphant? There must have been a great many men in her life. We know at least two definitely, you and Mr. Young. But she was in love with me. She was in love with me. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but she was not in love with either of you. She was using you for her purpose. What was her purpose? Tementing the man she married. That was her preoccupation day and night. She delighted in tyrannizing over him. As one might in breaking a bull or taming a wild mustang. Do I come near the truth, Hunter? Yes. Until I couldn't stand it any longer. May I ask then why you married her? Why? Because I couldn't help myself. I crawled for her. I married her on the terms that nobody should ever know I was her husband. She was too good for me, she told me, that to my face, over and over. But we belonged to different worlds. But I was crazy about her, so I took it. What I've taken, you wouldn't believe. Oh, I am sure I would, Mr. Hunter. I'm a very understanding man. The question is, will a jury believe you? And that we must begin to learn immediately. Archie. Yes, sir? Phone for Inspector Kramer. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Herb Ellis as Archie Goodwin and Lee Millar, Marna Keneally, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hosner. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Headless Hunter. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> And don't forget, this Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, drama, and the best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Theater Guild on the air this Sunday presents Judy Garland in Miss Alice Adams. So don't forget, Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show Sunday on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, which follows transcribed in 30 seconds. What's on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight? Well, there's a full serving of laughs with Archie the manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's Duffy's Tavern later this evening over most of these NBC stations. And this Sunday, the big show comes your way once again with Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. 
And, of course, your MC once again will be Tallulah Bankhead. That's this Sunday for The Big Show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the most famous brownstone house in New York City, the one located at number 601 West 35th Street. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Want something, Archie? Would you be interested in taking on a case involving a woman who was found stabbed to death in one of New York's fancier men's clubs? Can't you see I'm already occupied, Archie? My Oncidium hybrid is ailing. But, sir, cash... C-A-S-H. Remember, you need it to live on? Well, you're actually learning to spell. You'd better learn to count. We're broke. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Now, if you'll just go away and stop interfering. Oh, just a minute. Yes, sir? On your way out, switch on the fan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that one and only man of moves. The most famous detective in modern fiction. That corpulent, orchid-raising, beer-drinking gourmet who also happens to be a genius. Rick Stout's incomparable Nero Wolf, starring Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, Nero Wolf's long-suffering assistant, Archie Goodwin, tells us of the case of the careless cleaner. <laughs> We didn't know Clay Michelson very well at the time, though Mr. Wolf had hung one of the Michelson's paintings on the library wall. But then I guess we should have considered ourselves lucky not to have known him or his wife, Fila. Two weeks ago, they had a quarrel. Oh? Oh, Clay, darling. I didn't expect you home so soon. I thought you were going to the museum to see the Van Goghs. I decided not to, Fila. Oh. Well, if you were... Uh... Plan to paint this afternoon. I'll get out of the studio. I want to run some errands anyway. Why don't you make your phone call from here, Fila? Phone call? Who is he, Fila? He? Who were you waiting for this afternoon? Please, Clay, don't start that jealousy routine again. Don't try to kid me. You're being stupid, Clay. I'm stupid, all right, but I'm getting wise pretty fast. I'm through, Fila. I've had enough. I'm leaving you. So stay out of my way and keep your boyfriend out of my way, too, whoever he is, or I'll kill him. Yes? What can I do for you? Uh, uh, Sleepy. I want to have a drink and go to bed. I'm sorry, sir. The Garrison Club's a private establishment. No rooms available to the public. You think I'm drunk? Oh, no, sir. Why why do you suppose I came here? Well, I'm sure I wouldn't know, sir. I'll tell you why. I came here to see my old pal, Lou Saunders. That's why. You know Mr. Saunders? Do I know? Look, I paint him. Lou sells him. Mr. Saunders... Is your agent? I'm Clay Michelson. Just call Mr. Saunders. Clay, what in the world? Lou, tell this guy who I am. But I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. It's all right, Mr. Martin. You see? Let's go have a drink. Yeah, yeah, sure, Clay. Yeah. You know what, Lou? I left Fila. If I walked out on her. Is there something I can do, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, have someone fix a bed in the other room of my suite. Mr. Michelson will be staying with me. At least for tonight. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? It's Friday. Good. Fish for dinner, then. Nope. I was not referring to dinner. You were not? I can think of nothing more interesting at the moment. Oh, I can. My salary... Of course, according to the Julian Canada... We're on the Gregorian, so let's stick to it. Today is Friday. Today, I get paid. Archie, there's a drop. Oh, don't exaggerate. You can't be getting the cold shutters just because I'm asking for my money. I can distinctly feel fresh air flowing into the room. Well, it's possible I might have opened a window six inches. You're insane. Shut it at once. Nope. Are you trying to blackmail me? You think it might work? Never. Then the window stays open. You're fired. I accept your offer. All you have to do is pay up. I have hired you again. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you've cleaned out the bank balance again? Well, that is... <clears throat> well, hadn't you seen those Miltonians? Would I have voluntarily given up my paycheck for them? Orchids are very beautiful, Mr. Wolf, but blondes are... The door, Archie. 
I am unemployed. Confound you, it may be a client, and if it is, and we can uh, extract the fee. You follow me, Archie? I'm already on my way to the door. Mr. Wolf, I've got to see him at once. Well, come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is... My name is Sanders, Mr. Wolf. We've met before. Yes, I I remember. As a matter of fact, you sold me a painting of Michelson. Yes, well, that's why I'm here. It's about Michelson, Mr. Wolf, that I've come. Frankly, I... I think the man's about to go mad. He and his wife have split up and... and Uh, Such a splendid artist, too. A pity. I don't know what to do. He's drinking like a fish. For two weeks, I've been letting him live in part of my suite at the Garrison Club, but... uh, He's just steadily getting worse. I try a hospital... I can't. The publicity. Mr. Wolf, Clay admired you so that time we all had dinner after the painting transaction. I, I thought maybe you could talk to him. Maybe you could get him on his feet again. I'm not a doctor, Mr. Saunders. But I'm sure he'd listen to you. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Saunders. Near the Wolf speaking? Inspector Kramer. Uh, good evening, Inspector. Got a guy called Lou Saunders at your place? Garrison Club said he'd gone to your place. Yes, he's here. Well, see to it that he doesn't leave until I get there. You hardly do that, Inspector. I have no reason to detain Mr. Saunders. There's plenty of reason. It so happens a woman's just been murdered in his suite. Murdered? Yeah. A Miss Hilda Lundgren. What's happened? Now, will you hold him? Uh, do you know a Miss uh, Hilda Lundgren, Saunders? Hilda Lundgren? I've never heard of her. She seems to have chosen your suite to be murdered in. I'd better get right over there. Mr. Saunders says to tell you he'll be right over, Inspector. Now, listen, Wolf. Good day, Inspector. Murdered? Murdered in my suite? Mr. Wolf, you've got to come with me. Uh, Mr. Goodwin will accompany you after the formality of a retainer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, anything you say. Here, here, I'll write a check. Good, uh, 500. 500? Fine. My friend and assistant, Mr. Goodwin, will go with you. I have great confidence in his ability to bring back every detail of a murder, particularly where a woman's involved. Okay, you photographers, picnic's over for tonight. Pick up your stuff and get out of here. Come on, you sound real mean today, Inspector Kramer. Well, if it isn't Nero Wolf's favorite stooge. What are you doing here, Goodwin? I got bored with my knitting. Look, I wasn't asking for humor. I'm Louis Saunders, Inspector. Saunders? Ever seen that woman before? I... Yes. Yes, I believe I have. I can't remember where, but the face looks familiar. Mmm, lovely-looking woman. Blonde and really built. Well, she ought to look familiar. She's one of the cleaning women here at the club. She is? Cleaning? Well, since one of gals like this been reduced to cleaning floors, what's happening to the world? There ought to be a law. Yeah, there is. She was killed with a knife, or haven't you had time to notice? Uh, that's not a knife, Inspector Kramer. That, that's one of Clay's Chinese letter openers. He... What was that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, it is a strange knife. What were you saying, Mr. Saunders? I just, just said that that looked like one of the letter openers belonging to one of my friends. Who is this Clay? Clay Michelson, the artist. But you can't possibly think he'd do a thing like this. I think everybody did it until we know otherwise. When were you last up here, Mr. Saunders? Me? Why, just a little while ago. I changed my clothes just before I went to see Mr. Wolf. She wasn't here then? Well, I don't know. I didn't come into this room, just in my part of the suite. Your part? Who occupies this room? Mr. Michelson. He's been staying with me. Strange wound, no blood. What do you think you are, Goodwin, a medical examiner? Oh, but I Yeah, 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 the killer probably wiped the blood away. Saunders, have you any idea where your artist friend might have run off to? I haven't seen Clay all afternoon. He spends a lot of time down in the bar. Well, he'd hardly sit in a bar if he's killed somebody. But... Well, why would he pick on the cleaning woman? Oh, this is no ordinary cleaning woman. Get a load of that figure. Watch She's... it, Goodwin. Watch it. You're liable to stretch your brain. But you're wrong. In spite of everything, Clay's still terribly in love with his wife. He he, he wouldn't... Uh, Hello. Uh... Where did you get in? Yeah, who's this? Clay. We're your friends, Lou. They won't serve me any more liquor down at the bar. I gotta find my flash. Mr. Michelson, may I introduce you to Inspector Kramer of the police? The... Who's this guy, Lou? He's Nero Wolf's assistant. Wolf? Police? Well, what do you all want? Somebody park overtime? 
Where's my flask? The one with my initials. I just bought it this morning. Mr. Michelson, do you know that somebody was murdered here in your room? Murdered? Why don't you guys go away and joke with somebody else? Where's my flask? You better get hold of yourself. I said there's been a murder. Understand? You serious? Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Kramer here considers you top suspect. Me? They think I did it? You better pull yourself together, Clay. Yeah, because I got a lot of questions. Excuse me, the phone. Now, sit down, Mr. Saunders. I'll answer it. Hello? 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 This is Fela. Who is this? This is Inspector Kramer. Hello? Hello? Who is Fela? Anyone know? Well, that's my wife. Your wife? I, I want to speak to her. Come back here, Michelson. Let me alone. I'm... You're not be... going anywhere. Now, stay back there. You're wrong, Inspector. I am going somewhere. Junior's got a gun. Yes, Inspector. You should be more careful about your gun when you shove people. Now, look, Mr. Michelson. I'll I would see want... Mr. Wolf myself. Stay back, Inspector. You haven't a chance. We'll nab you before you get a block away. Well, then I'll just jerk these phone wires. There. And I'll lock the doors. That should hold you long enough. Good night. Hmm. Here, Wolf speaking. Wolf Kramer. Indeed. Clay Michelson may be on his way over there. Hold him until I get there. Hold him why? Not more than ten minutes ago, he held me up at the point of a gun. He carries a gun? It was my gun. <laughs> Careless of you, Inspector. Ah. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes? My name is Clay Michelson. Yes, I was rather expecting you. You've got to help me. They think I murdered someone. You shouldn't have run away from the police. I, I've been drinking a lot, but, but I wouldn't murder anyone. Feel it, tell you that. No way. Was she the model in that painting of yours I purchased? What difference does that make? I tell you, they're after me for murder. You obviously loved your wife deeply at the time you painted her. Oh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. It... Michelson. Clay. Good Lord, man. The police are on their way over here. He came for my help, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I'm glad he did, Mr. Wolf. But we left Inspector Kramer talking from a phone booth. He'll be here any minute. Then we have only a minute to decide why anyone would want to kill a cleaning woman. I didn't kill anybody. She was a beautiful woman, Mr. Wolf. I gather that, Archie, from your unusual interest in the case. She was stabbed with a letter opener from Mr. Michelson's house. Which might add, Mrs. Michelson, to our suspect list. Fela? You can't suspect Fela. You're very gallant, Mr. Michelson. Just how was this beautiful young cleaning woman, this Miss Lundgren, stabbed? Um, in the heart. Her eyes were wide open. Pupils dilated with shock. And Details I... later, Archie. Kramer will be here shortly. The moment I would like to know where everyone was. Well, Mr. Saunders was here with us, you remember. I don't know where Mrs. Michelson was, but I could go see her and find out. No, it won't be necessary, Archie. Mr. Michelson, where were you? Me? Why, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't seem to remember. It's hardly what we would call helpful. I, I was drunk. Maybe I went to Fela's. I've been over there lots this week trying to talk to her. I must have gone over there. Have you ever seen the murdered woman before? No, I never saw her before in my life. I've seen her before, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Mr. Saunders. I seem to remember your earlier statement to the contrary. Well, uh, I didn't know her name, but when I saw her, I remembered her. I understand she was quite an alcoholic. Hmm. Unfortunate woman. Beautiful woman. Well, look who's here, Inspector Kramer. Oh, here you are, Michelson. And as usual, you didn't have the courtesy to ring the bell, Inspector. And give you a chance to get this guy out of here? Nothing doing, Wolf. Now, come on. We're going to headquarters. Mr. Wolf, you can't let him take me. I didn't do it. I'm afraid there's not much I can do about it, Mr. Michelson. Come on. You come along too, Saunders. I gotta get a statement from you. Of course. This way. Come on. Well, all right. I just got an angle. Really, Archie? Sure, it's simple. Saunders been going for this beautiful cleaning babe. Clay worms in. Saunders kills her. Perhaps there was jealousy somewhere in this case, Archie. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Mr. Wolf, this is Fela Michaels. You don't know me, but you once bought a painting from my husband. I've got to see you, Mr. Wolf. You've got to help me. Ah, hmm. 
Please, his Michaels and have some of this delicious beer. Another can, Archie. And now, Mrs. Michelson, may I ask how you found out there was a murder in the first place? A policeman came to see me. He told me what had happened, that they were looking for Clay. I don't know what to think. He's temperamental, he's jealous, and he's sometimes violent, but I can't imagine anything like this. Not Clay. Maybe some of those friends of his, but... You uh, don't care for your husband's friends? No. They all live off him. They're leeches. Mrs. Michelson, did your husband come to see you this afternoon? This afternoon? No. Quite positive? Oh, yes. That was his alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to see you. Of course, he was fuzzy, usual effect of alcohol on the brain cells, but... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Michelson, might I be a little indiscreet for a moment? Indiscreet? Have you been seeing some other man? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Mrs. Michelson, I'm afraid your face gives away more than you tell. I thought we were here to talk about a murder, Mr. Wolfe. Indeed, but your husband's jealousy might well fit into that category. Oh, Clay, imagine things. You're a very beautiful woman, Mrs. Michelson. Now, if you will try telling me the truth, perhaps we can accomplish something. But I tell you... Uh... All right. So I thought I was in love with another man. Your husband suspected but didn't know, huh? No. Clay didn't know. He wouldn't have given me a divorce anyway. You sound as though you want your husband back. I did, but I didn't even know where he went. Indeed, Mrs. Michelson. Archie informs me that the murdered woman was quite lovely. What are you trying to suggest? You said yourself you wanted your husband back. Yeah, one woman jealous of another, that's always murder. Why, that's stupid. Clay wouldn't play around with a maid. That's stupid. Clay loves me. I'm not jealous of anyone. No one, do you understand? Archie. If you'll see Mrs. Michelson home... Yes, sir. Thank you. I can find my own way. I prefer Archie took you, Mrs. Michelson. You wanted my help, didn't you? I... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Michelson. If you will just wait outside for a moment, please. What have you got in mind, Mr. Wolf? Try exercising your own judgment just once, Archie. You mean she's the one who's jealous? Perhaps, Archie. Perhaps she may want us to think she was jealous. Perhaps she actually doesn't want her husband back at all, only to pin a murder on him. Oh. You see, in this case, it would be simpler than divorce. Yeah? Yeah, she might just be trying to get rid of him. She might, Archie. But then she's a woman, so don't count on anything. <laughs> she might even be telling the truth. This is where I live, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Very nice. I like Greenwich Village. I'm trying to figure out why Mr. Wolf sent you along with me. <laughs> I'm a sucker for beautiful women. <laughs> I wonder. Archie. Huh? Does Mr. Wolf believe me? He hasn't made an official statement yet. Nice furniture and things. You sound like an appraiser or, or someone looking for something. That's because it's November. Mr. Wolf sent you to search my apartment. You could be wrong. I don't... Oh. What's the matter now? Thought you said your husband hadn't been here today. He he wasn't. And what's his flask doing among these papers on the desk? Very prettily decorated with his initials. He was looking for it at the club. Flask? I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, sure. You're trying to help, Clay. Right into the electric chair. But... His only alibi was his being here this afternoon, and you said he wasn't. Then what is his flask doing here? He said he just bought it this morning, so he must have been here today. I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your phone? Well, you've got things wrong. I don't know anything about that flask. I... Hey, the lights... Who switched off those lights? Feeler, put those lights on. Put on those lights. Oh, oh, the lights. Get to the lights. That flask... Gone. Nero Wolf speaking. Wolf, where's Feeler Michelson? Feeler, perhaps you might try the lost and found, Inspector. Now, look, I know she was over at your place. I thought you were interested in Clay Michelson. Well, I let him and Saunders go, for the present. They're clean until I get the medical examiner's report. Oh, when will it be ready, by the way? An autopsy takes time, you know that. Where's the Michelson woman? I believe she had a date with Archie. Why do you want her? I'm sure it never dawned on you, Wolf, but this cleaning woman who was killed was some dish. Maybe Mrs. Michelson was the jealous one. 
Your thinking is beginning to bear an amazing resemblance to Archer's, Inspector. Also, it maybe never dawned on you that Fela Michelson hasn't offered an alibi for the time of the murder. Hmm. You're right, Inspector. Yeah, you are. Come on, Wolf. Quit stalling. Where's Fela Michelson? Hmm? What? Oh, I really don't know, Inspector, but perhaps as a last resort, of course, you might try her home. Good night, Inspector. Ah, uh, inevitable. The moment I'm comfortable. Come in. Mr. Wolf. Oh, thank heavens you're here. I always am. Where's Mr. Goodman? I don't understand how it happened. I swear I don't. What happened? I haven't got any idea how it got there. Got where? Calm down, Mrs. Michelson. I... Uh, now, just what got where? Clay's new flask. Your assistant, Archie. He, he came home with me and that new initial flask was there. He thinks Clay was there this afternoon and that I'm trying to frame him or something. Oh, here you are. She's here, therefore. This is our gal, Mr. Wolf. She's been lying right down the line. I tell you, Clay wasn't there. Then why did you give me this clout on the head and grab the evidence and run? I didn't. I didn't hit you. I ran, but I didn't hit you. And I didn't take that flask either. Oh, next thing she'll say, there wasn't any flask. Stop gaping at Mrs. Michael Sinatra and open the door. Yeah, sure. Well, Mr. Wolf, they let Clay and me go for the... Fila. What are you doing here? After your visit this afternoon, Mr. Saunders, she decided to come down and see me. After my visit? What, what makes you think I was at Fila's? It was Mr. Saunders, not your husband, who came to visit you this afternoon, wasn't it, Mrs. Michelson? I... I don't have anything to do with Mr. Saunders. And might I ask why you called him today? I, I wasn't calling him. I was calling Clay. You told me earlier yourself that you didn't know where Mr. Magazin was. Well, I... All right. So what if it was Mr. Saunders who came this afternoon? As he has for many afternoons. What are you trying to get at, Mr. Wolf? Saunders? He and Fela? Yes, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the artist's friend and agent, happens to be the one who was making a fool of the artist. But that's all over. I told him. That's what I was talking to Mr. Saunders about this afternoon. I didn't want Clay to know. Clay would never have come back. All to... right, so it was Fela and me. I admit it, but that's not murder. I suggest that it is, Mr. Saunders. I suggest that one of you two murdered the cleaning woman. Whichever one of you carelessly left the whiskey flask in Fela's apartment. This is murder, Mr. Wolf. Not a joke. Not at all a joke. You see, our cleaning woman was not murdered by the knife found in her body. She was poisoned. What do you mean? Not by the knife? Poisoned. She undoubtedly drank from Michelson's flask while she was working in his room at the garrison club. But she was stabbed. True. However, Miss Lundgren was an alcoholic. Saunders mentioned that, and I checked with the club manager. But how does that prove there was poison in the flask? That she was poisoned? Archie, would you mind repeating your description of the dead Miss Lundgren? First, uh, as to the wound. Okay. There was no blood. Someone advanced a fantastic theory about wiping the blood away. And now, Archie, the description of the body of Miss Lundgren. I mentioned the fact that her eyes were wide open, the pupils were dilated. Uh, hey, dilated pupils? Yes, Archie. The lack of blood had already made me wonder about the entire affair. When you added the dilated pupils... What's special about dilated pupils? In death, that is a common symptom of poison by a certain vegetable drug... Of considerable potency. But what was the point of stabbing her? The poison did the job. However, the killer later used the letter knife in an effort to deceive the police. However, he unhappily forgot that the dead don't bleed. I think you're guessing, Mr. Wolf. Am I? Well, all I can say is that I was at the pool in the early afternoon. Hmm. You're very certain you were at the club pool and the murder was committed, Mr. Saunders? Certainly. From one until three. Excuse me, please. Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer, medical examiner's report just came in this minute. And get a load of this wizard. The dame didn't die of stabbing at all. I know. You know? She died of drinking a fatal dose of poison known as deadly night shade. What? How do you know that? Inspector, do they know what time she died? Time? The medical examiner says 2.30. Thank you, Inspector. Oh, incidentally, if you care to drop over here, you may pick up the murderer. Goodbye. 
I heard him, Wolf. She died at 2.30. As I told you, I was in the pool at 2.30. Which is exactly how you prove yourself a murderer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I prove myself... Even the police didn't know what time she died. Until just now. And the body wasn't found until the evening. How did you know she died between one and three? I, I, I didn't know, but... You I... probably were at the pool at the time. The maid drank the poisoned whiskey. You put in the flask of your friend Clay Michelson. I tell you, you're crazy. You planned to get rid of Clay, who stood in the way of your marrying Fila. When you came back to your room at three and found that the maid had drunk it instead, you stabbed her with Clay's letter opener to cover up the real cause of the murder and throw suspicion on Clay. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. That's and then, thing. when you learned that the woman for whose love you were willing to commit murder was through with you, you took Michelson's new flask to Fila's home, confident that it would be found there. Yes, and then he attacked me and stole that flask again in order to make it look like Fila had done it. Exactly, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the chances are that your fingerprints will be found on that whiskey flask. And they'll be able to trace the poison to wherever you purchased it. The chances oh, are... Oh, no, you don't. Careful now, all of you. Guns bore me, Saunders. Oh, yeah? I'm leaving. You are not... Clay! Oh! Clay. Yes, Mrs. Michelson, your husband has been there for some time. Clay, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Well done, Mr. Michelson. I think you proved that an artist's life may indeed be exciting. I have been an awful fool, Mr. Wolfe. Mr. Michelson, you might remember for the future that unreasoning and unjustifiable jealousy sometimes creates the very conditions that it fears. You're being very kind to me, Mr. Wolf. How can we ever thank you? By prompt remittance of your check on receipt of my bill in the morning. <laughs> Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Michelson. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. What's the matter, Archie? You look glum. Yeah. I always have the lousiest luck. Meaning? A hectic case with two beautiful dames. Michelson gets one, the undertaker gets the other, and what do I get? Hey, that reminds me. You got a fee. I get paid. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Cheryl Hendricks and based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, Vic Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later this evening when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie the manager will definitely be on hand to spread his whimsical advice where it'll do the most damage. Tomorrow night, there's action on NBC with Herbert Marshall starring as the man called X in another exciting battle against the forces of international intrigue. Next, Sam Spade. Later, William Bendix on NBC. There's a full serving of laughs on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner. Archie's colleagues in comedy are Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. And just listen to a few of the stars who'll be with you. Fred Allen... Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC will be Tallulah Bankhead. Listen Sunday for The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means exciting adventure. Hello? Hello. The handsome young man answering Hello? the phone is Archie Goodwin. 
A mountain of a man engrossed in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolf. Hey, boss. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. There's a guy on the phone wants us to take a case. Seems that someone was mad at a guy who was mad, and now this guy on the phone is mad, wants us to find out who did the killing. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? We need the money. (laughs) Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf says he'll be happy to take the case. Just present yourself and a check for $2,000 at 601 West 35th Street at 11 o'clock. Mr. Wolf can't wait till you get here. He's dying to go to work. Goodbye. (sighs) Greatest detective in the world. The only trouble is... He is. Yes, listeners, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world. And the fattest and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures... By Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case of the beautiful archer. That's a good title. And it was a good case, too. It began in the consulting room of Dr. Raynard Townley of the Townley Sanitarium. Uh, skipping a jump north of Nyack, New York, when a very lovely young lovely glared across the desk at the good doctor. Shall we pretend you don't know who I am, Dr. Townley? How could we possibly do that, my dear Diana Lawrence? Twenty-three years old, daughter of one of our better-known sculptors, Michael Lawrence. You were born in Johannesburg, educated in London and Paris, and live at present a hundred yards from here in your father's cottage on Barry Hill Lane. How's that? It's intended to be staggering, isn't it? You take no cream or sugar in your coffee, were winner of the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947, and have an exceedingly high temper. Let's stop the nonsense. You have an inpatient here named Willard Garth. Well, Willard Garth happens to be my fiancé. Yes, he has mentioned the fact during his analysis. And, um... Well, has he by any chance mentioned his reasons for suddenly refusing to see me during the past five weeks? He didn't have to, Miss Lawrence. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I recommended he give you up as a bad job. What? Well, I suppose you had some purpose in saying what you did. Of course. I'm the boy's doctor. Uh, You think you're in love with Willard Garth, I know. But actually, you're infatuated with the Garth millions. You take a lot on yourself, don't you, doctor? I consider it important to relieve Willard of all painful external pressure. You've done well for Willard, Dr. Townley. Relieving him of me? I think so. Now, let's see you relieve yourself of me. You, uh, purchased the gun for this occasion, Miss Lawrence? Yes. And what exactly do you hope to accomplish with it? A quick and complete reversal of your decision about me. I'm not as easy to handle as Willard is, you see. And if you intend to ruin my life, then I intend to end yours. Here and now. The phone is ringing. Let it ring. Just as you say. It's the house phone, Miss Lawrence. It may be Willard, you know. Oh, Willard? Yes, he uh, usually phones me from his room at about this time every day. Oh. Well, all right. Answer it, but be careful what you say. You're in command, it seems. Hello? Oh, why, hello. I thought it would be you, Willard. Look, my boy, Diana Lawrence is here. I've had a talk with her, and I've reconsidered my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm quite serious. If you're at all sensible, you'll see her regularly and plan on a marriage as soon as you're discharged. Yes. Oh, you do? Very well, I'll see if she'll talk to you. Uh, Miss Lawrence. Yes? uh, Do you want to speak with him? Uh, Give me the phone. Of course. Here you are, and... I'll take this gun. There we are. Now... Stand away, Miss Lawrence. But, 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 but Willard, Willard's on the phone. Willard is not on the phone. No one was on the phone. The ring came from the push-button bell under my desk here. Oh. Sometimes I find it convenient to interrupt my consultations with a phone call. Oh, you... You smug, deceitful, self-sufficient... Murder is a vexatious business. You'll be grateful to me one day. 
All right. Give me my gun and let me go. The gun, I'm afraid, stays with me. Here in this Majolica cabinet. I'd scarcely feel justified in trusting you with it. And now, with your permission, or without it, the interview is ended. Later that day, the phone in the Lawrence house on Barry Hill Lane began to jingle. And this time, it was no phony. Hello? Diana? Yes? Willard, darling. Diana, darling, it's Willard. Imagine. Has the doctor let you use a telephone just as if you were a great big adult? Oh, I've got to see you, sweetheart. And I didn't call you to argue. Love, beauty, understanding, that's what matters. Isn't it? Isn't it? Do I hear the overtones of a change of heart? Oh, Diana, what's happened wasn't my fault. He poisoned me against you. Then why don't you walk out of that amateur nut house and stand up like a man? I probably shall, Diana. Now, please listen to me. He's letting me have the limousine tonight from 8 until 12. I want us to go for a ride and, and talk and talk and talk until everything is clear. Clear as a bell, my baby. Don't tell me he's trusting you to drive. Oh, no. No, one of the handymen here will show for us. Oh, say you'll come, Diana. Will you? Say it. Say yes. Say you will. Well, yes, Willard. I'll be glad to. Oh, eight o'clock, then? Eight. Oh, bless you. Bless you, my angel. Oh. Oh, so that's it. You want my father's money. That's what you love. Not me. Willard, the chauffeur will hear you. It's the way Townley says it is. He's right. He's right. Oh, why did I let you talk me into this? What a fool I was to have come at all. You're sick inside, Willard. So utterly, hopelessly sick. Oh. Oh, so now I'm... I'm hopelessly sick. Yes. Yes, you are. You're, you're trying to confuse me. Take advantage of me. Wind me around your finger. Just because I love you too much. That's it. That's my illness. Of course, I see it now. You. You're the thing I must get rid of. You with your beautiful, beautiful face and your twisted values. You're at the bottom of all my agony. Willard! Willard! Will I'm saving myself. Uh, I'm saving myself. Uh, uh, Once you're dead, uh, the sickness is ended. Uh, I'll be safe. Uh, I'll be safe. Uh, I'll be safe. Uh, uh, Willard! Dr. Townley? Yes. Come in. Mr. Wolf's been expecting you. Come in, Dr. Townley. Come in. Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. I'm so happy you've agreed to take this case. Have a glass of beer. Oh, no, no. Uh, never at this time of the morning, thank you. Well, Doctor, the newspaper's checked with what you told me. The girl and young Garth went out for a ride in your limousine last night. The car was driven by one of your handymen. Uh, that's right. Haynes, his name is. And they never came back. Young Garth was found dead in the car with two bullets in him. The girl was gone and also Haynes, the handyman chauffeur. Huh? Correct, sir. Have you any idea where he could be? No, sir. And the young lady, tell me about her. She's Diana Lawrence, daughter of Michael Lawrence. The sculptor? The sculptor. She lives with him in a small cottage near my sanatorium on Berry Hill Lane. An extremely aggressive and self-centered female with more than a slight flair for violence. Your description might easily lead me to suspect her of this murder, sir. Well, I'm aware of that. And I don't think you'd be far off the mark. As I told you on the phone, she tried to murder me yesterday morning. Hmm. The police have made no headway in locating her? No. The homicide division has contacted her father, but uh, he's remained quite noncommittal. He simply says that uh, he's sure she's incapable of killing a fly and that he hasn't laid eyes on her since 8 o'clock last night. Highly suspicious behavior. She was unquestionably in the car with young Garth when he was murdered. Hmm. She wasn't alone in the car with him. You were uh, referring to Haynes? Yes, but he can't be found either, remember? It appears that he failed to list his address on his job application. But somehow, Mr. Wolf, I'm quite sure he'll show up this afternoon. 
Somehow, Dr. Townley, if I were you, I wouldn't be quite so sure. We must begin by facing the initial problem of locating our suspects. Archie. Yes, sir? Get out the car and drive up to the house on Belly Hill Lane. And then? There you will ask Mr. Michael Lawrence to be sensible enough to cooperate with us in finding his daughter. And if the answer is no? I recommend, Archie, that you flatly refuse to take it. Mr. Lawrence was no simple baby to handle. He was in a studio when I walked in, chiseling on a statue of a boy and a girl, both wearing less clothes than the law allows. And before I got a chance to state my name, he commenced giving me a free lecture on the marble work of art. She's good. Really good. She's practically superb. The Ariadne. The what, Ariadne? The girl in the statue. Oh. That's Ariadne. Tragic nymph of Greek mythology. Don't tell me you're not familiar with Apollo and Ariadne. All right, I won't. The Apollo, on the other hand, is unfinished. The face, you see, it uh, <clears throat> it lacks something. The passion of yearning, Olympian desire. And yet, you know, the two figures have motion. Like your daughter? Eh? Your daughter, Diana, she's got motion also. As I hear it, she's been in motion ever since she murdered Willard Garth last night in the back end of a limousine. <laughs> so you're another flatfoot. Uh, not exactly. I'm paid in private by Nero Wolf. Nero Wolf? Yeah. You don't mean that a creditable man like Wolf thinks Diana killed young Gar? Well, he'd like to talk over the possibility with her. How laughable. Look at that face. Is there anything of the murderous in a face like that? In a face like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana posed for the Ariadne, you see. And the likeness is exact. Do you think a girl of this type, classic, sensitive, civilized could descend to the clumsy, brute level of murder? Well, it's... It's a little hard to imagine. There. Even you agree with me. On the other hand... Shall we discuss the other hand over a cup of coffee? I'm quite exhausted. If you insist. I do. Sit down and inhale the atmosphere of culture at its source. There's a pot warming on the stove. Pot of what? Coffee or culture? <laughs> well, wait to see what he means. Never ignore a phone call. Who knows? Might be something important. Yes? It's Diana, Father. Oh, uh... Oh, yes, Diana. It's, it's all over the papers. Yes, I know. Well, I, I don't think they'll find me where I am. And I'm staying here until things quiet down a little. Where are you, honey? Uh, what did you say? I said, where are you? You said, honey. Daddy, you never call me honey. Uh, I know, it's because I'm excited. Where are you, sweetheart? Well, you mustn't let anybody find out. Not a soul in the world. Where are you? Well, you know where Tyne Pike turns off to the left beyond Bartsville? Yes. Well, I'm... Call me later, Angel. But, Father, I... Oh. Oh, get that motorman's number. You will live, my friend, but not long if you don't control your curiosity. You with that mallet you hit me, what was the big idea? Do you really have to ask that question? Well, aren't you trying to trick my daughter into disclosing her whereabouts? The police are pretty interested in her whereabouts. Then let them find her. But you can't be surprised, my friend, if I choose to protect Diana's interests. So he's working on an Apollo and Ariadne, is he, Archie? Who cares about Apollo and Ariadne? The point is how he worked on my gourd. That, of course, is unfortunate, my boy, but... Did you get that piece? Mm Mm-hmm. Hello? Inspector Kramer. Hold it. For you. Here. Thanks. Yes? Wolf? Ah, how are you, Inspector? I hear you're in on the Garth killing. Not very deeply, I am afraid. We are still trying to locate the Lawrence girl. Well, you can forget about that. Yeah? Yes. We've already located her and released her on a habeas corpus. That sounds interesting. Her father had a lawyer on our heads before she was in here ten minutes. Too bad you couldn't have held on to her. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure we want her. Why not? Well, first of all, it's not likely she did it. No? No. Ballistics stated that the bullets that killed Willard Garth were not fired from point-blank range. And she was sitting beside him on the back seat. I see. Also, we found the murder weapon in the grass near where the limousine was parked. And she admitted it was hers. 
That sounds like a poor reason to release him. Well, the point is she wasn't in possession of the gun when the killing happened. At least so she says. No, who was? That doctor. What doctor? Townley. The guy who runs that sanitarium. According to her, he took the gun away from her for safekeeping at noon yesterday. There was a little more talk between them, something about fresh cigar ashes that were found in the dashboard ashtray of the limousine. After that, the boss hung up and exerted himself enough to put a call through to the Townley Sanatorium. I'm afraid the doctor is very busy just now. So am I, and my business happens to be highly important. Well, I'll say you call, Mr. Wolfe, and I'll ask him to contact you just as soon as he has a free moment. Do you happen to have a free moment, miss? Why, well, yes, sir. Could you spend it by telling me if that handyman, Mr. Haynes, is being located? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he has. One of the staff just found out where he lives, Mr. Wolf. Well? He has a little cottage at 206 Dockside Road. That's out near Sheep's Head Bay. Thank you. Archie. I'm going someplace, I suppose. You are? You're going to Sheep's Head Bay. Hello there. Hmm? Looking for a guy I can't find. Oh? Yeah, his name is Haynes. Stopped at the cottage up there, but there's no one there. I saw you here on the wharf fishing, so I... What did you say his name is? Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Oh. Oh, Haynes. Yeah. Yeah, do you know him? Well, there's a fellow named Hines used to fish out here. No, 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 not Hines. Haynes. Couldn't be Hunningburg? No, it couldn't be. The name is Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Haynes! Give me a hand here, eh? <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> Funny, huh? That guy seems to think my name is Haynes. Yeah, so do I. You do? Yes, I... <laughs> I got back to our house, soaked to the skin and minus Haynes, and just in time to see the boss in the exhausting process of walking across the room to answer the phone. Hello? This is Dr. Townley. You called me. So I did. About the murder? More specifically, about the statement from Diana Lawrence that you removed a firearm from her possession yesterday morning. Well, that's quite correct. It's here in my Majonica cabinet. Is it? Of course it is. I suggest you check. Just a moment. Wolf. Yeah? I'd like to see you at once. The gun, I suppose, has vanished. But how did you know? Because it is at ballistics, Doctor. It turned out to be the gun that killed Willard Garth. I... I see. Do you? Yes. And I understand everything now. It's all so crystal clear. Just how crystal clear? I'm quite certain, Mr. Wolf, that I can put my finger on the killer. Then I think it'd be well if you came here immediately. No, I'm afraid it's impossible, sir. There's an important operation scheduled, and I simply cannot leave. What do you suggest? Well, is it outside the realm of possibility that you come here? Is it, Mr. Wolf? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf? When my boss has to leave the house, it's a major tragedy. Sometimes he rages, sometimes he curses the whole detective business, lock, stock, and barrel. And sometimes he keeps very quiet and grips the side of the car desperately and tries not to inhale any fresh air. This was one of the quiet times. Just go slowly, Archie, but get there as quickly as you can. Oh, you don't want a chauffeur, Mr. Wolf. What you need is a magician. Keep your eye on the road and don't strain yourself to make superfluous witticisms. Why don't you try relaxing a little? I hear there hasn't been a man-eating tiger sighted on the Sawmill River Parkway in the last 500 years. Your liberty is out of order. Don't try to make light of a deplorable situation. Here's the sanatorium. And there's Dr. Townley coming to meet us. It's terribly nice of you to have come, Mr. Wolf. I've heard about your aversion to traveling, and I appreciate your going to the trouble. Don't uh, mention it. Oh, Archie, help me out with my other arm. Uh, there you are. Now, calm down. You're all in one piece. I think you'll find the trip highly profitable, Mr. Wolf. You'll consider it time very well. Hey, 
Hey, what's the matter? What is it? What happened? He's been shot. It's hardly likely there wasn't a sound. This kind of shot doesn't make a sound, boss. What do you mean? Better take a look for yourself. There's an arrow in his back, and he's dead. We remembered that Dr. Townley had said Diana Lawrence had won the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947. The Lawrence house was visible through the trees a hundred yards away. So we started for it and the sculptor's studio. There's no one around. So this is his lady's effort, Apollo and Ariadne. Yeah. Huh? Done a little work on it since I was here. The Apollo's face is more finished and... Hey, boss. Yes? You know, somehow or other, Apollo looks a little familiar. I wouldn't be surprised, Archie. I think if you examine it closely... Ah, our, our host. You remember me, don't you? I met you once at a dinner party at your house, the time they opened the new museum on 67th Street. Of course, of course, Mr. Lawrence. And to what do I owe the honor? It's not much of an honor. Dr. Townley has been murdered. No. I am afraid Mr. Goodwin is being accurate. He's been murdered with a bow and arrow. And what does that mean to you, Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry. I've been a fool. An awful fool. You can't blame yourself too much. If you'd cooperated with the police instead of looking out for your daughter's interest, the man would still be alive. But I assure you that... Where's the girl? She should be here now. She phoned me a while ago and said she was coming by for passage money to Rio. You were looking for me? Lost. Diana, put the gun down, Angel. And tie a rope around my neck? Might I inquire if your plan is to kill us all, Miss Lawrence? Oh, what would yours be if the world was after you for something you didn't do? Wouldn't you be willing to risk persuading a jury of that? Thanks, no. I'll skip that chance. Father, Father, get me the money. Diana, sweetheart, don't make me a part of your murders. That's asking too much of love. Do, don't you know I'm not guilty? No, no, Diana, I don't. Leave that gun away, Diana. Haynes. Looks like I walked in on the nose. That's him, boss, the guy who soused me. Take a little of your own advice. Relax, Archie. What do you want here, Mr. Haynes? I want to give up and try to straighten out this little deal. Mr. Lawrence. Yes? Here's your money back. You got a right to call me a welcher. I promised I wouldn't give evidence against the girl and you paid my price. But enough is enough and right here and now I'm unloading. Yes, what does this mean? It means I saw her do it. <gasps> oh, you, you stupid, lying, rotten... Oh, yeah? Grab her, Archie. Grab her. Get the pair of them out of here. <laughs> What can I say to myself now? What can I do? I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but it's not necessary to eat your heart out. Many fathers before you have done their best and failed. But I had a special duty toward Diana. Special duty? Yes. I... Well, you see, you find it out sooner or later, so I'd best tell you now. I'm not a real father. I adopted her nine years ago when she was 14. I see. And I should never have done it. I realize now that I wasn't equal to the task. Well, 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 all's not lost yet. They may not convict her, you know. Eh? I said they may not convict her. But how could they fail to convict her? She killed Garth, didn't she? Did she? She shot him. But the gun was in Townley's possession. She could easily have stolen that. She could have broken into his office later. It, it wasn't locked. What wasn't locked? The Majolica cabinet was... I mean... I believe you mean what you said, Lawrence, the Majolica cabinet. Though for the life of me, I can't see how you could know whether it was locked or not, unless you had the experience of opening it. Could it be that you went looking for the gun yourself after Townley said he had confiscated it? That you killed Townley with a bow and arrow which you handle as well as your daughter because he was just on the point of telling me that you knew where the gun was? And that you were the likeliest murder suspect? You must be mad. Oh, sir, not I. <laughs> but you are mad and more than a little. You hated Will Edgar. It was you who were making the marriage impossible. You loathed him, and in the end, you killed him. How could I have killed him? I'll tell you a little secret, Mr. Lawrence. The police found cigar ash in the dashboard tray of the death car. Chemical analysis showed that the ash was from an El Adoro cigar. What have you got in your left hand, sir? In my... Uh, an Eladora cigar. And in my right hand, a Derringer. 
powerful and admirable little weapon, Lawrence. I suggest you show proper respect for it by dropping all this here and now. You don't wish to hear me say the rest, that you were horribly in love with Diana, your own adopted daughter, in love and hopelessly, eternally frustrated... You begrudge me the triumph of accusing you of having bribed Haynes to let you take his place at the driver's seat of the limousine and further bribed and threatened him into putting on his show of merry pranks and false confessions to confuse us all beyond measure. You said I loved Diana. Would I do all this to her if I did? Oh, but of course, as love as yours is really hate. You were content to see her dead rather than relinquish her. Like all miserly, small-hearted men, you would rather kill the thing you love than muster the generosity necessary to seeing it attain happiness. That's enough out of you. I should think it was much too much. It is. Archie, my boy, I'm grateful to you, both for coming back into the house when you did and for being such a good shot. Hope you remember that next time you feel like insulting me. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell me, what's with that cigar ash routine? Who told you the ashes in the limousine were from an Eladoro, boss? I never heard anything about that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, neither did I. No one could possibly have determined the brand by any chemical means in existence. I knew that, you see, and I took the long chance that Lawrence didn't. Oh, uh-huh. but I still don't get the mainspring of the deal. How did you know he was in love with Diana? That, oh, that was genius. I have to admit it. You see, it all hinged on the statue of Apollo and Ariadne. According to the Greek myth, Apollo fell deeply in love with the nymph. But because they were of different worlds, he was condemned to pursue her always and never to catch her. Well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Isn't it perfectly obvious? Didn't he tell you that Diana had posed for the Ariadne? Yeah, but I still don't... And you yourself remarked on the fact that the finished Apollo looked somehow familiar, didn't you, Archie? Yeah. Yeah, I did, boss. Don't you know why that was? You mean that... I mean that Michael Lawrence unconsciously revealed the true state of his heart. He didn't intend to, I suppose. But precisely and accurately, he chiseled the features of the tortured god in his very own image. Oh. And speaking of torture, Archie... Yeah, Will we be home in time for dinner? Oh, boss, you can't be that hungry. Oh, yeah, I am. Good heavens, Archie. Do you realize that I haven't eaten since lunch? You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Ted Von Els, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Brave Rabbit. Don Stanley speaking. There's fun and laughs later tonight when Ed Archie Gardner stars as Archie the Manager in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie will be there, armed with his own whimsical version of the English language. Another Friday favorite you'll hear later is The Delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as Chester A. Riley. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, who follows Transcribed in 30 seconds. Later tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way. And on the menu at Duffy's tonight, there's a blue plate special of grilled English language, served up by the delightfully ungrammatical Archie. Plus, laughs garnished with chuckles, brought to you by Archie's remarkable crew. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern, just keep your dial tuned to NBC. And this Sunday means another broadcast of The Big Show. And your guests include Fred Allen, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, and many, many more. Tallulah, of course, is your hostess on The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. 
The mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, we've got a case. I'm not sure whether somebody's going to kill a rabbit or a rabbit is going to kill somebody, but either way, it's going to be murder. Please, Mr. Wolf, even orchids have to eat. Oy. Yes, sir, Mr. Wolf will take the case. As a matter of fact, he's working on it right now. Money, work, bah. Huh. Greatest detective in the world. Only trouble is, he is. <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Archie is right. Nero Wolf is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case Nero Wolf likes to remember as the case of the friendly rabbit. He sometimes prefers his proverb scramble. It began in lots of places. Let's take a look at a few of them. In particular, the richly appointed library of a man named Veek. Mr. Veek, what's happening? Relax, Haynes, your blood pressure. I thought it was a gag, but... You really are shutting the club down. I'm shutting it down. Why? I got the joint roll and the suckers are pouring in. And next week, the governor's committee. Huh? It's moving out of Baylor County. Our joint enterprise is in Baylor County. I think the club needs a rest. Crime committees so rarely admire gambling. Oh, that's different. So it is. The club needs a rest. You need a vacation. Florida, perhaps? I don't like Florida. Pick any place you like, just so long as you get out of reach of a subpoena. The heat's on, huh, boss? You've just coined a phrase that may very well catch on. Get out and stay out of the state until I send for you. Okay, Mr. V. Sure, Mr. V. Marshal? Yeah? That about covers us in Baylor, am I right? Yeah, right. The dear governor's dear committee will be sorely disappointed. However, I doubt it'll give up quite so soon. I wouldn't think so. Therefore, have the truck driver deliver another shipment of carrots to the rabbit farm. Eh, Marshal? Okay, boss. Come in, Williams. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Williams, I'm disturbed. The crime committee, sir? It was doing well, very well. And then... I know, sir. There's a leak... Someone is passing on confidential information. Who? That's the problem. Who? Started three weeks ago. A three-man committee, Wilson, McCarthy, Tolliver. One of them, Williams? I'd stake my life, sir, no. Then who? You've forgotten Collier, committee secretary. You have reason to suspect him? No, nothing that means anything. Except... You do suspect him. Well, he's been watched, telephone calls checked, mail. I have no reason to suspect him. Except that one thing bothers me. What's that? He has a small farm in Greendale County. He rarely went near the place in all the time he's been up here at the Capitol. But that suddenly changed. Three weeks ago? Yes, sir. He's been staying at the farm for three weeks. Is there anything unusual about that farm? Nothing unusual. Except Jimmy Collier has gone in for raising rabbits. Jimmy. Who is... Oh, hello, Claire. You've been hiding from me. I... I've been out here with the rabbits. Jimmy, what's wrong? With what? You. There's nothing... You're lying. We grew up together, remember? We lived next to each other, Jimmy. We were going to be married. Hey, wait a minute. We still are, last I heard. You haven't heard recently enough. What does that mean? It means we're not getting married. But, Claire... You've been avoiding me. And you've been getting money, lots of money, from someplace. And in a shady way, I feel. All right, you know. So what? I've been concerned about your sudden devotion to these... These rabbits... And the kind of men you've been seeing. What do you mean? Like the one up at the house now, waiting for you. Oh, there's somebody waiting? That's why I came down here after you. I'd better get up there. He's a crook, Jimmy. Look, I... All right. I sort of got myself in a mess. I needed money and... But it's over, Claire. No more. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wish I could believe you. For your own sake. But I feel I can't. Not anymore. <laughs> Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. I either stop breathing so heavily or... Take the evening off? Stop breathing. 
Old Dr. Tidmouse wouldn't approve of that. Who in blue and assorted blazes is old Dr. Tidmouse? My family doctor. May have escaped your puny mind, but you don't have a family. Answer the phone. Oh, but it might be a case. It might be very important. It might mean work, Mr. Wolf. Archie. W-O-R-K. You've got millions in the bank. Why worry? Confound you. Do you want me to answer that phone myself? Now you've got me. No, Mr. Wolf. Couldn't let you knock yourself out lifting a telephone receiver. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? what? Wait, Mr. Wolf is to go up to Greendale at. Oh, now look, friend. Mr. Wolf does not go anywhere, and that includes Greendale. He wouldn't stir out of the house for anybody short of the. Uh, what? I see. Yes, sir, in an hour. Goodbye. Mr. Wolf, brace yourself. You've got an appointment with a Mr. Williams at the Starlight Hotel in Greendale for one hour from now. You're insane. No, I'll admit I've been tempted. Sure, were it not for the fact that often the native view of resolution is sickly door with a pale cast of thought. Quoting Hamlet will get you no place. I would fire. And then who would drive you to the Starlight Hotel in Greendale? I'm not going to Greendale. Nevertheless, in an hour, you will be there. And who, may I inquire, Cecil? The governor of the state. Is that all, Mr. Williams? That, Mr. Wolfe, is all anyone knows about the situation. Except the guilty man, of course. An admirably clear summary, Mr. Williams. Obviously, our meeting here at the hotel was necessary. I couldn't be seen entering your house, nor would it have been advisable for you to visit the governor. I can appreciate that. You're quite sure I need pay no attention to anyone on the committee except James Collier? Quite sure. Police surveillance of Collier is deemed unwise. He has suddenly taken interest in rabbits, but although keeping them may perhaps be considered suspicious, it is hardly in itself of value. You have no other evidence against Collier? I know we're clutching at straws, Mr. Wolfe, but there is a leak and work is being nullified. Something must be done. Hence, the governor's call for you. Very well, sir. I shall uh, attempt to be more than uh, a man clutching at a straw. <laughs> I said attempt. Archie, unpack. We shall stay at Greendale near Collier and his rabbits. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Oh, naturally, I know that shutting your eyes and pushing your lips in and out indicates you're thinking feverishly, but there's nothing for you to think about. Three. Oh, I accept your correction. What are you thinking about? Hotel beds. They're notoriously flimsy. Oh, you gave up on the case so soon. Fiddlesticks. I already know exactly what role the rabbits play in our problem. Therefore... We're going to drive out to Collier's farm? You are. While you test the hotel beds, fine. It'll be necessary for you to spend the night at Collier's place. You'll drive out there and pretend you've lost a cylinder or something. <laughs> oh, a lost cylinder. Oh, fine. Confound you, Archie. You can invent something plausible as a pretext. And if you are properly charming, Mr. Collier will, I hope, invite you to stay the night. And during the night I sleep, hmm? Happily breathing the fresh country air. <laughs> Trust me. <not. laughs> okay, Mr. Wolf, I accept the assignment. I will learn all I can from Mr. Collier's rabbits. Incidentally, remember the play Harvey? I do. Why? Harvey was an invisible rabbit, a figment of a man's imagination. I hope this rabbit venture is more tangible, Mr. Wolf. It is, Mr. Goodwin. Will you desist and depart? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, if anyone calls, just say I've gone out to Greendale to cross-examine a rabbit. Hmm? Archie, I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yes. Running out of gas, and me such a big boy. Hmm. Ah. <gasps> hello. Uh, hello. That tree a friend of yours? The, the tree? Yeah, the one you're clutching. Oh, I, 
I was leaning against it. It's an idea, but not a good one. Trees are notoriously skittish. The instant you really need one, they're out sowing wild oaks or something. You sound as if you know a lot about trees. Oh, I do. I was brought up in one. Look, now, if you really have to lean, I can recommend No, thanks. Huh? I tried. Nice moonlight we're having. My name is Goodwin, and blondes call me Archie. I'm not blonde. Brunettes call me Archie, too. And what do redheads call you? <laughs> oh, we'll just skip that, huh? And your name is... Claire. Claire. I approve. Now, you may not believe this, but I have just run out of gas. You think I might wangle some up at your house? My house? You mean Jimmy's house. All right, I mean Jimmy's house. Well, I I don't know. He might have some. Now, why don't we go up to the house and ask him? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy who? Collier. Uh Uh-huh. I like to be formal when I'm borrowing gas. Would you mind waving your left hand in front of my nose? Waving, Mike? Yes, just try it. Don't worry. I won't bite it. All right. I did. And very gracefully, too. No ring on the third finger. You're not Mrs. Collier. There isn't any Mrs. Collier. Are you applying for the position? Mr. Goodwin, I... Now, remember what I confided in you about brunettes. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Archie, you're a little rapid. Maybe. But I always remember what old Dr. Tidmouse said. What did he say? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. Robert Herrick wrote that. He did? Dr. Tidmouse is a liar. How much farther is this house? Well, it's just beyond those trees. I... What? Uh... Oh, I... There was something ran across the path. It brushed my legs. It frightened me so. Must have been a rabbit. I I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. It was silly of me. Oh, don't worry about it. Also, you will have noticed how much more satisfactory I am than a tree. We're clutching at it. Moments of stress, I mean. Archie. Mm Mm-hmm. But you'd better let go now. What I... And we'll get on to the house. See, I don't need a haircut, and you're not the right type for Delilah anyway. You mean something by that. Something nasty. Well, that depends. What I meant is you've already signaled whoever you're supposed to signal. Nothing frightened you back there. Why? That scream had a lot of carrying power. Oh, that's the house, huh? Looks peaceful enough. Archie, I... Who were you supposed to warn if anyone came up the path to the house? For no one. Something did frighten me. Honey, I've been lied to by experts, and you're not one. Oh, Think I ought to knock? No, we don't think I ought to knock. Dark inside. Except for a handful of moonlight filtering in through the windows. Kind of early for Carly to turn in, isn't it? I wouldn't know. Let's go find out. (gasps) Now relax, relax. Grandpa's making with the chimes. Time is... Yeah, ten o'clock. It's getting late. Come on. This would be the living room. Filled with early American furniture. The early Americans would be pleased. Nothing here. What's that door lead to? I... I don't know. Or I won't tell? Uh, Smaller room. Dark as... Come in. Put the beer on it. Oh, you're not the bellboy. I'm sorry. I should have remembered to bring some beer. Indeed, and you are? I'm a fellow guest at this hotel, Mr. Wolf. My name is Veek. Veek, ah, yes. A criminal of moderate intelligence and immoderate pretensions. We won't quarrel, Mr. Wolf. I have something to offer you. You and your boy Goodwin didn't drive up to Greendale for the exercise. I dislike exercise. Shorten's life. James Collier lives nearby. The Governor's Committee on Crime is unhappy. There's been a leakage of information. It hasn't helped them in their work. But it has helped you. You wouldn't have left your house in New York on any ordinary job. A request from the Governor, however... Shall we stop fencing? Hmm. I don't have to fence with you. The Committee's work doesn't particularly bother me. I've already made my arrangements for retiring from active business, shall I say? However, I don't want you messing around in the meantime. Indeed. In your effort to discover how the committee's information leaked out, you might also discover a number of things about me that I prefer to remain undiscovered. No one has employed me to do anything about you, sir? Not directly, but indirectly you might have to. 
I want to insure myself against any such possibility. I want to make a deal with you. I'm ready to supply you with the name of the man responsible for the leak and papers proving his guilt. I have them here. In return for which you expect... A quick conclusion to your activities and your return to New York, leaving my name out of your reports. I'm neither a public official nor a philanthropist. I should do nothing about you unless it becomes necessary. You may remove your hand from your pocket. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Now then, the name of the man. James Collier. Proof of his guilt? These... A series of reports on the committee's meetings in Collier's handwriting. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And I hope for your sake that we do not meet again. Shoot me. Archie, answer it. Oh. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? I'm at the Collier place. Since it takes only ten minutes to get there, may I congratulate you on your speed? I've been at the Collier place for nearly an hour. Doing what? Oh. Discussing Rosebud. Your delay has been explained. Good night. And for another, I was being around when someone got murdered. Ah, you laid hands on the murderer? No, the room was dark. By the time I got Claire untangled from me and started looking for somebody with a gun, he'd left. I see. And the dead man, of course, is James Collier. No, sorry. Found it, it had to be. Who was he? Total stranger. Ah, gee. I'm not being difficult. There was no identification on him. Strange. A description. Early 30s, height maybe 5'10", weight around 175 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a very natty dresser. Suit custom tailored with a built-in shoulder holster. Don Juan shirts. Manicured but very dirty fingernails. And he... Uh-oh. Company. The police? Mm-hmm. Very well, you tell them whatever you think proper, without mentioning the governor's committee, of course. You then bid them farewell and come to the hotel. Can't I say goodbye to Claire, too? You cannot confound you, Archie. Do you think I want to wait up all night? Police were not happy about letting me go, but I threatened to tell you on them, so they gave up. You have told me the entire story of what occurred at the Collier Farm, Archie? Mm Mm-hmm. All details. If you like, I wouldn't mind repeating the parts about Claire. Phooey. You may call it phooey, I call it love. By the way, did you know that it was Robert Herrick who wrote that... Confound po- you, be quiet. Okay, push your lips around, but you've missed something. I have? Mm-hmm. The burning question of the day. The night, rather. Which is? Where is James Collier? Ah! Stop buying. The cops want him on suspicion of murder. The way it shapes up, he shot our unknown pal and then headed for the nearest border. Nonsense. You mean he didn't shoot our unknown pal? I mean, Collier's whereabouts are not a mystery. You know where he is? I know where he is. I don't believe it. You couldn't know. You haven't been out of the hotel. You haven't had any calls. Archie, I use my intelligence. If you had used yours instead of holding the girl... I still wouldn't know where Collier is. Never mind. I'm impressed. What do I do now? You get Mr. Veek on the phone. Huh? He's staying here at the hotel. Oh, old home week. Operator. Mr. Veek, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Veek? Mr. Wolf wants to speak with you. Just a second. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Mr. V, where were you at 10 o'clock? Why, on my way to the hotel. You checked in at... 10.15, um... then came directly to your room. One other question. You have an employee, a man in his early 30s, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and well-dressed. Am I correct? Yes, that is Marshall. No, that was Marshall. Good night, sir. Having done that, whatever it meant, we now go to sleep? So hey, we go to the Collier Farm. Okay, but why? Because, Archie, uh... <laughs> the time has come to cross-examine the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Confound you, Archie. You're not driving a truck. Be careful. Truck drivers are careful. Also, they are courteous. Indeed. Furthermore, they will always stop to help a motorist in time of trouble. Archie, are you training to become a truck driver, or have you fallen in love with a truck driver's daughter? Her name is Susie, a hair the color of wheat fields at high noon. Never mind turning purple. I'm about to change the subject. Boss, I have a theory. Stick to truck drivers. As follows. Our boy Collier, who had been selling information to Veek, had a change of heart and decided to turn ethical. 
But Veek's man, Marshall, at Veek's orders, tried to apply pressure. So Collier shot him and headed for Canada. Uh, and the girl's robe? Must have brightened my life. Uh, oh, you mean about her playing sentry? Well, she's in Veek's employ, too. Sorry. Don't like my theory. It's charming. It merely happens to be wrong. Merely happens to be... Why is it wrong? Because Archie of a dead man's dirty fingernails, Marshall's fingernails. Oh. Well, you made me bring you to the rabbit hutches. We have arrived. There are the rabbits. Go ahead, cross-examine them. Hmm, good many hutches. A large pen for the rabbits to run about in. Notice that they're all cowering at the far end of the pen, ran as we entered. That's because they don't like us, maybe, huh? <laughs> one of them, however, seems to be friendly. The one up here, and at the corner opposite us. Oh, yeah, there is one here. He's not friendly, Mr. Wolf. Indeed? He's dead. Somebody stole in his skull. Interesting. What's interesting about a dead rabbit? He may be dead now, Archie, but he was friendly. Too friendly. Claire, this is Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, this is Claire. Claire, I'm Archie. Ah, uh, chair, Archie. A chair. Try this one. Be gentle with it. If you break it, all the early Americans will hate you. It was, uh... Steady. Oh, uh. well, now then. Mr. Wolf, I'm dreadfully tired. The police have... Are idiots. What? For example, do they know that you were posted as sentry outside this house in order to warn James Collier of any intrusion? Well, they don't... I wasn't. I... Do they know that James Collier and the dead man, Marshall, were quarreling? No. Do they know that James Collier had armed himself in preparation for this meeting with the gunman? That isn't true. It I... is true. I don't have to say anything. You've already said more than enough with your actions, my dear. What, what do you mean? According to Archie's report, and Archie is always meticulously accurate, when you and he opened the door of the room in which the murder took place, you screamed at the shots. Well, of course. Any girl would scream with... Then you clung to Archie with sufficient force and for sufficient length of time to prevent him from chasing the murderer. Why? I... Because you had seen and recognized the murderer as the man you loved. It was too dark to see anything. True. Therefore, you didn't have to see the man. You thought you already knew who the killer had to be. That, that's a lie. You're shielding James Collier, aren't you? I'll never admit any of it. Never. May not be necessary. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Get hold of that policeman outside and remember what happened to one particular rabbit. Well, uh, look around for freshly dug earth. Midnight. What What are we waiting for? A return? Archie's? No, it'll take him longer. Well, then whose? <gasps> Mr. Veeks, of course, complete with the revolver. Come in, Mr. Veeks. It couldn't have been easier. No one outside, only the two of you here. I warned you, Wolf. Fiddlesticks, you merely tried to use me as a prop for an alibi and a rationalization for a motive. I don't understand. Mr. That... Wolf does. Indeed I do. Did you really think me fool enough to believe your proposal, Mr. Veek? It was plausible. It was nonsense. You pretended you were handling James Collier, plus the proofs of his guilt, over to me in an effort to keep yourself out of the picture. But your proposition was silly. No matter how much I might have wanted to help you, I would have been powerless once James Collier went before a jury. You are too intelligent not to know that. That couldn't have given you enough to go on. It didn't. You yourself gave me more. I did. When you came to my room, you told me you knew Mr. Goodwin and I had come to Greendale, checked in at the hotel. I did. However, when I phoned you later and asked for an account of your movements between 10 and 10.30, you replied that you had driven to the hotel, signed in, and came directly to my room. Obviously, you already knew of my presence in the hotel. How? I, uh... Only one way you could have known. You had seen Archie at some time prior to the time you checked in at the hotel. And the only place where Archie was... Was here, at the farm. Yes, which told me Mr. Veek had been here at the time of Marshall's death. What was Veek doing here? Only one thing. Murder. <gasps> then he killed the gunman. No other possibility. 
But, Jimmy, I thought he did it. James Collier couldn't have killed Marshall because at the time he was killed, James Collier was already... Already dead. Archie! What's this? Leave it, Scotty. Let's play. Uh, that gun first. My arm! Oh. That's nice and cooperative, so... Oh. He'll be quiet for a while. A cop is back in the rabbit pen, Mr. Wolf, guarding Collier's grave. Grave, Archie? Yeah, with James Collier in it. Oh, poor Jimmy. Veek knew the expose was coming. He had to shut Collier up. So he had his gunman, Marshall, kill Collier and bury him in the rabbit run back of the hutches. You spotted that, boss, because of... The dead rabbit. The others scudded away from the man who bore James Collier's body to that lonely spot. But one rabbit overcame his fear. He was too friendly. And got killed for it. There was that and... And the dirty fingernails of Marshall, the gunman who killed and buried James Collier. Your description indicated extreme neatness. The dirty fingernails were a wrong note. Yeah, indicated he'd been digging. So we know now, don't we? Veek killed his own trigger man to frame a dead man for it. Collier would be thought guilty. He'd be hunted among the living. And all the while... Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Claire. It's all right, Archie. I didn't love Jimmy... That was all washed up. Mr. Wolf, I understand everything, except why did Jimmy suddenly start staying at the farm with the rabbits? He knew he'd be watched. He couldn't risk conveying his information by telephone or the mails. Nor could he be seen holding conversation with men who might be traced to Veek. But who would suspect a truck driver delivering carrots for the rabbits as being the go-between for Jimmy Collier and Veek? Nero Wolf. Which is why I hope there's an adequate bed in this house for Mr. Wolf. I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Splendid, Archie. You will have the police remove Mr. Veek and then... And then maybe Claire would like to uh, go gathering rosebuds, huh? By moonlight? I would like to. Truly. I shall go up to bed now. I've seen the moonlight more times than I care to remember. However, while you and Miss Claire stroll through the moonlight, Archie... Yeah? You might remember that rosebuds have thorns. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Martha Shaw, Hal Gerard, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Impolite Corpse. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is the delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. Now it's Sam Spade. Then, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering oh, the phone yeah. is Archie Goodwin. And the mountain of a man engaged oh, yeah. in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolf. What was that? Somebody's going to be murdered who has no manners? Well, what do you want Nero Wolf to do? Teach him manners? Oh. Hold on. Mr. Wolf. Yes, Archie? We've got a prospective client. In case someone she knows gets murdered, she'd like you to do something about it. Very well, however, advise her. Yes? <laughs> Not to get murdered herself. I never take a corpse for a client. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest detective in the world. Yes, 
Douglas, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case of the impolite corpse. It began on a certain night at 8.40, when Walter Channing, an advertising executive, was dictating in his office to his charming secretary, Brenda Barclay. Brenda, take a memo. Yes, Mr. Channing. This is to be mimeographed and sent to the entire staff. The entire staff, yes, sir. Notice, effective at once, one-hour lunch periods will be strictly enforced. Employees will post time of departure and time of return. Yes, what is it? Mr. Channing... Bennett, I'm busy. Well, I've got to see you, Mr. Channing, about this afternoon. This afternoon was unfortunate, Bennett, but it happened. I lost my temper. I'm sorry. So am I. Mr. Channing, I've been with the firm 14 years, and I... Well, because a man blows up once in 14 years... Mr. Channing's office. Oh, you've got to reconsider. That's all, Mr. Channing. I never reconsider, Bennett. It's your wife. But, Mr. Channing... That will be all, Bennett. It won't be all. You can't wipe out 14 years of a man's life. Even you can't do that, Channing. It's Mrs. Channing on the phone. Oh. Hello? You're where? That's in this building. Since when has Dr. Ellis kept evening office hours? I told you there's nothing wrong with you. No, I can't. I don't know when I'll be through. And I don't want you hanging around up here. Well, take a cab or walk. I don't care what you do. What? I can't understand you. What? What? Goodbye, Doris. Where was I? Walter. Yes? You are going to reconsider about Tom Bennett, aren't you? Bennett was insolent this afternoon. I won't tolerate insolence. Yes? Shine, Mr. Channing. Shine? No! What's he doing down here this time of night? Half the staff's working overtime. Kerry was an enterprising shoeshine boy. Might have missed someone on his rounds this afternoon. Walter, about Tom Bennett. Forget Bennett! Look, did you upset the inkwell? Quick, blot the stuff. Yes, of course. Did any spill on you? Spot of my trouser cuff. Lucky you didn't get on the carpet. Walter, about Tom Bennett. I told you to forget Bennett. All right, Walter, all right. Though maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you'd be better off to use him as a model. A model? If he knows he's not wanted around here... He'll have the self-respect to get out. Meaning? Well, you've known for a long time you're not wanted. And you're still here. How you'd like to fire me. Denying that would be silly. I've been with this firm 15 years in January. Employees get a bonus of stock shares after 15 years' service. That's what I'm waiting for, and you know it. Suppose we get back to that memorandum. You'd like to get me out before I collect those shares, wouldn't you? I said let's get on with the memo. You'd be petty enough to do it, too, if you knew how. There may be a way. There isn't, and you know it. I'm too careful. You can't fire me without cause, and I've given you no cause, Walter. Nothing you can possibly dictate one of your vicious little memorandums about. Don't try my patience too far, Brenda. Walter, what? This this can't be us talking like this, you and me hating each other. (laughs) I find it remarkable there ever was anything between us except hate. Walter. I mean it. Look at you. You were flashy when I met you. You're getting flashier. That means cheaper, Brenda. Stop it. Too much lipstick? Too much rouge? Hair too bright? Dress too tight? You're trying too hard, Brenda. You're labeling yourself like a sound wagon. I wonder what it is that stops me from killing you. Cowardice, of course. Now, when you've stopped sniveling, we'll get on with a memorandum. You ready? Yes. I'm ready. Notice. In the interest of economy and efficiency, junior executives will confer in the conference room, not in private offices. Mid-afternoon coffee and personal phone calls and daily shoe shines will be eliminated. Your name is Barclay, Brenda Barclay. Very well, Miss Bagley. What can I do for you? Mr. Wolf, I... 
I, I don't know how to begin. Well, maybe I can make this easier all around by briefing Mr. Wolf on the Walter Channing case. Uh, hey, that's funny. What? Violet eyes. I always thought there was something the poets made up. Archie. Huh? Oh, the, Ch- the, the Channing case, yes. One moment, uh, Miss Barkley. Look this way, please. Hmm? To me, an eye is functional object found in mammals, birds, fish, potatoes, and horticulture. Thank you. Go on, Archie. Walter Channing was the boy wonder of advertising. At 33, executive vice president of Winslow Hart and Stratemeyer. Just 24 hours ago, they found him at his desk, shot through the heart. They? Who is they? A night porter and a shoeshine boy, is that right? Yes. Mm. He'd been dead about an hour. The bullet went through Channing, his desk chair, and lodged in the windowsill behind him. Police thought at first it was suicide. The gun? A thirty-eight found it on the floor, ten feet away. No fingerprints, anyhow, no clear ones. Seldom are on a gun butt. You say suicide was suspected. Why? The gun was ten feet from the body. It was the... the smudges. Smudges? Powder burns. According to the papers, he was sitting at his desk. There were no signs of a struggle. The gun was held against his chest and fired. But it wasn't suicide, Mr. Wolfe. Walter Channing would never have killed himself. The police have already decided that, finally, according to the evening papers. And I presume you, Miss Barkley, are a suspect. No, not yet. But you expect to be. That's why you came to me. When the police talked to her, I... Her? Doris, his wife. I've been Walter Channing's secretary for eight years. At one time, we... We thought we were in love. Mrs. Channing was aware of this? Yes. Oh, it was a long time ago. It was over. It was finished a long time ago. But she never believed that. Neither did Alan. Alan who? Alan Melick, head of the media department at the agency. We were going to be married when I... When Walter and I... Well, we decided were... you were in love. Miss Barkley, who finally decided you were not? You or Mr. Channing? He did. I see. Mr. Melick believes you did not share this change of heart. Yes. Oh, he's such a fool. I dare say you fear Mrs. Channing or Mr. Melick or both will reveal this ill-fated romance. You know what the papers will make of it, what the police will try to make of it. Uh, Miss Barkley, did you kill Channing? No. Oh, no, I swear I didn't. Oh, Mr. Wolf, I didn't. Please, for heaven's sake, no tears. Archie, put her in a cab. Yes, sir. Then come up to the plant room. There are some things I want you to execute for me. Yes, sir. Women. Bah! Yes, Mr. Goodwin, I'm Abe Jackson, a night porter. It was working late that night. Mr. Channon, his secretary, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Melick, and his secretary. Uh, about 10.30, I met the shoe shine Kelly, on Mr. Channon's floor. There was a light burning in Channon's plate. We went in to turn it off, Kelly and me, and there he was, sitting at his desk, a hole as big in his chest. Tell me, Mr. Bennett, did Channing have any enemies in the agency? Uh, Channing was a slave driver, Mr. Goodwin. The girls hated him, and the men were afraid of him. He'd send out memos like this one around. Here, yeah, take a look at it. It's typical. No coffee, no shoe shines, no office conferences. If you want my opinion, as one employee out of 150, whoever killed Walter Channing did the rest of us a favor. You're Amy Long, secretary to Alan Melick. Now, what can you tell... I can tell you plenty how she jilted Mr. Melick, took up with Mr. Channing, got thrown over by him. I, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say Brenda Barkley would murder anyone. But if she did, Walter Channing would be 1A. Channing get his shoes shine by you? I called the agency man, sir. You know, it was Jackson and me found him. Everyone else had gone and left himself, poor soul, sitting at his desk, dead. Uh, this specimen, a Manama's trained orchid. Beautiful, isn't it, Mrs. Channing? Hmm. Mr. Mellick? Hmm. I could never quite like orchids. They have no smell, you know. It's pretty all right, but tulips are more in my line, Mr. Wolf. Tulips, Mr. Mellick? I had to stand of emperors this spring. Emperors, come in, Archie. Emperors, Mr. Mellick? That's the name of a tulip, Mr. Wolf. A peasant flower, I've heard of it, of course. Archie. Mrs. Channing, Mr. Mellick, my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin. I didn't know you had company. Mr. Wolfe asked us here to explain why Brenda Barkley is worried. 
And you have both agreed to respect her position. Brenda ought to know I'd never tell the police anything to get her into trouble. Fooey. Sir, he said fooey, Mr. Munich, meaning he doubts what you say and does not admit your right to say it. Archie, Mr. Munich, you say you would never intentionally inform on Miss Barclay. Certainly not. The tongue slips, sir. We would expect you to guard your... What? Do you think What that... I started to say, you asked us here because Brenda Barclay is your client. I despise Miss Barclay. Everyone knows that and why. But I wouldn't stoop to implicating her in murder. You believe her innocent then, Mrs. Channing? I believe she lacks the gumption to pull a trigger. Poison, I wouldn't put past her at all. Mr. Melick, would you be kind enough to see me home? Of course, Mrs. Channing. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. And Mr. Goodwin. You have, I suppose, an exhaustive report from me, Archie? Seven pages of notes. Save them and get me a bottle of beer. You're in a rosy mood. What happened? I said I would like a bottle of beer. No, you wouldn't. Archie, you better... Don't puff up about it. Those vest buttons won't stand the strain. I can't get you a bottle of beer. Why not? You ordered me to hold you to four a day. I rescind the order. You also ordered me not to let you rescind the order. What's the matter with you, anyhow? I've had to entertain two very dull people too long. Both those dull people are prime suspects. Mrs. Channing is a woman scorned. Melick lost his girl to the guy who was killed. I can't blame her for throwing him over. Archie, the man grows tulips. What? Tulips. Well, give me a report. I checked the agency, everybody who was working down there the night of the murder. Also, I dropped in on Inspector Kramer at Homicide. Also, I visited the morgue. Why the morgue? Because if I hadn't, you'd have said, why not the morgue? Go on. I drew a blank there. Kramer let me look at the clothes Channing was wearing. There was an ink stain on the left trouser cuff. An ink stain? And a hole through his shirt front with plenty of powder smudge like the paper said. He was shot with a thirty-eight at point-blank range, sitting down. An impolite corpse. What? Discourteous. He didn't rise to meet his murder. That is most significant, Archie. I know. I've got a theory about this case. No theories, facts, if you please. But look, Channing owned a thirty-eight. That's a fact. It's disappeared. That's another fact. The murder gun was a thirty-eight with the numbers filed off, and it could be Channing's own gun. Thereby proving what, Archie? That his wife had access to it. Your theory involves Mrs. Channing, then? And Balick. She decides her husband is less trouble to her, dead than alive. A regrettable tendency of wives. Have you noticed? <laughs> and she sells Melick on the idea. Now, that wouldn't be hard. They figure to make it look like suicide, but Melick loses his head and runs, drops the gun on his way out, and... Oh. You don't buy it. Enough of theories, the facts, Archie. Out of your notebook. One. Nine people were on the scene that night, working late for one reason or another. Mrs. Channing tells me she was visiting a doctor's office in the same building, by the way. Two. Every one of those people hated Channing. Three. Here's a sample of why he wasn't popular. Memorandum. Dictated the night he was killed. The staff got it the next morning. Hmm. A whipcracker, ah, uh, Mr. Channing. Fact four. The ink stain on this trouser cuff was partly rubbed out. With what? Cleaner of some kind. I didn't get the brand. Fact five. There's a spot on the carpet near Channing's chair. Spot of what? Ink? Blood? Looks like ink. It looks like ink. Well, I didn't analyze it on the spur of the moment. My chemical set isn't working so good, boss. And... Fooey. Archie, I want two things. Yes, sir. Get over to headquarters. The police have Channing's trousers. Suggest to Inspector Kramer that he have the stain analyzed. Suggest also that the spot on the carpet be analyzed at the same time. Be around him when the information arrives. This is be kind to the police week? Fooey. I never have sought to beat the police on matters of fact. Only on interpretation. Deduction. Get going. Oh, and Archie. Yes? When you return, I should discourse upon the sanctity of deskhood. The sanctity of what hood? Deskhood. Now be off with you, and please remember you're tracking a murderer. Don't stub your toe. Good one. The thing on the carpet was a dye of some kind. Dye, huh? Uh-huh. How long will it take the lab to give you the analysis on it, Inspector? Oh, not very long. I've got the report on what was used on the trouser cuff right now, though. And? They found traces of carbon tetrachloride. Wait a minute, this goes in the notebook. A carbon tetrachloride. And something else. 
Goodwin, what's Wolf after? Interpretations was what he said, Inspector. You object? No. Maybe I'll get an interpretation, too. There's something else was perchloroethylene. Perchlor... Why, Inspector, such language. Mr. Goodwin has been to your office. Everything I need to know, You've he... You've got uh... to come, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. I don't go out. My digestion disapproves of it. I disapprove of it. But, Mr. Goodwin, he's in danger. What? What's that? Terrible danger. He needs you here at once. Arjun, danger? Let me talk to him. Please come. Hurry. What's happened? Hello. Sparkly. Fritz, get out of the car. Bring me my wool muffler and worsted vest. See if you can find my galoshes. Confound it, I've got to go out. Go on up. Step to the rear of the car, please. <laughs> Mister, will you please step back? I'm back as far as I can go. <laughs> you are. Elevators. Contraptions for little men. Come, come. Take me up, young man. Hold it. Hold that car. I'm late for a date with a blonde. 16th floor, buddy. Evening, Mr. Goodwin. Good evening. I was told you were in danger. Danger? I... Mr. Wolf! You were... What are you doing out down here? Sparkly's idea. About me being in danger? Obviously, she was lying. I suspected at the time. But I fell in with a suggestion. I'm anxious to end the case. My presence here is needed. Don't understand why she'd do such a thing. And why is your presence needed? Sixth floor. It's a matter of, uh, <laughs> perspective. Uh, Brenda's got a very nice perspective. She'll be around here someplace. The agency's got this whole floor. Her office? Down this corridor, next to Channing's. Well, Kramer came through on those reports from the lab. That smudge on the carpet wasn't ink. It was a dye. Powdered aniline. Brenda. Oh, oh, Mr. Wolf, thank heavens you're here. Hey, I'm here too. The police, they questioned me again this afternoon. I'm so frightened, Mr. Wolf. You've got to find the murderer before they... Before Baby, they... take it easy. Well, oh, hello, Archie. Hello, what's the idea of trying to pull a fast one on Mr. Wolf? Well, I just had to see him, please understand. Is this Channing's office? Yes. You told him I was in danger. Ah, last, the place to sit down. Well, I had to tell him something to get him down here. He's not happy. Are you comfortable there, sir? Miss Barkley, come here. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I can explain. I-, I thought if you were here where it happened, I mean, if you could see for yourself, then you'd... Young that... woman, there are many things I'd like to say to you. Oh, now, wait a minute. She was scared, boss. However, I am too short of breath to do them justice. Uh, Archie. Yes? Round up everyone concerned with this case. Right now? Including Mrs. Channing. Get them in here. Yes, sir. You help him, Miss Barkley, and close that window. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Fresh air. I've had enough today, thanks to you, to last me a lifetime. If after all that exposure, <laughs> I live a lifetime. <laughs> What's going on here, anyhow? A tea party. Find yourself seats. Keep your knees steady. All right, Mr. Wolf. everybody's here. Mr. Shushine Kelly? Uh, here, sir, here. It was you who found the body. Him and me, Mr. Wolf. How many of Jackson the night man? You gentlemen can help us, if you will. Oh, to be sure, Mr. Wolf. I'd like to know the exact position of the body when you found it. Well, he was sitting up. Uh, that's it, sir. Sitting up straight as you please. You'll oblige me if you'll demonstrate. Sit in the chair, please. His chair, sir? If you break. <clears throat> Abe. You. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not me. Not on your life. Uh, there's no easy thing you ask, Mr. Wolf. I uh, but uh, I- I'll oblige you. Uh, uh, 
so, yeah. Uh, it was like, uh, like this, I'd say. You agree, Mr. Jackson? A little more to the right, maybe. Yeah, that's the way he was. Archie. Yes, sir? Help me with a brief recapitulation. Well, um, so far as we know, Channing made no outcry. Therefore, he could not have been startled by the appearance of the killer. There were powder burns on the body. Therefore, the gun was against Channing when it was fired. His own hand couldn't have held it closer. Nobody heard the shot, probably because this officer soundproofed. The gun that killed him was lying on the floor ten feet from the desk. In the direction of flight through that door. Go on, Archie. The killer was almost certainly well known to Channing, or Channing wouldn't have let him come that close without a struggle or an alarm. Also, the killer had access to this office, another proof that he's not a stranger. One more point, if I may, Archie. The killer, he or she, is present here now. Quiet, everyone. We come now to the point I mentioned to you last night, Archie. The point I call the sanctity of deskhood. Sanctity of what? Deskhood, Mrs. Jenning. Explain, Archie. Still figure it's so important? Absolutely essential. Well, I wrote it here somewhere. Oh. Deskhood refers to that area behind a desk where a man earns his livelihood, makes his career, builds his reputation. You mean here? Where I'm sitting? So long as a man sits at his desk, he enjoys a curious area of privacy. He is remarkably safe from intrusion. That's it, Mr. Wolf. The sanctity of deskhood. Think about it a moment. You'll see what I mean. Nonsense. I've gone around that desk hundreds of times. I'm sure she has many more hundreds. If you mean what I think you mean, Mrs. Channing, you Please, are... lady. Mrs. Channing, when you approached your husband at his desk, what did he do? What did he... Why, he stood up and... He stood up. Sparkly, you agree? Well, yes, he'd have to stand up. At least he always did. But for his murderer, he did not. Archie, resume from your notes, please. Well, whoever killed Walter Channing went around the desk without Channing rising, held a gun to his chest, and pulled the trigger. Excuse me. If you will go behind the desk and stand facing Mr. Kelly, Archie... Here. This the way you mean? You know the angle of the body wound or the hole in the chair? There wasn't any angle. One was in a straight line with the other. From where you stand now, in front of Mr. Kelly... If you wish to inflict an identical wound upon him, could you do it? Not from where I stand. I'd have to kneel. You'd have to kneel. Do so. No, please, the murder tableau. Oh, no, 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 The question now, who could kneel before Channing? It's close enough to kill him from that position without alarming him in the least. Kelly. The shoeshine man. Hey, hey, wait a minute now. I... Shut up, you, and sit there. His motive is crystal clear. The memorandum. Memorandum. You have a copy, Archie? In my notebook. Ah, yes. Miss Barclay, read the part which could explain Mr. Kelly's action. No, no, not Why, now. The memo was all over the office. Kelly must have seen oh, it. Oh, wait a minute now. A notice effective at once. Yes, here it is. In the interest of economy, daily shoe shines will be eliminated. That'd cut off Kelly's bread and butter. Kelly, I can't believe it. No, can I? What? It's obvious Kelly murdered Walter Channing. Mr. Wolf, now listen, I did nothing to the But the obvious can be too obvious. Meaning what exactly? Archie? Yes, sir? Brief these people on the ink-stained trousers. Channing spilled ink on his trouser cuff the night he was murdered. Somebody tried to clean the spot off. With what? According to the police analysis, carbon tetrachloride and perchloroethylene showed up. Both non-inflammable ingredients used in many commercial cleaners. Exactly what are you getting at, Mr. Wolf? One moment, Mrs. Channing. Mr. Goodwin also has an analysis of the spot on the carpet behind the desk. Argy? A powder form of dye, aniline dye. Used in what, perhaps? Well, uh, the lab suggested a shoe dressing. I got no powder dye. I, I, I swear I ain't, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure you haven't, Mr. Kelly. You'll find this particular type of dressing is used on women's shoes, suede shoes, usually. I don't understand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, Archie? If a woman... Now, su suppose a, a woman knelt in front of Channy to clean that ink spot off his trouser cuff. That smudge could have rubbed off the tip of her shoe onto the carpet. Exactly. I believe you'll find a typewriter cleaner contains tetrachloride and perchlorethylene. Something else just occurred to me. That memo was sent around the morning after Channing was killed. I never thought of that. True, Archie. And for only one purpose, to point suspicion at Kelly. But when the police didn't take the hint... Go on, Archie. Why then? 
somebody else was brought down here who would. Comes around to three questions, doesn't it? Who knew about the memo? Who had access to Channing's file where he kept his gun? And who made sure Nero Wolf would see the evidence against Kelly? Three questions, Archie, with one answer that spells the name of the murderess. Our own client, Brenda Barkey. Steak, Archie, man, did you like it? I'm not hungry. Indeed, I suggest a tonic. That reminds me. <laughs> I had a call. You had? Doris Channing. She had some idea about my uh, explaining things to her. She found my explanation insufficient? No, but she felt it lacked the personal touch. Phooey. Hand me a can of beer. <laughs> However, you do have the evening off. Yes, sir. Keep out of trouble. Hmm. Doris Channing is a blonde. <laughs> that is try to keep out of trouble. In the company of a blonde who wants to. Good night, sir. Good night, Archie. Good night. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by William Kendall Clark was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edmund Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Donald Morrison, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Mary Lansing, and Barney Phillips. Next week, at this same time, Nero, Wolf, and Archie will bring you the case of The Girl Who Cried Wolf. John Storm speaking. <laughs> Nero Wolf, Archie, and all of our cast hope that our listeners have taken time out from this busy Christmas season to help brighten some youngster's Christmas day. Be sure to send a thing, your choice of anything you think a child would like for Christmas, to the groups in your own town who are distributing these toy gifts to less fortunate children. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf Transcribed. Later this evening, the unique Mr. Monty Woolley stars once again in the new comedy series, The Magnificent Montague, the delightful saga of an embittered Shakespearean ham. After many triumphant years on the stage, The Magnificent Montague now portrays Uncle Goodhart, the hero of a radio serial. And his trials and tribulations are 30 minutes of delightful listening over most of these NBC stations. And today being Friday means another visit to Duffy's Tavern, where Archie the manager presides over another sparkling session of mischief and madness. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Yes, this is Nero Wolf's office. The mountain of a man in the oversized armchair staring at Archie with a beady eye is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf is in... Mr. Wolf is always in. Would he stay in until... He would. Archie, what on earth? Boss, she sounds blonde. Phooey. Don't believe I can tell over the phone? Okay. Excuse me, miss, but are you blonde? Oh. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wolf will see you. Goodbye. I did not say... No, but you will. Besides, she wasn't blonde. And I want you to see red. Oh, Archie, you better think of some new ones. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf. 
Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case of the girl who cried wolf. In the old brownstone house on 35th Street, my boss, Nero Wolf, with all his 300 pounds, sits at his desk from which he runs his world. We have been patiently waiting for the lady client. And there's a knock at the door, and I admit her. A beautiful, frightened, and red-headed girl. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Nero Wolf? Not by 160 pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin. Oh, yes. I spoke to you on the phone. I'm... I'm Mary Dunning, Mr. Goodwin. I was wondering if... He's in. He's always in. Come on. We'll try getting him to admit it. This is Mr. Wolf. Miss Mary Dunning. How do you do, Miss Dunning? Here, take this red leather chair. It's a nice match for your hair. You know, it was old Dr. Titmouse who said to me, beware of a red-headed woman. But I never could believe Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Your business, Miss Dunning? Do you mean what I do or... Or why I've come to you. Both, if you please. Well, I'm Mr. Stevens' secretary at the Tolliver Ecological Foundation. Our offices are down on East 12th Street. Uh, ecological? Fear research as to factors operating on plant and animal development and survival, Archie. Animal development, huh? Miss Dunning, the foundation has several agricultural research projects throughout the country, hasn't it? That's right, Mr. Wolf. And Donald Stevens is executive director... Or was until... Was? He's disappeared. It's been three days now. He's not been near the office, nor his apartment. No message or... Apartment? Stephen's been living alone? He's a bachelor. He's engaged to Laura Tolliver. She's a cousin of the original Tollivers. But she doesn't know where he is either. Have you come to me on Laura Tolliver's account or on behalf of the foundation? Well... Well, neither, Mr. Wolf. I'm just worried and... And I'd heard of you as one of the finest private detectives in New York. You heard of me, Miss Dunning. We see that you're here. I still fail to understand why. But I've told you. Mr. Stevens has dropped out of sight. And there's another thing. The last time I saw him, he had a caller with him in his office. Caller? Male? Female? I don't know. We're in a converted old brownstone house, and... Well, the way the offices are laid out... I don't see all the people who come in unless they make a point of coming to my desk. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. All I know is that Mr. Stevens stepped out for a moment, looking either scared or angry, I couldn't be sure which, and asked me to see if there was a policeman at the corner. Which corner? (laughs) Archie, continue, Miss Dunning. Well, I started to go, and there were low voices arguing from the inner office. And then Mr. Stevens called me not to bother. Then what? He said I could go ahead and take my lunch hour then. So I did. And when I came back, he was gone. Leaving no message? Leaving no message. And you've neither seen or heard of him since? I've tried all over. By phone, going out myself. Miss Dunning, has Mr. Stevens been in the habit of making extended business trips? Well, once in a while to our research stations in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or up in Vermont, but not without letting me know. I have to make out his travel vouchers. Has there been any recent trouble at the foundation? Trouble? Financial trouble? Personal trouble? No, there's been no trouble. Miss Dunning, you're wasting my time and yours. This is a problem for the police, if there is a problem. Oh, oh no, Mr. Wolf. I, I'd have gone to the police, except... Well, if there should be an innocent explanation, it didn't seem fair to the foundation to risk the unpleasant publicity of... I said for the police. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. It's your say-so, but when a girl walks in here and asks... A young lady can depart by the use of the same rather trim legs that carried her here, Archie. Oh, now, look, boss, just because I look at... stunning. I can think of a dozen reasons that might take your bachelor director out of town for a few days without the formality of explaining his actions. Then... You won't look into this? Despite Mr. Goodwin's frowns, no. Should Mr. Stevens not turn up tomorrow or so, I suggest you advise the police or whatever attorney acts for the foundation. There is such a person, of course. Yes. Jonas Dowd is counsel. He's also a coat trustee. Consult him then, by all means. But you don't seem to understand. If you'll excuse me, I'm overdue for an important conference with my cook. 
We have just received a shipment of truffles from France. Well, of course, if Mr. I... Mr. Wolf, if you ask me... Precisely I... what I have refrained from doing, Archie. Would you be good enough to escort Miss Dunning to the door? To the door, Archie. Good night, Miss Dunning. Good night. Good night. And thanks, just the same. Look, Mr. Wolf, it's your shop and you can get as surly as you please. But can you give me one excuse for that high-handed brush? One thin shred of an excuse? Miss Dunning was sitting in this chair... The girl was lying, Archie. Lying? How can you say that? At least twice. And possibly from the moment she opened that undeniably pretty mouth. Now, if you would excuse me, Archie, I have an appointment with a truffle. You say you have a surprise for me, Archie. Enough to yank you three inches out of that chair. Remember the girl who was here last night, Mary Dunning? You seem unwilling to let me forget her. Well, I took off on my own this morning to check up on that foundation setup. Good, Archie. I ventured a small bet with Fritz that you would. All right. See if your bet included this. I found Stevens down there right in his office. Missing executive director? Yes, and the missing Mr. Stevens claimed he had just been on a business trip. Delayed getting back because his car had been smacked by a hit-and-run driver in New Jersey. Now, here's the payoff. He even tried to make out that he'd been thinking of calling you in on a problem. Hit-and-run accident? No, no, something about the foundation. But I didn't waste time letting him cloud it up for us. The point is... Archie, that... you brought him here, of course. Stevens? No, he's still down there. We'll want to grab him before the day is out, but I had something more important to run down first. It took me three calls on the way up here, but you can take it as confirmed. We've still got a disappearance case, and this one you're not sitting out. Indeed. And who has disappeared now? Mary Dunning. Stevens is back, but Mary's gone. Not at the office, not at her rooming house, and none of her clothes are taken. How'd you get going? Put a police call out on Mary. Back to 12th Street and get Stevens out of that office and up here as fast as you can. I'll phone him. You are on the way. Hello? This Donald Stevens? Yes, this is Donald Stevens. This is Nero Wolf. I understand you've been thinking of consulting me. Well, as a matter of fact, I have, Mr. Wolf. I started to explain to Mr. Goodwin, but... Uh... Are you alone there at the office? Why, well, yes. As it happens... Be careful. I don't think your car smashed up as an accident. I've just sent Mr. Goodwin to ask you to come here. Meanwhile, I'd suggest... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Wolf. There seems to be someone coming in now. Wait, Mr. Stevens. There hasn't been time for Archie to get there yet. Excuse me, Mr. Wolf. Don't. Just hold the wire a moment. Wait, Mr. Stevens. Uh, come on in. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, what? No! No! Oh. And that's all Inspector Kramer has been able to make of it, Archie? Not to hear him tell it, but that's all he's got. Stephen dead and the girl still missing. Did you find anything helpful at the office? I think the murderer started to tear up some account books and project ledgers, but I must have scared him away when I rang the bell. Couldn't have been more than three or four minutes after the shooting when I got there. But you saw no one? Hmm. The murderer can cover a lot of ground in three or four minutes. You, uh, naturally, by accident, since it is mildly illegal, you had a good look at the dead man? A very good look. Not to mention his pockets. Anything particular? Well, there was a half-eaten package of lifesavers in the left-hand trouser pocket. What's particular about that? The flavor was lime. I hate lime. Foy. <laughs> Archie, I uh, called Jonas Dowd last night. The foundation lawyer? Yes, he set up the original charter under which Donald Stevens operated with an annual fund of $90,000. Ecology has its attractions. 90,000 attractions, to be precise. It indicates a possible reason for Stevens' murder. He was in sole charge of that money. Somebody donated three thirty-eight caliber bullets to him. Hardly a token of appreciation. Perhaps not. However, the shooting followed the attempt to stage an automobile accident. Archie, I sent Saul Panza on an errand for me. Saul, huh? He's expensive. True, he's the best man in the shadow job there is, but... You've got something, huh? Possibility. An angle I can't handle? Apart from your natural preference for curves... You've more than work enough here in New York. Finding Mary Dunning for a starter. Or uh, her body. Or her body, as it may be. 
Is that what Saul's on, picking up a line on Mary? Among other chores, Saul's is buying me some special groceries at the city market. You frown, Archie. I glower. But okay, play it cozy. You can send Saul off to Stockholm for smorgasbord for all I care. I'm still asking, what about Stevens and what about Mary? Where do we start? I'm expecting Laura Tolliver, the heiress and the son of Jonas Dowd here within a few minutes. Jonas Dowd himself proved as difficult to pry from the office as... As you generally are from this one. Oh, good for old Jonas. Wait a minute, though. He said a son was coming. Would that be Peter Dowd? It would be. Could I trouble you to pass that second bottle of beer? It's your third. Stop auditing me, Archie. You reacted to the name of Peter Dowd. May I ask why? Kramer is ahead of you on that pitch. He's had Peter Dowd downtown already. And learn? Playboy, used to be in love with Laura Tolliver, now in line to take over Stephen's tidy 20000 a year salary as executive director. To take over Fui. Peter Dowd's no ecologist. He's got more important qualifications. His old man and Laura Tolliver are co-trustees under the Tolliver will, and the director can be anybody they name. Archie, you sound prejudiced against young Mr. Dowd. Yeah, that's what Kramer said. I'm just naturally suspicious of anybody who stood to pick up 20 grand a year, plus a whack at the 90,000 a year in house money, just by throwing three 38 caliber slugs into Stevens. Particularly after getting rid of Mary Dunning to clear the way. The police still have no leads on Miss Dunning? A for effort, Z for results. Now, the way I see it, boss. Was... Leg work now, Archie. Guess it's later. You might try Miss Dunning's landlady again for one, and try Peter Dowd's apartment. Now? Yes. I'd say go along and keep after the missing girl. Instead of sifting through the names in Stephen's appointment book you were asking about? It's two legs of the same animal. The names may help on the girl. Now, Archie, on your way. Come in. Mr. Wall? Yes, come in, Mr. Oliver, Mr. Dowd. Sit down. Yep. It's good of you both to come. Miss Tolliver, I'm profoundly sorry of your loss. You were to marry Mr. Stevens, as I understand it. Yes, three weeks from today. I was trying to warn poor Stevens just as the murderer came in. But he evidently knew his caller well enough to feel no alarm. The uh, police told us that, Mr. Wolfe. We've just come from Inspector Kramer's office. I know, Mr. Dowd. Did you gather the inspector meant to see you again? Why should he? How could anyone think that, well, that, that Peter could have anything to do with this, this horrible business? I see that you have no doubts about Mr. Dowd here, Miss Tolliver. Easy, Laura. Yes, Mr. Wolf, I, I gathered that Kramer was interested in me. He's got a man outside here watching us now. You're alert, Mr. Dowd, or... Or what? Or aware that Inspector Kramer may have grounds for keeping you under surveillance. Look, Mr. Wolf, I didn't come here to be put through the jumps again. First Kramer, and now you. I'm acting for the Tolliver Foundation, Mr. Dowd. I have been since your father retained me last night. Well, why jump on me, then? Young man in my age and weight, the chances of my jumping on anyone are about as likely as, uh, well, as unlikely as to expect that you are not still in love with Miss Laura Tolliver here. Mr. Wolf, we haven't admitted that, that we... Miss Tolliver, Miss Tolliver, your concern a moment ago at the possibility that this young man might be charged with Stephen's murder... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Climb back on me if you want, but let Laura alone. If you're trying to... to make... I'm no longer trying, Mr. Dowd. You both confirmed the point for me. All right. I am still in love with Laura. I think Laura's known ever since she accepted Stephen's ring that, her... well, that their engagement was a mistake. What are you going to make of that? Did Stevens know you hadn't given up on Laura? I told him twice. I even went down to the foundation just... Just when, Mr. Dowd? This morning while I was telephoned Stevens, for example? I... I... I haven't been near the foundation office for days. I, I've... Well, I, I've been out of town. Mr. Wolf, you've no right to twist and turn everything Peter says. I do love him, but I... Laura. Well, that's, that's the first time you've come right out with it since... I'm sorry, Peter. I've wanted to tell you a thousand times. But, well, you kept going away on all those trips, and I never knew whether it was for some other girl or... <clears throat> Mr. Dowd, Miss Tolliver, could this tender exchange be postponed till you two find yourselves alone? Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Ask anything you want, as long as I know it's all right with Laura here. Ronnie spoken, Mr. Dowd. May I ask about Mary? Ma What's Mary Dunning got to do with this? I'm glad you're aware of the Mary I meant. Well, well, I, I've met her at the foundation, of course. 
We've all heard she's missing. You couldn't suggest where she might be. How would Peter know? Let's return to Mr. Stevens. Can either of you explain his three days' absence from the city? I've been out of town myself. Mr. Oliver? He could have been inspecting any one of the research plants. He didn't tell me, if that's what you mean. Stephen said this morning he had been wanting to consult me. You can't suggest why? Well, no, I can't. About foundation business or personal business? Three thirty-eight caliber bullets kept Mr. Stevens from making that clear, Miss Tolliver. Mr. Dowd's father is sending me over some material, but as yet, it's not in my hands. Are you familiar with the personnel at the research stations? There aren't any more than four or five project managers. Halsey in Vermont, Schwartz in Pennsylvania... Excuse me. Near the work? Archie. Yes, Archie. You can take it back about Mary Dunning. If she's a liar, she's just gone to a lot of trouble to make it look good. Dead? No, but knocked out with chloroform and stuffed in a closet in a man's apartment. And uh, guess whose apartment? Spare me your charades, Archie. Peter Dowds. That's where I'm calling from. Is he still with you? As it happens, yes. You better hang on to him. There's been another development. Inspector Kramer's got hold of a man named Schwartz. The Pennsylvania project manager. Right. Schwartz was at the foundation office this morning, and he says Peter Dowd was going in as he came out. When? Within minutes of your call to Stevens. Kramer's on his way to your place now to pick up young Dowd. Any uh, instructions? I'd like more company. Well, the ball game is all wrapped up, isn't it? I'd still like more company. Right. Mary and Schwartz? If you can get them here. And Archie. Yes? Get them here. I'll have that fifth bottle of beer, Archie. Seventh and quarter for the night. And when do you get around to calling in Mary and our friend Schwartz? In a moment, Archie, in a moment. After all that scramble to get him here. I've been studying these project reports that Jonas Dowd sent over. Fascinating field ecology. I know. The factors playing on the development and survival of living organisms. Too bad poor Stevens didn't figure on a factor named Peter Dowd. Archie, I'm ready for Mr. Swartz now. No, Mary? I'll risk you in the next room with Miss Dunning for the time being. Okay. One Schwartz coming up. Oh, come in, Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Wolf? How do you do, Mr. Swartz? My apologies for this long wait you've had. And I'll try to make our business brief. Yes, sir. Mr. Swartz, you managed the Tolliver Agricultural Research Station in Pennsylvania for some time. Two years. I am not sure I didn't once enjoy a shipment of mushrooms that came from your place. You've experimented with Maya Arenaria. Maya Arenaria? Yes, of course. Yes, we've done some work with mushrooms. They were excellent. Uh, by the way, I understand... You saw Mr. Stevens just before he was shot down. If I'd stayed ten minutes longer, he might still be alive. May I ask the purpose of your call? I was delivering the monthly reports. No express of trouble you came to discuss? No, sir. You met Peter Dowd coming in at the foundation as you were going out. How did he look? In a hurry. How so? He just pushed past with his face turned away. You sure it was he? Yes, I had seen him at the foundation maybe two or three times before. Were you aware that Mr. Stevens and Mr. Dowd were both apparently in love with the same young lady? I'm a research worker, Mr. Wolfe. I wouldn't know about Mr. Stevens' personal affairs. Just an hour ago, before Inspector Kramer took him from here, young Dowd admitted that he'd been there today. I didn't think I could be mistaken. But he said only because Stevens had phoned him to come. Were you there when that call was made? No, there was no call to Dowd while I was there. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Swartz. Yes, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Saul Panzer. Yes, Saul, you're still... Yeah, on... still down here at the city market. Looks as if you were right. Indeed? One of their trucks just pulled in with a load of full crates. Top quality produce. I'll try not to wince when you send in the expense sheets. Any other confirmation? Internal revenue records show no taxes paid on income by the Tolliver Foundation. Thank you, Saul. Phone any information as you get it. You'll forgive me again, Mr. Swartz. Archie. Yes, boss? Would you ask Miss Dunning to step in now? Coming up. Come in now, Miss Dunning. Good evening, Miss Dunning. You've quite recovered from the chloroform? Mr. Goodwin's been helping me. He's been rubbing my forehead, and I'm... Spare me to... any further details. Miss Dunning, would you mind telling me again how it was you came to find yourself in Mr. Dowd's apartment? Well... 
It was a phone call that got me to go over. It was a man whispering. He didn't give his name, but he said if I came to that address, apartment 4C, I could learn something about Mr. Stevens. You went to apartment 4C, and then? That's really all I know. Just after the door opened, before I could see him, this coat was thrown over my head, and then he must have given me the chloroform. It was Peter Dowd, of course. Dowd? Who else could it have been? It could have been Mr. Swartz here. Mr. Wolf, you're joking. Am I, Swartz? Joking or drunk? Why should I... Uh... For the ancient reason, Swartz. Money. For the racket you had and wanted to keep. Racket? Mr. Schwartz was in... Schwartz is no more of an ecologist than Mr. Goodwin here. A moment ago, he accepted Myra Arenaria as a mushroom. It happens to be a common clam. Common on nearly any beach. Rare in inland Pennsylvania. Well, Stevens knew I didn't go in for all that Latin stuff. I could understand that you might be useful without it, Swartz. But to get away from your station operations, you faked the scientific knowledge you never had. All right. Suppose I am more of a farmer than a fancy scientist. Our job at the research station is to raise vegetable crops, isn't it? As you worked at Swartz, of course. You turned the agricultural research project into a commercial farm. All expenses met from tax-free funds. And not a cent of return shown for the produce sold. Oh, that's why Saul Panzer drew the rutabagus run. Stephen had the innocence of a specialist interested in his own field only. But even Stevens finally began to get on to those doctored reports of your sports. And when was it the Internal Revenue men began asking questions? Look, Goodwin, is this fat guy out of his mind? You had to get rid of Stevens after the last inspection trip. Were you even counting on taking over his job after Peter Dowd was put away for Stephen's murder? Merely if you'll just explain to this lunatic... Watch it, Archie, watch it. I've got his gun. Droidly done, Archie. Now, wait a minute. This is a thirty-two, and it was a thirty-eight that did the murder. Mr. Wolf, that's my bag. You can't... Take this pistol from it, I have, my dear. In this extraordinary effort you put me to, of actually leaving my chair to secure this weapon, we'll add that to the score against you. Mr. Wolf, if you aren't too Tucker to answer, that gun from Mary's bag. It's a thirty-eight. It may be the one used on Stevens. But Mary couldn't. She didn't. The ballistics tells us that this is the weapon. Then Swartz must have passed it to her for safekeeping. Till it could be planted in young Dowd's apartment or car or whatever. I didn't have anything to do with it. Miss Dunning, you had to do it more than you know. Do you realize that if Mr. Goodwin hadn't found you at the Dowd apartment when he did, that you might not be alive at this moment? You were the one person who knew Swartz's crime. Mary, don't listen to him. She's listening, Swartz. Miss Dunning, you thought the chloroform scheme was directed solely against Peter Dowd. And so you let Swartz talk you into it. Mr. Goodwin tells me the door of that closet was sealed with scotch tape. I didn't know that. Schwartz actually tried... Your chloroform sleep was meant to turn into a permanent one, Miss Dunning. And I was trying to cover for him. All right, here it is. Schwartz planned it all. He did try the hit and run, and he did shoot Stephen. He's a liar. Mary, you've been juggling those books since... Say the details for Inspector Kramer, Schwartz. There's guilt enough to be divided between you and guilt enough to burn you both. You're being noble and not rubbing it in. Don't I merit a full explanation? Archie, I'm concentrating on truffles. Do we dig out a bird, or shall we have them in an omelet again? Mr. Wolf, look, I've got a white flag up, and I'm asking. All right, Mary and Schwartz wanted Stevens out of the way. And all right, they tried to hang it on Peter Dowd. But why'd Mary come here and try to get you into it in the first place? As far as she knew that night, Archie, Stevens wasn't to get back to New York alive. Swartz's hit-and-run ambush in New Jersey was supposed to take care of Stevens on his way back from Pennsylvania. By luck, Stevens survived the accident, and Swartz had to follow him here to finish him off. Yes, but I still don't see why... Mary came here to establish her innocence by pretending to seek her help. Oh. And she thought to keep suspicion from Swartz by creating the imaginary figure of a threatening caller at the office several days before she knew Stevens meant to consult me about Swartz, and she could guess Jonas Dowd would call me in eventually. Well, Stevens said he wanted to consult you that morning when I... That morning when you couldn't hear Stevens out because you were seeing him as Mary Dunning wanted us to see him. 
Oh, a trick operated with two vanishing acts to explain. Stevens's and Mary's. There you have it, Archie. And both fake. A straight business trip branded a run out or a snatch only by Mary's account, and then the chloroform act at Dowd's apartment. You have it in full. Mm Mm-hmm. Except how you knew she was lying to start with. Point one, the girl offered no fee, no prospect of a fee. Mm Mm-hmm. Stay at that. Could anyone claim knowledge of my reputation, Archie, and still seriously expect that I would take an arduous labor for the love of it? (laughs) Oh, Hmm. I'm ashamed of myself. Point two, she told us of a caller coming to see Stevens. Of Stevens asking her to fetch a policeman, then changing his mind. When asked to call a policeman, what woman's curiosity would be satisfied by being told not to bother? (laughs) How utterly brilliant you are. Hmm, Yes. Archie, a bottle of beer. All right. And now back to a serious problem, you know. I think they see a compromise on these troubles. Between bird and omelet? Archie, why not both? Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Charles O'Neill was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Charlotte Lawrence, Howard McNear, Mona Keneally, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Butterfield. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Slaughtered Santa Clauses. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie the manager and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant, Duffy's Tavern. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes? Uh, yes, I know that in 48 hours it's going to be Christmas, but... Who is this? Who? Look, I'm a big boy now, so... Okay. Tonight at 8. Goodbye. What the devil was that? This may come as a shock to you, Mr. Wolf, but that was Santa Claus. You've been drinking? Uh-huh, the usual, Mill. He's coming to see you at 8 got a problem. Indeed. It seems that some low, not to mention murderous character, is going around slaughtering Santa Clauses. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It began earlier than eight, however, the case of the slaughtered Santas. It began, to be precise, on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. The hour was close to six, the weather cold, the sky dark. Uh, how you doing, Santa? Uh, I'm freezing to death, officer. Well, it's a cold day. You packing up? Yeah, I guess so. Not many people around anymore. Oh, heading for home and dinner. How was the collection? Well, I, I don't need no armored car, but... A few dozen kids are going to have something for their Christmas stockings. Your competition, the guy in the opposite corner, is already scrammed. <laughs> Probably got low blood pressure. Well, give me a hand to get the collection part off the chains, eh? Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'll just walk you down the block. Got to phone in. Okay, fine. One Santa's still left. 
Wonder what he's waiting for. <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> Well, watch yourself going down those chimneys tonight, eh? Sure, sure. Well, I'll cut across the avenue here. Be seeing you. Hey, that car coming down the street. Got its lights out. Look out! Hey, Peg. Huh? Did I ever tell you I love you? Oh, it's not me you love. It's a hot soup. Ah, now, you're not the only woman who can cook a dish of soup. Huh? It helps, though. I'm just beginning to thaw out. Yeah, that's a cold corner you play Santa Claus on. Well, don't hurt to make a few bucks. I ain't done so good this past year. Well, maybe the next year it'll be... Oh, well. Besides, I kind of like it, you know. Kids asking questions all day long. Yeah. You know, I wonder how, how they figure the other two Santas at the intersection. Our kids think of only one thing at a time. <laughs> Moises? Sure, Pat. You know, uh, one of them other Santas got hit by a car tonight. Oh? Huh? Yeah, packed up a few minutes before I did, started crossing the avenue, and bang! You know, hit and run driver. Oh, gosh, that's too bad. Was he hurt? Yes, he was killed. <laughs> Here's your soup. Oh, with traffic the way it is nowadays... Well, I better take a look at the stew. Somebody's at the door. I'll get it, Peg. Okay. Yeah, what? Oh, oh, Mike! The wolf? Yes, Archie? I've been thinking. Good heavens. Oh, I admit it won't bring about a national emergency... But, Mr. Wolf, Christmas is only a couple of days away. If you're hinting about your presence... No, no, no. I was just imagining you behind a team of reindeer. Your imagination is morbid. You'd make a wonderful Santa Claus. Oh, yeah. You've got the perfect build for it. Of course, as for character... Archie. Yeah. <laughs> Can you picture me scrambling down a chimney? <laughs> well, they might have to build bigger chimneys, but... Bah. Well, there's that, too. However... That is the front door. True. I was thinking... You might see who it is. Well, if nobody's been lying to me on the phone, that'll be Santa Claus. Maybe me. But I haven't decided what I want for Christmas yet, Mr. Wolf. For example, should she be blonde or brunette, tall or short? Archie. On my way. Good evening. I dislike dawdling on anyone's doorstep. Well, stop dawdling. Come in, please. Mr. Wolf has been warned of my arrival. He has. Through here. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is, uh, Santa Claus? My name is Barton. John Barton. How do you do, sir? I have no time for the social graces, Mr. Wolf. I'm about to be murdered. How do you... In my house, I have objections. I'm a frightened man, Mr. Wolf. Me? This, this costume you see me in is responsible for it all. Why are you in it? I had a notion it might be, well, entertaining to play Santa Claus in public. I'm a wealthy man, sir. I can afford to have whims. Therefore, I have assumed this masquerade. However, it apparently <laughs> is going to be the death of me. Mr. Barden, you have adequately conveyed an atmosphere and an emotion. I suggest you concentrate on facts now. Very well. I have been acting as Santa Claus for the tuberculosis fund. My station is the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle Avenue. I might add the northeast corner. Why? Because at that intersection there have been two other Santa Clauses. One on the southeast corner and one on the southwest corner. Three Santa Clauses, then, on three corners. Yes. Now, then, earlier tonight, the man on the southwest corner started home. He was crossing the avenue when he was run down and killed by an automobile. A regrettable accident. The car was running without lights. It deliberately ran the fellow down and then vanished. Not an accident, Mr. Wolf. You saw this yourself? I did. One Santa Claus dead. The man on the southeast corner got home all right. According to the radio news flash, that's where he was killed. By bullets. Coincidence? Possibly, but I wouldn't want to risk my life on the chance. This is Friday night, and the nature of things, you would have made two more appearances. Very well, Mr. Barton. I'll write you a check as a retainer, then hurry along home. I'm late now. No. I beg your pardon. You will neither hurry home nor notify anyone at your home of your whereabouts. But I... you will remain here until such time as I think it's safe for you to leave. The house is well guarded. I can't do that. In which case, I cannot accept you as a client. I fail to understand. Mr. Barton, it is very easy to murder someone. 
Avoiding the consequences of such an action is something else again. However, I'm assuming that you're not primarily interested in what happens to your murderer after you're dead? Of course not. Therefore, you remain here. Archie? Yep. First, the corner of 34th and Carlisle, a complete report. But that's nonsense. The corner will be deserted Mr. now. Mr. Barton, you're hiring my intelligence. You therefore permit me to use it as I see fit. A complete report, Archie? Right, sir. You will then visit Inspector Crame at headquarters. You will, in whatever manner you find effective, collect all the police information about the two already murdered Santas. Fine. The manner, I think, will be applying a blowtorch to the inspector's toes. Your levity is ill-timed. The inspector is likely to throw me out of my ear. Your problem. My ear. And on your way home, you might stop in at Mr. Barton's place. I don't see any purpose in that. Mr. Barton, there is a basic problem to which we must find an answer. Whether those two men were murdered because they were Santa Clauses or because their deaths were merely preliminaries to yours. Uh, Gee, I suggest haste. Yes, sir. And avoid blondes. Hmm? (laughs) I would like you to be home in time for Christmas. Hey, Pudge. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Got the price of a cup of coffee? <laughs> you sure you mean coffee? Either you're gonna dig it up or you ain't. Never mind the questions about my personal affairs, see? Oh, I apologize. Here. Two bits. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Don't let me keep you. You're not. 34th and Carlisle, huh? During the day filled with milling throngs and... That's a nice phrase. I'll have to remember it. Milling throngs. And now, desolate and deserted. Well, that's life. Is that a fact? That's philosophy. Yeah. Well, but two bits, I don't have to listen to no philosophy, see? Good night, bud. <laughs> The inspector's got company. If all you reporters will shut up and ask your questions one by one, I'll answer. Oh, right. Inspector Kramer, it's true a couple of Santa Clauses have been knocked off tonight? It's true that two men who have been employed as Santa Claus by charitable organizations have been murdered, yes. Any connection between those two guys, or does somebody just hate Santa Claus? You know, so far as we know, there is no connection. That means it could be maybe some kind of maniac who decided he doesn't like Christmas or Santa Claus. Is that right? Uh, the department is investigating along those lines. Like how? Well, we're checking all the local asylums for possible escape lunatics. Yeah, but, Inspector, suppose this nut has never been in an asylum. That'll be all, boys. I said that'll be all. Now, anything new comes in, you'll get it, understand? A good one. Hello, Inspector. Uh, I spotted you coming in. What happened? You decided to reform and got a job on a paper? Nope. I'm a public-spirited citizen, that's all. Yeah, I could add a few things to that description with practically no strain at all. Mr. Wolf and I are very sentimental about Christmas. We object to Santa Claus is being killed. Nuts. Oh, Inspector, aren't you in favor of Christmas? I'm in favor of Christmas. I'm in favor of motherhood. I'm in... Leave motherhood out of this. Neither of us are mothers. Our chances of becoming mothers aren't too good either. And furthermore... Okay, would... okay, you're not given. So get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, Inspector. Uh, but good one. Yeah? In case Wolf decides to send me something for Christmas, you know what I wish he'd send me? What? Your head. <laughs> Well. Oh. Now I know what I want for Christmas. What did you say? I said my name is Goodwin and it's cold on your doorstep. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Come in. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You didn't mention your name. I'm Laura Barton. Mrs. Laura Barton? No. Fine. Fine. That is, what relation are you to John Barton? His niece. Why do you ask? Oh, you've got a beautiful voice. Uh, all this marble and no butler? I don't know where Pleasant is. He should be here. Have him shot at sunrise. Oh, Laura. Wayne, this is Mr. Goodwin. I never heard of him. What does he want? Well, I don't know. Wayne what? Stevens. Uh Uh-huh. Friend of Mr. Barton? Half-brother, but we seem to be doing all the answering. How about your answering some questions, Goodwin? I'll try. Come into the library.
What do you want? For Christmas? Uh, erase that. I would like to see Mr. Barton. He's not home. Where is he? Don't you know? I wouldn't have come here asking for him if I did, would I? I suppose that's true. What did you want with him? Conversation. About? Anything. You see, I like to talk to rich men. Are you rich? <laughs> I can't play the piano either. You could always learn. But being rich is harder, I found Mr. it. Mr. Mr. Goodwin, you must have some reason for coming here. Some reason concerning Uncle. Laura, you're being imaginative. Well, Uncle is late. He's probably still on that street corner playing Santa Claus. He enjoys it. Why bother about I what... I don't know, except... He's never been as late as this? Well, no. Not since he started that masquerade of his. Would you happen to know where the butler is? Out getting drunk, I suspect. He was in the kitchen a little while ago. Disappeared. Pleasant likes to look on the wine when it's red. Or even when it's rye. Uh, no, I take that back. Oh, you do? He prefers Irish whiskey. We don't stock it. Therefore, no, um... too bad. I better run along. Good night, Mr. Stevens. Miss Barton. Good night. Uh, I'll see you out. Prettiest butler I ever saw. Blonde. Now, old Dr. Tidmouse always said, beware of blondes because... Mr. Goodwin, I... Well, I'm waiting. Well, I... Mr. Goodwin, you must know something about Uncle. Something you didn't want to tell us. Makes you think so. Well, otherwise, your visit was just pointless. Let's suppose I know. Now, I might be a kidnapper. Oh, no. My honest brown eyes. Your first name is Archie, isn't it? Archie? Archie Goodwin. Hmm. Goes together nicely, don't you think? You work for Nero Wolf. You're going back to him now? I might be, but then again, I might be going to the movies. I recognized you. Your pictures have been in the papers. Take me with you to see Mr. Wolf. You can trust me. I never trust blondes. Oh, that's unfair. Well, no, I don't trust brunettes either. Furthermore, I'm not sure Mr. Wolf would want to see you, so I... Uh... So? So why don't you, uh, trail me home, hmm? <laughs> Archie? Archie? Where's Santa Claus? Guest room. He was tired. What, uh... I've been trailed home. Me? By a blonde. Phooey. All right, I admit I didn't make any strenuous effort to shake her off, but she trailed... Where is she? Outside. Good. Your report. Oh, but she might freeze to death out there. That's her problem. Your report, Archie. It's short and simple. It would be simple. I haven't got time to resent that. A blonde is dying. As for the report... Corner of 34th and Carlisle is a very quiet spot at night. No one was around, but a bum who got into me for a quarter. For coffee, he said. You will not put that quarter on the expense account. Stop worrying. That was a private gesture. There were four corners. Corner number one had a dress shop on it. Corner number two, a drugstore with a beautiful redhead in the window, making with a hair rinse. The ad said her name was Noreen, but it didn't give her phone number. Ah, gee. <clears throat> Third corner was devoted to a shoe store, and the fourth corner had a bank on it. A bank? Mm. Uh -huh. Kind of thought we'd have a pause at that point. Mean something? Inspector Kramer's information consisted oh, of... Oh, you're being coy. Kramer furnished the information the police could find no connection between the two murdered Santas. Except for the fact that they were both playing Santa Claus. Well, isn't that a little on the obvious side? This is an obvious case. The Barton home, Archie. Uh, marble and old lace. A butler, his name is Pleasant, was among those missing. Among those present, Laura Barton, the old man's niece, and Wayne Stevens, his half-brother. Ah. Yeah, only for Laura. Stevens was not at all pretty. It was Laura Barton who followed you here. It was Laura. Archie, uh, go upstairs mm -hmm. and... Oh, now, wait a minute. The girl, the weather, common humanity demands that you have... Louis, you speak for yourself, not humanity. I'm human. On occasion, a debatable point. Very well. Let her in. Oh, thanks. Laura, yes. come in. Laura Barton, Mr. Wolf. How do you do? How much money do you inherit on the death of your uncle? Uh, what? That is known as the shock treatment. However, I need an answer. Uh, uncle isn't dead, is he? That, for the moment, is irrelevant. How much? Half his estate. The other half? Wayne, uncle's half-brother. Very well. Archie, will you go upstairs and inform Mr. Barton that his niece is here? Uncle is... 
Here? On my way. Yes? Archie, Mr. Barton. Come in. Mr. Wolf would like you to come downstairs. I suppose he has a reason. Mm Mm-hmm. A blonde reason, your niece. My niece? That's right. She just... Hey, where'd you get that? A man of my wealth finds it safer to carry a revolver. Yeah, but it's not safe to point it at people, especially for the people. Turn around, Goodwin. But, Mr. Barton, we're protecting you. By letting that girl into the house? If I had the time, I'd be amused. As it is! <laughs> Heaven. Uh huh. Santa Claus came early. Go ahead. Which one are you referring to? My own or the one Santa gave me? You had better sit. Nope. No, I had enough trouble getting up a little while ago. I'm staying out of any positions in which I might have to do that again. Mr. Barton is among the missing. Indeed. Mm hmm. Hit me on the head and use the back exit. I checked with Fritz in the kitchen on the way here. He offered a reason for his peculiar behavior? Laura Barton. So? I. I don't understand. Uncle wouldn't do... Uncle apparently has. He also, would appear, fancies himself in costume. Well, he used to be very much interested in the stage. He, he acted for a while, a long time ago, till the family objected to... Archie? Got it. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You recite very nicely, Goodwin. This is Kramer. Let me have Wolf, huh? Mr. Wolf? Inspector Kramer. Yes, Inspector? The papers haven't been carrying it, Wolf, but uh, you're working on the Santa Claus case, aren't you? Possibility? You didn't send Goodwin down to headquarters on a possibility. Uh, Never mind. We're working on a line down here, Wolf. Now, look, uh, if it doesn't strain your professional ethics, you might be able to help. How? There's a bank on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. We got the thought that suppose a gang was preparing to take that bank tomorrow morning. Those Santa Clauses have been on the corner for nearly a week now. They might have noticed something about the bank's routine, guards or what have you, that could interfere with the gang's plan. A mighty ingenious and imaginative thought, Inspector. Hey, you didn't say yes or no. I have at the moment no opinion. That's all you're going to give us? At the moment. However, Inspector, in a very little while I shall give you, uh, (laughs) the murderer. Archie, Miss Parton will remain here. As for you... Yeah, you return to 34th Street and find our coffee-loving friend. Hmm? You will persuade him in whatever manner you think best to return here with you. Huh? Yes. <laughs> you know, I think it's possible you may be able to put that quarter on the expense account after all. You... What? Oh, why? I've seen you before. Yeah, I've learned to love the neighborhood. That's why it's going to break my heart. What is? Leaving it with you. With... It's sensitive about having guns pulled on me tonight. Let go of me, will you? Not until I... 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 Yeah. The gun looks in a lot better shape than you do. You're coming with me. Oh, where? Mr. Wolf would like to see you. Nero Wolf? Yeah. Well, Why? He's trying to salvage a quarter. Ah, Archie. Uh huh. Complete with the. Uh, he wouldn't give his name. He did have a gun to it, though. This one. Yes. Archie, you know Miss Barton, of course? Hi. And Mr. Stevens? He joined us a moment ago. Miss Barton thought she'd be happy if he were here. Hello, Stevens. That's not the only reason I came. My brother is still missing. I'm concerned. Yes. You, sir, will you sit down? Watching people stand makes me uncomfortable. I don't have to. You do. Archie is stronger than you are. Mm, All right. Ah, That's better. If you don't mind, Mr. Wolf, I've never been here before, never met you. But you look as though you could handle things. I think my brother's been kidnapped. Possibility we shall have to consider. Miss Barton, perhaps you have a theory, too? 
Well, I don't know. Uncle's been behaving strangely for weeks now. In what way? Well, I'm not sure. Wayne... Well, of course, John's always been a little peculiar, but I'm afraid I saw nothing especially strange, outside of this Santa Claus stunt, of course. I see. Miss Barton, your uncle played Santa Claus all week on one of the corners of 34th Street in Carlisle. I know. On two other corners, two other men indulged in the same activity. Those two other men are now dead. Oh, no. uh, Wait. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you mean they were killed by mistake for Barton? It is true that one man made up of Santa Claus looks very much like any other man similarly costume. But the answer is no. One of the two men was shot in his home after he had removed his costume. Well, then, what connection? Miss Barton, in the event that you wanted to hide a tree, where would you hide it? Hide a tree? Why, I, I wouldn't even begin to know. If you were very clever, you would hide it in a forest. If you wanted to hide a murder and were very clever, you would adopt the same principle. Wait, you mean that if someone wanted to kill Uncle and didn't want to be suspected... He'd go about murdering several people with an ostensible, if lunatic, reason. He would let us say go about killing Santa Clauses. I get it. Then people would think the man he really wanted dead for a special and private reason had been killed for something that didn't point to him. True. That was why two Santa Clauses were murdered tonight. The third Santa Claus, however, the real object of the murderer's attention was luckier or suspicious. He fled. Ah, uh, do I have to hang around here and listen to all this? You do, my unwashed friend. Mr. Barton fled, and the murderer was in a quandary. He had, so to speak, invested in two murders merely to make the third one confusing. But he found himself unable to commit that third murder. He couldn't find his victim. Could he ask the police to do so? Hardly. But he might try to inveigle a private detective such as myself into the job. Uh, that makes sense, Mr. Wolf. But uh, why would my brother have deliberately fled from your house? Uh, I, I mean, he was protected here, so... But do I make myself clear? Very clear, Mr. Stevens. Archie, that gun you took from that dirty gentleman, you still have it? I still have it. Then would you mind pointing it at Mr. Stevens here until the police remove him? <laughs> Right, come along, Stevens. Well, that's the end of Mr. Stevens. Inspector Kramer will take good care of him from now on. But now, Mr. Wolf, Laura and me and the refugee from a washcloth over here would still like to know how and why and who was involved. I knew two people had a motive for John Barton's death. Laura Barton and Wayne Stevens. One of them proceeded to kill Santa Clauses in the hope that the police would assume those killings to be the work of a lunatic. The paper certainly hopped on that assumption. Yes. However, John Barton, aware that his life was in danger, escaped his murderer and hid. In this house? No. A man in Santa Claus costume came here and said he was Barton. However, he was an obvious imposter. He proved that by his flight when his niece came here. You mean he could fool you, but he knew he wouldn't be able to fool me, so... Precisely, therefore, was not Barton. Who was it? Who else had disappeared at the propitious moment? The butler, Pleasant. True. I distrust coincidence. Stevens needed an accomplice, hence he sent Pleasant here. And Pleasant would give you a song and dance about Barton's danger and then scram. You'd start investigating, discover Barton was missing, try to find him, and lead Stevens to his victim, huh? I frustrated that part of the plan by insisting on Pleasant's remaining here, which he did until... That part of it's fine. But how did you choose between Laura and Stevens? It was Stevens who knew, without being told, that Barton had been in this house and had fled from it. Yeah, yeah, you yourself mentioned that Stevens had only been here a moment, so you hadn't told him. Obviously, the butler phoned him as soon as he had hit you over the head and escaped. Furthermore, the butler masquerading as Barton had attempted to throw suspicion on Miss Barton. That convinced me of her innocence. Well, you've done it again, Mr. Wolf, except for one minor detail. You are not very successful at irony, Archie. What minor detail? Where is Barton? In this house. Huh? When did that happen? You arrived home with the gentleman sitting near you. The bum? The... Wait, wait a minute. This I ought to be able to figure out myself. Laura said Barton used to be an actor. That's item one, huh? Yes, Archie. 
Also, why is a supposed tramp hanging around a deserted intersection for handouts? The answer is he wasn't. He was keeping an eye out for trouble he knew was after him. (laughs) Oh, so it turns out I gave a quarter to a millionaire. Uncle, your uncle. That is, I... I know, my dear, yes, I'm uncle. I did a rather decent job, didn't I? No one recognized me. Uh, except, of course, you, Mr. Wolf. Not recognition, Mr. Barton. Logic. Archie, open some beer for us. Yes, sir. Logic, eh? Well, whatever it was, Mr. Wolf, I owe you a good deal. How can I ever repay you? Oddly enough, the answer is simplicity itself. <laughs> Make out a check. I've been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Howard McNear, Grace Lennard, Vic Rodman, Herbert Butterfield, Bill Johnstone, Gene Bates, and Bob Bruce. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Bashful Body. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. The chimes are all set to wish you a happy new year this Sunday with a gala broadcast of The Big Show. The unpredictable Tallulah will emcee with a host of leading stars of stage, screen, and radio, including Ken Murray, Gloria Swanson, Margaret O'Brien, Jose Ferrer, and many more. And there's a carnival of fun with Theater Guild on the air also this Sunday when the sparkling Lockhart family, Jean, Kathleen, and daughter June, Co-star with Van Heflin in Theater Guild's presentation of the exciting story, State Fair. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Near Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, I see. Oh, and you think Mr. Wolf might be interested in going over and... Hold on a minute. Archie, I'm not interested in going anywhere. Ill-considered movement is the curse of our times. Not to mention the mania for fresh air. Phew. Bottle opener, if you please. Here you are. But that was Zabro's flower shop, Mr. Wolf. Indeed. Got a new shipment of orchids from upstate. In that case... Mr. Wolf, remember the curse of our times? Not to mention the mania of... I'll be there. <laughs> He'll be there. After all, a man must risk his life sometimes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chairborn genius, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Orchids don't grow up overnight. They have to be carefully planted, tended, watered, and watched. And the same thing goes for murder. Take Zabro's flower shop minutes after we got that phone call. Zabro! Uh, oh, Mr. Hansen, I did not notice you are here. I'm here, and what's more... You, you like the, the way I display your orchids, hmm? I don't like the way you've been avoiding meeting your obligations. Please, please, it is better not to shout. It would be still better if you paid me what you owe me. Mr. Hansen, uh, business has not been so good. I will pay. You'd better. I, I intend to... My lawyers aren't going to be satisfied by intentions. You, 
You're lawyers. I've no particular desire to own a flower shop, but it looks as if I'm going to. Unless you raise some money. <laughs> Mr. Hansen, I have worked years. I have given of my blood to make a success of this establishment. You cannot take him from me. You are a rich man. I intend to stay rich, too. You've got 24 hours, Abro. A man can accomplish a lot in 24 hours. Yes, Mr. Hansen. Even maybe murder. <laughs> Mr. Zabro? Hmm? Oh, good afternoon, Miss Hansen. Is Uncle here? Yes, he is here. At the display, towards the back of the store. Oh, thanks. How is he? Oh, I, I mean... He is the way he always is. Hard, vindictive. Mr. Zabro. I am sorry. Excuse me now. Hmm. Uncle? What is it, Enid? I, um... Have you seen my display? The lilies? Uh-huh. Yes. Pretty. Oh, thank you. Uh, it... He's not here. Well, I didn't say... You didn't have to. John Arndt is not here. Why he is not here, I don't know. His job was to look after my display. Perhaps he doesn't need a job anymore. You know he does. Fiddlesticks. After all, if he marries my heiress... Uncle! My dear girl, John Arndt is a fairly capable man with orchids. Outside of that, I have no use for him whatsoever. Especially in the role of your husband. Isn't that for me to decide? Of course it is, except that, pretty as you are, John Arndt is seeing you through a golden haze. To be precise, the money that will come to you from me when I die. That's nasty. It's the truth. Oh, you can't know that. <laughs> I'm going to find out. What? I saw my lawyers this morning. Among other things, I instructed them to draw up a codicil to my will. A codicil to the effect that all my money goes to you on one condition. Oh, you couldn't. I did. Condition was that you refrain from marrying John Arndt, either now or at any time in the future. Well, that's not fair. It's a very good way of discouraging Mr. Arndt. What'll you bet his ardor cools off quickly, hmm? You... you told him? Yes. Probably why he hasn't appeared as yet. He's sulking. You really sign that... that codicil? I will, as soon as the papers are drawn up. Where are you going? I don't know. I've got to get away someplace and think. Very well. Think about forgetting John Arndt. Best thing in the world for you. Uncle, do you really think you can manage other people's lives for them? I don't see why not. No? Well, people don't like to be managed. They get desperate sometimes. And sometimes they kill. Uh, Mr. Wolf, what are you doing? Getting up. Mm. I'm a... Well... That makes you eligible for the Explorers Club or something. Ah, my coat and muffler, Archie. I got them here. Thank you. You're really going out into that... that weather outside? Archie, must you try to be witty? It amuses me no end. Haven't you seen enough of those weeds yet? An orchid is not a weed. A another muffler, Archie, the woolen one. You've already got two on. Please, fresh air clogs the lungs, Archie. <laughs> sure, everybody knows that, but they won't admit it. Of course not. The conspiracy of silence. Archie, I'm ready. You sure? I can see a square inch of skin showing. Tom, you're driving me to Zabra. Mm-hmm. All right, careful. And take a deep breath. I'm going to open the door. You ready? Yeah, very well. Open it. <laughs> Be brave, Mr. Wolf. We'll keep the car window shut, and maybe you'll make it. Mm -hmm. uh, careful. The risks one takes. Uh. In you go. Uh, uh, oh. Mm. Yeah. Well. Okay, boss. Now, where is Zabros? 45th Street. Gee. <laughs> Ten blocks. Grit your teeth, Mr. Wolf. We're off. <laughs> I'm glad you are here. Those orchids you wrote me about had better be worth a trip. The trip? But I think you live only a little way from here. Don't forget it had to be made in the open air, Mr. Zabro. Where are the orchids? Uh, towards the back. They are from Hansen's place. He is a fine grower. I have made an exhibit. Good. Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, others are here. You go look for yourself, no? 
Very well. Archie. Hmm? Oh, uh, I, I was just noticing the... Uh, the uh, did a girl just enter the store? A girl, a goddess, tall, graceful, Venus de Milo with arms. Arms that were made... Never mind, let's go look at orchids. Thank you. Mmm, very fine. The exhibit is laid out like nature, huh? Reminds me of a spot in Central Park that I spent some of my happiest moments in. Then you do like flowers. I don't go to Central Park to look at flowers. I went there to, uh, forget it. Gladly. Now go away and annoy someone else. Venus? I want to concentrate on these orchids. Goodbye. Okay. I'll leave you alone with your loved ones. Let's see, maybe I can arrange to be left alone with something I could very easily learn to love. Hey, boss. Don't bother me, Archie. Oh, this is serious. There's a lily display just like this one over at the other end of the store. Nothing connected with lilies could possibly be serious. Maybe not, but there's a corpse planted among these lilies. Indeed? A lot of ferns were banked up in back of the display. I saw a foot sticking out, so I slipped back, lifted a few ferns, and found a body. Fresh? Very. The wound was still bleeding. Knife wound. Sad, very. Now run along. Well, aren't you going to do anything about it? Why should I? Anyone who'd permit himself to be found dead or alive among a display of lilies is beneath contempt. Well, maybe the poor guy didn't have a chance to crawl into an orchid display before he died. However, if that's the way you feel, I'll tell the police all about poor Mr. Hansen and let Who? them... Who? Hansen, the orchid grower. He's one of the finest in the country. Not is. Was. Wasn't me who pushed him under the lilies. And the lilies, bah, he would have hated that. Have you told Zabro? No, no, Zabro's been busy up front. Uh, where is this display? Ah, right along here. There's been a number of people in the store since we came. Someone else may have noticed that dead man's foot. Uh-uh, I covered it. Satisfactory. At times you give the illusions of intelligence. Is this the display? Yep. Come around to the back. There's a little space between the back of the display and the wall. Uh, oh. oh. Yeah, yeah. Now, here, right under this pile of ferns... Of ferns? Yes, Sergeant? Hey, that body. What about it? It got bashful. It's gone. Indeed. The corpse was dead. Corpse is off now. Confound you, Archie. Have you been drinking too much milk again? Now, look, boss. I saw him there. The blood's still coming out of his back. And I tell you that... Let me understand you. Are you suggesting the corpse rose and walked away? No, but somebody could have dragged it away. Somebody who put it here in the first place. Pictures, no doubt. Come along, Archie. If this is some half-witted trick to distract me from the orchid... Oh, no, no. I never come between a man and his love. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Yes? Do ferns bleed? Ah, let me see. Oh. Indeed. Yes, there is blood, fresh arterial blood on these ferns, bright red color, which means there was a wounded person among these lilies recently. Thanks for the late vote of confidence. Hmm. Whoever killed Hanson apparently found a better place for him. Mm -hmm. Took him home to put him over the mantelpiece. Unlikely Hanson wasn't very decorative. Okay. Now shall for the police... You have nothing to show them except a fern leaf covered with blood? No. Don't tell me you smell a fee among all these flowers. Hanson was a man I admired. Good heavens, Archie. The number of first-rate orchid growers is small enough without one of us being murdered. Mm-hmm. Unsportsmanlike, huh? Okay, we won't stand for it. What next? The body was removed from the building. How? Well, I wouldn't swear to it, but... There's a window here that leads out to an alleyway. Could the alleyway be seen from the street? I don't think so. There's a bend in it. Wide enough for a car? Yep. Bring Zabu to me. Oh, don't bother. He's coming himself. Well, Mr. Wolf, what do you think of the... Mr. Wolf, I do not believe this. What don't you believe? You are looking at lilies. Not exactly. Whose flowers are these? Uh, Mr. Hansen's niece grows lilies. I see. Sabro, did you get all your orchids from Hanson? Oh, yes, yes. He is an artist. Practically an old master at the moment. How much money do you owe him? Who, who tell you I owe him? I... You do, don't you? Well, yes. Business has not been so good. But did he speak to you? 
No, I guess you owed him money. But I do not understand. Was Hanson in the store today? Yes, yes, he came. You hear us quarrel, eh? Where is he now? Oh, I do not know. He he leave, maybe. I rather think he did. Zabra, who else was in the store within the last half hour who might have known Hanson? Oh, Miss Hanson was here and uh, uh, John Arndt. He is Mr. Hanson's assistant and, how you say, uh, sweet on uh, Miss Hanson. Was she the tall girl came in shortly after we did, Mr. Zabra? Tall? Yes, yes, I think so. Are either of them still here? No, no, no. They go. Together? Uh, Miss Hanson go first. Very well. Come along, Archie. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Uh, you will not tell Mr. Hanson you know... Uh, you know of my debts. Uh, no, Mr. Zabro, I won't tell him. As a matter of fact, even if I wanted to, I don't think he would listen. I love these long drives in the country. Where are we going? Hanson's place. Oh. You think he returned to it to haunt it, huh? He was returned there, I suspect. Uh-huh. In order to cast suspicion on himself. Miss Hanson lives with him. Mr. Arndt works for him on the premises, therefore... Miss Hanson will be there? I imagine so. Why? Oh, well, nothing. Nothing at all. Boss, can we stop at the next town? Why? I want to buy a book on lilies. This sudden... In... <laughs> you mean Miss Hanson grows them in there? Uh-huh. You see, that way we'll have something in common. Perhaps, but Archie, is an interest in fires what you want to have in common with her? (laughs) (laughs) So this is the house that Orchid's built, huh? Snazzy. Very handsome country home. For streamlined zombies, I... Hello. I take that back. Miss Hanson? Yes. I'm Nero Wolf. The person ogling you is my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Oh. Well, Uncle's spoken of you, Mr. Wolf. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. I was not ogling. I was merely tracing a resemblance. Oh, between Uncle and me? Between you and my heart's desire. Archie, stop being poetic. It doesn't become me. In here, please. My uncle isn't at home yet, but... Oh, John, this is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodwin. John is Uncle's assistant. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Hanson hasn't returned from town yet, Mr. Wolf. Are you quite sure? Why, yes. Unless Enid saw him. Oh, no, I didn't, John. Indeed. In that case, if you don't mind, we'll wait for him. Well, of course. We'd be delighted. Sure. Uh, Excuse me, won't you? I've got some work to do. On orchids or uh, lilies? The orchids. Well, then go right ahead. See you later. Oh, well, can I get you something to drink? Beer will do. Thank you. I'd better help you bring the bottle in, Miss... uh, Archie. On the other hand, maybe you can manage alone. Well, of course I can. I'm a big girl, Mr. Goodwin. I noticed. I mean, uh, uh, why not uh, Why not call me Archie? It takes less time. Mm, I'd like to, Archie. Swell. Remember what old Dr. Tidmouse said? I want a bottle of beer. He said, I want a bottle of... Oh. <laughs> no, never mind, Enid. You better uh, go gather some beer for Mr. Wolf. All right. I'll be back in a minute. Mmm, so much of her and all so nice. Archie, are you forgetting why we are here? I don't care why you're here. Me, I... We are waiting for Uncle. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Wolf, it's unlikely that Uncle is going to walk in through that front door. True. That is why you're sneaking out the back door to find him. How do you know he'll be around here? This is where he lives, isn't it, Archie? Yes, but if you'll remember, Uncle gave up living earlier this afternoon. You mean he was persuaded to? Nevertheless, I rather think he'll be around, body and all. He wasn't in the house, so I tried the conservatory, hothouse, what have you. It was hot in that steam-heated orchid paradise. Also, it was full of orchids. Unfortunately, it wasn't full of Miss Hanson. I wandered hither and yon for a moment, dreaming of her, until I noticed a foot... Same foot I'd seen back at Zabro's, and peculiarly enough, the same corpse was attached to it. Uncle's. I was bending over to take a closer look when I felt a thud. 
realize that thud was the sound of something hitting my head, and I began to realize, too, that I'd been knocked almost unconscious, which the second blow did. I can't understand where my uncle is, Mr. Wolf. He's staying away so late is unusual, then. Of course it is. Which reminds me, Archie's been gone for several hours. Yeah, where did he go, Mr. Wolf? To look about. Were you in the hothouse, Mr. Hunt? No, I was packing some plants. You, Miss Hanson? Well, after I brought your beer, I went upstairs and rested for a while. Why? Because if either of you harmed Archie, I shall personally murder you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. <clears throat> Come on, we've got to find the boy. Why should either of us want to harm him? Because he probably found your uncle's body. His body? Huh? What are you... I don't understand. Mr. Hanson has been murdered. Oh, oh no. Enid, Enid. Oh, stop there, Miss Hanson. You're a perfectly healthy young woman. There's no reason for you to swoon. Now, look here, you. Besides, I rather suspect she lost no love for him. Am I right, Miss Hanson? He, he was my uncle. You're aware of the fact? He opposed your marriage to Miss Aunt here. Yeah? That's none of your business. Which means he did oppose it. Mr. Hart, Mr. Hanson was a friend of mine. I intend to find the murderer after I find his body. It shows a lack of proper respect to transport a corpse about the countryside. Come, both of you, we must find Archie. This whole thing's like a nightmare. So if you can't wake up from it, let's go on with the search. <gasps> Oh, look, there on the ground. Archie. I'll, I'll see if he's all right. Why, this is fantastic. Mr. Hanson stabbed to death, and now Goodwin. He's oh. just been stunned, thank heavens. Oh. He's, he's coming to. Oh, I died. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm dead. Archie. Archie, speak to me. Oh, I went to heaven. Are you all right, Archie? Uh-oh, the other place. Ah, get up. Sure, if somebody will hold my head. Oh, this... <sighs> Are we having an earthquake? You poor boy. Take my arm here. Mm, I'll take both. Boy, he's normal. What happened, Archie? Somebody hit me when I wasn't looking. Yeah? Why? I don't know. Oh, yes, I remember. Yes? I found Uncle lying right there. Right there. The poor boy's delirious. Don't tell me he's gone again. I'm afraid he has, Archie. Are you sure you saw him? I'm positive, and then somebody slugged me. That corpse is the shyest one I've ever met. Blood would have dried. There'll be no signs of his having been placed here. Bad. Why? Your testimony would be valueless, especially since you were found unconscious. The jury would suspect you of having hit the bottle. <laughs> Why didn't we stay the night? I'm a sick man. Enid would have nursed me. Ah, you're not sick. And I won't have you taking advantage of that girl. In my condition, I couldn't have. But maybe she would have taken advantage of me. Fooey. Is that what they call it in your day? The Zabro. Stop the car. Okay. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> No, I can manage. Don't. I'm not entirely helpless. Yeah. Place is closed. Dark. I was afraid it might be. Don't tell me Zabro's gone traveling, too. Possibility, Archie. You mean he killed Hanson to cancel the dead he owed him and then followed us out to the country house and dumped Hanson there hoping to, to pin suspicion on Eden and John? Perhaps. Uh-huh. Slugged me when I found the body too soon, and then... Uh-huh. Guess we'd better get into the joint. Door's locked. Um, a guy I know got out of jail the other day. Yeah? Uh, he's reformed, so he gave me all his skeleton keys. You have them with you? Mm-hmm. And we'll find out in a minute just how good a burglar he was. Mmm, very good. Will you come in? Shut the door. Okay. Now... Uh... What's that? Somebody's been hurt. The lights. Nothing up front here. Shh. Back of the store where the exhibits are. I'll go see. Maybe you better stay here. Nonsense. Now, where... 
Uh oh, among the lilies again, but this time there are two bodies there. Uh, Sabro. Quick, Archie. Mr. Sabro? Uh, Mr. Zop? He's been shot, boss. Bad. I. I. He's trying to say something. He. In the lilies. Mr. Mr. Hansen. Yes, yes, we know about him. Who shot you? From the window. Alleyway. Came in. Mr. Zabro, who? He inherit money. Inherit. Down, Mr. Wolf, quick. Somebody's shooting from that window. Archie. All in one piece. Are you all right? Yes, that car. It's gone. Brought the body here and... Zabra. He couldn't duck. He's dead. Yes. Police boss, this time we've got more than a fern leaf smeared with blood to show them. Not yet, Archie. I prefer handing the murderer over to them along with the victims. I'm going home. Archie, get Miss Hanson and Mr. Arn there as soon as you can. Well, suppose they don't want to come. Knock them unconscious and drag them there. Not Enid, boss. Enid's... Hey... What Zabro said about inheriting. Don't anticipate, Archie. When you get them to my office, we'll identify the murderer then. Mr. Wolf, don't you think this is all a little high-handed, dragging us here in the middle of the night? Murder is even more high-handed, Mr. Arndt. Please, John. Miss Hanson, do you inherit? Well, well I guess so. I'm, I'm Uncle's only relative, so I suppose... Wait a minute, Enid. Mr. Wolf, are you suggesting that she had anything to do with this invisible corpse? The corpse is no longer invisible, Mr. Arndt. You... Oh, you've seen, Uncle? Yes, dead, in Zabra's establishment. Lying with a knife in his back, in his own orchid display. Now you're trying to pin something on me. You know I set up that orchid display. Indeed. The police will be interested in that information. But he wasn't found in the orchids. He was... Yes, Mr. Arndt. He was found where? I... I don't know. You were about to say the lily display, weren't you? I wasn't going to say anything. You're a little late. You already informed us that you knew his body was not placed in the orchid display. How did you know? I... I, I just guessed. The jury will be very much impressed by your remarkable clairvoyance. Especially since, uh... Archie, ask Mr. Zabro to come in. Mr. Zabro? Okay. Don't bother, Goodwin. John, that gun. Shut up, you little fool. I mean, it's a big girl. I don't know how you tumbled, Wolf. Lucky guessing, maybe. Oh, come now. Neither of us has indulged in guesswork. You killed Hanson, placed his body in the lily display to attract suspicion towards Miss Hanson. You felt sure she wouldn't be convicted, so you were safe. She would inherit, you would marry her, a marriage which your uncle opposed. When you saw that Archie had discovered the body too early for you to establish an alibi for yourself... Then he sneaked the body out of the window into his car and then dumped it in the hothouse. For time. Go on, Mr. Wolf. He didn't intend it to be discovered there, which was why he knocked you unconscious, Archie. Oh, I'm so glad he had a good reason for it. He had a body on his hands. He decided to double back, put the body in its original place, and carry through his plan. But Zabro caught him at it, poor fellow. I thought Zabro was in the other room. Last you, you fool. Do you think I, too, am addicted to carrying corpses about? Zabro is dead. And you've given yourself away unnecessarily. Archie? All right. Archie, quick. Let, 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 let go, Edith. I've got his arm. I'll give him mine with a fist attached. Oh. Very satisfactory, Archie. Now call the police. Inform them you have two corpses and a murderer for them. You should have heard Mr. Arndt's language, boss, when the police took him away. Oh, I don't think he loves you. I don't think it matters anymore. It used to, to me. Growing pains. You'll get over it, Miss Hanson. Uh, you trapped him, Mr. Wolf, but what made you so sure he did it? At the hot house, when you were unconscious, Archie, Mr. Arndt deplored the fact that Mr. Hanson had been stabbed in the back. And no one had mentioned how he was killed. Therefore... The reason Arndt knew was because he himself had killed Mr. Hanson. Hmm. Murderers seldom get away with it, no matter how tightly they button their lips. Hmm. Well, mine, however, are not buttoned up. Archie? Oh, the beer is on your desk. Thank you. Miss Hanson, stop brooding. Try some of this beer. 
Mr. Wolf, my my heart's broken. As a man who's lived a good many years, Miss Hanson, permit me to assure you that the easiest way of mending a broken heart is by filling the stomach. <laughs> ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, Jay Novello, Herb Butterfield, and Byron Kane. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Deadly Sellout. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Friday means another visit with that entertaining eating establishment, Duffy's Tavern. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You're up. And you've lost your... Oh. Archie, the answer is no. Hold on a second. The answer to what is no, Mr. Wolf? I shall not attempt to find a blonde for anyone. You've got the man on the phone a little wrong, Mr. Wolf. He's not looking for a blonde. He's looking for a prize fighter. <laughs> Indeed. Have him come here. Okay. Mr. Wolf will see you at eight. So long. I was all set to argue with you about taking the case. You, you gave in too fast. Nonsense. I'm fascinated by the thought of anyone misplacing a prize fighter. They're usually quite large, aren't they? They are. But what this guy is worried about is not only finding his boy, but finding him alive. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Case of the Deadly Sellout. That's what my boss, Nero Wolf, called it. And it almost meant curtains for the firm of Wolf and Goodwin. But let me give it to you straight right from the beginning. Although you ought to know that it wasn't until it was all over that I knew the very beginning of it myself. It all started in the New York flat of one Brock Rainey. Yes? My name is Jerry Fay. I'm supposed to know you? Being a very good friend of Pepe Gatto's, it's time you got to know me. May I come in? Oh, sure. You've got a problem, Miss Fay? Debbie took a fall at the garden last night against a coffee and bum named Eubanks, right? As far as I know, Sister Gatto met his match. Please, Mr. Rainey, do me a favor. Skip the sausage meat. It happens I saw the 1200 bucks you counted out to him to take a quick dive in the first. Mm, you did. How else would I know? Okay, then here's my wrist. Slap it, Miss Fay. I'm a bad boy. Now, look, who's kidding who? I don't care if Peppy makes himself a few deals on the side. I should worry whether he gives those meat eaters on the benches a run for the ducats. What's it to me? If you're not worried, Sugar Plum, then neither am I. Also, I'm a very busy man. Not too busy to pay off, I hope. Pay off? To who? To me. For what? For keeping it to myself that you collected five grand from the Eubanks crowd for getting Peppy to take that dive. Certain people might not like to hear it. Miss Fay. Yeah? Drop dead. I don't think we understand each other. Which is just as well. Now get out of here. There's something Blow, else. bimbo. Okay, Mr. Rainey. Have it your way. I'll go find someone with a more sympathetic ear. Someone like Lawson. Arnold F. Lawson. 
So long. Wait. Where does Lawson come into this? You asking a Stalin. Lawson dropped a sizable piece of change on last night's two-step. No. Close the door, Jerry. Oh, yeah. $25,000 to be exact. That's a lot of corn to lose because a cheap fight manager arranges a frame. At least Arnold Lawson might think so. Sit down. Who's tired? Look, Mr. Rainey, it goes very simply in only one way. Lawson at yet knows from nothing except that your boy Gatto lost the fight. He may suspect, but he don't know. And he really don't have to know. Glad to hear you say that. And I'll be glad to see the shade of 3,000 long green banknotes. How much? You heard me, three grand. Get out. Okay, I'm going. To the next phone and call Lawson. Look, Jerry, give me time, huh? I haven't got that kind of dough right now. I Tell don't... it to Lawson. When he gets through with you, you won't need any kind of dough. You know, I've got Gatto set for a go with Mellish, the title contender. Gatto can take him. Please believe me, he's going to take him. So? So after what happened in the Eubanks fight, the odds on Gatto will be like a war debt. We can clean up. Listen, we can make Heel, a... I wouldn't trust you from 11.59 to midnight. Get it up. Now. I'll give you six hours. After that, Lawson. So long. Come on, come on. Hello? Hello, Rainey, this is Gatto. Hiya, baby. Look, the boys dropped in on me at the office at Mindy's. Lawson wants to see me. What? Look, bum, I'm the one with the cauliflower ears. You heard me, and what do I do? Nothing. But... Don't but... go near him. Stay home. Let me take care of it. How? How? What do you do? I don't know yet, Pepe, but I'll find a way. How did he find out? Your girlfriend. What? She wouldn't do that. She hates the guy. Hate him or love him, she told him. I, I can't believe it. I... I suggest you call our little doll Jerry and give her your regards for the double cross. Meanwhile, stay put in your apartment. Don't move. But, Rainy... Hello. Hello. Seventy-five, three, three nineteen, three. Archie, mm-hmm. what on earth are you mumbling about? The high cost of blunt. Indeed. Oh, you can say that again. I have no intention of doing so. Okay, be smug. But there must have been a time even in your life when knickknacks from Tiffany figured on the budget. Phooey. Ah, uh, not to mention steak dinners and champagne. Or what did you feed your girls? Peppermint lozenges? Nonsense. Nonsense. They preferred lime. Oh, oh, I'm dying and he laughs. Mr. Wolf? Yes? I have decided that you are giving me a raise. Archie, this is not a period in which uh, unilateral decisions are wise. So I'll be a dope and get a raise, huh? As for your future mental attainments, you may be right. As for raise... You want to drive me to gambling? Like betting on fights or going... Okay, it's the doorbell and I'm answering it. The name's Rainey. You're Goodwin? I'm Goodwin. Come in. Is Wolf in? Mr. Wolf is always in. Unlike prize fighters, I guess. Come on. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Rainey, the man who lost his prize fighter. How do you do, sir? I'm not doing so good. Mr. Wolf, you gotta help me. That will depend. On what? The fee. <laughs> I digress. Your problem is what, Mr. Rainey? Mr. Wolf, I manage a fighter named Gatto. Maybe you've heard of him. I have not. However, that is of little significance. You are having difficulty with this Mr. Gatto? I'm not having difficulty with him. I can't find him. Uh, maybe you better let me give you the whole picture, huh? Very well. Well, Gatto is an up-and-coming boy, Mr. Wolf. He had a little upset last week with a guy named Eubanks. But everybody knows in spite of that, Gatto's heading for the big time. I think he'll prove that when he goes against Mellish. Mr. Mellish being another pugilist, huh? Uh, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Now, Peppy, that's Gatto. Peppy was due at the turf club this afternoon to meet the opposition management and go over the setup. He was due, but he didn't show. I waited all afternoon, and then I started the phone calls and taxis. The results? No results. I combed every joint I ever knew him to buy a beer in, and the score was zero. Matter of fact, nobody's even seen him for four days. 
You would have tried the gymnasiums, naturally? I did. Does this pugilist have a home? Yeah, 206 A Rathbone Street, a penthouse on the roof. He was not at home during all this time? It's where I tried first. It was empty as a bank on Saturday afternoon. I see. And you want me to find him for you? If Pepe blows this fight, Mr. Wolf, it'll ruin his career. And the preservation of his career is worth a good deal to you? I got a check for two grand right here. Archie? I'll get it. Two thousand dollars. Very well, Mr. Rainey. I should take immediate steps. I got a cab waiting outside. We can get started right away. We? Oui. <laughs> I should remain here. But how do you expect to... Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. You will leave with Mr. Rainey. I need information. You might try the Rathbun Street penthouse to start with. But I've already been there. Lord, your apologies, Mr. Rainey. Suppose you restrict your activities to pugilists. Archie is a trained observer. You are not. Archie, you will pick up whatever you can in Gardner's apartment. I especially suggest a careful check on his wardrobe. Wardrobe? If his clothes are missing, Mr. Rainey, it would indicate that he left voluntarily and deliberately. For whatever reasons he may have had. If they are not, Archie, you will phone me from the apartment after your investigation is over. Okay. I should, in the meantime, devote some thought to the subject. Huh? For two grand, all you're going to do is devote some thought? Mr. Rainey, if I were not a modest man, I would point out to you that you're getting quite a... <laughs> a bargain. <laughs> Gatto? Gatto? He's not here, I told you that. I was up here before. He left the door unlocked? I had a key. Guess I forgot to lock up after I left. Now, let's look around. Bathroom? Yeah. Hmm. Empty. Hmm. It's a nice penthouse. Better closet? Yeah. What do you think? He's playing hide and seek? Try it. Okay. Anything in there? Nothing I'm looking for. What's that you found? A hat. Well, let's see. A lady's hat. Yeah, a smart and expensive. Label reads a Madame Yetta original. <laughs> that bunch of lace and feathers cost somebody a fast half a hundred. Yeah, probably one of his girls left it behind. And maybe she'll call for it. Come on, we'll take a gander out on the roof. I took a gander out there. It's bare as a bone. Uh-uh. What have we got over there with the chimney? Where? Over there. Uh, just an old awning. Got blown down in the storm last month. Be right with you. What are you doing? Looking under it. Oh, brother. You, you found him? Yeah, we found him, chum. A little late. Two holes in his dorsal development and dead as a clay pigeon. Yeah. Well, what have you got to say? Well, now at least the bookies will cancel all bets. We both save our dough. Yeah. I got a phone, Mr. Wolf. And there he was, Mr. Wolf, under the old canvas awning. Hmm. Where's the hat? Oh, this is it. Mm hmm. That's it, boss. <laughs> Snazzy number, no? Where'd you find it? On the floor of the closet. You're right, Archie. Frothy little bit of millinery, caprice. Mm hmm. Have you any idea whose it may be, Mr. Rainey? I wish I did. You'll have to find out. Well, how, uh, boss? The hat is an original. See? The label under the band reads a Madame Yetta original. Tomorrow morning, Archie, you will interview Madame Yetta. Yes, boss. And discover in your inimitable fashion for whom she made this chapeau. Again, Mr. Wolf. Per your instructions, I have just talked to Madame Yetta. What did you learn? Madame Yetta tells me she made that hat for a Mrs. Lawson. Who is Mrs. Lawson? The wife of an ex beer hustler who's in the chips and puts on airs. Lives in the penthouse of the Bradford Arms. I was just about to hop a cab and go up there, boss. Good. Keep this up, Archie. And through sheer practice, you may yet develop to a full blown intelligence. Well, I'm trying, Mr. Wolf. And after the Lawsons, I do what? Return here immediately and hurry. How do you do, Mr. Lawson? Oh, Mr. 
Mr. Goodwin. My secretary tells me you're a detective. My boss might argue with you on that, Mr. Larson. Your boss? It happens I work for Nero Wolf. I see. And you wish to see me about... About this hat. Hat? Oh, I see, yeah. Well, Mr. Goodwin, please believe me. I never wear hats like that. Would your wife be likely to say the same? My wife? Just what are you getting at? Would I seem too nosy if I asked how well you and your wife know Pepe Gatto? How well do we know who? Pepe Gatto. The pug? No, no, not such a pug. No, huh? <laughs> I lost 25000 on him in the Eubanks fight. If you ask me, he laid down like a dog. And did you talk it over with him? Talk it over with him? Never seen the man in my life. Not even at the fight? No, I placed a bet over the telephone. I'd scarcely have anything to do with a character like Gatto, Mr. Goodwin. You surely won't from here on out, Mr. Larson. What do you mean? Gatto is dead. You don't say. He was murdered last night. Murdered? And what would you say, Mr. Larson, if I told you that this hat is your wife's and that it was found in a closet in Gatto's apartment? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Are you implying... Not implying. That... Facts are sticking out. What time was this dumb brute done away with? Oh, I'd set it at somewhere between 5 and 7 p.m. last night. Well, you said it very conveniently. Thanks. Why? My wife and I drove out of the city at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Didn't get back until 2 this morning. And this hat... It took wings and flew into Gatto's closet? Is that the answer? No, that's not the answer. Then what is? This is. A month and a half ago, I was with Celia on a bus top. She was wearing that hat, and the wind blew it off her head. I see. And from there, we figured that somebody picked it up, and it finally wound up at Gatto. You can figure anything you please. Personally, I don't feel in any way obligated to figure anything. Darling, I was just on my way out, and... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were busy. Yes, I am busy, Celia. Wait a minute. He's not all that Run along now, dear. You'll be late. But I want to talk to you. Run along, Celia. Yes, darling. Sorry. I'll see you later. Beautiful. Really beautiful. I've always thought so, Goodwin. You, uh, didn't give me much of a chance to talk to her, did you, Larson? If I didn't, it's for your own good. My good? I don't get it. Celia's a sensitive person, and I won't have her bothered... And do you mean to tell me you let him scare you? Let him scare me? Say, will you stop being so fearless with my life? The guy said don't bother my wife, so I didn't bother his wife. It was that simple. Apparently his wife is not blonde. Answer the phone, Archie. No, you answer it. Now you've hurt my feelings. Oh, well... Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh? Is it true that you're interested in the Gatto murder? Who are you, and how do you know he's been murdered? The second question is none of your business. And as for the first, call me Jerry. J E R I. How do you do, Jerry? J E R I. Where do you call? Would you like to come to an auction? An auction? You know, going, going, gone to the highest bidder. And what are you placing on the auction block, Miss Jerry? A few facts. All in good condition and guaranteed to make it a cinch to snag the Gatto killer. Sounds promising. Only you'll have to bid against real money. May I have the address of the auction room? You'll have no trouble finding it. Your assistant was there last night. Where? The penthouse on top of 206A Rathburn Street. The big item goes on at four bells. <laughs> Yeah? Who is it? Man in Wolf sent me. Just a sec. Hmm. You're Jerry, huh? I was expecting the man named Wolf. Unfortunately for me, honey, when he's expected, I usually show up. Come on in. You? See, I'm the legs of the combination. He's the brains. It makes, uh, makes a nice division of labor. I see. You came in plenty of time. On the nose is our custom. Where are the rest of the bidders? Any second now. Mm-hmm. How many besides me are coming? One. Small auction. But big action. How'd you happen to decide on this? I knew Gatto pretty good. And you were fond of him pretty good, huh? How did you guess? Well, you've got a key to this place of his, or you couldn't let yourself in. It adds, no. Gee, you should have been a detective. Just what I keep telling Mr. Wolf. Look, tell me, Jerry, darling, this other person who's coming to the auction, who? The killer. You don't say. 
You sure the killer isn't here already? Look, I didn't kill him. Uh, the story you would like me to believe is that you witnessed the killing, huh? Called the killer and Mr. Wolf and said, Come on, kids, you can get me either to talk or shut up, depending on who pays the most, then it? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, prove you know what you're talking about. Who is the killer? Is it Block Rainey? should also have your head examined, pretty boy. I talk for dough and only for dough. Not that I'm mercenary or anything, okay. but... Okay. Okay, tell me this. How come you saw the killer in the act? Simple. I was here with Gatto. Called me to come see him. While I was here, the shot came through the window there from the roof. You know something, sweetheart? What? I can't understand how a girl like you, a pretty nice girl under all that uh, paint and powder and Broadway shellac, how you could do a thing like this. You were in love with Gatto. I know that. Everybody does. And still you're willing to keep your mouth shut if the killer pays enough. How come? Hmm? What's the matter, honey? Did I hit a tender spot? I... I don't think you understand. Sure, I was in love with the goof. Then along comes this other dame. She's rich and beautiful and she has everything to give him. Oh, do I know her? Of course you do. She... Jerry! Oh! Uh... Jerry. She was just about to tell me, and then the shot came through the window from the roof, boss. It's a flat roof outside. You didn't, I suppose, see the murderer? No. Nope. I caught Jerry in my arms. By the time I laid her down on the couch and got out on the roof, the killer was gone. Get right over here and bring our client with you, if you can find him. Rainey? That's right. He has a right to be in on the kill. Okay, boss. But keep away from that beer till I get there. Don't be impertinent. I should be busy phoning Mr. and Mrs. Lawson. Meanwhile, I want them here, too. Besides, one bottle won't do any harm. Ah, there they are. Let them in, Archie. You remain seated, Mr. Rainey. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Well, come in, Mr. Lawson. Come in. Mr. Wolf here? He's here. Nice of you to come. Anything to help the law. Ah, Mr. Lawson. Your wife didn't come. Uh, no, Mr. Wolf. She was out when you called. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. I left word with the butler, however. Mr. Lawson, about 20 minutes ago, a girl named Jerry Faye was killed. So? She was killed in your neighborhood, in a flat formerly occupied by one Pepe Gatto. Well, where would that be? Maybe your wife knows where the flat would be. How dare you, sir? No histrionics, please. Where was your wife when the girl was killed? I'm advising you that if there is an alibi, now's the time to state it. I wouldn't humiliate Celia by alibying for her. Then the police will pick her up. But she didn't kill this girl, Mr. Wolf. You have reasons for that opinion? The best of reasons. I'd be grateful if you'd state them and let me be the judge of their excellence. A one should do. This one. Celia's out in the country visiting her mother. Oh? Does that settle it? Possibly. What's her mother's telephone number? Why, uh... Merely a routine check. Well, can't you take my word? I'll take her mother's number. Well, Mr. Lawson? I'm sorry. I... I hoped you'd buy this story. What do you mean? The mother's been dead for ten years. I see. Well, I don't. What's the idea? It's known as marital devotion, Archie. <laughs> I suppose you realize, Mr. Lawson, that in shielding your wife, you're aiding and abetting a murderer. I, I haven't stopped to realize anything. When Goodwin brought me that hat, I didn't know what to say. Oh, you pitched me a curve then, too. Well, I suppose you might call it that, but... And she didn't lose the chapeau off a bus top. No, but you've got to understand. Celia's the dearest thing in life to me. Yeah, so is a lady rattlesnake to its husband. I suggest it is time for you to be objective in this matter, Mr. Lawson. What do you want to know? Tell us where she can be found. I, I have no idea. When is she expected to return home? Never. Oh? You see, we, we had an argument. I doubt that I'll ever see her again. Then we are quite on our own, Archie. To do what? To make a journey to Gatto's apartment. Gatto's apartment? She probably has a key to that popular abode. But she wouldn't go there, boss. On the contrary, I am of the opinion that that's just where she would go. Give me my hat. Don't tell me you're going to stir yourself. Ah, it's a most unpleasant necessity, Archie. But the lady in question is dangerous and not at all hesitant about indiscriminate gunplay. 
Get out the car, Archie. We'll make the journey to Rathburn Street penthouse with the hope that Celia Lawson will show up in time to mourn her lost love. Uh, uh, you want me to go along with you too, Mr. Wolf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rainey, I do. Trust this chair will hold me. Should. Biggest chair in the house. Mr. Wolf. Yes, Mr. Reening? Mr. Wolf, am I to understand that the way you have it figured is that Mrs. Lawson killed Gatto, and then to keep the girl from pinning the crime on her, she killed her too? What's the matter, Mr. Reening? Don't you think the theory holds water? Well, yes. I, I mean, of course it does. Mm, thank you. On the other hand, there is room for doubt. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Wolf. Would you mind explaining? I'll explain, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Goodwin was in this room when Jerry Fay was killed. Right, Archie? Right, boss. He ran as quickly as he could out onto the roof, but your wife was nowhere in evidence. What difference does that make? A good deal, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Archie? Yes, a detail like that would give a jury room for doubt. Oh, don't be a fool. How so, Rainey? Well, I was about to agree with Rainey. I, I mean, on sheer logic. I'm afraid I miss your point, Mr. Lawson. Well, what if Goodwin didn't see her? That proves nothing. She fired the shots and then she ran down the fire escape. What fire escape? The one a few feet beyond the chimney. Mr. Lawson. Yes? Who told you there was a fire escape there? Why, uh, Yeah, I... Yeah, who did? You can't see it from here, Lawson. Well, I, I just imagine there might be. Sensationally accurate imagination, Mr. Lawson. Allow me to congratulate you. I don't know what you have in mind. You have in mind to see your wife convicted of the murder of Pepe Gatto. And so punish them both for having dared to fall in love. I love Celia. I worship her. Yes, that's what you expected me to believe. Hoping, meanwhile, that a hat would convict her. You worshipped her until she became fascinated by a young savage animal known as Pepe Gatto. No. At that point, the worship shifted into reverse. And you went green with hate. Hate that drove you to climb that fire escape that you know so much about and shoot him in the back. You're dreaming. Jerry Faye saw you in the act. And when she was about to divulge your identity to Archie, you killed her too. Meaning to hang her murder on your wife along with the other killing. That's a lie. Mr. Lawson, I didn't bring you here to apprehend your wife. There's really no reason why she should come here. I suggested this visit in the belief that you'd betray some guilty knowledge of the place and circumstances. As you have so obligingly just done. You're clever, aren't you? Monumentally. But a little hasty. So, why? This gun in my hand, haven't you noticed? <laughs> of course, sir, but yours is not the only gun in the world. What? Sit still, Arnold, and don't turn her off. Your wife, Mr. Lawson. Come in, my dear. Celia, what are you doing here? I came to get a hat that I'd left in Pepe's closet. It suddenly was clear to me what was in the wind. And I thought I'd better remove all evidence that you could possibly use against me. Celia, listen, you must understand I understand you... one thing only. Pepe's gone. And you took him away. Listen, please, if you let me explain, you'll understand. Yeah. Please, honey, help me. Sure, I'll help you. Celia. Oh, uh, well, that's all, Mr. Wolf. What now? Drivers always get so crowded outside. Will it go tough on her, boss? Why not? She killed a man in cold blood. Though she actually saved our lives while doing so. I hope that helps her at the trial. I hope so, Archie. After all, if she hadn't done what she did, what would have happened to the lobster beast? What lobster beast? The lobster beast that Fritz is making for dinner. <laughs> Hurry, Archie. It really can't be appreciated unless it's eaten hot. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Oh.
Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Ann Diamond, Charlotte Lawrence, Gerald Moore, Don Diamond, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Killer Card. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, and NBC has a lively lineup of music and fun to help your courting along. Tomorrow, Dennis Day brings you a melodic and mirthful 30 minutes, and then Judy Canova gets together with her gang for a sparkling session of mountain-style song and laughter, followed by singing MC Red Foley and his friends on that exciting parcel of Western tunes and mayhem Grand Ole Opry. Here's Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You want Mr. Wolf to what? Mr. Wolf will do nothing of the sort, Archie. Mr. Wolf is thirsty. Hold on for a moment. Uh, the bottle opener is in the left hand drawer of your desk. Thank you, Archie. Mr. Wolf, I've got a man named Denby on the phone. He wants you to umpire a card game. The man is insane. He's offering a fee. The answer is no. I know nothing of card games, nor do I wish to learn. Okay. Well, the answer's no, Mr. Denby. Sure, I'll ask him again. After he finishes the beer he's working on. Goodbye. People appall me. The fantasies they indulge in. Bah, what on earth made that maniac think I might consent to preside at a card game? Well, seems he expects one of the players to be death. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. not attend, but the card game went on anyway. At the home of a Mr. Stephen Denby. Well. Gene? Yes? The custom? Mr. Piper? Hmm? I think we're ready to begin, eh? I'm ready. Yes, Gene. You always are. How I like that remark. I'll have to decide later on. Yeah, please do. The custom? It's all right with me. And Mr. Piper? I, uh, I brought a deck. No, as host, I shall supply the card. Uh, before we play, I examine them, yes? Of course. Here you are. Chuck. Yeah, Mr. Denby. You will remain outside the door until call. No one is to enter this room under any circumstances. Got it. Lucasta? The cards look all right. Thank you. Now then... Shall we make things absolutely clear? You mean, should you make a speech? I don't mind. But uh, make it short, huh? I shall. The four of us seated at this table are joint owners of the Candy Club, a rather successful institution devoted to the sale of food, liquor, entertainment... And the gambling. And games of chance. For some time now, we have all resented sharing the profits. Some of us have attempted to buy out the others. Again, you needn't babble on. No one wants to sell. We know that. True, true, Mr. Piper. Which is the reason for this little game of cards? One hand shall be dealt to each of us. A hand at poker. Whoever wins, gets the club. The others, retire as gracefully as they can. Agreed? That's why yes, we... agree. Very well. The cards are shuffled. I'll place them in the center of the table. Macasto... Would you like to... I cut. Good. If nobody minds, I'll cut them too. After Mr. Lacasto. Nobody minds. Happy now, Mr. Piper? Let's get going, huh? Very well. Unless Jean would care to... Oh, thanks. We're all crooks here, which sort of cancels out any funny business with a car. Very well. 
We shall all draw a card in turn until five cards are drawn by each player. Shall we start, Jean? Sure. Lucasto? Okay. Mr. Piper? Yes, of course. And myself. We just keep going in rotation. This is fun. Fun? No, no. There's too much money which rides on these cards. That's what makes it fun. Uh, would you mind keeping quiet? I'm nervous. We all are, one way or another. I think we all have our five cards now. We all got them. Very well, then. In the same order that the cards were dealt. Jean? A pair of threes. Lucasto? Nothing. Mr. Piper? Kings. Two. The light! Piper. Yeah, well, what? Hey, hey, I don't like the same stuff here, mister, but will you take your elbow out of my back? I'd be delighted to, Mr. Goodwin, but it's not my elbow. I don't care if it's your tibia maximus, just take it away. Chuck wouldn't like that. Well, we have company. Mind if I look around? Keep Uh, right on walking, pal. That would be Chuck behind me, huh? And you are... My name is Denby. You may remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you phoned a couple of hours ago about, about a card game. Now, look, just what is your boy poking in my back? I think it's a 38. You're not sure? It might be a 45. Chuck, is it loaded? Make a funny move, pal, and you'll find out the hard way. Yo, wait a minute. It's just a passing curiosity. Uh, where are we going? My car. Get in. If you insist. I guess you do. Okay. I'll drive, Chuck. Car bulletproof? No, that's hardly necessary. Chuck shoots first. Well, it's a saving, I guess. The only thing is, I uh, I hadn't figured on taking a ride. I told Mr. Wolf I was going for a walk. He disapproved. You're but... going for a ride. Isn't that a little corny? Now, there's a minor difference. Usually, the uh, guest, shall we say, is killed at the conclusion of the ride. In this Let's case, let's not make the difference too minor. Huh? You will survive the ride. It's what comes afterwards that might kill you. You see, Mr. Goodwin, my friends and I have a little mystery to solve. You want me to solve it? No. We want Mr. Wolf to solve it. In order to do so, he must leave his house and come to mine. He has to in order to find the solution quickly. Why? Neither my friends nor myself have any desire to improve our acquaintance with the police. Therefore, we want the mystery solved before the police are even called in. Hence our need for Mr. Wolf. Hence our detaining you. Detaining is a pretty word in the circumstances. Now, this is my home, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, I don't like the architecture. I think I'll stay out. Get going, pal. On second thought... Mr. Denby, what makes you think Mr. Wolf is going to leave his house and come here? You. Unless he does so, he will lose you. Forever. The door, Chuck. Okay. Mr. Goodwin, may I introduce you to my associates in business and in poker? To your right, Mr. Lacasto. A charming but impulsive fellow. Hello. He's only the stooge. Where's the fat fellow? In time, Castro. The lovely lady whose back is to you is Jean. Jean something or other. She's always changing her name. Hello. Hello. And the gentleman facing you is Mr. Piper. How do you do? Uh, Is he exclusive or just... Hey, he's wearing his red carnation a little low, isn't he? Over his heart. Except that's no carnation. That, Mr. Goodwin, is blood. Life blood. Archie. Oh, Pa, he's always taking walks. Come in, the door is unlocked. Are you? Yeah, you're Wolf. Having made a magnificent discovery, suppose you remove your hat? No, come on. I beg your pardon? Mr. Denby wants to see you. 
Mr. Danby can see me here. Here ain't where he wants to see you. Here, at the risk of minor monotony, is where he'll have to see me. Don't you want your boy Goodwin to keep on living? No one has ever been able to discourage him. Mr. Denby will. Ah, Archie's in custody? No, in Mr. Denby's house under a gun. I don't have to believe that. Take a look at this. Hmm, wallet. Archie's wallet. I shall accompany you. And permit me to warn you that if Mr. Goodwin has been harmed, nothing short of murder will satisfy me. It's getting late. Wolf isn't here yet. Maybe he doesn't worry about you, Goodwin. Well, he could have been delayed. Maybe an orchid needed a pollen transfusion or something. <laughs> Besides, only the good die young. Then you must be very, very good, Archie. That remark I didn't care for. We sit here and wait for the fat one, but in the meanwhile, the police... The police will come when we notify them. But they will not like the delay we make to notify them. I say we waste time. I say the fat one will not risk coming. You say entirely too much. Is that so? Maybe I kill you myself. Picasso, put that gun away. Yes, darling Archie should have a chance to live. Not long if Wolf doesn't come. Stop looking so pleased. Are you afraid to die, Archie? Yeah, well, I'm not looking forward to it. It's so final. <laughs> Besides, I didn't eat a hearty dinner. And it... Oh, the Marines have landed. Who is it? Chuck, with Merrill Wolf. Let him in. Shut the door, Chuck. Stay outside. Archie? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Oh, am I glad to see you. I regret I cannot say the same thing. But I asked you, why couldn't you stay at home instead of taking those confounded walks? I warned you it'd be dangerous. Yeah, but Mr. Wolf, it wasn't the fresh air that got me. It was Denby. Mr. Wolf, I knew you wouldn't come here without some sort of pressure. I thought the method I used would be most effective. Would you really have killed Archie if I hadn't come? I would have had no choice. I would have been stuck with a witness to an unsolved murder. Suppose I cannot solve it. I should be forced to apply the same logic to two witnesses. Mm-hmm. Mr. Wolf, you really came here to save my life, huh? Nonsense. I came here for a fee, Mr. Denby. I have a check for $1,000 already made out. Clear it up. You forget. I left my home. I traveled unprotected through the streets of this city, exposed to motor accidents, to fresh air, too. You offer me $1,000. Will $2,500 do? Barely. Archie, will you take the check? Now... I presume you want me to find who killed the gentleman at the table, the one facing me, huh? His name is Mr. Piper. The name is no importance. Will you all sit at the table in the same position you were at the time of the shooting? Of course. Jean? Picasso? Good. Now for a look at the wound. Hmm. The lights, I should imagine, went out for a while when the shooting occurred. They went out. Yes. Of the three of you at the table, which one had the best motive for the murder? We all have the same motive. The club. Helpful. There was no one else in the room at the time? No one. The door? Locked. With Chuck on guard outside of it. So much for that. The windows, I notice, are closed. They were closed when the murder took place? They were closed. The window panes are all unbroken, which eliminates the possibility of the shot being fired from outside of them, unless one of them was raised and lowered. That wouldn't have been possible. The windows are secured by catches. Archie, will you check that? Okay, Mr. Wolf. I shall for the moment assume that the windows are neither lying nor untrustworthy. Does anyone remember anything unusual occurring at the time of the shooting? Well, someone whispered Piper just before the shot. Indeed. You all heard that whisper? We heard it. Man's voice or woman? Well, I... I can't say. A whisper doesn't reveal much of anything. The windows weren't open, Mr. Wolf. Which leads to... The fact that it had to be one of us in this room. But which one, Mr. Wolf? The murder weapon. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Has it been moved? Nobody touched it. It's laying on the floor where it was dropped. Interesting. If you look closely, you would observe two oil spots staining the rug between the revolver and the lady's chair, indicating uh, who sat at the right of Mr. Piper. I did. Why? Mr. Danby. Yes? 
If I were you, I would turn Mr. LeCastro over to the police. You are a liar. I, I... warned you about that gun, LeCastro. Was it necessary to shoot Mr. LeCastro? In the arm, yes. He was reaching for a gun. He'll live, however, till the police take him away. What do I tell them? You could point out the angle of the wound. As you notice, Mr. Denby, the bullet entered Mr. Piper's heart from the right. Yes, so it did. Therefore, whoever sat to his right, well, that was Locasto. Archie, you have the check? I have it. We may as well leave. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you're sure Locasto shot Piper? I have indicated the evidence. The rest will be up to the jury. Come, Archie. Uh-huh. Uh, Jean. Yes, Archie? Now that my life expectancy has increased, what are you doing tomorrow night? Archie? I got a scram. Frank Astor 7583. I'll be ringing your bell. Oh, Mr. Denby, you better do something about Lucasto's arm or he won't live to be executed. You see, the executioner likes them warm before he chills them. Homestead looks very nice, Mr. Wolf. Yes, Archie. You should stay in it more often. Yeah, but you never get to meet babes like Jean that way. You never get kidnapped either. No, but I have had to leave my home in order to rescue you. Yeah, well, you earned a nice fee, fast. Indeed? You seem doubtful about it. Positive, Archie. I know. I have not as yet earned my fee. Huh? You mean Denby might not turn Lucasto over to the cops? Of course he will. The trouble is, you see, Lucasto did not murder Piper. No? <laughs> he just thought a bullet in the heart might be good for Piper's rheumatism, huh? As it happens, Piper suffered from asthma. <laughs> That's beside the point. Fine. Mr. Wolf, I'm going to take it for granted that you know who did kill Piper. I'm also going to take it for granted that you won't tell me until you're ready. But why turn Lucasto over to the police? Two reasons, Archie. First, I had no proof against the real killer. Secondly... We had to supply a scapegoat in order to be permitted to leave the Danby home. You were unarmed, helpless. Go ahead, rub it in. Nonsense. It was an interesting problem. I enjoyed it. It was, huh? Well, to me, it's still in the present tenses. Which reminds me, as old Dr. Tidmouse said, there's always a future tense. And in that future tense, Jean. No, Archie. Oh, Mr. Wolf, stop. That girl's got a love for blood that appeals to the ghoul in me. Besides, did you notice what she does to her dress? Archie, I was merely about to say that I have no objections to your dallying with the girl. Oh, I don't believe it. My ears need overhauling. I objected only to the future tense. Why not call her now? Yeah, well, I won't pretend I understand this sudden enthusiasm on your part about my love life. Probably there's some foul scheming motive at the bottom of it. But who am I to look a gift horse in the mouth? Now, let's see. Her number was, uh... Lancaster, 7583, of course. <laughs> this is the most beautiful bar and grill I've ever seen, Archie. Drank, you mean? What? Uh, never mind, never mind. All right. Archie, did anybody tell you you were beautiful, too? Well, a girl here and there has mentioned it. Oh, were they liars? No. Uh, tell me, Jean, how did you ever get into the gambling den racket? Because I'm a crook. Well, I suspected that, but... Uh, I want another drink. You've had enough. I want another drink, and when Jean wants another drink, no gentleman who is a gentleman... Jean, get down! Oh, let me go. I don't want to climb under the table. Don't stay on the hearing until the barrage stops. Huh. I guess the war's over. All right, Jean, get up. No, now I'm here. I like it. I'm going to stay here for months and months. Jean, do you realize that somebody just tried to kill you? And I thought you had such a nice, honest face. No, 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 not me. Somebody out in the street. I don't know why, but Mr. Wolf will. Come on, pour yourself together and let's go see him. The nice fat man? All right, I like him. You do? Why? Because he'd make such a big corpse. Is that you, Archie? Plus Jean. 
What made you think I wanted her here? Well, she's one of your fans. <laughs> she thinks you'd make a lovely corpse. What was the reason for bringing her here? She was shot at. Did you expect her to be? I expected her to be killed. That's why I sent you to her. It didn't occur to you I might be killed, too? It did. I was willing to take the chance. You were willing? <laughs> oh, Mr. Wolf, Jean's a little under the weather. Splendid. In vino veritas. Watch your language. I mean the people in their cups often tell the truth, a proverb of some antiquity. Who shot at you tonight, Jean? Oh, I don't know. I, I didn't see. Has it occurred to you that you might just as easily have murdered Piper as not? But Lucasto killed Piper. You said so yourself. I lied. Furthermore, why the attack on you if Lucasto was the murderer? Well, I, I... I don't know. Did you also not know that Lucasto escaped from jail earlier this evening? You're making that up. Why should I? Mr. Denby turned him over to the police... But Lacoste managed to get away before being jailed. That's not crooked. Incidentally, Mr. Denby will be joining us at any moment. I expected you to bring Jean Archie. Therefore, with the exception of Mr. Piper, who is resting in the morgue, and Mr. Lacoste, who is at large, we shall have all the participants in the card game. With them, perhaps, we can deal a new hand, hmm? Archie? Okay. Maybe it's the morgue to tell us Piper escaped. Oh, wrong again. Come in, Mr. Denby. Mr. Wolf, I'm upset. I heard over the radio about Lucasto's escape. He'll try to kill us all. Why? Well, because we can testify that he murdered Piper. Truly. I beg your pardon? Lucasto did not kill Piper. But you said that he did. The only evidence against Lucasto was the angle of the entrance of the bullet that lodged in his heart. May I remind you of the whisper you all heard in the darkness preceding Piper's death? The whisper that said Piper? Precisely. We must assume, then, that Piper turned his body in the direction of the whisper. Therefore, the angle of the wound would be wrong for Lacoste, but the correct one for... Whoever sat opposite Piper. I sat opposite him, but that doesn't mean I killed him. Wait, you must have. Once he turned, the bullet must have come from opposite him. Only possible way. That means you, Jean. No. No, it's a frame. May I interrupt for a moment? Mr. Denby... If our present analysis is correct, it must have been you who whispered to Piper. Did you? I... I hadn't thought about it before, but... I... Denby, you're lying. No, he's not lying. Continue, Mr. Denby. Well, when the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He, he turned to me, and that's when he was shot. Archie, you've taken all this down. In my prettiest shorthand, Mr. Wolf. Good. I, I don't know why you're doing this, Denby. Maybe you think if I take the rap, you'll get the club. But remember, Lacasto's still free. He's gunning for all of us. But it'll be you. Especially you he'll want. Maybe you can talk a jury into sending me up for something I didn't do, but you won't live to gloat about Go it. Go shut up, Jean. You killed Piper and... Who, who's that? This is, of course, the murderer of Mr. Piper. No comments? Archie, the door, if you please. But, but you said I was the one who... What kind of idiocy is this? Archie, I said the door. Okay, but shall I ask him in or sock him? You will act as the situation demands. Yes, sir. But for once, I'd like to know what the situation is. Raise him, Goodwin, and keep him that way. Now back up into the living room. I don't back up, Good. My gears... You want it here? Uh, never mind, I'll strip a gear. Archie, what are you doing? Just what the situation demands, backing up. In case your knowledge of armaments has failed you, our little friend Chuck here is pointing a thirty-eight revolver at me. Won't save him from the chair. Maybe not. But it could give me quite a pain in the stomach. Chuck, what do you think you're doing? You double-crossing louse. Gentlemen, if you So please. you thought you'd run to the fat dick and pin it all on me, huh, Denby? You don't know what you're talking about. We haven't even mentioned you. You sure of that, huh? Then why did Wolf phone me and tell me you were about to sing? Wolf phoned you? Yeah. Said you were getting ready to feed me to the electrician up the river. Oh, he was making a stab in the dark, Chuck. Trying to start something. That's so, Wolf. Archie, will you read Chuck your notes about Mr. Denby's statement regarding the whisper? But that doesn't mean... It, it could be misunderstood. Read me the notes, Goodwin. Here it is, I quote. When the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He turned That's to me That's all I need to hear. Chuck, you were selling me out after hiring me to knock off Piper. You dumb gunman. Now you've given Wolf what he wants, a confession. I was trying to pin it on Gene. That's what you say now. It's kind of late, though. Too late no. for you. No, no. Oh, oh. 
Goodbye, Mr. Denby. Nice shooting, Chuck. Stay put, Goodwin. The rest of you, I'm leaving. The police wouldn't approve. Better let me have your gun. Huh? Wise guy. You know something? I've been thinking. Can you think? If I was to knock off you and Goodwin, me and Gene could split the club between us and nobody would ever know who killed Piper. Very whimsical, Chuck, but if you don't mind... Ah, gee, don't be an idiot. Well, if I have to get shot, I prefer it to happen when I'm moving forward. Ah, gee. Okay, come and get it, Goodwin. March right up nice and easy and take it. I'm coming. (laughs) Would somebody mind telling me why I don't fall down? I've been shot. Well, that's not the way to talk to a man who's just been... Hey, Chuck is lying down. He... Is he dead? Well, there's been a mistake. I didn't shoot him. He shot me. Archie, stop blabbering. Neither of you shot the other. As a matter of fact... I shot the Chuck. Lucasto. Lucasto, Archie? Well, I thought he escaped. No, I'm not crazy. I do not escape. The fat one, he phones the police to tell them how I'm innocent. Yes, I had the police announce the escape, however, for reasons of, uh... Should I say strategy? <laughs> Well, on account of there are no bullet holes in me, you can say whatever you like, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Archie. That announcement helped heighten the tension our murderers were under. And then they explode. The fat one, he says to me, Locasto, wait in the next room. Watch careful. Maybe there's trouble. I watch. And now? <laughs> now there's no more trouble. <laughs> Well, the place looks a lot tidier now with all those bodies removed, huh? Indeed. Okay, I'll get I... you the bottle of beer. But first, make with an explanation. The case was crystal clear, Archie. Maybe, but I'm no crystal gazer. Sure, I know. Denby had things arranged in advance with Chuck in case anybody held a better hand than his own. Piper did. So Denby whispered to Piper after kicking the light switch and set him up for a shot by Chuck from the doorway. The angle would provide evidence against Lucasto. True. However, we had only Denby's word for it and Chuck's that the door was locked. All right. We know, but you knew before Denby and Chuck blew up. How? The oil spots on the rug, Archie? Well, they only showed the gun had bounced when the murderer threw it away. Spattered oil, very well-kept gun. They showed more than that. Where were those spots in relation to the gun? Think back, Archie. Spots in relation... Oh, Sure. They were between the gun and the door. Therefore, the gun must have been thrown from the door. Bounced twice, staining the rug before reaching its final destination. Ah, I get it now. That told you who'd fired the gun. But there wasn't proof enough, so you set up a nice atmosphere of suspicion and had the boys give each other away. (laughs) All right, Mr. Wolf, you're a genius, and uh, you may have your beer. Thank you, Archie. As for me, I'm not a genius, but I remember a phone number. <laughs> so if you'll excuse me, Mr. Wolf. You're excused, Archie. Thanks. But before you call that number, may I remind you that Jean is a girl of macabre tastes who appeals to the ghoul in you. <laughs> sure you may, but why bother? In order to be able to warn you that uh, a ghoul and his money are soon parted. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Jay Novello, Howard McNear, Barney Phillips, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Calculated Risk. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, he's right here. Who's this? Archie, hang up. Don't ask questions. You, uh, you have a what? Archie, it's past your bedtime. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Wolf, uh, it's past his bedtime. Your bedtime. It's a client, boss. That's what I was afraid of. Foolish. Hello? Hello? Well, why do you look so bewildered? He's coming right over. He says he's got a date with murder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story, The Case of the Calculated Risk, was as strange and baffling as any Nero Wolf had to deal with. It started late one night when a big-shouldered man sporting a reddish beard and billing himself as Dave Caffrey pushed his way in, walked up to Nero Wolf's desk, and rocked him with this opener. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to kill a man. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm going to kill a man with these two hands. I've been told strange things across this desk, Mr. Caffrey. This is the first time a murderer has confided his intention to me in advance. This man you speak of... I'm not telling you his name. I'm not telling you where I'm going to meet him. This session tomorrow is going to be private and personal. But if anything happens to me between now and then, I want you to take over. Mr. Gaffrey, do you seriously think I could assist you in a matter of private vengeance? That's not what I'm asking. This guy deserves to die. I plan to kill him with these two hands, me, myself. But if I slip up, if he gets me first, I want you to see that justice is done. But I assure you, sir... I told you this guy deserves to die. Let me tell you why. Years ago, down south, there were three men in business together, partners. Me and two others. Your notebook, Archie, if Mr. Gaffrey doesn't mind. You're wasting your time, Wolf. The names I'll use will be phony. I won't give you anything you can check back on. We'll take our chance, sir. Please proceed. It happened in a town about 40 miles from the place where we had our business. We'd gone there to collect some money, the three of us. Carl, Mitch, and me. Dave Caffrey. But all we collected was bad news. So bad that Carl hadn't even given our right names at the hotel. Said he was scared some of our creditors had come hitting up on us for what we owed. Three of us had had some drinks and we'd been pacing around for nearly an hour. I can still remember the way Mitch stood and looked at me. And then up at Carl, when Carl suddenly pulled to a stop and came out with this idea of his. Isn't so, Dave. You got 6,000 cash on hand. You counted it, Mitch. Well, didn't we make it 6240, Carl? Whichever. We've got this 6,000 odd, plus some slow accounts receivable against debts of 38,000. With three of us trying to live from the business, we haven't got a chance. Well, we ain't got much of a one, Carl, but. It's hopeless, Dave. With two partners, though. Two partners? You reckon on pulling out, Carl? I say we cut cards for it, Mitch. Low man drops out. Break up the partnership? After sticking together all these oh, years? Oh, wait a minute, Dave. Wait a minute. Maybe Carl's right. Maybe this could work. Carl, you mean the low man drops out clean? Right now? Right now, Mitch. Other two to take over assets and debts and see if they can get this thing back in the black. Okay, Carl. Get the cards out. Dave? Well, that's what you guys want. Okay, then. Here's a new deck. Shuffle them, Mitch. All shuffle. Cut them, Dave. Go ahead, Mitch. You get first pick. Spread them if you like. Here goes. Ah, six. Your turn, Dave. Okay. Nine of clubs. Huh, lucky guy, Dave. That puts you in uh, whatever Carl pulls. I'll pull it fast. There she is. Denise. Sorry, Mitch. That leaves you elected. Well, Mitch, I'm sorry, too. I guess we all had a fair whack at it, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that ace again, Carl. Easy, Mitch. I said I was sorry, Look, but... Look, Dave. Yeah, what is it, Mitch? All the aces are marked. 
Carl, I'm going to cram this dick right down your crooked throat. Oh, look out, Mick. She's got a knife. Sure. Oh. Carl, you... All right. I've cut him for keeps. What do we do now? What do we do? Look, Carl, I, I didn't mark those cards. I, I didn't kill Mitch. And what's more... Shut I... up, Dave. We're both in and out now. Come on. Let's get out of here. Now what, Carl? Look, Dave, this is where we split up. Two men together, easy to trace. You head one way, I go the other. Yeah, but the door, I, I got no money. Here, I'll split up the 6000 This is your head. Here, stick the envelope in your pocket. Now, grab that trace. Get set. I'll catch the next one going the other way. Get going, Dave! That's how it was, Mr. Wolf. It all happened so fast that I... Mm, this man you call Carl, <laughs> he would seem to be one of the world's choice creatures, Mr. Geffrey. When I thought to look in that envelope he gave me, I found $40 and a few folds of wrapping paper in it. I was mad enough to... Well, I got off the freight and intended to go back, but... Then I picked up a paper. And read all about the murder of your friend Mitch with the statement that Carl had accused you of the crime. And that the police believed him in view of your escape. That's it. Classical, but not at all original. Well, I was young then and stupid. And I'd had those drinks to start with. And you spent the intervening years hunting down the man Carl, am I correct? Yeah. I tramped the country from east to west, from north to south. Tramped it for years, searching for him. And yesterday, I located him. He's a big wheel these days up on that 37th floor of his. But tomorrow when I get... Yes, to... Mr. Caffrey, the 37th floor of... Never mind what building. Now, wait a minute, Caffrey. If you expect Mr. Wolf to help you... I you... don't want him to help me. I'll help myself. But if I slip off, I know Wolf's reputation well enough to know that he'll never rest till this, this rotten, chiseling murderer is sitting in the chair. That's why I've come here. Just to provide a backstop in case my dear friend of long ago manages to get the best of me. How will we know? You see this envelope? Read what it says. Nero Wolf, 601 West 35th Street, New York. Delivered to him in case of my death. That's right. And this envelope was $500. Nearly all I've got in the world. Along with it, the full details on that knife. Real names, dates. The proof you'll need in case I don't finish it up. Go on. Tonight, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to give this envelope to the manager of the hotel where I'm stopping. I'm calling on, well, Carl... Tomorrow at noon, right after his secretary goes to lunch. If I'm not back in my hotel at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the hotel manager will deliver this envelope to you. Is that clear? Perfectly. But you don't think I'm going to allow you to go through with this wire plan, do you? You can't stop me. And don't have Goodwin follow me. I'd lose him in two blocks. Good night. Shall I try to tail him, boss? It's no use, Archie. Get Inspector Kramer on the phone at once. I want the police to help us head off this murder. Nero Wolf speaking. It's Archie. I'm calling from the morgue. And? They found Caffrey's body in a subway washroom, mugged and stabbed. Wallet gone, pockets cleaned out, no envelope. And just two hours ago, he was here. No envelope, eh? Gone. Witnesses? None so far. Homicide's calling it straight mugging and robbery. As it well might look, except for... Except for a guy named Carl. How much do I tell Kramer? All of it. Ask the inspector to start queries throughout the South on the original killing. The original killing? Look... It's our best chance of getting a description of the man called Carl. The original killing and the partnership. Starting from, say, eight years ago and working back to the middle twenties. Tell him to concentrate on towns on railway lines. Putting out pictures of Caffrey and... Pictures and dentistry. Fingerprints to Washington... Kramer will know. And if I come across a haystack, do I keep my eye out for needles? We are going to find Carl, Archie. We are going to find him if it takes him now till doomsday. Mr. Wolf, let's face it, we're licked. Licked, Archie? Three days now. We found Caffrey's hotel here in New York. No traceable phone calls. Not a witness has turned up on that subway washroom party. And Kramer says he's getting nowhere with those answers from the Southland. The original story is bound to come slowly, Archie. We are asking a check on the unsolved killings of a dozen states over a 20-year period. 
Hmm. Then what now? You start trudging, Archie. Trudging? Through office buildings. Through 37th floors of many office buildings. You keep trudging till we find him. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. This is a big city, remember? I might have to go through hundreds of buildings. This morning, Archie, the Municipal Reference Library informed me that there are exactly 34 buildings of 37 floors or higher in Manhattan. Now, when you rule out the United Nations building, hotels Okay, okay. Maybe not so many 37th floors, but lots of offices per floor. Maybe 40 or 50. Call it 30 times 40 and you've still got uh, uh, 1,200 to start with. And you don't know what kind of business, you don't know what Carl's real name is, you don't even know what he looks like. There could be 4,000 men like him. 4,000 affluent men, Archie? Yeah, well, all right. (laughs) Caffrey said he was in the chips, though. You know, for a guy who'd been bumming around, that could mean anything from 10 grand a year up. Say, wait a minute, that cuts your field to 1,000. 1,000 tall men? Tall? I've been over those notes. Caffrey didn't say he was tall. As plainly as you could ask. Caffrey was almost your height, but he said Mitch stood and looked at me. And then he looked up at Carl. Up, Archie. That makes Carl your height or taller. Yeah. Well, maybe Caffrey and Mitch were sitting down and Carl was, uh... Caffrey told us the three were standing at the time. Check your notes. I've studied them. Okay. Maybe that does cut it down some. Yeah, it's still a lot of citizens that start checking for a southern accent. Don't rely on accent, Archie. Carl has had many years to lose any accent he might have had. Yeah, that's true. And so we narrow it, Archie. A man almost surely tall. A man not using the name he was born with. A man with an unexplained gap in his past. I ought to be able to reach right out and tap him. You go skeptical again, Archie. Well, it's still a pretty big haystack. Let's see if we can't trim it some more. On these building lists I've been going over, I've ruled out for now the members of professions requiring lengthy formal training. Medical men, lawyers, scientists of most kinds. Yeah, that's chopping it down. I'll admit that. I'll have further eliminations as we get into it. And I'm putting soil pans on a second list this afternoon. Some of the credit references I'll handle by phone. So I start trudging, huh? You start trudging. And remember, Archie, since you'll probably be operating through secretaries, you're looking for a murderer named Carl, not for a new set of telephone numbers to brighten your winter. Tall? I don't know what you're peddling, Goodwin, but if my boss put his elevator shoes on and stood on a box... He'd still be down somewhere around my necktie. If he stood on his money, though, (laughs) we'd need a helicopter to get up near his shoelaces. Oh, Miss Jonas, do you mind if I sit down? Why, of course not, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, thanks. You know, I've been in 12 offices on this floor, and you're the first girl who's seen the importance of this survey first crack out of the box. (laughs) Well, I'm sort of new here, and, and I try to pay attention. Oh, but... you're not just beautiful. You've got a head on you. Is Mr. McLean in? Well, he's at lunch right now. Lunch? But... Oh, that reminds me. Know any good restaurants up this way? Well, I was just going to the downstairs drugstore myself, but I wouldn't say Well, that... come on. Put your bonnet on and let's skip the drugstore. <laughs> this meal is on the Executive Resources Survey. Yeah, boss, the boil down. Tinsley, McLean, Fernandes, Tessero, and Kaplan. All five of them tall, all five a little misty in the background. You and Saul have done well, Archie. Very well. But I'm crossing off Fernandes and Kaplan. Why? If Credit Bureau report clears Fernandes, and Kaplan was on a special war job. The FBI x-rayed his record twice. Leaving J.P. Tinsley, Carson McLean, and Philip Tesro, huh? I'd like to see all three here, Archie. Get them here one way or another. And so you do admit that Tinsley isn't your real name. Mr. Wolf, are you a blackmailer or what? I'm a licensed private investigator, sir. Any disclosure you make will be kept in confidence, provided it doesn't touch on the case I'm engaged on. You haven't said what the case is. I don't intend to. If you prefer to explain this mysterious gap in your background at the district attorney's office... Well, 
I'm using the name Tinsley because I've got an undivorced first wife out on the coast. We broke up 20 years ago, but uh, she said she'd see to it that I never married again. And she knew where I was today. Well, I, I don't say I'm a saint, but uh, she's a vindictive woman. I see. May I have names, dates, and places starting 1924? I can't quite understand your interest, Mr. Wolf. It's rather complicated, to put it briefly, Mr. McLean. I'm working in the interest of a client. Our people have found this puzzling gap in your background, and I'd appreciate such clarification as you may be able to supply. But I told you, Mr. Goodwin, I was raised and educated in the Orient. Until 32, I was in business with my father in China. Where you say your father died? Died. With the Depression, I returned to New York, started this importing business in a small way, weathered through the early 30s, and I think my bankers can assure you of my standing today. They've done so. Carson McLean and Company has an excellent credit rating. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. To switch somewhat abruptly, Mr. McLean, would you happen to remember how you spent the evening of the 19th? Of this month? Of this month. Well, I could hardly... Wait. You say the 19th. Would that have been on a Tuesday? Yes, it was Tuesday. Well, that simplifies it. I'm nearly always at the office on Tuesday nights dictating the revisions in our weekly wholesalers' lists. Let me see... Yes, I was there on the 19th. Had a tray sent in. Miss Tunis and I worked till just after midnight. Miss Helen Tunis. The secretary Mr. Goodwin spoke of. She's been with me for two or three months. Miss Tunis can confirm this dictation on the night of the 19th? Of course. And Mr. Wolf, your manner is so persuasive that I'd scarcely realize you're asking some extraordinary searching questions. May I ask why in the world you... If you'll indulge me, Mr. McLean, my... Prying is nearly concluded. You say you were in China until 1932. Mr. Tesro, I'll be brutally frank. We know that your name is not Tesro. And we know that you served a prison term from 34 to 38 for arson. I'd like some straight answers. I didn't say I wouldn't answer your questions. The past can remain your own provided... Now, look, Mr. Wolfe. I've been going straight for 12 years. And this business of mine is on the level. Now, if this is a shakedown... I'm asking where you were on the night of the 19th. And I'm telling you I stayed in town. I ate alone. And I went to a movie. I caught the 11.35 for Stanford. And that's all there is to it. You're denying that you were ever in business in the South? I was born in the South, but I haven't been back there since I was a kid. What about the arson? I put in four years squaring for that mistake. Let's start again, Mr. Tesro. You say you were in Cincinnati in 1931. Okay, Mr. Wolf, three candidates and we're still on the one-yard line. Our one-yard line. Tessero McLean Tinsley. No, no, rule out McLean. He gave references enough for those years in China. And with Helen Tunis, he's got the one firm alibi we've laid on to. Caffrey was killed before midnight. With conditions as they are in the Far East, Archie... It would be weeks before cables came back on McLean's claims. Uh, claims? You figure the whole Chinese background's a fake? I want you to see Miss Tunis again, Archie. Taking all precautions for her safety. And this is one time I give you permission to ply her with all the attentions you can contrive. <laughs> Are we far enough to pull tails on any of these three? I've got Saul Panza on Tesro. And Saul promised to have men on Tinsley and McLean. Pictures of the three have gone to Kramer for circulation in the south. Oh. No answer yet from the coast on Tinsley, huh? Not yet. For the moment, Archie, you'll concentrate on Helen Tunis. Helen, I've got to see you tonight. I'd love to, Archie, Now, look, but... Helen, I phoned you to come out in the car to this way because I didn't want McLean to know we're talking. Do you still say you got that new mink coat on your own money? Mr. Goodwin, I don't know what right you Helen, have Helen, if you to... get five guys to buy your stuff, it's your business, Mr. But... McLean said his wife might be sent detectives around. You can go right back to your old Mrs. McLean and tell easy, her that I... Easy, Helen, easy. He was dictating to me. You know, baby, the harder you lie, the prettier you look. <laughs> but if this is a fake alibi, and if you keep propping it up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Bad trouble. Now, how about it? Do I see you at your apartment tonight, or would you rather come down with me to Nero Wolf's right now? Archie, I... 
All right. I can't go with you now, and I've got a dinner date with my aunt tonight that I can't break, but I'll try to be back at my apartment by 11. Archie! Near Wolf's being. This is Archie, Mr. Wolf. I'm at Helen Tunis's apartment. Well? I could cut my throat for not making her come with me this afternoon. Trouble? Not for her anymore, poor kid. I got here three minutes ago and found her strangled. Couldn't have happened more than half an hour ago. Mac Lane. Mac Lane. Didn't Saul Panzer say he was getting a tail on him? He was a new man and he lost him. I should have left you on Mac Lane, Archie. Yeah, we were both wrong. What do you want me to do? Phone the police immediately. This is 32nd Street. I'm only three blocks in a job from the office. What if I come back and call from there? Come back, then. I'll phone Kramer myself. Mr. Wolf, I'm still kicking myself for that. Look out, Archie. Too late, Mr. Wolf. Keep coming right in, Goodwin. With your hands up. No, I wouldn't try that. McLean. And keep your hand out of that desk drawer, Wolf. This time you're too late, McLean. My hand's in the drawer, and I think I'll leave it there. You don't think I'd shoot? I'm sure you would. But you've got two of us to cover now. No, Archie, don't try to draw yet. How'd you get in here, McLean? He surprised me after making his way in through the area way below, and of course, it had to be Fritz's night out. I caught your fat friend just two seconds before he could get in his call to the police, Goodwin. I overheard his talk with you from the hallway here. My apologies for not crying out sooner, Archie. Get your hand out of that drawer. Pull it out without the gun, Wolf, or I'll let you have it now. I refuse to, McLean. Seems obvious that you mean to kill us in any case. I'm afraid that's true, Wolf. But when you called me here and Goodwin started making dates with Helen Tunis... Poor kid, I told her not to talk to you. He didn't, Goodwin. I've been scared of you and Wolf since I followed Colby here that first night. Colby? You knew him as Caffrey. I caught up with him afterward in that subway washroom. No, keep that hand up. And watch that gun of yours, Wolf. When I found that envelope on him and read the letter to you contained in it... I knew he hadn't spilled the whole South Carolina story to you. South Carolina? Would the original knifing have been taking place anywhere near Hampton or Jasper Counties? Hampton County. But our business is over the line in Georgia. It doesn't matter now. Uh, pity, Archie. We learned this afternoon that we were growing warm on South Carolina. Mr. McLean, may I ask what you hope to achieve by this insane project of disposing of Mr. Goodwin and myself? I'm buying time, Wolf. I've 90,000 in small bills in that bag there, plus a plane ticket of Buenos Aires. I've got a silencer on this gun. If you two aren't found till tomorrow morning, I'll be out of the country before they start looking for me. You don't think the police will put out an alarm for you when they find the body of Helen Tunis? Goodwin left it to you to report that, Remember? Let's remind ourselves to be prompter on reporting death, Sachi. Starting with our own, Mr. Wolf. Glad you can take it that way, Goodwin. You actually think you can knock the two of us off? I'm about to find out, Goodwin. One moment, McLean. You've never been a real gambler. You know that. With marked cards, of course. But you're not the man to face a sure loss now. A sure loss? The loss of your life. Within seconds after you try to pull that trigger. I told you I had a silencer. You think anyone will hear the shots? There will be more shots than you count on. My hand's on a pistol now in this drawer, and Mr. Goodwin has a thirty-eight in his shoulder holster. You can't shoot through the desk, and Goodwin won't get a chance to draw. You're an intelligent man, McLean. Vicious, but intelligent. May I describe the certainty of your immediate death if you don't throw that pistol on the desk and give yourself up? There are two of you, I know that, but... McLean, you must be aware that in the actual fact... Exceedingly few men are killed instantly by a single shot, even from a pistol of heavy caliber. The one you hold is a thirty-two, And it's a forty-five in that drawer, McLean. I assure you, McLean, that neither of us will surrender the weapons we have. Should you start shooting, we'll both do our best to draw and keep firing till you're dead. You're stalling, Wolf. What have I got to lose by trying for you both now? Your life? I'll correct that. The loss of some six or eight weeks of your life, possibly months. Whatever the time necessary to bring you to trial and to convict you and execute you for the murders you've committed. Suppose I cancel you out and then take my chances with Goodwin. A better choice, but still a dubious one. I am fat, exceedingly fat. 
And for perhaps the first time in my life, I'm thoroughly grateful for that. My bulk affects the calculation, McLean. McLean, you could pull off all seven shots and still not hit Mr. Wolf where it counts. You have to start, you better start on me. You exaggerate, Archie, and I thank you for the gallantry of it. No, it's quite likely that with two or three shots, McLean might well dispose of me, but not uh, with your first shot, McLean, and we'll not permit you many more than your first. Look, if I promise to do no more than tie you two up to give me my head start, will you toss in your guns? Of course not. Do I speak for us both, Archie? Check. I say let's start it now. Wolf, if I give you half of what's in that bag, would you forget these admissions I've made and help on my defense? I've told you I refuse to bargain. I think that I shall count five. If your weapon hasn't been tossed on the desk by then, I'll do my best to get my pistol into action. How are you in accord, Archie? Start counting. Wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. One. If I trade half that bag for no shooting and one hour start, no tying up, just your promise that... Two. All the bag for a half hour start, 90,000. Three. Are you ready, Archie? All set, sir. Uh, except if you're the one who walks out of this, call up every number in my little red book, huh? And tell each girl I was thinking of her just before you got the five. Agreed. I resume four. Okay. You win. Holy sweet Susan, it worked, it worked. A commendable choice, McLean, for us at least. You see, I'm afraid I forgot to mention one slight factor which might have operated in your favor. What's that, boss? I must confess, Archie, that my forty-five is in the upstairs den where I took it to oil it last night. Holy cow, you didn't have a gun? Why, you dirty... Take it easy, McLean, I've really got one. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wolf, <laughs> signals off on those women, huh? When my heart gets back down out of my throat, I'll call them myself. I'll trouble you for a beer first, Archie. And then if you'll be good enough to phone Inspector Kramer, you can bid him pick up his triple murderer. The one-time cutter of cards. Fortunately for us, who's never been a real gambler. <laughs> ah, you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and Lorraine Carter, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Vic Rodman. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Phantom Fingers. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? You're expecting Mr. Wolf at your place in three hours? Your place is where? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm expecting Hetty Lamar in 15 minutes. Yeah, but, mister, we're both out of luck. <laughs> Archie, what are you babbling about? Well, there's a character on the phone who's laboring under the naive delusion that you're about to make a trip upstate. His name? Finley, he said. In that case, he's quite correct. Yeah, he's quite... Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Finley. Mr. Wolf will be there. Yeah, goodbye. I shall need some beer, Archie. The bottle opener's in the right-hand drawer. Thank you. What one of us needs is a psychiatrist. You're voluntarily leaving your happy home, exposing yourself to the elements, entrusting your only life to a savage automobile? I am. Oh, oh, oh. somebody's offered you the United States Treasury, huh? Mr. Finley happens to grow orchids. Among them, he has developed a plant possessing spurred labili. I have an opportunity to purchase a couple of the plants, therefore... I don't believe it. But Archie, according to the reports I have received, he has produced a strain of black cypripidium. Oh, well, in that case. But, Mr. Wolf, while it's true that black may be the color of your true love's hair, 
It is also true that black is the color of funerals. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Beginning of the case of the Phantom Fingers actually had nothing to do with black orchids. The first act was played in an old house at the end of an old dirt road. It was short and simple. As short as life. And as simple as murder. Joe, I didn't believe the letters I got. Didn't believe them until now. I've been a lonely man. No wife, no children. Joe, it was all coming to you after I died. There was no need for you to steal from me. All you had to do was wait. Joe, and that gun, put it down. No, no, no. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. How much longer? Oh, an hour, maybe. Why? I'm a fool. Yeah, well, payday's tomorrow. I refuse to agree with you. <laughs> Besides, the trip's been fine so far, huh? So there's snow on the road, but... Uh, Fooey. Well, it's nice snow. Pretty soon it'll be spring, and in the spring... If you mention old Tidmas once more, I shall strangle you. Uh, no, no, it's against the law. But you know, if that snow melts much faster, the trees won't look so pretty. Trees? Are they really necessary? Uh-huh. People cut them down and make paper out of them. And they take the paper and make dollar bills. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, we're surrounded by future fees. I prefer the finished product. What on earth is that? Sounds like a river. Indeed. Except there aren't any rivers around here. Hey! Yeah? Up ahead. What? Huh? It's a river. Only it isn't a river. It's wet. It's wet and it's got waves on it. Had to start raining, too. Nature. Fui. The road behind us is covered with water. We just have to keep going onward and upward. Would you like to recite Excelsior to me? Why, sure. Shades of night were falling fast when through an alpine village passed... An idiot of your caliber, no doubt. Oh. <sighs> An infernal engine has died. No, no, the road dips up ahead. And where it dips, there's a junior Mississippi growing up. Splendid. Not so splendid. We can't go back and we can't go forward. Why not? They didn't build this model to swim. No foresight. What do we do now? Well, we could abandon the car and, uh... Walk, are you mad? Are you seriously suggesting I indulge in a foot race with the flood? Yeah, well, not seriously, but, uh... Oh, you've decided to give the car a swimming lesson? No. There's what looks like a cow path leading off the highway. To your right. Maybe it's a road. We progress. We now follow the footstep of the cow. Ah, it is a road. An old dirt road. Not only that, it goes up. Is that good? Theoretically. We might get above the water that way. And if the theory fails? Mr. Wolf, how are you on the Australian crawl? Hey, there's been another car on this road before us. You can see the tire tracks in the mud. Interesting. An indication that there are other maniacs about. I myself would not have chosen this particular spot to picnic in. Well, it's not that. There's somebody lying on the road. People have peculiar habits. Ignore him and drive on. Uh-uh. Hold on a moment. Mr. Wolf, you better come out here. My madness has its limits. The answer is no. Serious, Archie? Very serious. Oh, very well. Uh, oh, oh, Good heavens. 
Yeah, it's still oh, alive, but... Uh, the man's being shot. He's uh, mumbling. Uh, Joe. Uh, He's Joe. yelling for Joe. Be still. Uh, don't forgive stealing. Uh, don't. Uh, uh, uh. So much for that. Pick him up, Archie. Put him in the car. Might be bad for him to be moved. No. There is nothing that can be bad for him. He's dead. Is this blasted road leading anywhere, Archie? Well, seems to be a clearing up ahead. Maybe... Hey, it's a house. Splendid. I'm not so sure. It's perched up on top of a cliff, surrounded on three sides by nothing. On the side facing us, there's a deep ravine and a small wooden bridge. An island in the air. Hmm. Yeah. High enough to keep above water, maybe, but... Now, that bridge doesn't look too good. Rain may have weakened it. I have no choice, Archie. I have no intention of being drowned in these barbaric surroundings. The bridge, Archie. Okay, hold on. Oh, the thing's collapsing under us. Our momentum, sir. Well, if it doesn't, 37 blondes are going to be wearing black. Correction, 38. I forgot the one in Gimbel's bargain basement. Hey, we made it. The bridge will never be the same, though. There's a car ahead of us in front of the house. The car from which our friend, our dead friend, was thrown. Only one set of car tracks in the mud along the road, and here... And all we have to do is walk in, ask for the owner of the house, and, uh... Possibly, and possibly not. Archie, go through the corpse's pockets. Oh, that's not cricket. Yeah, all right, all right, I'm going through. There's not much on him. Handkerchief, silver, driver's license... The name was uh, James Miller. Address Garner Lane. Walden. Now I've got an idea this is Garner Lane, Mr. Wolf. In which case, someone named Joe was looking after the house for him, committed theft, and murdered Miller. Miller's body was then dumped on the road in the hopes that the floods would wash the body away. No one at the house seems to have noticed our arrival. Nope. Well, let's go in and ask for Joe, huh? Very well. Uh, oh. Uh, mm. uh, hard. With the bridge down, there's absolutely no way of getting on or off this place. Except for a mountain goat. I don't know any mountain goats. <laughs> I used to know a plain goat once, though. Indeed. He ran at the fifth at Jamaica. Stop mourning. I never mourned her. Also, I never win bets on horse races. <laughs> That's why I continue to work for you. That is also why you had better ring the door then. Okay, okay. Nobody's going to break a leg rushing to open the door. I suppose you try. I have had more than enough of the weather. Is that polite? Besides, the killer may have some more bullets in that gun. Are you afraid? Sure. Fooey, the door, Archie. But old Dr. Tidmouse would say... Well, oh, never mind. Mm. Hey, somebody was careless leaving the door open like that. On the other hand, does a spider ever shut its web? The answer is no. Are we flies? Yes. Out of my way, Archie. There are lights up ahead. Must be the living room. Uh, 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 excuse me. Uh, sure, sure, your excuse. Uh, do you live here, sir? Do we? No, don't you? Of course not. This is very strange. I came out to see the people who live here, or the person. I found the door open and no one about I've been sitting in this corner now for a long time. Well, it's a pity no one offered you a plum pie. Then you could have stuck in your thumb. You saw no one enter, sir? Uh, no one at all. I didn't want to go any further. It would have seemed like prying. Perhaps you had better come along with us. Well, uh, all right. You know, this place, it has an evil atmosphere. It certainly has. What it needs is fresh air. Hooey. This would be the living room door. A job, it. It is. Looks as pretty as a picture. At the... Oh. Hello. Well, just think of it. Five minutes ago, you know, I didn't know you existed. And you didn't know I existed. And now... Archie, uh, your existence would have a sudden end unless you keep quiet. Uh, excuse us for intruding, Miss... Intruding? Uh, oh, but I really should ask you to excuse me. You do not live here? I wish I did, but... You see, I've been out walking. I live maybe a oh, mile from here, and then when the flood began, I, I thought I'd come in here and stay for a while. 
And you found? An empty house. That's not what I found. As old Dr. Tidmouse has often said... Go through the rest of the house, Archie. Go through the rest... Yeah, well, never mind. I'll, uh... Shh. What's that? Somebody's walking. Coming downstairs. I'll go and see. Hey, you! Come on into the living room. Meet your guests in one or several pieces as you prefer. You what? Ah. Oh. Hiya, folks. Ah, oh, who's the last... That's very funny. I think I'll laugh. Uh, uh. May I ask why? Because this here ain't my dump. I was just casing the joint. I mean, I was just taking a stroll. Through the house? I'm eccentric. Oh, clever. However, I think you'd better stay. Why? Because you may turn out to be the owner of this house after all. I rather think introductions are in order. Well, I'm Peg Shirley. Uh, my name is Wagner. Joseph Wagner? Uh, Lewis. How about you, Stroller? Cregan. Sam Cregan. Hmm. Pig, Louis, Sam. Mr. Cregan, while you were strolling upstairs, did you notice anyone else about? No. There was no one outside when Archie and I entered. The bridge is down, effectively cutting us off from further visitors. We may assume, therefore, that we are the only people in or about this house. Yeah, it's cozy, ain't it? Which further means that one of you three is... A murderer. A murderer. The murderer is the person who owns or lives in this house. All three of you denied being that person. Conclusion: One of you is a liar. Well, I, 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 that. How I hardly expected a full immediate confession. However, we are absolutely isolated here. No one is going to come or leave until we have a killer. You know, you can't really keep us here. The flood can and will. Remember, the bridge is no longer. So you see, just the five of us alone. No one else inside the house, no one outside. Therefore... <laughs> Correction, Mr. Wolf. Maybe it's a branch or something tapping against the door. Unlikely. Archie. Okay, I'll go see who or what it is. Oh, hey! Uh, oh, what the what? What? I got him. Somebody shut the door. Yeah, all right, I get it. A disreputable and unwashed gentleman, head badly hurt. Is he conscious, Archie? I, uh, I don't know. He's mumbling something. Legs pushed off. Fell from the ledge. He's passed out. I guess he was trying to say that somebody pushed him out on a ledge. On the side of the cliff, maybe. He must have regained consciousness and crawled to the house. Where'll I put him, Mr. Wolf? Bedroom, I suppose. We'll need first aid. We can't get a doctor. Cregan, where are the bedrooms? Yeah, one right up at the head of the stairs. And don't ask me how I happen to know. We shan't, Archie. Okay. I'll need somebody to help me carry him up without shaking him too badly. Cregan? Okay. Uh, let's go. As for the rest of you, Mr. Wagner, Miss Shirley, I suggest we return to the living room. But I don't see any reason why we should take orders from you. One of you is a murderer. I include Mr. Cregan, of course. Oh, but that poor man wasn't dead. Not for lack of trying. However, I was not referring to him. You mean... You mean someone else has been killed? Precisely. That is why I hope we shall not hear another knocking at the door. It could only be a corpse. <laughs> Archie. And Cregan. Yeah. The injured man? Still out. Probably got a concussion. Uh, did he say anything further? Well, he babbled a bit. I don't know if... Uh, we should assume we're among friends, Archie. Exactly what did he say? Well, he was pushed over the edge of the cliff because he saw Miller killed. Ah. Did he also see who? No. Passed out before he had a chance. He's an old tramp, Mr. Wolf. He was bumming his way through the country when he saw the murder. He must have decided on a touch of blackmail and receiving a concussion instead, which may last for hours or for days. <gasps> Somebody's playing with the lights. Some fool. Uh, the switch was over this way. Ah. Ah, the lights are on again. Whose idea was that? Well, I had nothing to do with this. Me neither. Miss Shirley, why did you scream? Oh, well, someone brushed against me in the, in the darkness. You were standing? Uh, near the table, this table. Archie? No, nothing on the table except a bunch of keys on a ring. Eh, hey, something screwy. Why should a guy put the lights out just to deposit a bunch of keys on a table? Obvious. 
Without doubt, those are the keys of this house. Possession of them would have disclosed which of you lives here and which of you therefore killed Miller. It's late. I shall sleep down here, lacking an elevator to transport me upstairs. The elevator's lacking. Yes, the rest of you should be able to find bedrooms upstairs. Good night. Yeah, Archie. Yeah? Follow them upstairs. Spend the night awake. Okay. Good heavens, Archie. On my way. What's cooking up here? Uh, somebody's playing with the lights up Strike a match. Get uh-huh. on half die. I got a flashlight. Oh, yeah. oh, here it is. Light switch. You know, this putting out of lights is getting to be somebody's bad habit. Well, all three of you seem to be okay. Stay here. Where, right. where are you going? Tramps room, right here at the head of the stairs. Think of all your good deeds while I'm gone. All right, downstairs again. What, again? Oh, dear. What happened? Well, it was more than a bunch of keys this time. Oh, that knife. There's blood on it. There should be. I just pulled it out of a man's heart. Wow. Well, Mr. Wolf, one of these three babies doused the lights, popped into the tramps room, deposited the knife in his chest, and popped right out again. The knife you're holding? Yeah. Intelligent of you to wrap a handkerchief around the handle. Well, whoever killed the tramp didn't have time to fool around with gloves, so... There should be prints on the knife handle. Satisfactory, Archie. That's mild enthusiasm. Archie, on that desk, an ink pad. Yeah. Miss Shirley, mm-hmm. you carry face powder, of course? Yes, I do. Archie will need it to bring out the prints on the knife. He will then fingerprint each of you. Compare your prints with those on the knife. And we shall have a murderer to hand over to the police. Archie, will you begin, please? Here they are, Mr. Wolf. Three cards labeled with Miss Shirley's name, Cregan's, and Wagner's. Their respective prints are on each card. Good. I have the knife here. Several quite distinct prints on it. It should be child's play to, uh... Hmm. Archie. Yeah? Take your own prints and mine. What? Do as I say quickly. Yes, sir. All right, give me your thumb. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Now mine. Thank me. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's something wrong. Something wrong and deadly loose in this house tonight. Well, there's a card with your prints and mine. Thank you. <clears throat> now you got five cards all together. So I have. Uh, Archie. What now? Take the ink pad and a fresh card with you. Where am I going with them? Upstairs. But, Mr. Wolf, there's nobody upstairs except the corpse. Precisely. It is his prints I want. Oh, this is... Oh, Archie. Yeah, I got the dead man's prints. Will all of you please sit? All right, but it's... Good heavens, young woman. Be careful. We want no accidents. I'm sorry. I caught my high heels in the rug. Archie, the card with the corpse's prints on it. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Mm. You know, I've had quite enough of this nonsense. Have you, Mr. Wagner? Yeah, and so have I, Mr. Wolf. Also, I don't think you know what you're doing. Perhaps not. However, I have something rather interesting to tell all of you. There is no one in this house besides yourselves, except, of course, for the dead man upstairs... There is no one on the rock on which this house stands except for another dead man in our car. Look, we already know all that. Bear with me. We may rule out secret passages, unusual hiding places, or anything of that esoteric and childish nature. We may also rest assured that no one has come to or left this house or rock within the last few hours. Well, that means we're kind of hermetically sealed here, huh? Meaning also that whoever was here when the tramp was killed is still here. Still here in this room. Correct, Archie. Now then, I have checked the dead tramp's prints against those on the knife. Theoretically, suicide was possible. However, the prints do not match. That guy was in no condition to kill himself anyway. True. And I checked Archie's prints and mine against those on the knife. No similarity. Oh, but no one suspected either of you. Thank you, but I had to be thorough. That left only the three of you. I compared your cards and the prints on them with the prints on the handle of the knife. And? I want you to remember one thing very clearly. We are the only living people in this house or on this rock of land. No tricks are possible and may be ruled out. All right, so what? This. 
The prints on the handle of the knife that pierced the heart of the man upstairs do not match his prints or the prints of anyone in this room. Yeah, oh, no, well. mine wouldn't match. Would you mind saying that again? He doesn't have to. In those cards, Mr. Wolf has the prints of everybody here. And yet none of them match the prints on the knife handle. But, well, in that case, who or, or what killed him? Why, there must be someone else in the house. I give you my word, there is not. Hey, you thinking about ghosts or something? Ghosts never leave fingerprints. I... I, I've got to get away. I can't stand this. Me too. Come on, lady. But I, I'll come along with you, if you don't mind. Mr. Wolf. Let them go. The bridge is down. They can't get far. Okay. I don't get it. Get what? Well, the fingerprint business. And who killed Miller, plus the tramp? The identity of the killer, Archie, is quite obvious. It is? To who? To whom? Who's whom? <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah, I'm stalling for self-respect. You know? Uh, Of course I do. I have no conclusive proof, however. I had hoped the fingerprints would be of assistance there, but they proved to be phantoms. I'm still smarting about the other thing. You know, it's at times like this that I almost agree with you about my intelligence. Lack of intelligence? Yeah, well, don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Just go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe you better rub it in. From now on, you may refer to my brain in the negative. In the negative? Bless you, Archie. What I've just done, I don't know, but can I have a raise? No. I'll take it back. You can't. Get the others in at once. Mr. Wolf, you now have the appearance of Mr. Wolf being surrounded by several dozen bottles of beer. What have I done? You've explained the fingerprints, Archie. Hurry. I don't want to keep the killer in suspense. I'm very nervous. I don't like this. Archie. They're all here. Yes, but they're all making a noise. Stop them. Miss Shirley, Mr. Krieg, and Mr. Wagner, will you please shut? Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf, they have. Thank you, Archie. Now then, I have known for some little time which of you killed the tramp and Miller. I lack proof, however. And you... you have it now? I will admit for a while I was flummoxed by the negative evidence of the fingerprints. They seem to indicate that the tramp was murdered by a phantom. However, the word negative itself has solved the minor problem. Minor to whom? To whom? Never mind. Shh. Archie, what is the salient feature of a film negative? Well, I suppose it's the fact that the darks are light and the lights are dark. Precisely. A reversal, then, of the actual appearances. Now, are there any similarities between filmed images and fingerprints? Oh, in a way... You could call the whorls and hollows that determine the individual characteristics of a fingerprint the lights and darks, huh? You could. I shall. Miss Shirley, would you help in an experiment? Well, of course. Thank you. Archie, I want you to take Miss Shirley's fingerprints once again. Okay. Pad and card. Here you are, Miss Shirley. All right. Archie, quick. Huh? Grab her arm. I got it. Usually I don't have to be coached, but... Let go of me. What are you trying to do? Miss Shirley... You already had pressed your fingers on the ink pad once. Why were you about to do it a second time? Well, I... I just wanted to make a better impression. Fury. Archie, wipe some of the ink off her fingers. Oh, but then it won't be any good. It'll be very good, Archie. I've well, done it. And take the print. No. No, let go of me. Maybe I never hurt women if I can help it, but right now I won't be able to help it. Mr. Wolf wants your prints all over again, so down on the nice white card. No. Hey, thanks. Will you let me have that card now, Archie? Sure. In the meanwhile, hold on to Miss Shirley. A pleasure. Indeed? Would you continue to think so, Archie, if I told you that Miss Shirley's first name is not Peg, but happens to be Josephine, for which the diminutive is Joe? Glad they're fixing the bridge. I was beginning to think we'd be here forever. Boy, we have been. <laughs> you know, if those black orchids have been holding their breath waiting for you, they're going to be red in the face. Hey, hey new breed, red orchids, huh? Ah, uh, gee, must you talk? Well, it's fun. Also, you've been holding out on me about the case. I surrender. Okay. You know, when we compared the new prints of Josephine with those on the knife, you could have knocked me over with a sash weight. They were identical. Naturally. She stabbed the tramp. Yeah, but what was the fingerprint gag? She merely loaded her fingers so heavily with ink that she falsified the markings. 
She filled up the hollows and walls with ink. The result was that ridges became hollows and vice versa, in the same fashion that a photographic negative falsifies lights and darks. You got that when I mentioned the word negative. It works, huh? Try it sometime. Yeah, the very next bank I rob. <laughs> but you said you knew who killed Miller and the Tramp even before you exposed the fingerprint gimmick. How? We knew Miller's murderer lived in this house. Had been stealing from him and so on. Uh-huh. Stealing what? Cash, of course. He, as the girl admitted, was an eccentric, kept his money on the property. Cregan had probably heard of it, hence his casing of the house. Yeah? Our problem, therefore, was to discover who lived in this house. All three suspects denied it. Josephine Shirley told us, as you may remember, that she'd gone for a walk and then been driven by the flood to this house where we found her. Well, that's what she said. It could have been. No. Because, as you may also remember, she tripped at one point over the living room rug and mentioned why. Sure. Sure, she said she was wearing high heels. Uh Uh-oh, because out in the country there are no pavements, so girls don't go for walk in high heel shoes. Therefore, she hadn't gone for a walk. Therefore, she was lying. Therefore, she killed Miller and... (laughs) I should have noticed those heels myself. You should have, Archie. Your trouble, I suspect, was that uh, you didn't notice the feet for the legs. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, Howard McNear, Tim Graham, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Vanishing Shells. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? No, he isn't. Huh? Oh, well, <laughs> for you, maybe he is. I'm not here. Oh, yes, yeah. He's always here. I've gone out. No, no. He seldom ever goes out. I won't start on anything tonight. Oh, well, sure. He'd love to start on a case tonight. What's your name? Oh, that's a beautiful name. Address? Archie, it's another woman. Hang up. No, no, no. Honest, I'm not Mr. Wolf, but I'm his agent. Yeah, I'll be right over, miss. Goodbye. What's her trouble? Where are you going? Well, she said she's received some threatening notes and she's afraid to leave her hotel. So long, boss. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> We prefer to call tonight's story the case of the vanishing shells. It didn't seem to be difficult at first, but... Well, I'm not a stupid individual, but so often... Ooh, so often I allow myself to become mesmerized by beautiful women. Eh, heaven bless them. Doris Murray was such a woman. She phoned us first late one afternoon about 5 o'clock. Then again at 5.30. Very well, Mr. Goodwin, but I, I would prefer to see Mr. Wolf. Well, I said I'd be there at 6, Miss Murray. I don't want to talk any longer on the phone. Please hurry. There... There's someone at the door. I'll see you in the cocktail lounge at your hotel. At 
Six o'clock. That's half an hour. Don't fail. Who is it? Emil Stoner. Oh, come in, Emil. You got my call, darling. Here, let me take your briefcase. I, I, I'll just put it here on the piano, Doris. Oh, I'm terribly upset about those threatening notes, darling. I, I know it's upset you, too, but I'm determined to find out who it is. I'm not going to let them bluff me out of my first chance to play the star part in one of your shows. But look, Doris, there's that other part. Other? Is that all I mean to you? Well, what can they divulge that'll harm us? What? Several things. And I can't afford... A, I mean at this time... You're frightened, Amo. Doris, I'm going to give the star part to Paula. Paula! You've been divorced for four years. Why? Because I feel she and can... And play it better. Is that what you're going to say? Well, I can act rings around her. Now, 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 look, Doris. I know it's a big disappointment to you, but that's the way it is. Get out. Get out. Go on across the hall to Paula. Give her the part. Louse up your show. She and that playwright of hers. Get out, Emil. But, Doris... You frightened little... Get out! <laughs> I believe, Mr. Wolf, you're making a great mistake in not coming along. Indeed. I'm sure that what attracts you could not possibly be of interest to me. A gal needs help. Money is money. Girls, money. Fooey. Yeah, well, we could have dinner out for a change. They have one of the finest chefs in town at that hotel. You're most impolite. I'm trying to read this book. Poetry. Archie. Uh, yes, sir? Shut up. Uh, uh... Well, we need money. That filthy green cabbage is necessary to our existence. This may be a tough case, you know. I... You're sufficiently intelligent. Sometimes. Mm. If I sat around like you do, I'd weigh 500 pounds, too. How'd you leave the room besides it's only 300? What a way to run a business. Orchids, beer, books. <laughs> Don't keep the charming client waiting. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. And always remember, there is a telephone. Thank you, waiter. <clears throat> oh, good evening, Miss Moray. I'm Archie Goodwin. Well, I didn't expect... I mean, please sit down. Well, I think I should explain the absence of Nero Wolf. <laughs> there's, uh, there's so much of him that it's not too convenient to transport it about. I do all the outside work. And I'm sure you do it well. Uh, Mr... Well, you know, some women call me Goodwin and some call me Mr. Goodwin. And, uh... Yes? Uh, the unattached call me Archie. Hello, Archie. Oh, splendid. I'm glad to hear it. Now we can get right down to the nasty old business that's troubling you, Doris. First, here's the 500 retainer fee. Well, you thank you. Now, what's the note about? Well, there are two notes, both printed by hand. Uh-huh. Oh, will you hand me my purse, please? Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, I see. Doris Moray, if you fail to withdraw from the cast of Stoner's next production by start of rehearsals Monday, both you and Stoner will have a blasted reputation and perhaps other injuries... From which you will be unable to recover. The other one is like it, only more vehement. Yeah, someone or a group of someones are intent on keeping you out of Stoner's shows, huh? It's too bad. His next one is said to be a sure smash hit. And a star-making part for the leading woman. Yes, Emil Stoner wants me to play it. He's been planning on it ever since David Banning wrote the play. What does David Banning think of you playing the part? Well, I... I don't think he's too enthused about it. You see, Mr. Stoner and Paula Kenyon have been divorced for four years, but... She has continued to be his top leading woman. Now she's engaged to David Banning, who wrote this play. Oh. Makes things a bit difficult. Well, of course, Rick Hunter, Stoner's director, is... Hunter's somewhat in favor of your playing the part. Well, Rick Hunter is very fond of my work. And very fond of you as well, huh? Yes, unfortunately. I... I like Rick Hunter tremendously, but... Emil Stoner has been of greater interest to me. In fact, we're more or less engaged, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, had any words lately with the ex-Mrs. Stoner, Paula Canyon? Is that her name? Paula and I were great friends when I first joined the Stoner Productions, but I don't know, she... I, I don't think she appreciated the fact that Mr. Stoner and Rick Hunter, the director, took such an interest in me. Tell me, did you ever think you were in love with Rick Hunter? Yes, at first I was thrilled by his artistic imagination. And then as time went on, I realized that he was subject to melancholia. Mr. Stoner was more stable, and I needed someone older to advise me. Well, what's wrong with your reputation of Mr. Stoner's? Well, there's nothing I fear, but I'm afraid Mr. Stoner is somewhat disturbed by these threats. He, 
He feels there's something in his past of sufficient import to really harm him. I, I think it's nonsense. Well, then what we have to do is uncover this person or persons before you end up with ruined careers on Broadway. Where does the ex-Mrs. Stoner live? Well, as a matter of fact, she lives just down the hall from me. Lived here for years. Oh, well, I think it's advisable, honey, that you stay close to your room until we solve this thing. Oh, but I'm not afraid for my life, Archie. No? Well, I am. I'll see you into your room, Doris. Oh, now, please, Mr. Goodwin, if oh, you... Oh, you don't trust the boy, huh? Well, I... Such beautiful eyes. Oh, I... Lovely red hair. Yeah. You could have the lead in my new play. I never wrote one, but for you, I'll try anything. <laughs> Come along. Here's your bag. Well, hello, Doris. Oh, hello, Rick. Mr. Goodwin, this is Rick Hunter. Hiya, Hunter. Nice shows you've been putting on. I've just been admiring your work, Goodwin. Hey, oh, well, that's nice. I'm glad. Nothing like encouragement for a beginner, Mr. Hunter. You're ready for the big time from what I saw. Heard from Emil Stoner today, Doris? I talked to him once this morning. Uh, have you been sitting in the cocktail lounge all afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> that I have, honey. I want to see you play that lead, baby. And I think I just about got it all settled. Dreaming about it won't settle it. Like I never accomplished anything in itself, Rick. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. He's a very jealous man, Doris. In fact, right now, I can feel his thoughts piercing me between the shoulder blades. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Here's a phone book. Yes, Archie? How do you know it's Archie? I felt the time was exactly right for you to call. I wish you felt it was time to earn some money. Is this a worthwhile case? Well, she's a beautiful redhead, and... Uh... That, of course, makes it very worthwhile. Yeah, well, I got 500 as a retainer. Fooey, a pittance, and probably all you'll ever get. What do you mean by that? She's probably guilty. Now, look, boss, she's the victim. Received notes threatening her reputation and her health if she plays the star part in Emil Stoner's new production. Also, they threaten Emil Stoner, likewise. The playwright, Dave Banning, is engaged to Paula Kenyon. Incidentally, she lives here at the hotel, too, just down the hall from Doris. I remember her. And the playwright wants Paula Kenyon to play the part. Well, Archie, you have only the beginning. It is probably too late to prevent whatever is going to happen. Like what, for instance? Have you found a body yet? Call me after you find the body. What body? There's no body. But there will be, Archie. There's always a body where you are concerned. Either a body beautiful or a dead one. Bye. Bye. Thanks for seeing me to my room, Archie. Oh, I'm not stopping here, Doris. I'll take a look inside. But I'm not... Oh, I insist. Part of my job, you know. If I fail to take every precaution, Mr. Wolf would never... Well, look in that chair. Emil. Emil? Emil Stoner? Uh, uh, oh, three red dots on his shirt front. Uh, uh, Doris, Doris, hold on. I, I'm all right. Yes, I, I'm all right. All right, sit down. That's it. Uh, now, let's see. The body's still warm. What's this crumpled in his left hand? A horoscope. Between the fingers of his right hand, an unlit cigarette. Monogram PK. Paula Kenyon. This horoscope is for March. Something he picked up from your desk here? I don't believe in astrology. Where'd he get this cigarette with Paula Kenyon's monogram? Oh, poor Emil. Poor Emil. I didn't believe anyone would really harm us. Why was I so stubborn? When did you see him last? Please, shouldn't we do something? Call the police. No, 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 not yet. When did you see him? Why, I, I saw him this morning. I, I'm so shocked I can hardly think clearly. Doris. Yes? There's a briefcase here on the piano with a newspaper on top of it. What? Oh, it, it is, yes. It's it's Emil's. He, he must have left it here this morning. That's strange. Emil Stoner was bald, but... But What? Well, I'm sure he's a man who always wore a hat, but I see no hat. He must have come up the elevator as I went down to meet you. Who would know he'd come up here? Your director, Rick Hunter, he said he'd been in the bar all afternoon. What else was it he said? Thought he had everything just about settled. Oh, no, Rick couldn't. He just... Oh, Mr. Goodwin, I, I couldn't believe that. I can believe anything about anybody. I learned that the hard way. In my book, everybody's guilty until proved otherwise. Even you, baby. What? Even you. Yeah. A Herald Tribune newspaper. 
Are you sure you haven't seen him since this morning, Doris? What are you doing? Absolutely nothing. Someone came in here and shot him. Call the police. I insist. Maybe... What? Maybe I did leave my door unlocked. Why did I do that? Well, they couldn't have opened the door otherwise, could he? No. Give me the check room, please. Oh, hello. Did you, uh... Do you know Mr. Emil Stoner, the producer? You do? Well, uh, tell me, did he check his hat with you this afternoon or this evening? He didn't, huh? All right, thanks. He must have carried it up here to this floor. Doris, do you have a gun? I own a gun. A small twenty-five automatic. But it's not here. Where is it? I had the handle repaired and it's been in my dressing room for a week or two. I hate to do this, Doris, but I'm going to move the body away from the back of that chair. Oh. There. Yeah, three wounds. One bullet went through the upper part of the chest, out the middle of the back. I'd say right through the heart. By the angle of the wound, he was shot while sitting down. Please, Mr. Goodwin, must we stay here? I, I want to I give like... this room a thorough going over. We'll go down to the lobby. I want to use that phone booth again. And, Doris, I hope... I know what you're going to say. You hope that gun of mine... Is still in your dressing room at the theater. Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, Mr. Wolf, may I have your autograph? <laughs> I'm taking a correspondence course on how to be a detective, and I think you're a wizard. <laughs> so kind of you to say so. I would be just thrilled to have your autograph on the bottom of a paycheck. Why are you calling from a phone booth? What? Who said I was? It's obvious. There's no room tone reverberation. Uh, oh, well, you shouldn't have to ask. You know everything before it happens. You found the body, then. Happened just before you got there. Took the girl up to a room to be sure it was safe for her to go in, and... <laughs> okay, okay. And there, sitting in a big leather chair, was Emil Stoner. Shot three times with a small caliber gun, dead about an hour. One shot went through the body from the upper part of the chest to the middle of the back. Therefore, he was shot while sitting down. The killer was standing, huh? I'm listening. Oh. Well, his left hand was clutching a horoscope folder... And between the index and second finger of the right hand was an unlit cigarette with a monogram on it, P.K. Emil Stoner is bald, but there was no hat in the room. However, on the piano was his briefcase, and on top of it, a four o'clock afternoon edition of the Herald Tribune. Better look in the briefcase, Archie. No weapon? No, no weapon. But Doris Murray says she owns a twenty-five caliber automatic, and it's in her dressing room at the theater. Also, she claims she hadn't seen Stoner since this morning. You found no empty shells about the floor? None. What did you do with the bullet? What bullet? The one which passed through his chest and lodged in the back of the leather chair. Are you there? Boss, I'm a very stupid fella. Stop bragging. The bullet. Boss, there ain't no hole in the back of that chair. I just realized it. Maybe he was standing up. Ah, then the killer must have been on stilts. Archie, let us pretend. Only pretend. That you're very observant. Now proceed to Paula Kenyon's apartment, just down the hall, you said, and see what she knows without divulging the fact that Stoner is dead and look sharp. My gears must be slipping. Archie, do you know what great event will be celebrated tomorrow? Yeah, my birthday. What'd you get me? Cuthbert's correspondence detective course in four easy lessons. Bye. This is Paul's apartment. No answer. Let's see if it's open. Ah, oh, there's no one in sight. Come on in. Now, look, if anyone walks in on us, we found the door open and we just came in to wait. Which huh? is the truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ah, oh. here on the desk we have a stack of horoscope stars and a box of Paula's monogrammed cigarettes. Mr. Goodwin. Huh? This is Emil's grave fedora hat. And he was in this apartment this afternoon. What are you staring at? Oh, small pearl-handled automatic. Yes. Twenty-five caliber. Yeah, it's been fired very recently. We won't touch it now. Does it look like yours? Archie, it is mine. Yeah. Your initials? I found old Jenkins, the stage doorman at the theater, to look in my dressing room. And... Well, my gun isn't there. Did you leave the gun out in plain view in the dressing room? Yes, for several days anyway. Then I put it behind the mirror. I suppose many people have seen it. Then. I'm sure. 
I hope, Doris, that your fingerprints are not the only ones on that gun. If they use my gun to shoot him in my apartment, why would they bring the gun back here and leave it in plain well, sight? maybe they didn't do it just that way. No? His hat's here, the gun is here, and yet he's dead in your apartment. How can you answer that? Well, maybe he was sitting here waiting for Paula and someone called him out and over to your place and shot him. Ah, that's no good. Doesn't make sense. Now, if he was sitting in this chair here and someone entered that door, it'd be... Hey. What is it? Look in the chair back. Huh? Little round hole. Start looking for some empty shells around here. You find something? No, I want to make a call. He was shot with this automatic. Three shells were ejected. They certainly vanished. Here, yeah, Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm in Paula Kenyon's. She's not here. Found his hat, a stack of horoscopes on the desk, box of monogrammed cigarettes, a twenty-five automatic which belongs to Miss Moray, recently fired, but not an empty shell in sight. No blood, but a single small hole in the back of the chair near the desk. Doris Moray is with me. I will call Inspector Kramer now about the body and have ballistics check the bullets for the gun. And the bullet in the chair back? Did you find anything of particular importance in Emil Stoner's briefcase? Yes, I found... Never mind. Bring the girl here at once. Okay, boss. Say, don't you think I'd better wait for Paula Kenyon? Uh-oh, here she is. Bye. Bring her along, too, if you can. Goodbye. Hello, Paula. Well, Doris, what are you doing here? I wasn't aware that I left the door unlocked. Seems to be contagious this evening. I left mine unlocked, too. Hello, Dave. Uh, Miss Kenyon, Mr. Goodwin. Hello, Doris. Hello. Archie, this is Dave Banning, the playwright. How are you, Mr. Banning? How do you do? I've heard all about your new play, and I want to meet you. Doris thought you might be over here, and the door was ajar, so we, well... I just walked in. I hope you don't mind, Paul. Certainly not. I'm used to people just walking in. We were here a while ago and went down to the cocktail lounge for a while. When does the play open, or have you cast it yet? The Mr. Stoner handles that part of it. Are you a prospective investor, Goodwin? Oh, I've had a number of flings in the business. Matter of fact, I expect to see Mr. Stoner tonight. You do? Tonight? Here? I don't understand. What's this fencing all about? Doris, you're not just visiting me. We've hardly spoken for... Oh. Is that your gun, Miss Kenyon? It's yours, Doris. Yes, that's right, Paula. It was in my dressing room. When did you see Mr. Stoner last? But I haven't seen him today. I had lunch with him. Why? What hat did he wear at lunchtime, Mr. Banning? Why, the gray fedora. How did it get here? That's Amos. What is this? What are you two doing here? Where is Amos? Come on, cut out the melodramatics. Mr. Stoner is dead. He's what? Paula. And without any further explanation, I shall have to ask you to accompany me downtown. Police? If you will, please. They're still in the front room, boss. I'll bring them into your office when you're ready. Yes, R.J., I'm sure they're all anxious to talk. They've been sitting there for an hour now. Maybe we ought to make some sort of explanation to them, huh? Why? This sort of technique should work very well in this particular instance. Yeah, but I don't know about that director, Rick Hunter. He may be difficult. Does anyone know that you found the completed and signed contract in the briefcase? No one. Mm -hmm. Good. Now we have the threat notes, the contract, the afternoon newspaper, the briefcase, the fedora hat, the gun, no ejected shells, the horoscope, the cigarette, and the two chairs. One with a small hole in it. Come in. Ah, Inspector Kramer at last. Uh, what have you? Well, we covered every inch of that place and didn't find a single empty shell. There were two bullets in the body and the one that passed through him into the chair back in Paula Kenyon's place. They were all three fired from Doris Moray's little automatic. Any fingerprints on the gun? None but Doris Moray's. Not unexpected, to say the least. The bullet that was lodged in the chair in Paula's place went through his heart. Now, he was apparently shot in her room, but... Uh... But how did he get into Doris Moray's place? I'll be able to explain that when we locate those three empty shells, Inspector. Bring our guests in, Archie. Come in, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Miss Paula Kenyon. Hello. Miss Doris Murray. Hello, Mr. Mm -hmm. Rick Hutter, the director. How do you do? David Banning, the playwright. How do you do? Won't you be seated, please? May I present Inspector Kramer of Homicide? How do you do, Inspector? Yeah. Mr. Wolf has asked you here to give such details as you recall, which might be of assistance to him in the solution of the murder of Emil Stoner. 
Mr. Hunter, as the director, whom did you favor as the star of your next production? Why, Doris Murray. You have been deeply interested in Miss Murray? Hasn't done me much good. But you do love her? I do. And you are deeply interested in the progress of her career? I am, most assuredly. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made out and signed a contract for a certain woman to play the lead in the new show? No. You knew that Doris Murray had a gun in her dressing room? Yes. You were in the hotel cocktail lounge all afternoon until you met Doris and Mr. Goodwin? Yes. And you could have seen Emil Stoner into the lobby and go to the elevator? I could. Could you prove that you never left the cocktail lounge until you met Doris and Archie? Maybe not. Did you see Mr. Stoner going to the elevator? I did. Mr. Banning, you wrote the new play. Were you in favor of Miss Murray playing the part? I know. I felt Paula Kenyon was better suited for it. You and Miss Kenyon are engaged to be married? Yes. Anything happened to Mr. Stoner, you as next in line could assign the role as you saw fit? That's correct. Did you know that Mr. Stoner had made a final decision on the part? I did not. He didn't tell you anything about it at lunch today? No, I made a strong plea for Paula. You know about the gun in Miss Murray's dressing room? Everyone did, apparently. Very well. Uh, Miss Kenyon, did Emil Stoner visit your apartment often? Not often. We were not on too friendly terms. Did you phone him to visit you this afternoon? No, who said I did? No one? <laughs> I merely asked. Were you by any chance still in love with Emil Stoner? Now, see here, I don't appreciate that kind Just of talk. Just relax, Mr. Banning. I was not in love with Mr. Stoner. That was over. You and Doris Murray were at one time very friendly. Yes. Well, I found out how two-faced she was. Emil was a fool to fall for her, but you couldn't tell him anything. All she's interested in is a career. You're not interested in your career, Miss Kenyon. Well... Well, yes, in a way. You wanted the star part. You phoned Stoner this morning. Yes, but he said he was going to give it to her. You knew about Doris's gun? No, I you didn't. You recognized it immediately, boss. Well, yes, I knew. What if I did? Then you wrote these threatening notes to Miss Murray. I did not. I did not. You didn't know the contract had already been signed? No. Then you still had a motive to kill him. I wrote those notes. She had nothing to do with it. You can check them on my typewriter. We know, Mr. Banning. We've already done it. I know how it looks, but but Paula didn't do it. I, I knew he was coming to her place. I called him. I, I knew Paula was out. I did it. If so, what did you do with the ejected shell? I threw them away. How many? Three. Oh, no, David, please don't. I don't believe you, Mr. Banning. Miss Murray, did you know the contract had been made out and signed? No. You're lying, Miss Murray. You said you didn't see Stoner this afternoon. I didn't. You called him and asked him to visit you. You did get the threat notes and they frightened you. But you didn't know they would frighten Stoner. I did not phone him, nor did I see him. Yes, you did. His briefcase was on the piano. And he was there in the late afternoon because he brought with him a four o'clock edition of the Herald Tribune. What if he was there? I didn't kill him. He told you then about his decision. He left hurriedly. We got the briefcase and went to Paula's apartment to wait for her. That's not true. That's not true. Filled with rage, you got your gun, which you said had disappeared from your dressing room, then calmly put it into your bag, walked across the hall, and shot him as he sat reading a horoscope. No, no, no. Archie, her handbag. Thank you. Notice. I run my finger through a hole in the corner. She fired through the bag. And see... Three empty shelves. No. And here's a contract made out to Paula Kenyon. Too bad, Miss Murray. Well, that's a good day's work, boss. Some beer, Archie. Right. Say, tell me, how did Stoner, if he was shot in Paula's room, get back to Doris's room? She couldn't carry him. Oh, now, Archie, that's not too difficult. He walked. Shot through the heart? Impossible. That's a fallacy, Archie. Our official medical records show that people have walked a block in such instances. No wonder Doris was so shocked when she saw him back in her room. The shooting took place after she called us, and it seemed unbelievable that anyone would leave the gun and not the ejected shells. Ergo, the gun must have been concealed when fired. Yeah. Paula would have no reason to do that, because she was in her own apartment. And these men are not the type who would have fired through their coats. And Doris, before she started down the hall, would naturally conceal the gun, huh? In her handbag. Where else? Boss, midnight. It's another day. <laughs> I'm a year older. Yes. Mm. 
Cuthbert's Correspondence Detective Course in Four Easy Lessons. <laughs> Happy birthday, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Vic Perrin. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Party for Death. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf is busy planning a menu. I'll see if he can talk to you. What's the name again? You want to talk to a dame named Mrs. Collins? Hang up, Archie. Do we know a Mrs. Collins? No. I don't suppose you care, but I think her voice is very charming. Doubtless. Every female has a charming voice to you. Hang up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins, but at the moment, Mr. Wolf is too involved with his digestive system to be interrupted. However, if I may introduce myself, Archie Goodwin, uh, Mr. Wolf's assistant, if I can be of any help. Archie. Uh, yes, Mrs. Collins, I'll ask you. Cocktail party. Hang up, Archie. Well, Mrs. Collins, I'm afraid it would be better if you didn't expect Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Cocktails. Fooey. Sad. Perfectly absurd. She says you promised to come to her cocktail party, and why aren't you there? Because you are going to attend the cocktail party and the probable unpleasant ending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, the most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Mr. Wolf and I refer to this as the case of the party for death. Nero Wolf really should have gone to the party since he'd accepted, but I was delegated. I can't complain now since it was there that I met Georgia, the most beautiful redhead. Well, that's my weakness, redheads. Yeah, and blondes and brunettes. And... Well, anyway, Mr. Wolf was adamant about going to the party. I've never been to a cocktail party in my life. You know, I drink nothing but beer. You could take your beer with you, couldn't you? I could not. Do we know a Mrs. Collins whose cocktail party you said you'd go to? The phone rang and I picked it up. Where was I? Exactly. Okay. So a Mrs. Collins with a beautiful, seductive voice conned you into accepting an invitation to a cocktail party that you knew you weren't going to. Archie. Yes, master. Just a little less sarcasm, perhaps. Sarcasm? Call it impertinence, then. Impertinence, master? Exactly. Less of that. Much less. Okay. Continue now. Where was I? You were eating the duck recipe. Oh, yes, the duck. Oh, here we are. Dodine de Canard. The Dodine is one of the oldest dishes in the repertory of French cooking, being mentioned in books of the 14th century. Le Grand Cousinier de Toute Cousinie. Hurry, what time is it, Archie? Almost 
Oh, in that case, uh, you're going to get up. Here on this card are your instructions, Archie. If you are still alive tomorrow, you may make your report. I helped the huge bulk that was Nero Wolf out of his specially built desk chair and walked with him to the elevator that would take him upstairs to his orchids. I stepped back to the desk and found the card which bore my instructions. In his small, perfect handwriting, I read, Mrs. Albert Collins, Empire Towers. Arrive at 7, say I sent you. After the murder, telephone me before the police arrive. At exactly 7, I rang Mrs. Collins' doorbell. Mrs. Collins? I'm Mrs. Collins. I'm Archie Goodwin. We talked on the phone a little while ago. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, come in, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, Mr. Wolf begs to be excused at the last moment he was unable to attend. Well, I'm glad you could come. You're not disappointed? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm rather upset. I'm afraid, Mr. Goodman, for my life. That's why I called Mr. Wolf. Oh, oh, just drop your hat and coat there, Mr. Goodman. Uh, may I tell you something, Mrs. Collins? Well, of course, Mr. Goodman. Archie will do. Uh, Archie? When I spoke to you on the phone, I thought I knew what you'd look like. And? You do. Well, is that good? It's not bad, Mrs. Collins. Janie will do. Janie will do. Um, Archie, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it would be best if I say you're an old beau of mine. From where? Uh, in Hollywood. When I went to Hollywood High School and you went to USC. Okay, but don't expect me to remember much about it. <laughs> I'll be flattered if you remember anything about it. <laughs> I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. Observe everything tonight. Well, now shall we join the party? <laughs> oh, Albert, this is Archie Goodwin. Archie, this is my husband, Albert. How do you do? Hello. And this is Joe Boyce, my husband's partner. How do you do? Boyce? I've told you about Archie, Albert, but well, I guess you probably don't remember, do you? No, I don't. When I was in high school and he went to USC. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, sure. What do you have, Goodwin? I'd like a plain lime and soda. Oh, now, really? A teetotaler now? Uh, yes, I, uh, well, I used to overdo it, uh -huh. remember? So you knew my wife in Hollywood? Quite a while ago, though. Uh-huh. Been here long? Oh, a while. Did you and my wife run into each other again just lately? Yeah. A few days ago? About. Joe Boyce here is my partner, chemical business. Makes this sort of an old home week, doesn't it, Joe? In a way, Al... I guess it does at that. Joe knew my wife back in those days, too. And they're still very friendly. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You two have got something in common to talk about, haven't you, Goodman? Mrs. Collins, you mean? Uh, we never knew each other very well. No? Okay, Goodman, let it go. Why, look. Look what I found. A new man. Just what I need. I'm Georgia. Archie. Archie, dear, will you fix up my drink, please? Anything for a lady. Let's go to the bar. Eh, Archie? I'm determined, Joe. If you are only the money, our only Jane, I might listen. Oh, Al, can't we talk about it later? I like talking about it now, Joe. You're going to be sorry about this, Al. I am already. But you'll have 20 years or so in prison just being sorry. I've got the papers you forged right here. You're hysterical, Al. Let's face it. The firm went broke, but I suffered too. So let's forget it. Yes, Joe. The firm went broke, but you didn't. And I don't think my wife did either. The two of you had everything figured for yourselves. Well, I'm turning the papers over to the DA tomorrow. Near a wolf speaking. Archie, what do you know about this expected murder, if anything? Has it happened yet? No, but who's supposed to get killed? I haven't the faintest idea, Archie. Then why don't you stop it? That is impossible. I don't even know who's there. You want me to tell you? Not in the least. How am I supposed to prevent it if I don't know what I'm looking for? You're not supposed to prevent it, Archie. I don't think you could. I don't think anybody could. You want to hear what I found out already? No. I'll tell you anyway. Collins thinks his wife and his partner, Boyce, have been stealing his dough, and he's threatening to send Boyce to the clink. Archie. Yeah? You're wasting our time. Go back to the party. There is nothing you can do to prevent the murder. But I want you to be there when it happens. Now, 
Now that all the guests have gone, let's uh, sit down here, Georgie. When Janie was in Hollywood, she must have had more good-looking boyfriends. Let's get personal about this, Georgie. Yeah, let's. When you say good-looking, do you mean me? I don't mean anybody else, Archie. You know, I think you're pretty, too. You'd better not let Jane hear you say that. You think she'd care? I thought you knew Jane. Only slightly. You don't like Jane too well, do you? Why? Why? Why what? Why don't you tell the truth about it? No man as attractive as you ever knew Jane slightly. Either they knew her or they didn't know her. Maybe you think I'm getting a little tipsy. The idea never occurred to me. No? Well, it has to me. Refill your glass? I'll come with you to the bar. Well, here's your drink, Georgia. Oh, I find there's no ice left in the ice bucket. Janie? Hey, Janie, no ice. Oh, well, I'll get some. Here, give me the bucket. Uh, Mrs. Collins, uh, Janie, I mean. Yes, Archie? May I use the phone in the bedroom again? Oh, of course. Will you excuse me for a minute, Georgia? I'm coming with you. Uh, why don't you just stay here until Jane brings the ice? Well, why don't you go talk to Joe Boyce? I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce. I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce ever. Now, look, Georgia. I'm coming with you, Archie. Is that clear? Okay, come on. Here's where the phone is. I could have found it myself. You don't want me with you, do you? Just sit down here on the edge of the bed and listen, if that's what you want to do. Neil Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, Archie, what? Just a bit of a report. Go on. At this moment, I am sitting on the edge of one of two twin beds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Collins. Sitting next to me is a gorgeous redhead named Georgia. Georgia what, dear? Boyce. You mean you're the wife of Joe Boyce? Of course. Didn't you know? I am sitting next to the gorgeous red-headed wife of Albert Collins' partner, Joe Boyce. Archie, you annoy me. From what I just learned, I can see there's another friction going on. You mean Georgia and Jane? Yep, fireworks between them. This one, no like other one. Have you anything more to say? When I called, I was going to ask if there's any reason why I shouldn't come home now. I wrote your instructions for you, Archie. After the murder, call you. Yeah, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? But what if there isn't any? Don't call me. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Hello. He hung up. Archie. What? It was a strange conversation. Do you want me to explain it to you, honey? What was that business about murder? Shall we join the party? Murder. Archie, wouldn't you be surprised if there was one? Yeah? Who's going to do what and to whom? I don't know. Maybe I will. Elucidate, honey. Do you intend to figure as the killer or the corpse? I don't intend to figure as anything. But you never know. Archie, do you think Jane Collins is better looking than me? Nope. Honestly? Honestly. Then what's the matter with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, there is. Look, do you want to kiss me? Uh, I... Well, I'll tell you. When I graduated from Sunday school, I took a vow. That's what I mean. But if I were Jane, you'd want to kiss me, wouldn't you? No, frankly, no. Why not? Well, when I graduated from Sunday school, I... Okay, Archie. Let's go back. You boys have such happy faces. Where's Jane? In the kitchen getting some ice. Where have you been? With Archie. Is he an old school chum of yours, too? Do you care, Joe? No. Mr. Boyce. What? How much do you weigh? 187. Why? Then I'll be giving you five pounds. Shall we step outside? This I have got to see. Shut up. Mr. Goodwin, you seem angry. Just terribly, terribly hurt. Would it do any good if I apologized? Today I'm a little upset. If I said anything to offend you, I do apologize. Now, um... Did you still want me to give you a boxing lesson? I'm at your service. Let's forget it. I'm sorry, too. Jane Collins came in from the kitchen with a bucket of ice cubes, a tray of fresh glasses, and the strapless gown she'd been wearing. <sighs> there. I never thought I'd make it. Now I'm going to mix my own drink, and you can take care of yourselves. Iceberg. Huh? Whiskey. And soda. <laughs> The simple recipe, isn't it, Archie? All it needs is the ingredients. Well, I drink to the ingredients. Mmm. Ah, nice. Janie, darling. What, dear? Would you mind very much if I took Archie away from you? Uh-huh. 
Haven't you done that already, dear? To listen to those girls, you'd think, wouldn't you, Goodman? Me, I never think. What do you do, Archie? I concentrate. On what? On not thinking. I did some serious concentrating on not thinking about Nero Wolfe or about the conflict of the partners, Albert Collins and Joe Boyce, about the jealousies of Jane and Georgia. The next five minutes hardly seemed an hour. Jane and Boyce murmured to each other. Collins drank gently but firmly. Why can't you be honest, Archie? What's the matter with me? What, Georgia? You weren't listening, were you? To every gorgeous word you said. What did I say? I want to hear it again, just the way you said it before. I said, why shouldn't there be a murder? Why not? It's an order. It's just not considered the thing to do. Thing to do? Can you think of anything better? No, frankly. I can. My glass is empty. My glass is empty, too. Jane? Jane! Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not much of a hostess, am I? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, you're all empty. But I've only drunk half of mine. You don't usually drink so slowly, Jane. Oh, I'm just not in the mood tonight. I usually drink faster to keep you from drinking mine. <laughs> See, Albert always gulps his and then reaches for mine. What's the difference? Well, I'll fix you some fresh drinks, but... Uh, put my drink over there by you, Georgia, and lay off, Albert. I only had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more. I suppose we know what dear Jane is going to do, don't we? Lay off, will you? Lay off. It's my husband who said that, Archie. Archie, meet my husband, Mr. Boyce. I will now explain why dear Jane took our glasses away to the kitchen when she could have poured a drink right here. Listen, George, will you... Mr. Boyce is speaking, Archie. What, Mr. Boyce? Uh, ah, nuts. Mr. Boyce says nuts, Mr. Goodwin. What do you say, Mr. Collins? I think Joe has covered the field. We were talking, weren't we, Archie? Possibly. We were talking about dear Jane... She's got to be always the prettiest, always devastating. Right now, she's putting on a completely new face. And in about 20 minutes, when our tongues are hanging out, she'll come back, all horsed up and bright and smiling with another tray of drinks. Yeah, she'll take all night to fix them. Well, I'm going to get some air on the balcony. Don't jump off. Al, you're drinking too much lately. I should have worried you, Joe. Especially now. When you start drinking not only your drinks, but everybody else's too, well... Ah, Jane's right. Is that what worries you? Slide Jane's glass down. Hmm. The ice is all melted. You see what I mean? Okay, Joe, let's not be nasty until tomorrow. Well, that gives me an idea. Think I'll propose a toast. Until tomorrow. You know, it may be rather fitting that I should drink a toast from the glass that Janey left. Until tomorrow. Al. Al? Jane? Janey! Albert! Oh, Albert. Nero Wolf speaking. May I come home now? Oh, hello, Archie. I said, may I come home now? Have you sent for the police, Inspector Kramer? Of course. Who was killed, Archie? Albert Collins. How, Archie? I don't know. You were right, though, weren't you? Naturally. About what? Murder. Oh, that. We can talk about it tomorrow. Good night, Archie. Come home when you can. What do you mean, come home when I can? You'll be held as a witness, won't you? <laughs> Try not to wake me with the elevator when you come in. Well, Inspector Kramer, you've had me here at headquarters for a long while. For quite a long while. Haven't you asked me enough questions? Goodwin, you say you never saw these people before, Collins or Boyce or their wives. Yet when all the other guests had gone, you were still there. I guess I just don't know how to say goodbye. You didn't know they were partners in a chemical company. You didn't know that Boyce had forged a lot of papers with Collins' name. All I know is what you tell me. Goodwin. Yes, sir? I'm trying to be nice. Yes, sir. Now, I know, of course, that you went to that party because Nero Wolf told you to. Do you? My question is, how did Wolf know it was going to happen? Why don't you ask him? I already have. He told you? He says he never heard of Collins or Boyce. 
Did he say he'd ever heard of me? He says he isn't responsible for you or your shady friends. Maybe he knows I found a poison pellet in George's bag. Inspector, may I make an important call? Go ahead. Argy, argy. Uh, found it late. Hello? What time is it, Master? And find it, Argy. I'll tell you what time it is. It's a little after 4 a.m. I'm at Central Headquarters, and Inspector Kramer has been chatting with me about my shady friends. Kramer is a jackass. Just a second. Uh, pick up the other phone, will you, Inspector? Uh, sorry, Mr. Wolf. What was that you were saying about Inspector Kramer? I said Kramer is a jackass. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wolf! Oh? Eavesdropping, Inspector. I was just talking about bringing you down here for a little questioning, Wolf. Phooey. What's that? Phooey. It can be spelled in several ways. I spell it P-F-U-I. Phooey. You think I won't bring you down here as a material witness? Yes, I think you won't. I think you'd be making a great mistake if you did. A great mistake? Why? Because I might not tell you who killed Collins. And you wouldn't know which one of these people to prefer charges against. Now send Archie home. Even he needs an occasional night's sleep. <laughs> He hung up. So it seems. Busy? He's probably left the phone off the hook, Inspector. By now, he's probably asleep again. Uh, you know I can go out there, don't you? Sure you can. More important men than you have tried it. And where are they now? Goodwin? Yes, sir? I'm going to let you go. I'm sure Mr. Wolf and I are very grateful, Inspector. You want to know why I'm letting you go? I know why. Why? Because if you're nice and cooperative and don't make too much trouble, Mr. Wolf will solve this case for you and tell you whom to prefer charges against. Goodwin. Sir? Get out. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Inspector. Three o'clock the next afternoon, I was rearranging the furniture in Nero Wolf's office while the great man sat behind his desk watching me perspire. How are you finished now, Archie? Yeah, I guess so. And tell me where they sat. There were two couches, like this, in front of a fireplace. Collins and Boyce were sitting together on one couch. When Georgia and I came in, they were looking at some canceled checks. Where was Mrs. Collins? I told you she was getting ice and fresh glasses. Why was she getting fresh glasses, Archie? Where were the empty ones? I don't know. Maybe they were the same ones she brought back washed and polished. Archie, I trust your powers of observation absolutely. That's why I sent you to Mrs. Collins' cocktail party. Okay, how did you know there was going to be a murder? If it was a murder. It was a murder, Archie. But isn't it obvious? How is it obvious? Suppose Collins slipped a few drops of the poison into his drink himself. It's very strong, very deadly poison. With a remarkably strong odor. Like almonds, I know. I smelled it when I picked him up. Archie, was anything found on the body that might have contained the poison, a fountain pen, whatever? Not even that. Inspector Kramer found a poison pellet in Georgia's handbag. He thinks she poisoned Collins' drink. Say, could be. But it wasn't his drink, it was his wife's. Then Georgia was trying to kill Jane and Collins got it by mistake. We shall soon see, Archie. I was expecting a murder because you told me to expect it. I watched every move that everybody made. There is no possibility that Jane's glass, the glass with the poison in it, was tampered with by anybody. Yes, I believe. Okay. Archie, you're sore, aren't you? Have you ever spent the night with Inspector Kramer? He's really a good man, too. Why did you say he was a jackass? Because he didn't know who killed Collins. Do you? Of course. Is there ever any question about it? Just a moment, please. The only trouble is it may be difficult to prove. That's why we are giving this little cocktail party this afternoon with the help of Inspector Kramer. By the way... Yes? Call Mrs. Collins and tell her to bring a bucket of ice from her refrigerator. Why? Because our refrigerator's broken down. No, it hasn't. I was just out in the kitchen a minute ago. Our refrigerator has broken down. And it would be very helpful if Mrs. Collins would bring a bucket of ice cubes. What makes you think she'll do it? She will. Call her. 
6.45. There we were in Wolf's office doing a repeat performance of last night's smash hit. Two couches faced each other, a cocktail table between them. On one couch, red-headed Georgia and me. On the other couch, it was a big one, Joe Boyce, Jane Collins, widow of the lately defunct Albert, and Nero Wolf. Jane had been drinking a little slower than the rest of us. Our glasses were empty. Hers was still half full. Wolf said... Archie. Yeah? At this point in last night's party, Mrs. Collins got up and left to get some fresh drinks. Repeat what she said. Approximately. Approximately will do. I think she said something like this. She said, um, put my drink over by you, Georgia. Lay off, Albert. I've had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more, Albert. Am I right, Jane? Close enough, Archie. But what of it? No. What is this nonsense all about, Wolf? Uh, Mr. Wolf is trying to make something out of nothing. I think Mr. Wolf is going to turn up something mighty interesting. Don't look so perturbed, Joe. Since I am playing the part of the late Mr. Collins, pass me Jane's glass. I'll keep my glass, Mr. Wolf. I haven't finished my drink. You're a very clever woman, Mrs. Collins. Would it be too much if I ask what this is all about? What about it, you, Archie? You make it sound as if that drink she's holding is poison. But it can't be, because as yesterday, she's already drunk half of it herself. When our freezer broke down, she was more than willing to bring a bucket of ice cubes, wasn't she? So? What would happen, Archie, if you froze a gelatine-coated pellet of poison in the center of one particular ice cube? Mrs. Collins hasn't finished her drink. Notice the ice is all melted now. She hasn't taken one sip since the ice melted completely. She came prepared in case she was exposed. Smell it, Archie. No, Archie, stand back. I can easily swallow this before you can reach me. Mr. Wolf, in a few seconds, I'll drink it. But tell me something first. Tell me how you knew. Jane, Jane, listen to me. I knew there was going to be a murder last night because you said so. I knew that it was you who would commit the murder because it was you who invited me. You hoped an expert witness would prove that you couldn't have killed your husband. So I sent Archie Goodwin, whose observations are always exact, even when he doesn't know the import of what he's observing. She brought back clean glasses. She poured the drinks out of bottles already open. And if anybody had put anything in or touched one of those glasses, I would have seen it. Exactly. The poison pellet was frozen in a certain ice cube. Mrs. Collins put that cube in her own drink, drank it until the ice had almost melted down to the poisonous pellet center. And then... Then she took all the other glasses away, leaving only hers half full. And as usual, her husband drank it. No, no, Jane, don't. Don't. Too late, Joe. (laughs) Too late. Well, boss, Jane didn't get away with the suicide try. That was clever thinking you did. I prepared a cube of ice in which I had frozen a gelatine capsule containing nothing more than a vitamin compound. I substituted for the cube in which Jane had placed the poison for herself. wonder why Jane Collins wanted to have Joe. He'd stolen practically all the money in the company. He was just a crook. Birds of a feather, Archie. I don't believe Joe Boyce had any idea that Jane was planning a murder. And he still had all the money. Well, the forgeries will put him away for a long time. And poor Georgia could have had it pinned on her if it hadn't been for me. Yes, yes. You knew all along, didn't you, that Jane had planned to have Georgia accused by planting another pellet of the poison in Georgia's handbag. Jane would have gotten rid of her husband and Joe's wife in one stroke. You knew all that, didn't you? Well, I... Um... How about a bottle of beer, boss? (laughs) Could you spare the time? (sighs) Georgia... Beautiful redhead. Wonder where she is tonight. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea, but in case you do... (laughs) Well, just be quiet with the elevator door when you come in. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet.
Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gigi Pearson, Herb Butterfield, Peter Leeds, Evelyn Eaton, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Malevolent Medic. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. The orchestra will be under the direction of Bruno Walter for tomorrow's performance, and celebrated violinist Joseph Zagetti will be featured soloist. Selections for tomorrow include the overture to Mozart's Marriage of Figaro and the same composer's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. You're invited every Saturday to a concert by the NBC Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolfe's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Mr. Hal Horton, United Industries? Oh, I see. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Wolfe doesn't take kindly to big industrialists. Says their great wealth upsets his digestion. Why do you want to see him? The connection's bad. I don't hear you. Who? Who? Mr. Horton, who? Hmm. We're cut off. What is it, Mr. Goodwin? Mr. Hal Horton called. I understand that. I won't see him. Tell him what money I have to invest I put into orchid plants. Mr. Horton wasn't promoting anything. Then what did he call you for? The great Horton needs a detective. Maybe just my occupational reflex, but I thought he said somebody had been murdered. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It turned out that what Horton had said had been murder, which became celebrated in the case of the malevolent medic. But its solution wasn't a simple matter of following up his accusation. It had false clues mixed all through it like raisins in a pudding. The man we came to know as the malevolent medic was young Dr. Benjamin Sloan. The case began on the sunny afternoon when Grace Banks, his nurse, came into his private office. Waiting room's finally empty, I take it. Well, there's one more patient, darling. I'm sorry. Doctor, hmm. Mrs. Horton's here for another of the thymine chloride shots you ordered for. I said you could give her those, Grace. She doesn't have to wait to see me. Oh, she's hung up her mink coat, parked her orchid and her alligator bag, and filled up all the ashtrays with lipstick cigarette stubs. Mrs. Horton prefers to wait for you. She seems very upset. I hoped she'd get hold of herself. Mrs. Hal Horton, with all that money, whatever gives her such jitters? <laughs> Darling, if I ever get in that condition after we're married, please shoot me. I've advised her to go to a specialist. Hers isn't a true medical case. Well, I'll do what I can. Get a needle ready, will you, Grace, and show Mrs. Horton in. Yes, darling. I mean, doctor. <laughs> Mrs. Horton, will you step in now? Been in that waiting room for hours. Ben, I wrote you every day this week. Why didn't you answer me? You say your health hasn't improved, Leslie. I'm worse, much worse. Still chain smoking, drinking, and the sleeping pills? I have to take something. I can't walk the floor all night, can I? Thinking, thinking. Why are you so unhappy, Leslie? You have what you always said you wanted, money, clothes, excitement. You have the right to say that. But don't, please don't. I'm only pointing out facts you should face. I told you from the beginning you need a nerve specialist. I need you. Nobody else can help me at all. Leslie, you went over this the last time you were here, and in all those letters you've been sending. Now, let's cross it off for good, shall we? Don't talk like that. You don't mean I'm it. no longer a lovesick dope, and you're the wife of one of the biggest industrialists in the country. Yes, Hal Horton, I despise him. He thinks his money makes him God. He thinks he can buy anything that he bought me. He made me think I was getting the world with a fence around it. 
Everything I want is on the other side of that fence. You don't know what you do want. I want us the way we used to be happy in love together. Leslie, please be quiet. Why? Miss Banks is in the laboratory. She can hear you. What of it? I'm not ashamed. I'll tell her. I'll tell everybody. Imagine Hal's face when he finds out I'm leaving him. But I'm coming back to you. He already knows about you. I told him you were in love with me, that you're jealous. He doesn't like Leslie, you. Leslie, you're raving now. Stop it. You always said I was the most attractive woman in the world. You made your choice. Now get this into your head. I'm really in love now. In a few weeks, I'm going to be married. Now I'll get your medicine. So it's really true. You are going to be married. Yes. I'd heard it, but I didn't believe it. Going to marry a nurse. All my friends have known and been laughing at me. Please, now that's enough. I made a plan, a wonderful, beautiful plan about us. Ben, you love me. Ben, say you love me. Mrs. Horton, that is all over. You don't love me. No longer. You're here as my patient, and that's all. After this treatment, I must ask you to get another doctor. A wonderful, beautiful plan for us. And now she threatens to step in and spoil it. Well, maybe I'll spoil a few plans. How would you like that? Threats will accomplish nothing. I can ruin things for you, Ben. All those fancy ideas of yours about having a fine practice, being a great doctor. Do you want to give those up? I can arrange it so that maybe there won't be any wonderful future for you. Are you prepared to face that possibility? Because I'm prepared to make it a reality. And I mean it. You'll regret this day as long as you live. I'll get your medicine, Mrs. Horton. Hand me my bag. Thank you. Oh, I hate you, Ben. I hate you both. <laughs> Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Horton. Miss Banks had to do a repair job before she could use the sterilizer. Alcohol, Miss Banks? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Now, Mrs. Horton, may I help? Thanks. So nice of you. There. Right side for the hypo this time, isn't it? Just touch with this cotton. Ready now, Doctor. Oh, I... What's the matter, Mrs. Horton? I'm just cold. Alcohol. After this, I advise you to go home and rest. These massive doses are a little painful, but they give results. There. That's all. Just relax here and you can leave in ten minutes. Come, Miss Banks. I want to talk to you. Doctor! Doctor! I, I feel sick. I feel very sick. You might as well stop acting. I can't get up. My feet, Ben. Look at her. Something's happened. Hysteria. No, her face. Oh, and she's falling. Mrs. Horton, hold on to me. I've got you. Hold her up. Leslie, what is it? Pain. Terrible pain. Where? What from? Sick everywhere. Pain. Everything's pain. Pain in my head. Pain in my feet. My feet. My feet. Doctor. She's dead. Yes, Grace. Get a card from the files. I, I want to study it. From the first day Mrs. Horton came here. What was it, Ben? What happened to her? Symptoms are of a heart condition from which it seems the patient has just expired. Then you must call her husband. Grace, did you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Well, I discourage your visit here, Mr. Horton. I do have a sort of curiosity about the operation of so-called big business. Maybe offer you a glass of beer and hear an explanation of the rise and fall of this morning's stock market. You don't think I've come here socially? I wish to engage your services for... Not available. You're a detective, aren't you? Specializing in cases that interest me. Sherry, Mr. Horton? I don't need it, thank you. But Mr. Wolf says he specializes in cases that interest... I've just got here. I haven't told my story. I don't believe you even know who I am. Oh, yes, we do. We do indeed. A millionaire. Did I offend you by speaking of a fee? No, on the contrary. It is that portion of your conversation which interested me most. 
Frankly, I plan to spend the evening examining the first edition of Henry James that I'd like to purchase, and the word fee suggested a possible way. Now, what have you done, sir? What have I done? <laughs> One doesn't have to be a detective to recognize you're in trouble, Mr. Horton. Look, Mr. Wolf, I have done nothing. But I've got a question I've got to have answered. I need facts. They tell me you're the man who can give them to me. If Nero Wolf can't get them for you, they're not facts. They're fancies, Mr. Horton. My story's involved. But the gist of it is uh, your beautiful wife, a former model, died last week. The death certificate indicated a heart attack. You suggest she was murdered. How did you know? Never mind how I came to my conclusions. How did you come to yours? Leslie had been going to a Dr. Benjamin Sloan. She said he was a specialist. Some friend had recommended. She'd been upset. He was giving her vitamin B shots, she told me. You doubt that was true. Dr. Sloan informed me uh, after she died in his office uh, there'd been a heart condition from the beginning. Well, I don't believe it. Leslie was a very emotional girl. She'd have been quite frightened of a heart ailment. She'd have told me about it. Maybe she didn't comprehend its seriousness. Dr. Sloan did. Why didn't he get in touch with me at once about it? Then, when I went to clear up Leslie's room, I discovered something. Leslie didn't go to Sloan through a friend. She'd known him when she was a model and he was a hospital intern. She'd kept letters he'd written to her then. Love letters. Indeed. Well, doesn't that give you an idea, Mr. Wolf? Sloan lost Leslie to me. No man who'd been in love with Leslie would ever get over it. Would a man be jealous enough, kill a woman he loved, rather than have her belong to another man? An interesting theory, Mr. Horton, one frequently advanced in fiction. Shall we investigate and see how it works out in fact? Ah, you'll take the case, then. The intricacies of the feminine nature are challenging, if you do not have to come in contact with the creatures. The uh, practical research in such matters I leave to Mr. Goodwin here. It is a field in which he specializes. But it's you I want. Our method of operation is not under your control, Mr. Horton. You'll be so kind, Archie. Get a first-hand report of Dr. Benjamin Sloan and the women in his life. Just came to ask a few routine questions, Dr. Sloan. I don't understand your interest in the Horton case, Mr. Goodwin, is it? That's right. The death certificate was signed and a report made to the medical inspector. Detectives are a snoopy lot. Detectives? Are you from the police department? No, I'm employed to note some details before we close up the Leslie Horton estate. Sudden deaths have to be double-checked. I'm afraid I can't add a thing to what I've already reported. Well, thanks for seeing me anyhow. Been a pleasant visit. Ever have a patient die in your office before, Dr. Sloan? No, but I've seen similar cases in the hospital, of course. Was Mrs. Horton warned about her heart condition, Dr. Sloan? I discussed her case with her fully and frankly. And her husband, wasn't Mr. Horton alarmed? He didn't know. Mrs. Horton's ailment was, well, not to bore a layman with medical details, was not a fatal one necessarily. She might have gone on for years. Just played in bad luck, huh? The worst. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet her? Several weeks ago. And you saw her how many times? It's all on the record. She was nervous. I prescribed thiamine chloride. Her medical report card shows that. You read it for yourself. Well, I guess that's all, Dr. Sloan. Won't bother you further. Miss Banks will show you out. Yes, Dr. Sloan? Sort of a modern Aladdin arrangement, isn't it? Wish I could press a buzzer and have a beautiful girl like you appear. Mr. Goodwin is leaving. Oh, this way, Mr. Goodwin. You can use the side door. The waiting room's full of patients. So long, Doctor. This way, through the lab. There's a door from it into the corridor. Cozy place, all those bottles. I suppose there's enough stuff in here to kill an army. To cure one. Miss Banks, may I say that you're the kind of a nurse that patients dream about? Make it a pleasure to go to a hospital. Blonde hair, blue eyes, winkers, an inch long. Are they real? If you'll excuse me. Who do I have to come down with to persuade you to take care of me? Huh? I don't take cases. I'm a technician. Good day, Miss. So you work just for Dr. Sloan? That's too bad the way he's involved in this Horton case. It looks serious. Mrs. Horton simply died of a heart attack in Dr. Sloan's office. If you wanted to help your boss, Miss Banks, you'd stop rushing around and answer a few questions. I'm sure Dr. Sloan gave you the necessary information. Guess he doesn't realize the trouble he's in. If you can supply any details that'll change the picture, you'll be doing him a great favor. He's a nice guy. I want to help. What is there to say? The report... Let's get it in your own words. Just what really happened here that day? Well, Dr. Sloan gave Mrs. Horton the vitamin B shot. That was routine. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get up afterward. She said she was sick. And then she fell and I caught her. And Dr. Sloan administered emergency treatment. What did that consist of, Miss Banks? All that is in the office record. What would bring on such an attack? It could have been 
several things. Could it have been something she ate? Acute indigestion affects the heart. Maybe Mrs. Horton would be here now if the doctor thought to use a stomach pump. He did use one. He did everything there was time to do. She certainly went in a hurry. Suffer a lot? She said she was in pain. Where, her stomach? No, not her stomach. Where then? She seemed to be in pain all over. Reflex, maybe? When it was over, what did you do, Miss Banks? Called Mr. Horton. Must have been a blow to the great man. I understand she was younger than he is and quite a sultry gal. I've talked to you professionally because you said it was necessary to help Dr. Sloan. Is that all, Mr. Goodwin? I guess it is for now. Unless you'll have dinner with him. Thank you, no. I'm handsome, hardworking, and harmless. I'll bring you references from my employer. What do you say? The express elevator's the one on the right. Must be there's another man. Wouldn't be the doctor, would it? Well, you'll fit better in a Pullman kitchen than here among the test tubes at that. My reluctant congratulations. Verdict, Archie? Innocent as lambs, both Sloan and the nurse. Evidence to prove it? My unfailing sensibilities, not the murderer type. Nice couple, doctor and the nurse, I suspect they're engaged. She's so much in love with him, I could have been you and she wouldn't have known the difference. Very flattering. Records? The usual medical record, Mrs. Horton's first visit, symptoms, subsequent visits. Here are the notes on it. Hmm. Vitamin B shots. No chance they brought this on, huh? Dr. Sloan says absolutely not. I checked that with other doctors. But Mrs. Horton did go into this right after the hypo. There's the story, Jives and Sloan? Mm-hmm. A little more detail. She says he did everything, even used a stomach pump. The woman was in pain? What's this? Head to feet? My way of saying pain all over. What other papers did you examine? Only the medical record. Get back to Sloan's office late tonight and examine all the papers in his desk. Can't you trust me? I tell you, there's no reason even to suspect these two. When you have one of your adolescent's infatuations on, blood dripping from a dagger in a girl's hand would look to you like crushed rose petals. With this Grace Banks out of the way, maybe you can recognize evidence. Uh, sounds like a long, bleak evening. Hand me that medical book, and then be on your way. I want to think. Well, good evening, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, good evening, Dr. Sloan. This is a surprise to us both. I didn't anticipate that you'd be keeping office hours after midnight. What are you doing in my office at 2 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Goodwin? Reading your mail and having a ghoulish time surrounded by all these shiny instruments of yours. You've been rifling my desk. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've put things back very neatly, even the letters from this little secret compartment, which isn't secret at all to anybody who knows about desks. I've kept only Give one. Give me that Easy. Let... It's the my darling mine first shan't ever give you up one way or another one. Remember? I'll bet that nice little nurse you're engaged to never wrote that, did she? What do you intend to do with it? Mark it Exhibit A in the Horton murder case. Maybe you'd like to come with me and explain it to Nero Wolf. Very moving, very flattering, very interesting if you like women. But also very incriminating, Dr. Sloan. What does it prove? A silly woman with a nervous breakdown imagined she was infatuated with me. A woman who is now dead, you must remember, under, shall we say, unusual circumstances. You signed a death certificate which stated Mrs. Horton died of a heart attack. As you signed it, Dr. Sloan, did you remember she had threatened you and heave a sigh of relief that fate had done you such a good turn? I didn't bear Leslie any ill will. I was sorry for her. You felt adequate to the situation. You called no other doctor... Though there are several in your building. My first thought, of course, was that it was some extraordinary allergic reaction to the vitamin dose. It was not until an hour or two after she was dead you decided she expired from a heart attack. Yes. How did you explain the pain? I, I reported no pain. Miss Banks said Mrs. Horton had pain from her head to her feet. Grace said that? Well, not in those words, but that was the general idea. Dr. Idea. Slow, why did you use a stomach pump on a heart case? Why, I... I, I told you I tried everything, sometimes an acute digestive disturbance. But... I suggest you did it because to you, as to any qualified physician, the pain in the feet suggested poisoning, a particular kind of poison, an inorganic poison. There wasn't any in her stomach. You maintain that? Archie, get the medical examiner on the phone. Tell him the body of Miss Hal Horton must be examined for any evidence of poisoning. I know you think Mrs. Horton was murdered, but it's impossible. There'd been no one near her. 
Miss Banks. Miss Banks couldn't have done it. She was working with me constantly. That's what I thought you'd say, Dr. Sloan. Mr. Wolf, I had to see you. This is the most dreadful thing I've ever heard of. Trying to accuse Dr. Sloan of murdering a patient. It appears he had a reason to want Mrs. Horton dead, Miss Banks. She was that thing the poets write about, a woman scorned. She had sent him this hysterical letter threatening scandal if he rejected her. He couldn't control her. She kept coming back to his office making scenes. He gave her nothing but thymine chloride. I know. I fixed the shop myself. Don't start covering for her. I'm not. I tell you, I fill the needle. And I didn't put anything but thymine chloride in it. You haven't any reason to think anybody did, except for that letter you stole. If it wasn't for that letter... Give it to me. Give it to me. Stop it, Archie. Quick. Drop it, baby. Come away from that fireplace. Why, you little tiger kid. I didn't think you had it in you. Come on, let go of it. Let go. Give it to Papa. Now, look what you did. You almost got Nero Wolf out of his chair. Destroying evidence is a serious offense, young woman. She kept coming to the office, writing a pestering, and I heard her from the laboratory. You read her letters too, didn't you? You knew if something didn't stop her, Dr. Benjamin Sloan was a ruined man. But he didn't kill her. I know he didn't. I don't believe he did. You... You don't? Well, then who? You've just provided an excellent motive for having done it yourself, Miss Banks. Pears in white wine. Cold, luscious, exotic. Excellent, Fritz. Excellent. Best thing that's happened today. I don't like this Sloan case. If you ask me, I think that Horton Dengawa was coming to her. Those are not the words of abstract justice, nor the phrases of a gentleman of culture. A good detective never plays favorites. Good night's rest, and you will find your attitude more normal by morning. You expect to have this case solved by morning? It's solved now. Thanks to the expedition I sent you on this afternoon. The arrest can wait. No one will escape. I feel like a murderer myself. If I hadn't wormed it out of grace about the Horton woman complaining of pain, and if you hadn't jumped at the word feet... That, Archie, my dear fellow, is the purpose for which you exist, to discover pertinent facts. Have we quite finished? Copy in the study, then. Here's the door. I'll go. Mr. Wolf in? He isn't seeing anyone this evening, Mr. Horton. Well, he's seeing me. Archie, if that's Mr. Horton, I'll see him. You'd better... Sorry you found Mr. Goodman so impossible, Mr. Horton. He, uh, he came to pay you a call this afternoon. I sent him, but he didn't find you in, did you, Archie? No, but I made myself at home. I knew anything that would help to solve this case you'd want us to have. What do you mean? You were in my house? What did you take? Nothing of monetary value, I assure you, that will not be returned in due course. But before I announce the solution of a case, I like to have all my little props in place. I appreciate a well-rounded performance. Mr. Wolf. I've had enough of this foolishness, this, this delay. I hired you to convict Sloan, not to play parlor games. You must be patient, Mr. Horton. Don't force me. I want action. Well, I had planned to wait until the morning, but if you insist, these papers here may interest you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Goodwin here collects them, your wife's letters. Leslie's? You recognize the script? These are addressed to Dr. Sloan. Do they, uh, they prove anything against him? The lady's correspondence should be kept private. This other letter, however, was sent to you. To, to me? Leslie's? What, what? Give it to me. Easy, Horton, easy. Don't grab. No, but that letter's mine. You stole it from my desk. There is a point in a case, Mr. Horton, where letters cease to be personal property and become evidence. What evidence can that letter provide? It seems you had reason for wanting to kill your wife, Mr. Horton. A man can get annoyed by a note saying his wife never loved him, that all his money isn't enough, and that she's going to another man. You accusing me of murder? It could have been the perfect crime. Poison in one of those pills she was forever taking, or on the tip of the cigarette she chain-smoked, and a doctor's office to die in. If you hadn't been fool enough to try to pin it on Sloan, you might have gotten away with it. If I had known while she was alive what Leslie was, I might have done anything. But that letter you stole from me was one she left under my pillow. I didn't find it until after she was dead. I didn't kill her. Sloan did. You hired me to prove that, Mr. Horton. Suppose you let me go about my business. Near our wolf's office. Yeah? Oh, you did? Good boy. We'll expect you. I'll tell Mr. Wolf at once. 
Medical examiner's officer. Just as you thought, they found poison in the body. Listen to me. Inspector Kramer's picking up Dr. Sloan and Grace. They'll be here any minute. Kramer's set to make an arrest. I told you. The police know it's Sloan. Put the letters in Mrs. Horton's bag on my desk, Archie. Leslie's alligator bag? You stole that from my house this afternoon, too. Those things are mine. Inspector Kramer will want to take them with him. But you think I want it made public what Leslie did to me? Kramer can't have them. Maybe the inspector will want to take you, too, Mr. Horton. Let them in, Archie. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Oh. Dr. Sloan, Miss Banks. Won't well, pass me to bring them here first before I locked anybody up. Mrs. Horton was murdered, all right. I'm sending a man for Horton, too. You won't have to. Mr. Horton's waiting here to join the party. Come into Mr. Wolf's office. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Wolf. Uh, will you all please range yourselves around the room as I indicate? Miss Banks here. Yes. Dr. Sloan, Mr. Horton, Archie, you stand between the two men, if you please. Mr. Wolf, this is a dreadful mistake. I swear the doctor didn't... Stop thinking about the doctor. What about you? If you're accusing Miss Banks, I might as well tell you now. Hold it, Dr. Sloan. From here on, anything you say will be held against you. That's what I want. Let Grace go home and well, I'll... For heaven's you. sake, why don't you arrest the man? Isn't it obvious he's guilty? You and your trumped-up charges against me. I'll do the talking now, Mr. Horton. Mrs. Horton died from a certain inorganic poisoning. Poison administered in your office, Dr. Sloan, with a hypo syringe. Let's get it over with. I gave her the hypo. But I fill the needle. There you are. They're both guilty. Which would solve the case if they weren't lying. Miss Banks believes Dr. Sloan killed Leslie for her sake. Dr. Sloan thinks Miss Banks put poison in the hypo to save him from professional ruin. They're trying to protect each other. The fact is the hypo they gave was perfectly harmless. It did not kill Mrs. Horton. But then what did? Mrs. Horton came to your office in desperation, Dr. Sloan. But she came prepared for the worst. You see this handbag? Can any of you identify it? Yes. It, it's hers. Is it Mr. Horton? It's Leslie's. The bag she carried to the office the day she died. Open it, Archie. You will see it contains her change purse, billfold, cigarette case, matches, her handkerchief, nothing more. That is, not unless you look closely. Then you will observe this lining has a double fold. A secret compartment. Exactly. We open it this way, and there we find it. A hypodermic needle with which the unhappy woman committed suicide. Miss Banks, Dr. Sloan, you can stop protecting one another. Mr. Horton, the world need never know you were a betrayed husband. Mrs. Horton killed herself while in a confused state following a mental breakdown. The case of the malevolent medic is closed. How did you ever get the hunch about the handbag, Mr. Wolf? I know nothing about women. But on my occasional trips abroad, I have been forced to observe their handbags. Monstrosities. They hold anything and everything. <laughs> now that our guests have gone, Fritz is bringing coffee to the study. Would you like some beer? I believe I would. Somehow I feel I've earned it. Ah, here you are. Poor fellow, I'm very sorry for you. How so? This is one case in which there is no falsely accused, unattached young lady for you to squire about. <laughs> well, here's to your better luck next time. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf. Starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Ruth Adams Knight was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Bruce Payne, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Lansing. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Hasty Will. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you every Saturday evening on NBC. 
For music tomorrow, your hit parade brings you the top tunes of the land with Snooky Lanson, Eileen Wilson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. And for mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man in search of adventure who travels wherever there is intrigue, danger, and romance. More good mystery at Sam Spade next on NBC. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Trouble as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor, Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake. I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, What sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir. Very urgent. I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any kind until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake. Come at once. What were you saying, boss? And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolfe was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You've passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, This way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Uh, Good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I I haven't signed it yet. Uh, Also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, Do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a star for the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly could Archie. Have... Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing. Uh, for the time being. Indeed. 
You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now, the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolfe, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolfe. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said, uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. And good evening, gentlemen, and, uh... Thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You have more than earned this thousand, young man. Archie. Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Boy, Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. <laughs> I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now... Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. Hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin, how do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. What do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. Why do you think that? 
Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable... Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I... I thought you were done for. That is... Uh, I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my Uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, that's news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide? I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, miss. You, you read it, Wilbur? Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it is all right. But there still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodwin. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will... Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he has to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? Uh, <clears throat> Joe says, uh... Hmm. Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia... She was rightfully yours. But I loved her too. And I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both. And I've uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend. Because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, when Marcia died last year and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded. But I didn't answer you. And I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hillary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hillary. Hmm, well, this... Uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. 
even though it is around zero outside. The sun is fine for them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium scorostel. The b- b- Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. I find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to uh, fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. No, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on. This way. Well, here we are. Say, Miss Blake. Oh. Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's father. And you, Mr. Blake? Well, it's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or. Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, be of us. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, eh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do. But not by you, of course. Certainly not. (laughs) But who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm... How interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. So enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha... Well, uh, there's several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. (laughs) I merely asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm. 
I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad... Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. Yeah, thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed, the will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes. But on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That is, it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? Uh, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie. Phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. And I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss... Please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita. Anita. What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look. Look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Well, but what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, closed the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such a I'm thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense, he must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your Uncle Hillary found the hiding place. And he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservation. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out! I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Ah, Archie. Come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. 
And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, Bring it in here, Sergeant. Just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a need order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolf. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope, too. But he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting. You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Willie Inch, did you say? Just a second. Do you want to talk to a fellow named Willie Inch, which I doubt? No. He says he's got to see you, got to. Who is he? I'll ask. Uh, Mr. Wolf doesn't recognize your name, Mr. Inch. He wants to know who you are. Uh, just a second, I'll tell him. Mr. Inch says he's a sneak thief. He says you never heard of him, but he's heard of you. Should I tell him to get lost? Wait a minute, Archie. Ask him what he wants. Uh, Inch, Mr. Wolf wants to know what you want to see him about. A phony murder rap. This is a phony murder rap. It'd have to be, wouldn't it, Archie? How do you mean? Phony, I mean. Did you ever hear of a sneak thief committing murder if it could possibly be avoided? Yes, Archie. Tell Mr. Inch. I'll listen to his story. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> When Mr. Wolf and I talk about this little difficulty, he calls it the case of Archie Goodwin and how he got hooked. However, I call it the case of the disappearing diamonds. I prefer my title. He prefers his. Anyhow, it started with an improbable character named Willie Inch. That'll be our sneak thief, Archie. Let him in. Okay, boss. Okay. Inch? Yeah. Come in. In there. I'll follow you. Mr. Wolf, this is your client. Mr. Inch? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Tall fellow. Must be over six feet six. Sit down. Uh, where? Archie? Here, Mr. Inch. This ought to be comfortable. Where, well, Mr. Inch? Uh, uh, look, Mr. Wolf. They're going to claim that I killed a woman I never even touched. And I'm going to fry for something I've never even done. All right, Mr. Inch. How did you kill her? I didn't. I didn't. I never killed nobody in my life. Mr. Inch, you say you're a thief. Can you prove it? Uh, I got a record. Why? I was wondering about that bulge in your pocket. Oh. Oh, here? It's a, it's a silver cigarette lighter, ain't it? I guess it sort of dropped into my pocket as I was going by. Y- you see you see the way it happened? Never mind, Miss Dange. Now tell me how you didn't kill the woman for whose murder you will fry. Well, well, Mr. Wolf, sir, it was like this. There was a window half open, you see, and I happened to crawl inside the house. But hey, now. Well, Miss Dange? This, uh... This is just between us, ain't it? Possibly. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Mr. Wolf said possibly. Oh. Well, uh, okay. So I happen to find myself in the bedroom, see? So I happen to sort of roam around, and I hear there's like a party going on. You know, people and music. So I lock the door. So go on. Let him tell it his own way, Archie. Well, Miss Lynch? Uh, so that's the mistake I make. Mistake? Uh, maybe I, I leave my fingerprints on the door. So? So, so later, a dame gets herself knocked off in the same room. And they look for fingerprints. And they find mine. I'm it. That's all. I, I got a record. So, so the chair. I see. Pitiful case, isn't it, Archie? Very, very mournful. Inch. Uh, yes, sir. I presume you came away with some souvenirs? Oh, nothing. It wasn't worth the trouble. You know, just odds and ends junk. Have you got the junk with you? Yeah. Let me see. Uh, here. Hmm. Cigarette case, platinum. Lighter, gold. Vanity case, gold. That's that's all? Mm, Positively. Junk, the man says. I promise nothing, Mr. Inch, but it might be better if you told the truth. Me? You. Oh, well. Mm. One square cut emerald ring. I I just happened to find it. (laughs) Here's something more. A pewter ashtray. Look, the room is dark. I can't see. Piles of coats under beds and hats and handbags. I take what I find. Why didn't you turn on the lights? One of these big standing lamps. You know what I mean. Go on. I bump into it. And it scares the living... I mean, it scares me. So? I I turn the switch. It don't work. Archie. That sounds like the law, boss. The law. Stay right where you are, Willie. 
May I suggest that there is a way to find out, Archie? Okay, okay. We don't want any. Good morning, Goodwin. You remember me, your old friend, Inspector Kramer? Two gentlemen with me are also with the department, Pearly and Ostrakovich. May we come in? What do you want? We want a murderer, and we want some rocks worth 250 grand. Does that answer your question? What makes you think you'll find all those goodies here? Come in, man. We know Willie Inch is here. Where is he? Now, just a second. We're coming with you, Goodwin. Okay, Inspector, come along. Well, Archie. The law. That's Willie Inch. Frisk him. Ah, no weapons? Okay, just put the cuffs on him. Inspector Kramer. Oh, yes. Hello, Wolf. I want to tell you something about this man whom you and your men have so bravely captured in my office. You don't need to tell me about him, Wolf. We know about him. Do you indeed? Yes. We know he killed Mrs. Florence Avery March and stripped a quarter of a million worth of diamonds off her. That's all we need to know. I didn't do no such a thing. Where's the ice, Willie? I never even seen none, honest. Take him away, boys. I'll make the charge when I get back to my office. Wait. Uh, Mr. Wolf, sir. Take him. Look, I ain't got nothing, I tell you. Inspector Kramer. Yeah. We're going to have a little talk now, aren't we? If necessary. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf means you're going to have a little talk if necessary. Very funny. I will now draw up a chair and show you why it's necessary. In the first place, $250,000 worth of diamonds makes it necessary. Archie, if you please, a bottle of beer. Okay. Will the inspector name his poison? You know I never drink on duty. And just for me, Archie, please. On my way. While I opened a bottle of imported beer, it occurred to me that I had something to be grateful for. At least I wasn't in Willie Inch's enormous shoes. And as I went back to the office, I had time to wonder why Mr. Wolf would stick his fat neck out for a no good like Willie. Thank you, Archie. And sit down, Archie. Inspector Kramer has a theory that may amuse you. Near our Wolf's office. It's for you, Inspector. Hello, Kramer. Yeah? A gold cigarette holder? That's all? Okay. Inspector, do you realize that you have already taken a great deal of my time? Archie. Yes, Inspector? The great Mr. Wolf just said I had a theory that might amuse you. Would you care to hear it? I can hardly wait. Okay. My theory is that both Wolf and you are receivers of stolen property and possibly guilty of murder conspiracy. So far, you got me in stitches. <laughs> Willie Inch, with a record as long as your arm, robs the home of Mrs. Florence Avery Marsh. He strangles her with a silk scarf, takes the diamond she's wearing, grabs everything else that's lying around, and then what? Is it a question? I'll tell you what. He will, too. <laughs> Archie, listen, listen. Then Inch brings the stuff here, the stuff that's piled on Wolf's desk and the diamonds. You want me to tell you where the diamonds are? They're in that safe right there. Inspector Kramer, I know nothing about the diamonds. They are not in the safe and they're not in the house. Now you can take my word for it, or you can get a search warrant and make a fool of yourself. I'm going to have lunch. By two o'clock, the newspapers were full of the murder of Mrs. Florence Avery March. The suspect was already in custody, caught at the home of Nero Wolf, well-known private investigator. Some of the stolen jewelry had been recovered, but not the diamonds. Then we had a visit from Mr. Anson Stark, who had opened Mrs. March's door and found her dead. Stark was a big athletic guy of about 30 or so, with the large, capable hands of a surgeon or a laboratory worker. He seemed annoyed at the inconvenience we caused him, but that was only natural. That's the story, Mr. Wolf. I don't see how I can add anything more to it. Uh, you had known Mrs. March for several years, huh? Mm, casually. When you broke the door open, uh, was it difficult? Not very. You were the first into the room? There were three or four of us. We pushed in together. You saw the body of Mrs. March immediately? She was lying across the bed that was heaped with coats and hats and handbags. You knew she was dead? Of course not. In fact, somebody else discovered that she had been choked to death. And who discovered that the diamonds were gone? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, were there many diamonds, Mr. Stark? No, just a few, but big ones. She wore them on a pendant around her neck. 
Mr. Stark, I want to thank you again for having been so patient. I have been patient, Mr. Wolfe. I have my own business to attend to. Which is? Oh, I have a small but hopeful enterprise. Electronics, tubes for radio and television. Mostly experimental. Well, that reminds me, Mr. Stark. When you entered the bedroom, was the light on or off? Uh, let me see. Of course, it was on. It must have been on. Why? Just curiosity, Mr. Stark. Oh, Anything more? That's all, except thank you for coming here. Archie, will you take Mr. Stark to the door? Mr. Stark departed like a man who'd been delayed by a petty annoyance. A few minutes later, the door buzzed. And I went, expecting anything. Anything but what was standing on the threshold when I opened up. A honey blonde. Or, to put it another way, a blonde honey. I said hello. No, more like hello. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, I'm his assistant, Archie Goodwin, and what can we do for you? Well, I'm Valerie Ladd. And I'm Archie Goodwin. Or did I tell you that? Well, that's exactly where I came in. Well, I mean, where I thought you were going to ask me to come in. Oh, come in, come in. I'm sorry. Well, is he? Is he here? Wolf? Mm-hmm. Uh, does he know you? No. Is he expecting you? No. I see. Of course you don't see, do you? Well, uh, this is it, Mr. Goodwin. I'm a writer. Well, I may not look like it, but that's what I am. And I want to do a, a profile, a character study of Mr. Wolf for a magazine. Oh. Well, what's wrong? Well, you see, there's a writer named Rex Stout. Oh, I know. He's written a lot about Nero Wolf, but well, can't I write about him, too? I don't know if he's going to like it, but you can't be shot for trying. Come on. Mr. Wolf, this is Valerie Ladd. Pardon me for not rising, Miss Ladd. It is not impolite. It is merely impracticable. Miss Ladd wants to write about you for a magazine. Please, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. Mr. Wolf, if I could just spend a few hours with you, that would be enough. Would it indeed? Oh, yes. Have you written much, Miss Ladd? Oh, reams. You know, uh, the habits of writers interest me. The habits? Yeah, the writing habits. For instance, do you use a pen or a pencil? Do you dictate, or like most writers, do you do your own typing? Mr. Wolfe, if you knew the hours and days and and years that I've pounded a typewriter. Of course. Archie. Yes, sir? Why don't you take Miss Ladd up and show her the orchids? You never know about Nero, Wolfe. At least I never do. This was something I would have bet against a thousand to one. Couldn't understand it. But I certainly couldn't complain. Archie, look at this one. Oh, did you ever see anything so gorgeous? Very pretty. Ah, they're all just beyond belief. Yeah? But you're not even looking at them, Archie. What? Oh! <laughs> Archie, are you always like this? What do you mean, like this? Well, so... So distant and preoccupied. Honey, you got me wrong. Completely. I was thinking... Oh. Yeah, about telephone numbers. Well, it's a lovely thing to think about. What can you think about telephone numbers? I was thinking how some girls have them and some don't. Oh, I see. Archie, I apologize. For what? I did have you wrong. You're not a bit distant. I can be a lot closer than this, honey. What is it? What's what? The number. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's in the book. Yeah. I wonder. Hmm. Sound as if you don't believe me. Oh, I believe you, but uh, there's a telephone book here. Let's lick it up together, shall we? Uh, Archie. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm afraid I lied to you. I was afraid of that, too. Are you angry? Well, I can take no for an answer, honey. Even when it's hard to take. Archie, I've changed my mind. I want you to have my number. And I want you to use it, too. You know, honey, I'm beginning to take an interest in this dialogue. Let's have it. Okay. Olympia 9, 3659. And a very, very pretty number it is. Valerie Ladd. Two Ds? Mm-hmm. Olympia 9, 3659. Honey Blonde. Gorgeous. Oh. Spelled <gasps> gorgeous. There. There. Uh, what are we doing tonight, Olympia 9? And I said that you were distant and preoccupied. Uh, We were talking about tonight. Hmm. 
Isn't all right, Archie? Yes, I'd love it. Oh, these orchids, oh, they're really beyond belief. And you won't even look at them. True, I'm too busy looking at you. Well, how do I look, Archie? Beyond belief, honey, <laughs> beyond belief. Well, there goes the good one luck again. It's a house phone, partner. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. He wants us to come down. Archie. Yes, dear. Even if he says no, we, uh, we still have a date? Honey, though the heavens fall. When we entered the office, Mr. Wolf was frowning over a sheet of letter paper in his hand. He looked up and tossed the paper to me. That is a peculiar thing, Archie. The sheet of letter paper just arrived. Since Miss Ladd is interested in detection, show it to her. Thank you. Well, it was some sort of code, isn't it? Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. That's all. What do you suppose it means? You're kidding. Archie. Oh. What? Did I say something wrong? No, 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 no. Miss Ladd, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I haven't time for an interview just now. Goodbye, Miss Ladd. Oh, but Mr. Wolf. Goodbye, Archie. Say goodbye to Mr. Wolf and let's go, honey. Goodbye. That's the way things can be around here. Well, here's the door, and shall we, uh, shall we pause for station identification? Mm-hmm. Oh. I'll wipe it off, Archie. There. Thanks. Well, what happened, Archie? Yes, indeed. Yeah, oh, Mr. Wolf, I mean. Oh. Why did he suddenly want me to go? Well, I'll tell you, though, I don't know whether I should. That, that code message he showed you? Yes. Quirky up. You remember. Yeah, sure. Because I use a typewriter. From left to right, it's the first bank of letters on any typewriter. I see. It was a test. Yeah. And you flunked it, baby. You're no writer. Archie, I, I, I can explain Sure, it. sure, sure. Tonight. <sighs> Tonight, Archie. <laughs> You do believe me, don't you, Archie? Oh, of course, baby, of course. Well, it's just that I was there at the party, I mean, when, when poor Florence was murdered. Then I read in the paper about, well, how they caught the man at Nero Wolf's. And I always wanted to be a writer, so I thought if I could get an exclusive interview and... Well, that would be a good way to start my career, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, pardon me a second, will you, Valerie? I've got to make a phone call. There's a booth. It'll only take a minute or two. Near Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm at the Riviera with Valerie Ladd. I'm happy for you, Archie. I will remind you that I have not seen you since Valerie left the house. I was otherwise occupied, Archie. With orchids. With orchids? What do you want, Archie? Now look, with that typewriter gag, you practically told me she was a phony, didn't you? Of course, of course. Just for the record, how did you know? Have you looked at her fingernails? She never touched a typewriter in her life. I wanted to be sure. Okay, now... Now, do you want me to tell you something? You mean that your charming companion, Valerie, was at the party when Mrs. March was murdered? How did you know that? Simple, Archie. I got a list of the guests from Inspector Kramer. Among them was the name of Valerie Ladway. Simple? Ladway. Lad. Yeah, sure. Okay, what am I supposed to do about it? Just hang on, Archie. Just hang on. I went back to the honey blonde, the beautiful phony Valerie Ladd, Ladway. I mean, I went back to the table where she should have been, but she wasn't there. I sat down and waited. Looked at my watch, 11.24. 11.32, no Miss Ladway. 11.45, I finally realized that not only Valerie, but her coat and bag were also absent. I called the waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, what happened to my friend? The young lady left some time ago, sir. Okay, give me the bill. She paid it, sir. She did? Yes, sir. In fact, she said you gave her the money for it. Yeah? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Well, I didn't know it, but she is certainly right. Oh, oh my. Well, Archie, this is most thoughtless of you. Sorry, I, uh, I lost my keys. My money, too. Your keys, Archie? Yeah. Glad you were still up. You lost Miss Ladway, too? Definitely. I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. You think it's funny, don't you? <laughs> yes, Archie. Yes, yes, I do. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Archie. Yeah? Before you retire, one thing. What? Open the safe, will you? And leave it open. Why? Because there's nothing in it of importance. And it's a valuable safe and I don't want it damaged. Good night, Archie. At about two o'clock in the morning, I thought I heard a noise. I got up, put on the rest of my pajamas, picked up my gun and went down to the office. The man had his head in the safe and everything was scattered all over. I stepped inside the door. Put your hands behind your back and stand up. Huh? Okay. Now, just what are you after, bud? Uh... When I woke up, I was alone on the office floor. I did not feel good. The place looked as if a hurricane had struck it. Every file drawer had been empty. I felt a draft from somewhere. Got to my feet, trying not to joggle my head too much. It was the front door standing open. I closed it gently. Then very, very gently, I groped my way to the kitchen for ice, water, and towels. Archie! What? Oh, didn't you hear me scream? No. Is it bad? It's better. You're angry, aren't you? Nuts. What, Archie? I said nuts, Mr. Wolf. Nuts. I'm sorry about what happened. Yeah, you expected it. But I didn't expect you to be caught by somebody behind you. You must have known there would have been two of them. Now, how would I know that? How? Think of Miss Ladway's delicate hands. Do you believe she intended to open the safe herself? You think she stole my keys and so on? Well, let me tell you... Hey, wait. That guy was digging in the safe that... Then who hit me in the head? (laughs) Ah, gee, someday you'll be the death of me. In the morning, will you tell Inspector Kramer I'd like to see him here? Fuming and protesting, Kramer arrived about 1.30. When I let him into the office, Mr. Wolfe was gazing thoughtfully at the ground floor plan of the house of the late Mrs. Florence Avery March. We'd gotten it from the original architects. Wolfe looked up and almost smiled. Thank you for coming to me, Inspector. You know how difficult it is for me to come to you. Okay, okay, what's up? I take it you haven't found the diamonds. No, not yet. We'll break inch down, though. Don't think we won't. Oh, I'm sure. But this is what I want to ask you, and it's quite serious. Okay, okay, all right, what? After the body was found, your man arrived at the house before anyone left. Right. And before anybody was allowed to go, every person was searched thoroughly. Nobody could have gotten a pin or a needle out of that place. I know something about police methods, and I believe you. Now, how thoroughly did you search the house itself? Wolf, look. We've got that floor plan you're studying now. There are no hidden closets. Every square inch of that house has been examined. The diamonds aren't there. Willie Inch killed the dame and snatched the diamonds. What he did with them, we'll find out. Possibly, possibly. Goodbye, Inspector. At approximately 3.15, the postman arrived with an envelope for me. The envelope contained my keys, the bill from the Riviera, and the money left after the check was paid. At approximately 5.07 p.m., I discovered that Wolf had been using the telephone all by himself. He explained. He was going to have a party. He had invited all of the guests who were at Mrs. Florence Avery March's somewhat fatal party including Anson Stark, Willie Inch, and Valerie. Near old Wolf, the natural-born ham, he made an entrance that would have been worthy of Queen Victoria in her heavier days. He sat in his oversized throne behind his oversized desk and beamed at the peasants. Valerie moved toward me. I'm 
I'm sorry, Archie, but you must know why I did it. Why? Well, you said I wasn't a writer. I wanted to prove that you weren't a detective. Did you take the stuff while we were dancing? I could have, couldn't I? You could have bumped me on the head last night, too, couldn't you? Oh, Archie. Let it go. It was humiliating, though. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you realize the purpose of this party. We want to know who killed Mrs. March and what became of her diamond. Mr. Inch. Uh, yeah? When you visited the room where the body was found, the room was dark? Uh, the bulb was burned out. I tried to turn it on. If there had been a body on the bed, would you have seen it? Maybe. With all those coats, maybe not. Sir, so, Mr. Stark? Yes, I said the light was on. Perhaps I was wrong. What of it? You're engaged in the manufacture of tubes for radio and television, huh? I told you that. Inspector Kramer. Yeah, why? A light bulb was found in the wastebasket in the room where Mrs. March died. Yeah. Like you said, we tried the bulb in the socket and it worked. So what? One more question. Does anybody remember whether Mr. Stark was carrying a bundle or a package under his arm when he arrived at Mrs. March's party? Oh, I do, Mr. Wolf. I think he had a box of flowers. That's true. I did bring flowers. No, Mr. Stark. That box contained two parts of a light bulb and some adhesive. During the party, you strangled Mrs. March, put the diamonds into the light bulb, assembled the thing, and screwed it into the lamp socket. Archie, stop him! <laughs> really, Archie, it was quite simple. Light bulbs are only a stem glass bowl and a brass sheet. Yet nobody, including the police, would think of looking inside one. Mr. Stark could come back and collect his treasure any time after the excitement had died down. What's the matter, Archie? I got a headache. Valerie Ladd. Ladby. Poor girl. She and whoever the man was with her must have thought the diamonds were here. That bump on your head will be better in the morning. Bottle of beer, please, Archie. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yes. Why must you place such confidence in women? Remember what happened to Mark Antony and Samson and Archie Goodwin. (laughs) Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. This is an Edwin Fadiman production. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and G.G. Pearson, Bud Heaston, Gray Stafford, Dick Ryan, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Midnight Ride. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? (laughs) What? In trouble, you? (laughs) More trouble, you attract trouble, Archie, hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc. Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look, look, listen, Doc, come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about odontocosms. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man, bring on all the curses that is available.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, there was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrumming phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. What was that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that? Archie. Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired. Naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf's... What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie. Please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria... Ba- no. No, don't. Is Gloria who? Ronaldo... West... Hello? Hello? Well, did you hear that? Another female bar. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help. And for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria Barr or Mar or something like that. And then she said Ronaldo Road West. And then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. Sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West. Where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. Westchester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this Gloria alive, Archie? I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her, then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. (laughs) Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. My nose. (laughs) I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? It's only been three or four minutes. I have never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? Well, there were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh good evening, Nero. Were they waiting for you, Doctor? Well, why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, I... Doc, here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, I never... Uh, well, that is... Uh, well, a small one. I, I am upset. Uh, you understand, Archie. Uh, uh, Oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you so? Oh, hello, Nero. Did someone call me? When? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? But didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear. What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. 
Uh, no, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember, we all went to school together. Uh, that is, uh, oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was... Um, uh, just uh, what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria? of Barnesworth you knew, and I'm supposed to know. My. Uh, could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So, if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Yeah, Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak tonight. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Now, just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Good evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, I told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Uh, why, I'm... And don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, uh... Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get tonight. along. Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in on... Are you going to shut up and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. <laughs> See here, it's getting very late. I I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. you What's the idea back of all this, friend? Pull off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now we'll all get out here. Now wait a I minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now wait a second. What's the big idea? Now all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. <laughs> What's he going to do? What do you think? Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now wait a minute. This is get the way you Get out your gun and don't turn around, driver. Now let him have it. Go on or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, come on. empty your gun into them. Go on. Oh! Now just drop your gun on the ground. There. Now I will take Goodwin's gun and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now, wait a minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. Hey, Doc. Dr. Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh. Oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I, I can't last long. Where are you hit? 
tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around You're me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. We're very lucky people. Yeah. What became of them? Hand me my gun. Oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. Have a look through his pockets. Wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl says to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. This fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this, uh, this girl Violet is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? Strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? We can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoofing it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc because Gloria had called Doc and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin, it. And then the man shot him up. And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recording, hmm? Bring it in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're you Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Well, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Well, you look at this photo. It says, to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You've seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? No, at least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was a maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I, I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolf? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There's no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Well, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Uh, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. No, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Hey, what do you know? It didn't lock. The lights are on. I know. I know. Listen. 
Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is, a radio. And a phonograph combination. Yes, and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. Just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. Look, I don't go in for that kind of stuff. You've been working for me for several weeks now, haven't you? Well, sure, boss, but I never went in for no kind We're of... We're going to pick this guy up and take him for a little ride. It ain't my life. All you do is drive the car. Okay, I'll take a chance. But remember, I'm just the driver of your car. If anything happens, I didn't know nothing. You'll do just as I say. Incidentally, I know a lot about you. Things the police would like to know. Okay. Okay, I'm working for you. I came out to Ronaldo Road to make an honest living. But I see I'm right back where I started. And worse, the guy just ain't got a chance. <laughs> oh, remind me. I've got to phone the place. did say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help, Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. Six, five, three, two, two, three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. I'll call Kramer, and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. Hmm. No such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. <laughs> Oh, here it is. I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Well, here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. Don't pull, Doctor. Don't pull on me. Oh. Yeah. There we are. Now, come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. Yeah. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Uh-oh, stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, we are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. 
in the uh, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh, they're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now, what did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then... Then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrumming. Uh, but you I are... I called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this... Uh... Oh. And who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle... Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin. Yeah? What is it you wish? The girl called you uncle. Oh, pardon me. I'm near a wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see, the girl is quite ill. Oh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria. Now, come, Dr. Gunther, you know to whom we refer. What? You, you mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange... If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year. Paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but she passed away this afternoon. Died? Gloria? This afternoon? But how could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah. It's been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. You've given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle, rather Dr. Gunther? No, do you, Thromey? No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss, and he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. Uh, uh, let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc, let's put our shoulders to it. One, two... Go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. Yeah, about time... Getting cold out here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Kenton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but his young Gloria's husband, 
And they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thromig and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. With this... This is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him, believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. <laughs> All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie. I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, dear me. Uh, oh. Uh, what happened? Uh, am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. It's really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slipper. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie... If you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lover's convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Howard McNear, Gene Bates, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, Grace Lennard, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Final Page. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribe. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz. Yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why is Mr. Ware being in such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner, that should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? <laughs> I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Murrow's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe. It's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no. This is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rush me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here. And we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merrill has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merrill is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, miss. I'll speak to the management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain quail shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merle displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure, he probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again. Don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not, I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. It's strange as a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Hmm, unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. I must figure out the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm, very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm, not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Ah, the Merle, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I am exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Vi- Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at homicide. How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Murrow? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. Oh, no. Don't tell me you two have started up something on a night like this. It's ten below zero. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body on the Grant's tomb? 
I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. So, you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector. That this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar? Or a madman? Or a crank? Or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone at the door, Archie. Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. The dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... Uh, murdered? Well, oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow, Inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively delectable. Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, Inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merle, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. <laughs> Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. The sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Apparently. King Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly, as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. You no, know, I'd it... like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. It. Oh, what is this, open house? Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Murrow. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, I... Come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she felt free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I, well, I'm his fiancée. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? 
Why, yes, I had dinner early. Uh, when I... were you last here, Miss Roberts? Well, last night, after the theater. Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but Arthur Merle was murdered. <laughs> and you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances, we can't very well leave him out. Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Near yeah, Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with her. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now, see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer, admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then, if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for him? I thought you were the admirer of the fair to six, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancée of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh, oh, there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, just started the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? That's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. Yes, may I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, Hom- oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Murrow. Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolfe? I'm his, well, his assistant, man Friday. Mr. And... Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Murrow. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolf. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Charles. A little early for that. 
Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh, I want to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave. I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. I'll see you again soon, Mr. Child. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you? Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. Mr. Merle's name on a novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. I haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages. All we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. But the rest of it's gone. You mean, Goodwin, the, the novel's gone? Oh, this will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. Oh, I hope I've been of some help, although I I'm don't sorry quite see... you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Mirror Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made carbons. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Oh, then you haven't dismissed the possibility that she may have had something to do with it. Being his fiancée, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night. And she also may know what Merle's novel was about. Right, boss. I'm anxious to know what the novel was about, too. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle. Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolf and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. A, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up, or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're convinced I... that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hope you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. Got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work Consequently, with the major portion of his... Boss! Boss! Good heaven, Archie. Please don't be so loud. Look here. In this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about. And And listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. 
Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me. I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle, but on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it, you are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home, and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What the... You mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him... We have only one other choice, make him come to us. Will you tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office? Yes, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. Then it won't be long until we know, too. Now, you should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen, huh? Someone's coming. A brilliant deduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick! I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Child. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Charles. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Charles. There you are. Yeah. Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? That no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then? Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes? Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So you can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed a murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. I'm sorry to do this to you, child, but I can't... Child, please, enough! <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Charles. There wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles. Get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you. Behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Charles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel. That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. 
And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Child. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank. They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer. Eh, Inspector? Child! Child! Stop, Child! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got Charles. Some beer, please. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes. In a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Murrell's novel. Why? You never read detective stories. No, but I've drummed up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah. I've been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin. And Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on the Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blanding. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Who? Who is this? Who wants to speak to Mr. Wolf? Nobody. Nobody? I said that. Hang up. It's late and it's too cold. And even if it weren't, I would not consider for one moment moving from this room. Please, Mr. Wolf, I can't hear a thing this old gentleman's saying. Does it matter? You heard what I said? No. Now, what did you say? You were late because she was killed. Well, who was killed? I can't hear you. What is it about, Archie? He says he was due here an hour ago, but she was killed. Who was killed? What does he want? Uh, do you want us to solve the crime? I say, do you want us to find out who killed her? Oh. He says he knows who did it, but he has an important message for you. Well, then come right over. We'll be waiting, Mr. Jenkins. Archie, why do you insist on taking every silly little case? Because, boss, we need to recover for March 15th. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This case I like to refer to as the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Perhaps a better title would be Wolf Goes A-Hunting. For in a way, this was one of those unusual instances in which my boss, of his own free will and without any coercion, actually decided to leave the house and go to the scene of the crime. It started when the strange old gentleman who phoned us finally arrived. Well, there's our client, Mr. Wolf. 
Evening. It's me. Who's me? Oh, I, I just phoned you. I, I'm Jenkins. I got a dispatch for Nero Wolf. Oh, you're Jenkins. Well, come in, come in. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Jenkins. Says he has a dispatch for you. Yep. Yeah. Are you Wolf? I am. Where is the dispatch from? Don't know. You, you don't know? How come? Oh, I know, but I'm supposed to say I don't. See? That's my job. What is? Just to say I don't know. What about the matter? Yeah, who was killed? Oh, my goodness. It was a terrible thing. We were just crossing the turnpike, and this fella come at us out of nowhere. The killer? Yeah. Must have been drunk, I guess. Well, how did it happen? Did he shoot her and stab her? Oh, no, no. He ran into her with his car. And she was only nine years old. Your granddaughter? No, no, it was Bessie. But the police got him. I, I have to appear, I guess. Probably get 90 days, he will. For murder? Murder. Was somebody murdered? I must have missed something. Look, we're talking about Bessie. And what do you want us to do about it? Nothing. Bessie's my old horse. Oh, no. Uh, but say, who was it that was murdered? Nobody yet. Good night, Mr. Jenkins. I thought you said it was important. It might be. At least that's the way I was told. What might be? Uh, this here letter I was bringing to you. This uh, dispatch. Well, got to get along now. Uh, goodbye. Well, get him. What a pixie. What is in the envelope? Mr. Wolf, look. Five $100 bills. And the note says, Mr. Wolf, your services are desperately needed. Come up this weekend as my guest. Signed, E. Malott. Edwin Malott, the wealthy manufacturer. Hmm. Well, looks as though you're going out this weekend. Well, our GP, my respects to Mr. Malott, and I hope you enjoy the weekend. Good night. Something certainly phony about this. There's no party going on here tonight. Yes? What is it? Is this the Malott place? It is. What do you want? My name's Goodwin. I'm a guest of Mr. Malott's. A guest? Yes, he invited me down for the weekend. Weekend? Oh. Well, you better step in, please, Mr. Goodwin. Quite a bolt you've got on that door. Yes, isn't it? Just sit down there, please. I'll get Mr. Malott. He's in the library. Oh, here he is. This is Mr. Goodwin, sir. Says he's come down for the weekend. Mr. Goodwin? Good evening. You've come for the weekend, you say? Well, yes. Wasn't that the idea, Mr. Malott? Well, I, uh, I don't understand, Mr. Goodwin. Didn't you send me this note asking me to come here? Note? I did not. Oh, well, well, this is my personal note stationery. But I don't recall sending this. I didn't even type it. And I'm in the habit of signing my name with a pen, not with a typewriter. E. Malott. You're certainly Edward Malott. Yes. Services are desperately needed. What does this mean? What services? Who are you, Mr. Goodwin? Are you serious? I'm a private investigator. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. Oh, indeed. Nero Wolfe, eh? I know of him, yes, indeed. And you really don't know anything about this note? I do not. Are you having a weekend party here? <laughs> I most certainly am not. Then who sent this? And there were five $100 bills as a retainer. I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, uh, Dorothy. Yes? Would you step in here, please? Uh, Miss Davis is my private secretary. Uh, she may know something about this. Yes, Mr. Malott. What is it? I... Uh, Dorothy. Oh. Dorothy, this is Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I... How do you do, Miss Davis? Uh, yes, yes, well. Uh, Mr. Goodwin is assistant to Nero Wolfe. You don't say. Nero Wolfe, the detective? Well, I've heard a great deal about him. And about you, too, Mr. Goodwin. Well, now I'm mighty glad to hear you say that, Miss Davis. Uh, Mr. Goodwin has yes. a note here. Is anything wrong, Edward? I heard voices. Oh, do we have company? Nothing is wrong, Eva. I was calling Dorothy, that's all. Oh, oh this is Mr. Goodwin, Eva. My wife, Mr. Goodwin. How do you do, Mrs. Malone? Mr. Goodwin, I... Uh, yes, how, how do you do? Uh, now, as I was about to say, Dorothy, yes. Mr. Goodwin... What's going on? Mr. Goodwin, uh, this is my son, Larry. Good evening. What's wrong? Uh, Mr. Goodwin has been invited here for the weekend. He has an invitation supposedly written by me. At least uh, it's on my stationery. Look at this, Dorothy. Know anything about this note? No. No. I certainly didn't write it. But it's my personal note paper and my signature is typewritten. I'd uh, never do that. Well, somebody sent it. Who's Jenkins? Jenkins? Never heard of him. A little dried up old man. He delivered it to us. Yeah, maybe it didn't even come from this house. I'm positive that it didn't. Never heard of Jenkins. You have a typewriter here, of course. Yes? I'd like to see it. 
Uh, certainly, Mr. Goodwin, in the library. How far have you come, Mr. Goodwin? From New York, Manhattan. Oh, and it's such a dreadful night, too. Yes, yes, and it is rather late. Late? It's only 7.30. Why not stay here for the night? Plenty of room? Uh, yes, Mr. Goodwin, plenty of room. Well, I, I don't really think that's necessary. I, uh... On the other hand, it would be a tough drive back to the city in this storm. I'll accept your hospitality, Mr. Mallott. Very good. Oh, uh, Jeffries, show Mr. Goodwin to the uh, east wing. And uh, take care of his car. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Goodwin. You, you, you mean you're all going to retire now? I haven't even had my dinner. We retire very early here. But Jeffries will prepare anything you want. Good night. <laughs> Oh, dear, who moved that phone? Hello, uh, Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, I'm here at Malotte's place, but there ain't no party. What happened? Are you in the right house? I'm afraid I am. They've all gone to bed. Weird bunch. His wife, who looks very sickly and I think wants to say something to me alone, and Larry the son and Malotte's secretary, Dorothy Davis. She has me bothered a bit. How unusual. Especially if she's pretty. A beauty. But she seems to know all about me. Hmm. You better come home, Archie. I can see you're in no condition to handle this case properly. Give them the money back. Oh, I forgot to tell you. They don't want me here. Malat didn't send the note. No one here knows anything about it, so we can keep the dough. Interesting indeed. The circumstances would indicate that you should stay there and wait for it to happen. For what to happen? For whatever it is the fates have conspired to have happened there while your shining little ego is in the midst of it. Bye. Who is it? It's Archie Goodwin, Mrs. Mallott. Come in. Come in, please. I saw you give me the eye when I was about to leave. I've been waiting till I felt sure they were all asleep. Now, what's up? I wrote you that note. I sent for you. How do I know that? Old man Jenkins is a scissor and knife sharpener who happens along every month or so. They wouldn't know him. I put five $100 bills in the envelope. Okay, why? My life is in danger. I've been threatened. I received three notes through the mail. They were all postmarked in New York City. Could I see them? Here they are. All typewritten. Hmm. The first one reads, there is no love for you in Grey Gables. The second, why stay on in the face of death? And the third, the time is shorter than you think. Do you think this is a, well, an inside job, Mrs. Mallard? Well, at first I didn't. But lately I've come to think it is. What caused you to think that? For some time I've been having severe spells. I thought it was indigestion. But then it occurred to me that I always broke out in cold perspiration. I was left horribly weakened, terribly thirsty. Thirsty? You fear you're being poisoned? Yes. And since the thought came to me, I've been living in fear. Fear of every bite of food or drink. I had so shattered my nerves that I have to take these yellow sleeping capsules to even close my eyes. Well, as your husband and his secretary and your son, Larry. Larry is my stepson. Which one do you suspect? The secretary, Dorothy, or my husband, or both. What's the motive? Well, they're in love. She's been here over two years, and they've spent most of their time together. The idea never occurred to me till last week. And when I watched them, it... It was quite obvious. Anybody else know about these three notes? Oh, no. Then I'll keep them for a while. Good night, Mrs. Mallott. And don't worry. What are you doing, Mr. Goodwin, snooping around his father's library? Well, Larry, I was just trying to find out if this Remington was the machine you used to type those notes. What? What notes? The notes you sent your stepmother. Why, I don't know anything about any notes. And why were you so startled? I'm not startled. I just, well, uh, why would I threaten her? Well, so you do know about them. I didn't mention the contents of the notes. I just happened to see them on the table in her sitting room. You don't care too much about your stepmother, do you? Oh, she's all right. You don't care too much about Dorothy either, do you? I certainly don't. Why not? Well, I don't like her tactics, making a fool out of my father. If anybody here sent those notes, she did. You think Dorothy would have a motive? I certainly do. Of course, you wouldn't have a motive, would you? No. Well, I'm inclined to think you would. Well, just what motive would I have? You don't seem to like any woman who's too close to your father. Maybe because you'd resent anyone sharing in the estate if your father died. If I were you, Mr. Goodwin, I'd leave. Tonight. 
And the sooner the better. Good night. Archie. Arch. Oh, confounded boy. Yes, Archie? You have the wrong number. This is Sherlock Holmes speaking. Why didn't you go to bed like the others? You don't have to push it. It'll happen. Eva Malott thinks she's being slowly poisoned. Suspects her husband and his secretary. He could be right. What are the symptoms she suffers? Gastric disturbances, weakness, thirst. Indeed. What about the son? Have any ideas? He doesn't like his stepmother and is decidedly against his father's secretary, Dorothy. He knew all about the notes Mrs. Malott had received. Saw them on her dressing table. He believes Dorothy's the culprit. Then I should say that Dorothy should be the next on your list. You can say that again. Be careful, Archie. Use your head this time. Incidentally, Larry advised me to leave the place tonight. Bit of a threat it was, too. What shall I do, Mr. Anthony? Do nothing. The trouble will come to you. Bye. Oh. Hello there, Mr. Mallard. I thought you'd turned in for the night. It's quite obvious you thought so, Mr. Goodwin. What are you doing in the library? Why, just looking for something to read. You'll find the books all around the walls, not on my desk. Well, I was looking for a particular kind of book. I'm very much interested in poisons. Poisons? Yeah, a hobby of mine. You happen to have any books on toxicology? I do not. And what's that book on the fourth shelf right beside you? Why, I... I uh... Oh, oh toxicology... Where did that come from? Never saw it before. Hmm. Uh, perhaps it was in that uh, assorted collection I bought a couple of weeks ago. I uh, hadn't noticed it. Larry probably put them on the shelves. Mr. Mallard, how long have you known Dorothy, your secretary? Uh, a little over two years. Did it ever occur to you that she might be, well, infatuated, in love with you? What? Well, of all the... Now, see here. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't know how you got hold of my stationery to write that fake note. It isn't a but fake I... note, Mallard. I'm only trying to find out what's back of it. Mr. Goodwin, there is nothing going on here that requires the services of a detective, and Dorothy is not in love with me. I didn't say she was. I asked you if you thought she might be. Well, since this conversation seems to concern me, I suppose I am at liberty to come in. Oh, you're still up too, Miss Davis. Did you hear what this man said, Dorothy? Yes, I did, Mr. Millard. And I'd like to have a few words alone with Mr. Goodwin, if you don't mind. Mr. Goodwin, would you mind coming with me for a few minutes? No, not at all. And... Well, it's rather late, Mr. Mallott. Don't you think you should retire? It's a heavy day tomorrow. Well, uh, uh, yes. Yes, I suppose I should. And please, don't let this upset you. Mr. Goodwin has been misinformed. I'll straighten him out. Come on, Mr. Goodwin. The bar is right across the hall. I'll fix you a nice, soothing drink. That'll be nice. Well, now, what would you like, Mr. Goodwin? In the way of drinks? Oh, well, some seven-up. Really? <laughs> Just sit down over there. Okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, where did you get the idea that I was in love with Mr. Millat? First, suppose you tell me if you are in love with him. Yes, I am. But until a few minutes ago, he wasn't even aware of it. I worship him and his work. I never wanted him to know because he's married. It would have caused trouble and I'd have had to leave here. But now he knows it's true. Well, now that he knows, what will happen? Well, I'm going to leave tonight. Now. I see. And since I don't own a car, Mr. Goodwin, I'm going to ask you to do me a very great favor. Will you run me into New York? I want to leave without a word. If I wait till morning, I'll have to explain to Mr. Mallard and... Well, that would be most embarrassing, Archie. Oh, now it's Archie. You, you don't really mind, do you? No, no, I guess I don't. I should, maybe, but, uh... Don't you like your drink? What'd you put in this drink? What do you mean? What'd you dope it with? <laughs> Archie, why would I do that? Might be several reasons. There's nothing in that drink. No? Then suppose you drink it. Why? <laughs> Give it to me. I'll throw it out. If you want another drink, fix it yourself. I'll have my things ready in five minutes. Are you going to take me? Sure. Certainly I'm going to take you. But are you sure you have to go tonight? I must go tonight. Now. I wish I knew why. Mr. Wolf's always so right. What? Just talking to myself. Dorothy! Larry! Jeffries! Come upstairs! What's happened? Call Dr. Hauser. Something terrible has happened to Eva. <laughs> Well, 
Well, Dr. Hauser? Ah, oh, poor Mrs. Malott. No, there's nothing to be done now. It's all over. Eva. Eva. You'd better lie down, Mr. Malott. I'll phone and take care of everything. I'll be here if you need me. I uh, have to make out the certificate. Yes, come along, Mr. Malott. Just a minute. You too, Larry. I don't want to make this any more unpleasant for you, but, Doctor, just what are you going to put on the certificate as the cause of death? Acute gastritis. Is that what you've been treating her for? Well, she's had several attacks lately. I'd warned her to be cautious of her diet. And that was wise advice, too. Did you know about these attacks, Mr. Malott? Yes, I did. And you, Dorothy? Yes, I knew. And you knew also, Larry? Uh, no, I, I knew she hadn't been feeling well. How long had Mrs. Malott been suffering from insomnia? Oh, a year at least. I prescribed Nemitol. In yellow capsules? Of course. I wrote a prescription ever so often calling for 12 capsules. You all knew about that, of course. I thought so. And would this be the prescription, this little box of capsules here on... Well. What's the matter, Mr. Goodwin? That box was open on this nightstand when we stepped into this room. All right, let's have the box, Mr. Malad. Thank you. Why'd you pick it up? Uh, because I... I didn't want the stigma of suicide on Eva's name, nor mine. Suicide? Yes. Eva had this prescription filled yesterday morning. The dose is one at bedtime. Twelve capsules. She took one last night. I glanced at the open box when I came into the room, and there were only eight capsules left. I, I knew instantly what had happened. She'd taken an overdose. Doctor, do you think three capsules would be sufficient to cause her death? I doubt it very much. So do I. Mrs. Malott didn't die from an overdose of sleeping capsules. She was poisoned. Poisoned? Are you crazy? By whom? By you. Or Dorothy. Or Larry. No. I didn't do it. I didn't write those notes. What notes? Mrs. Malott had received three notes threatening her life if she didn't leave this house. Each of you had a motive, so I'm sending this body to the coroner for an immediate autopsy. I won't permit it. The police will see to it. You have no choice. <laughs> Yes, Archie. What now? Do you know who did it? How do you know anything's happened? Let us call it extrasensory perception. Well, Mrs. Malott was right. She's dead. Her doctor knew nothing about the spell she was having as being caused by anything but indigestion. How about an autopsy? It's all in the works. Looks like a metallic poison, all the symptoms. Oh? Did you search the house carefully for such a poison? I did. And I'll check the drugstores in the morning. Somebody in that house will purchase some poison. Let me know when the autopsy report is in. Right. Let's see now. We have Mr. Malott, Dorothy Davis, and Larry the son. He's Mr. Malott's son, but not the child of Eva Malott, remember? Yes. Is it true that Dorothy is in love with Malott? Yeah. Dorothy admitted it to me, but claimed Malott wasn't aware of it until tonight. And earlier this evening, Dorothy tried her best to get me out of the house, insisted that I drive her into town. She tried to give me a drink, which I think might have contained knockout drops. You don't say. Archie, I should have Fritz drive me up to the Malort place at once. Archie, are you there? No, boss, I just fainted. And that, Mr. Wolf, is most of the story up to now. Very interesting. Yes, indeed. But it isn't true. I did not put anything in Mr. Goodwin's drink. Then did you ask him to take you into town? Yes. And I might have been found in a ditch. Oh, it's ridiculous. Why did you try to get Mr. Goodwin to take you to town? Because I felt it would be too embarrassing to remain until morning. Maybe you'd already given Mother the big dose of poison and wanted Goodwin out before it was discovered. Well, you Wait a minute. That... Now, Mr. Miller, you claim that you knew nothing about Dorothy being in love with you? Should we believe that? You can believe it or not. Dorothy had a motive to get rid of Mrs. Malott. It seems that Mr. Malott had one, too. And so did Larry. What? You admitted to me that you didn't like your stepmother. And that you disliked Dorothy even more. I didn't say that. You said Dorothy was making a fool of your father. You resented the possibility of any woman sharing in the estate. You knew about the sleeping capsules, and you could have put poison in some of them. You could have written those threat notes. And by getting rid of your stepmother and placing the blame on Dorothy, you'd be getting rid of them both. But I didn't. I did not write those notes. You were the only one who knew about them. I was not the only one. I saw Dorothy coming out of Mother's room. It was this afternoon. Mother was out taking his son back. Dorothy did it. She's the one. I think you're the one. No, no, Dorothy wrote those notes. That's a lie. No, she probably slipped into Mother's room and wrote those notes on Mother's portable. What? In just a minute. Archie, come here. I never heard of sex lies. Oh, I didn't do it. You can't send me to jail. I'll kill you first. Larry, drop that gun. Don't come near me, any of you. You're such a fool, Larry. Give me that gun. I'll shoot. I'll shoot! Come on. 
There. Now, you better quiet down, kid. Or Inspector Crane will take care of you when he arrives. Well, Mr. Wolf, what goes on here? Where's Goodwin? I uh, sent him upstairs, Inspector Kramer, upstairs to Mrs. Malotte's room to check on something. Ah, uh, here he is. Yeah? What have you been doing, Goodwin? This, Inspector, is the piece de resistance. This is what Mr. Wolf has been waiting for. This little black box contains a typewriter, a portable noiseless Remington. Mrs. Malotte's typewriter. What? I didn't even know she had a typewriter. Larry knew she had one. And this is undoubtedly the very typewriter the threat notes were written on. All three of them. You were right, boss. Oh, I knew she had a typewriter, but I didn't write those notes. Oh, shut up. Archie, how do you know the notes were written on this typewriter? I've compared the type and the ribbon. They're both the same. These notes were written on this Remington. It was Dorothy! Larry, I don't believe a word you've been saying. Dorothy couldn't possibly be guilty of such a thing. If anyone is guilty, you yourself certainly have all the earmarks. Everybody's against me, even my own father. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me get it. I think I know who it is. Hello? Yeah, just a second. You better take it, boss. Wolf. Oh, yes, go ahead. Let's have it. Yes. He's here, but he won't mind. Yes? I see. Uh Uh-huh. You just finished. Oh. Good. Right. Bye. Was it the coroner? The coroner. Reporting that poison was found in the sleeping capsules. And the body. Did they find poison? They did. You're right again, boss. I'm going up to Mrs. Minot's room for a while. I want you to come along with me. Find anything yet, Archie? No, mostly bills and invitations to bridge parties and so on. Ah. You find something, boss? Yes and no. This pocketbook detective story. What about it? I was just flipping through the pages and I find this corner turned down. Well, well. What is it? Look and read. Why stay on in the face of death? Interesting. The very words used in one of the notes. Give me the book. Of course, uh, this doesn't prove a thing either. But it does confirm what I was... Oh, oh. What now? This cinches it. Get them all up here, Archie. Tell Kramer to bring them all to the bedroom. Well, Mr. Wolf, what now? As you all know, Mrs. Millot was poisoned by someone who had an opportunity to put it in the sleeping capsule. Someone in this household. Yeah, but which one? The kin? I never bought any poison in my life. Be quiet, will you? No, Inspector, it wasn't Larry. And I suppose you think I put the rest of that rat poison in your drink, Mr. Goodwin. No, Dorothy, it wasn't you. But how did you know it was rat poison? I didn't. I just guessed. I can think, too. Then if it wasn't Dorothy or Larry, you you must mean me. No, Mr. Lott. No, wait a minute. It had to be somebody. Yes. This is going to be painful for you, Mr. Malott. Well, you... You mean that Mrs. Malott did commit suicide? It was more than suicide. It was suicide with an attempt to have both you and Dorothy convicted of murder. She planted things? She did. I can't believe it. Show him the pocketbook, mystery. Here's the proof. Some of the threat notes were lifted bodily from this novel. But look on the back cover. Isn't that Mrs. Malott's handwriting? Yes, and this is the other note. The one to you, Mr. Wolf. Composed in pencil before she typed it out on her machine. Then, Wolf, the note you received was the same typing as the threat notes. See for yourself, Inspector. Then why the Dickens didn't Archie compare them right away? Just one of those things, Inspector. There are times when even a good detective is a bit on the, uh, shall we say, dull side. Don't you find it often true, Inspector? Hmm? <laughs> Nice of you to go all the way out there, boss. I was a bit stuck. Quite all right, Archie. Yeah, something that still bothers me. So? How can such a sweet, motherly type as Mrs. Malott cook up such gruesome ideas? She was a very sick woman, mentally as well as physically. She probably felt she was going to die. And her warped mind seized on the opportunity to make sure that this Dorothy didn't get her man after she was dead. And speaking of Dorothy, she's a mighty pretty... Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Some beer, please, Archie. If you were so certain that Dorothy wasn't guilty, what was the idea of spending so much time questioning her? Huh? 
Why, I, I, I... Never mind the raised eyebrow department. Answer the question. Well, there are certain rules a good detective always follows. Some are in the book, others aren't. You mean there's nothing in the book which says a good detective shouldn't spend a few minutes with an attractive brunette, even though she is a murder suspect? The author of that book can be none other than the incomparable Archie Goodwin. (laughs) Good night, Archie. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Irene Winston, Ted Von Elts, Jerry Hausner, Vic Rodman, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case of the shot in the dark. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music in the air tomorrow evening, music and fun, brought to you by Dennis Day, Judy Canova, and Grand Old Opry. Charming and boyish Dennis gets himself tangled in another bewildering situation, while Judy Canova gets together with her comedy pals for some mountain-style goings-on, and Saturday also means a killer cycle trip to Nashville for Grand Old Opry. Friday's fun includes Sam Spade and, of course, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Uh, just a moment, please. Hey, boss, uh, Mr. Tom Wilcox wants an appointment. How about one o'clock? Archie, no appointments today. I intend to pot some dendrobium offsets. One o'clock will be fine, Mr. Wilcox. You see the Tom Wilcox who was acquitted yesterday of the murder of that singer, Keith Hansen? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, are you the Tom Wilcox who... Oh, you are. I see. What does he want with me? Uh, Mr. Wilcox, why do you seek Mr. Wolf's services? I see. Well, our fee is $1,000 with a retainer of 500 okay? Oh, yes, Mr. Wolf will see you. Uh, what's that? Hey, what was that? Hey, hey, Mr. Wilcox. Archie, uh, stop shouting, hey. He whispered someone was at the window. Then I heard a shot and he dropped the phone. Boss, I'm afraid we've just lost a client. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborn mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This episode is one Nero Wolf refers to as a slight case of perjury. It all started with a phone call from Tom Wilcox and the ensuing shot, which I was sure had brought our newfound income to an early end. Anyway, there was the shot and... Hello? Mr. Wilcox? Hello? Well, boss, I've certainly waited long enough for him to come back to the phone. We may have just lost a nice bankroll. Nonsense, Archie. Other clients will rescue us. Now for a cool bottle of beer, Archie. We're almost out of beer. I better get over there and see what happened to Mr. Wilcox. The beer first. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Oh, Wilcox, are you all right? Well, was that a shot? It was, huh? I'm glad it missed. Tell him to come right over here. Yeah, you dug the slug out of the wall. Well, come right over. Boss, the police never found the gun that killed Keith Hansen. No gun was found. Wilcox said he thinks he was shot at with a thirty-two. He dug the bullet out of the wall. The murderer of Hanson must now be after Wilcox. If Wilcox is telling the truth. He was acquitted. 
The society gal, Mrs. Patricia Park, established his alibi, said she was with Wilcox at the time the murder was supposed to have occurred. I read the papers, Archie. Where's last night's paper? Wow, boss, look at her picture. Ooh, she's a honey. Archie, will you get me some beer? Well, if you move your arm six and a quarter inches, you can't possibly miss it. Mr. Wolf, this is Tom Wilcox, our new client. How do you do? Uh Archie, the red leather chair for Mr. Wilcox. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I'd like your aid in finding the murderer of Keith Hanson. Indeed. Why do you suppose you were shot at this morning? I gave a statement to the press last night, which was printed this morning, saying that I was going to seek out the killer of Keith Hanson. The killer obviously wants me stopped. Uh, Here's the bullet, a thirty-two, I'd say. Why did you go to Keith Hanson's apartment on the day of his death? I went there to tell him to stay away from my sister. We had a fight. The manager came and stopped us. I told Hanson I'd kill him if he didn't lay off. The manager heard this. Then I went home. What time was that? About 8.30. The police claimed I returned to Hanson's apartment and shot him. I couldn't prove I was at home all night. It was going rough for me until Patricia Park testified she was with me at the time when the crime was said to have been committed. Why didn't you tell the police in the first place that this Patricia Park was with you? Well, that's the whole trouble. She wasn't. What? Her claim that she spent the hours from nine till midnight with me was a lie. In fact, I'd never met the woman in my life. Have you contacted this Patricia since your release, Mr. Wilcox? Yes, but she refuses to see me. Archie, phone Mrs. Patricia Park and tell her that she must see you at once, for her own good. Time is of the essence. And what else can you tell me, Mrs. Park? Mr. Goodwin, I haven't anything more to say than I've already said. All I want is a simple answer as to why you lied about being with Tom Wilcox. Well, Tom Wilcox is a very fine man, but he isn't telling you the truth. Did you commit the murder? and succeed in establishing your own alibi by swearing you and Tom Wilcox were together ten miles from the scene of the crime? I did not. Do you own a gun? Don has one around. Who's Don? Don's my husband. Oh, is he here? I doubt it. He's never here. Spends most of his time at the book. He's throwing away every cent he can get his hands on. I've had to cut his allowance to practically nothing. Doesn't he work? No. He studied medicine but gave it up. He was an illustrator for years, but gave that up when his eyes were burned in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. Where's the gun? It's in the desk. It used to be in here. What caliber? I don't know. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Why, I think I was with the cook. Someone fired a shot at Tom Wilcox this morning through the window. No. Oh, no. Archie, please don't continue with this investigation, please. How well did you know Keith Hanson? Not very well, but enough to realize he was no good. Mr. Goodwin, if you will drop this case, I'll give you a thousand dollars cash. Not interested. But I am interested in learning why you lied, why Tom was shot at this morning, and why you should try to bribe me. You must stop for your own sake. How will it benefit me to step out of it? The killer tried to stop Tom Wilcox. You might be next, and he may not miss this time. Go on. Why have you been protecting Wilcox? I believe Tom Wilcox was innocent. Now, I didn't want him to be sentenced to die, so... So I lied at the trial. He told us today he'd never seen you before. That's true. But he looked so innocent, so so clean and good and decent. That's not very believable. If you don't think Wilcox killed Hanson, who do you think did it? Please believe me, Archie. I don't know. I don't, I tell you. Hi, sis. Hey, what's the matter? Are we intruding? Oh, hello, Marge. Brad, come in. This is Mr. Goodwin, my sister and brother-in-law, Marge and Brad Keene. How do you do? Hello. What gives and who's Mr. Goodwin? A private detective, Marge. I've just explained to Mr. Goodwin that I wasn't with Tom Wilcox at the time of Keith Hansen's murder. Pat, why did you tell him that? Mr. Goodwin, I hope you will not use this knowledge against Pat. Did you all know Keith Hansen? Yes. And my husband and Keith went to school together. Keith, Don, and I were on the same polo team. Where were you at the time of the Hansen murder, Mr. King? He and Don were attending a horse show at Madison Square Garden. Marge and I didn't want to go. We stayed here. Where were you at 10 this morning, Mr. King? Why, uh... I had an appointment with my dentist, Dr. Flagg, Rockefeller Center. And you, Mrs. King? I was shopping. Ilsa's salon. A salon dresses. Why all this questioning? Marge, someone tried to kill Tom Wilcox this morning. What? May I use the phone, Mrs. Park? Yes, of course. First door to your left. Suppose you try to find the gun. Marge, that gun is missing from the desk. I haven't seen it. Do you know the caliber, Mr. King? Uh, 32, I think. It must be in the house. For your sake, I hope you find it. (laughs) 
speaking. Archie, boss. You should have reported long ago. She must be very pretty. That Park admits she lied. She claims now she was with her sister, Marge King. Marge and her husband, Brad, have alibis and all have alibis for this morning. I'll check them before I return. Where were they the night of the Hanson murder? Well, Brad and Don Park, that's Pat's husband, were at the Madison Square Garden horse show. Pat and Marge were together here at the house. Impossible to verify the Madison Square alibi at this date. Check all the rest and come home for lunch. It's Oysters Rockefeller. Has Inspector Kramer arrived yet? He has, and left the police records on the Hanson murder. He has taken the bullet Wilcox brought to be checked at ballistics. Good. Pat had a thirty-two caliber gun in the desk in the library. It's now missing. Indeed. And boss Pat just offered me a thousand dollars to quit the case. When I refused, she said if I didn't lay off, something might happen to me. Oh, dear me. That would be most upsetting, eh? <laughs> After lunch, I want you to visit the late Keith Hansen's apartment. Bye. Before you join the others, Mr. Goodwin, I want to talk to you. All right. Close the door, Marge. Pat didn't mean anything when she offered you money, Archie. And she wasn't threatening you, honest. I'm convinced. Why the pressure? Uh, well, why don't you sit down? Here, by me. Okay. What's on your mind, huh? Archie, I can add another thousand to what Pat offered. Wouldn't that be enough, Archie? I can give it to you right now. Brad will write a check. Does Brad want me to stop, too? He said you couldn't be persuaded. Every one of you seems to have had a reason for killing Hanson. None of you apparently liked him. Now, be a good little girl, Marge, and stop trying to act like a Delilah. If you're innocent, you have nothing to worry about. You're stuffy. I hope you do get hurt. Thanks a million. Now let's join the others. Well, Pat, did you find the gun? I can't find it anywhere. Oh, Mr. Goodwin, this is Don Park, my husband. How do you do? How are you? Have you seen the gun, Mr. Park? Not for ages. You're a detective, eh? Yeah. May I ask where you were this morning, about ten? Why? Well, frankly, I was at my bookies. Where's that? I can't tell you. But I'll call him and you can check it. Were you and Brad together at all times during the horse show the night of Keith Hansen's murder? No. Brad wanted away a couple of times and I saw some people I knew. You know how it is. We'd meet at intervals. Archie, you're wasting your time. None of us is guilty. I made a fool of myself, that's all. Tom Wilcox was such a decent man that I hated to see him have to pay for taking Keith Hansen's rotten life. If a man's guilty, why should you butt in? You never use your head. Pat is one person who thinks of others before herself. Marge, forget it. Now you've got private detectives snooping around. What are you after, Goodwin? Who are you working for? Why don't you let my wife alone? The case is closed, isn't it? Maybe. Don, this just makes it more interesting to Mr. Goodwin. As a matter of fact, I think you all know more than you're telling. I still think Tom Wilcox killed him. And there's only one reason why Pat should protect him. Don, that's enough. Nice, happy family. Suffering all the torments of a guilty conscience, is that it? What are you trying to do, Mr. Goodwin? Get your nose poked? Not exactly. If not, you'd better leave. Okay, Mr. King, I'll run along. Mr. Wolf will be anxiously waiting to hear about this. So long. Pet Park's cook verified an alibi for 10 o'clock this morning, then. Uh, what about the other alibis? Well, Brad's dentist said that he didn't get to Brad until about 10.30. His appointments had run over. He wasn't sure if Brad was there at 10 or not. The nurse was out at that time. Marge's alibi is no good. And that mob at Elsa's, the saleswomen wouldn't have known their own mothers. Don's alibi checks, if we can take the word of the bookie. Don and Pat, then, are the only ones who have alibis that checked, huh? That's right. Are these the reports Inspector Kramer brought? Mm-hmm. Keith Hansen's body showed obvious signs of battering. Lips were swollen and lacerated, clothes disarranged. Knuckles of the right hand were skinned, nose fractured. Major contusion over the right eye, and the eyes were closed. Thirty-two caliber bullet was embedded in the left chest wall. Wow, what a battle. I am of the opinion that Hanson was battered by two different people. I think someone arrived after Will Coates was thrown out by the manager, and this someone gave Hanson another beating. Really, boss? Come, let's have dinner. Then you must get over to Hanson's apartment. Boss. 
boss? Yes, Archie. What have you found at Hanson's place? Well, the desk yielded one thing of interest. Keith's address book. And Marge's name is in there. Apparently, he'd known her before she was married, when she was Marge Van Cott. I see. Her married name, King, was added in a different colored ink. Pat's phone number's there, and, of course, Don's and Brad's office numbers. There are a few bills, but no letters, no clues. Sure. Boss, I've combed the place, and isn't it? Hey, wait a minute. I'll call you back. Who's there? Archie, you know I just like the banging of doors. Sign of ill breathing. Archie, what happened to you? Target for tonight, Archie Goodwin. Your forehead's bleeding. You better have Fritz fix it. Well, my head can wait. Some guy certainly surprised me at Hanson's. Creased me on the forehead. Good thing I snapped off the lights. He emptied his gun at me. He scuffled and he got away. And then I dug his slug out of a chair. I think it's a thirty-two. But look at this, boss. A little round piece of glass. Found it on the floor. Hmm. It's very small, very smooth. And concave or convex in shape. Half an inch diameter. Watch crystal? I don't think so. The edges are too smoothly ground. I'll examine it under a magnifying glass. I'll get it, boss. Oh, hi, Tom. Come in. It's Mr. Wilcox, boss. Archie, hey, what's happened to you? Somebody tried to scalp me. Good evening, Mr. Wilcox. The red leather chair, Tom. Archie, please finish your report. Did you notice anything else of importance at Hanson's apartment? Is that where this happened? Yeah. Well, there were dozens of gals' photos scattered around. Photos, eh? But no letters, Archie? Not a one. There must be some letters, Archie. Love letters. Wherever we have girls' photos and telephone numbers, I assure you they're bound to be love letters. That is what we must find. But then we'd have a motive. Yeah, but where do I look, huh? Go to Hanson's dressing room at the Club Diablo. I have just phoned the place. A female singer is substituting for Hanson. But she won't arrive until supper hour. Mr. Wilcox, accompany Mr. Goodwin, if you please. Keep your eyes open. I need the boy. Then you do love me, boss? Come on, Tom. Let's look at this Club Diablo. Well, I fixed it up with a stage doorman. Here, this is Hanson's dressing room. What a layout. This dressing room's fancier than most of the Met stars get. Uh, Hanson fixed it up himself. A bar, refrigerator, hot plate, television set. He could live here. Some of this stuff could be the new girl singers. I don't think so. Well, let's get to work, Tom. Take the drawers in his dressing table first. What are we looking for, Archie? Mr. Wolf says the motive. He means letters. There's nothing here. Nothing in the desk. New singer must have cleaned it out for her things. Nothing in the books. Don't pass up that refrigerator. Nope. Empty. Hey, there is something here. Back of the ice cube trays. Come here. Oh, well. Mr. Wolf said there had to be letters, and so there are letters. Lots of them. Hey, here's one from Marge. And another. And look here. Really confidential letters from a dozen society gals. There's something else in the back. Bank book. What do you know? A singer like Keith didn't make this much. No, that kind of money didn't come from crooning. This guy Keith was really shaking these babes down. Archie, someone's coming, Liz. Quick, behind the door and grab him. Douse the lights. Ah! Run, Marge, run! Hold it, Tom. Well, it's you two. Oh, you dirty rat. Hitting a woman. Tom, what are you and Archie doing here? The letters... Oh, Archie, you found them. Archie, please, give me those uh, letters. Uh-uh, uh-uh, don't touch. I'll just put them safely away in my pocket. Besides, you didn't write all of these. Give them to me. At least give me my letters. I'll tell you what, you go on home and stay there, and we'll leave it up to Mr. Wolf. Tom, take him outside. I want to use his phone. Come along, ladies. Let us oblige Mr. Goodwin. I'll meet you at the stage door, Archie. Right. Hey, the lights. Who's there? Put the phone up, Goodwin. Who are you? Uh, 
Archie. What happened? Are you hurt? Here, let me help you. Uh, I'm all right. I guess. Oh, my head. Did you see anybody? No, no, I didn't. I shouldn't have left you. Turn out the lights before I saw him. He whispered. Got away with all the evidence. Where are the girls? I sent them home in a cab. Well, let's get over to Mr. Wolf. This is tough luck. If I'm not mistaken, his next move will be to have a little get-together with all concerned. Come on. Archie, the door, our guests are arriving. Excuse me, Tom. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Uh, good one. Good evening, Inspector. Well, Mr. Wolf, got the killer? You said you'd hand him over to me this evening. In time, Inspector. You know Tom Wilcox, of course. Mr. Wolf, Good evening, yes. Inspector. What about the ballistics report, Inspector? The bullet was shot from the same gun that killed Hanson. And that gun, I am certain, came from the home of Pat and Don Parks. Marge and Brad King also had access to it. I have one more bullet here, Inspector. One fired at Mr. Goodwin. I'm sure it was also shot from the same gun. However, it isn't important now. It isn't important? It almost cost me my life. You can make it into a charm if you wish. Inspector Kramer, before our other guests arrive, I must tell you that Mrs. Park lied on the witness stand. She was not with Tom Wilcox at the time Keith Hanson was murdered. In fact, they were absolute strangers. What? Sit down, Inspector. Four other guests are due to arrive any moment. Well, who are the other guests? Patricia and Don Park, Marge and Brad King. One or all is involved in the Hanson murder. Archie, do any of these people wear spectacles? No, nope, none of them. Do you know why this person killed Hanson, Mr. Wolf? First of all, Hanson was a blackmailer. The girl Marge was the current victim. The letters Hanson held with a threat. I'll explain later. Well, then Pat must have thought that Marge killed Hanson to get the letters, and she lied on the stand to save Tom's life because she believed Tom was innocent. Where's this Marge King? I'll have her picked up. Sit down, Inspector. Archie, I believe our guests are arriving now. Come in, come in. How are you? Good evening. Archie, cheers. Inspector Kramer, Patricia and Don Park, Marge and Brad King, and this is Tom Wilcox. Who we've met at the Club Diablo this afternoon. All right, Mr. Wolf. which one is it? Patience, Inspector. One of these five people is the murderer of Keith Hansen, a killer. What is this nonsense? Please sit down. Mr. Wolf speaking. Go ahead, boss. Any one of you had sufficient motive to have committed the Hansen murder. Not one of you has established a bona fide alibi. You who are actually innocent must tell the truth, or you shall all suffer as accessories after the fact. Mr. Wolf, you're wasting your time. Marge, several years ago, you were secretly married to Keith Hansen. It lasted but one week. You gave Keith the money to get a divorce from you at Mexico. He didn't, which made you a bigger miss when you married Brad. Keith was all set to blackmail you. He knew your husband Brad was wealthy. Marge, is this true? Yes. Oh, please, Brad, I thought he got the divorce. Well, if I'd known that, I would have killed Hanson myself. Maybe you did kill him. One moment, Inspector. Patricia, you lied on the stand to protect Tom Wilcox here because you believe your sister Marge was guilty of Hanson's murder. Why did you believe her, her guilty? Were you at the scene of the crime? Marge, it's time to tell the truth and clear all this up. You won't be satisfied until you're in jail. Will you shut Quiet, up? Quiet, please. Go ahead, Marge. All right. Keith Hanson was shot from the bedroom while I stood talking to him in the living room. You went there to buy back your letters? Yes, Pat drove me to his apartment. There was no place to park, so she said she'd drive around the block until I came out. That's why she's never been sure whether I killed him or not. That's right. Because I feel I might have shot him if I'd been in your place. Because of what Hanson did. What was it he did? Keith Hanson demanded $10,000 in exchange for the letters. Pat loaned me the money so Brad wouldn't know. What? Is that true, Pat? You loaned her 10000 I got to Keith's apartment about 9.30. He looked awful. He obviously had been in a fight. The room was mussed up and his nose was bleeding. Yes, go on. He went to the bedroom to get the letters and came back saying they were gone. I didn't believe him. Keith said he knew who had taken them and he'd have them back by morning. 
He grabbed the money from me and put it in his pocket. He was just about to tell me who took the letters when there was a shot from the bedroom door. Keith Hansen fell to the floor, but I didn't see anyone. I, I wanted to get my money from his coat pocket, Pat's money, but I, I couldn't touch him. His staring wide open eyes were horrifying. I ran and I ran. Poor baby, why didn't you tell me? I think you're lying, young lady. You took the gun from your sister's desk, and when Keith Hansen didn't produce the letters, you deliberately shot him. You didn't even offer him any money. You kept it yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, Pat, don't believe him. Inspector Kramer, she's innocent. I know who did it. Oh, no, Brad, stop. Oh, Brad, what are you saying? All right, all right, break it up. Yeah, so do I know, Brad. That's why you left the horse show. I thought you were guilty all along. All right, Inspector. Now you know. I don't get this, boss. Inspector, ladies and gentlemen, please. First, which of you had some medical training? Medical training? Well, Keith Hansen and I both went to medical school. Why? That is most enlightening, Mr. Park. Marge and I were nurses' aides during the war. Then perhaps you can interpret this medical phraseology for me. These few lines from this little medical book. Archie, hand it to Dunpop. Will you read it, please, at the top of page 75? It uh, says the form of pernicious anemia commonly found in the human is... Now, uh, Don, hold your hand over your right eye and read on. What? Uh, also common to the many lower... Now, uh, cover the left eye and read with the other. What is this? Go ahead. Well, uh, many, many lower animals and... Uh, and uh, this, this light isn't so good. Step close to me. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Mr. Park, here is the contact lens for your right eye. I'm sure you've been tremendously handicapped without it all day. Inspector Don Park is your murderer. Don't move, Park. Keep away, I warn you. Drop that gun, Park. Well, I got his gun. There you are, Inspector. He's all yours now. Okay, come on. Okay, good one. But I'll get out of this. You trapped yourself, Don, by your contact lens. It dropped from your eye during the scuffle with Archie in the Hanson apartment this afternoon. And the gun Archie just took from you is undoubtedly the murder weapon. And the gun that fired the bullets at Wilcox and Archie today. Hey, Tom, are you all right? There's blood on the side of your head. Uh, just graze my scalp. You and I must have hard heads. Well, that's that. Thanks so much, Inspector, for dropping in. Come again, won't you? This was a rough day's work, boss. Send me an RG, please. Right. Hey, what was that business about the medical training? Marge said the body of Keith had staring, wide-open eyes, preventing her from touching the body. But the police found the eyelids closed. How did they get closed? Well, he must have bothered Don, too, and he closed them. His medical training. Right. A layman would never touch the eyes of the dead. Marge couldn't, not even to get back the $10,000. Here's your beer. Why did Don do all this, boss? Obviously, he learned of Hanson's blackmail scheme and was trying to force him to agree to split Marge's $10,000. Don was quite startled a minute ago to learn that Pat, his own wife, put up the money. However, when they heard Marge arriving, Don stepped into the bedroom, found Marge's letters in there, and must have hidden in the closet. And then as Keith Hanson was about to speak Don's name, Don shot him and took Marge's money. Of course, he planned to carry on a blackmailing of Marge himself, thinking the money would come from Brad. Yeah. And you are warming that beer with your hot glands. Pour it, please. There you are. You've had a rough day, beaten twice and lost to interesting women. <laughs> Tonight, you may open your bedroom window. <laughs> Good night, Archie. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet.
Tonight's transcribed story by Gladys Williams was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Mary Lansing, Jean Bates, Paul Marion, Barney Phillips, Ken Peters, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Lost Heir. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Horace Crail. Crail, uh, does Mr. Crail know Mr. Wolf? Oh, I see. What is it, Archie? A guy named Horace Crail. His secretary says he wants to talk to you. What about? I don't know. Us? Uh, Mr. Wolf's rather busy right now, but I'll give him a message if you wish. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait a second, Mr. Wolf. What? Black on red and red on black. Archie, this is solitaire. So? Solitaire is a game that is played by one single person alone. If I wish to put a red card on a red card or a black card on a black card... You're cheating. Of course I am cheating. What is the message Mr. Horace Crail's secretary asked you to convey? Just that he wants to see you. In a rather tragic sense, I suppose he does. Why tragic? In that he wants to see me. He is blind. Tell him to come here at his own convenience. Okay. Uh, what does Mr. Crail want to see Mr. Wolf about? A murder? A murder that may still be prevented. Archie. Uh, just a second. What? I have run the cards out perfectly. Is it his own murder Mr. Crail wants us to prevent? Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Once in a long while, Mr. Wolf and I talk about this affair. When we do, we call it the case of the lost heir. But I don't think the title's quite adequate. For me, it ought to be called the case of the gone goose. And I was the goose. Well, Archie, do you see any red on red or black on black? No. So? So what? You irritate me, Archie. Okay, you won your little game of solitaire perfectly, as you say. Now, who is Horace Crail? A prominent industrialist. If you read the papers, you would know. Horace Crail. Crail? Oh, yeah, the Crail Company. Exactly. How did you know he was blind, if he is? The papers have carried the story. The headlines read, Blind Father Welcomes Lost Daughter. Oh, yeah, I remember. A few days ago, there was a picture, too. <laughs> I thought you'd remember the girl, at least. Well, if it's the one I remember, I remember. Archie. Oh, well, it probably isn't true. By the way, let me tell you what I found out about the facts of life. You do it, Archie. Mr. Crail is here to see Mr. Wolf. Oh, yes, come in. This is Mr. Crail. I'm his secretary, Hugh Gaines. Uh, there's a step here, Mr. Crail. Of course. Uh, who is this man? I'm Archie Goodwin, Mr. Wolf's assistant. Mr. Wolf's waiting for you. Where is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodwin? I led the way. The blind man and his secretary followed. Mr. Horace Crail was tall, thin, white-haired. His face was heavily lined, but the lines were not those of care or worry. He wore very dark glasses through which he might not have been able to see, even if he had had his sight. Hugh Gaines, the secretary, was in his late twenties. Surprisingly young and surprisingly handsome for the kind of a job he had. I led them into Mr. Wolfe's office, made the introductions, and sat them down. Well, Mr. Crail, what can I do for you? As you see, Mr. Wolfe, I'm blind. Need I say you have my deepest sympathy? I don't give a hoot for your sympathy, Mr. Wolf. Oh, uh, thank you, of course. I mention my condition merely because it affects the position in which I find myself. Go on. 
Uh, you. Yes, Mr. Crowell? Tell Mr. Wolf about my daughter. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Wolf, I asked my secretary to do this because in this way you will get a first-hand account. Now, let's see. A few days ago, Tuesday to be exact, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, a young woman walked into the house and said she wanted to see her father. I spoke to her myself. She said her name was Magda Crail. I asked her certain questions. Why, Mr. Gaines? He asked her questions because he thought, and I, I thought, that my daughter died 13 years ago. Oh, either the girl who came back to me is my daughter, or she is an imposter, and she belongs in jail. Is there any doubt in your mind about it? Of course. That's why I'm here. On the telephone, you said something about preventing murder. Well, I uh, I have a stepson named Anthony George to whom I intended to leave my money. Not because I liked him. <laughs> Simply because I had nobody else to leave it to. Except your daughter. Except my daughter. If she is my daughter. We were talking about murder. I was talking about my daughter and my stepson. Uh, same thing, I think. Maybe. Possibly. I, I don't know. Mr. Crail. Yes? I am not a wealthy man, but I am certainly able to make ends meet. Yeah? What do you mean? Explain, Archie. I think Mr. Wolf means that if you don't want to be frank with him, he'd rather not waste his time. Mr. Wolf, I apologize if I've seemed to spar with you. Fooey. See, a blind man can only judge by what he hears and smells and feels. So? No, I must be a little more cautious than I would have to be uh, otherwise. I'm sorry, Mr. Crail. Patience is not one of my virtues. Now, about your daughter or your non-daughter, what's her name? Magda. She calls herself Magda Crail, which was, was my daughter's name. What makes you think she isn't your daughter? Well, ten million dollars, partly. Uh, once again, Mr. Crail? My estate may be worth more than that, but uh, surely not less. You? Surely not less, Mr. Crail. Rather more, I should say. Yes, ten million might have some appeal to an ambitious girl, eh, Archie? Sure, but I'm not a girl, and I'm not ambitious. Nobody could accuse you of either four. Mr. Crail, we are getting nowhere. Either you tell your story from the beginning, or take it somewhere else. Archie, I'd like some beer. <laughs> When I went out for the beer, the kitchen was a mess, and incidentally, I saw what was being prepared for lunch. When I got back to the office, Mr. Crail and his boy were gone. One beer for Mr. Wolf. What happened? What took you so long, Archie? I had a sandwich. And spoiled your lunch. You know what you're having for lunch? Of course. I planned it. Baby octopus. Delicious. I'll take your word for it. What happened to the blind tycoon? Get your book, will you, Archie? I want to give you a few notes. Well, just a second. Okay. Item. Item. You needn't repeat everything after me. Yes, master. Item. Horace Crail was born blind. Item. His wife and their six-year-old daughter, Magda, disappeared in their private plane 13 years ago. Magda returned last Tuesday. Item. No matter what he says to the contrary... Horace Crail is afraid he's going to be killed. I think Mr. Crail is right. Memo. From Archie Goodwin to Nero Wolf. Time, 4.32 p.m. The notes you dictated on the Crail case are on your blotter. Three pages of them. You are with your orchids. I am on my way to the Crail domicile to meet the other characters in this turgid drama. As per instructions, I will bring them here if possible. Love, Archie. Yes, sir? My name is Goodwin, Archie Goodwin, I believe I'm expected. This way, please, sir. Yes, sir? Thanks. Hello. Don't tell me you're near old wolf. Not by a couple of hundred pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin, his assistant. Well, I'm Nag Cray. Nobody's assistant. That awful Hugh Gaines creature said Nero Wolf wants to talk to me. He does. Well, where is he? Waiting for you. No hurry, though. No hurry at all. Just, uh, just play and don't worry about a thing. Black hair, green eyes, skin like a magnolia pad. Beautiful, beautiful. While she finished what she was playing, I watched her. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
Well? Beautiful. Mr. Goodwin. Archie. Oh, we could get along together, Archie, if that's the way you are. It's the way I am. I can't seem to do anything about it. Where's Anthony? Anthony? Oh, Anthony George. But I thought both my repulsive half-brother and I were supposed to meet Nero Wolf. I'm here in case anybody wants to know. Over there in the shadows, listening with all his ears. That's Anthony George. Shall we go and talk to Nero Wolf, Anthony? Goodwin? You look like a normal sort of person. Well, that's open to question, but go on. If you had to choose between $10 million and killing a woman by due process of law, which would you choose? I'll think about it between now and July 1994. Now, shall we go talk to Nero Wolf? Miss Crayer. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Why did you wait until now, until last Tuesday, to let your father know that you were living? Does it make any difference? I think so. Thirteen years ago, I was six. What she means is that she was six when she died. But I didn't die, Anthony Sweet. Obviously. But Magda Crail did. With my mother. His mother. Anthony says he doesn't remember me as a child. But I remember him, the brat. What about me? Well, when I was about four or five, you were eight or nine, I suppose... Do you remember dressing up in one of Daddy's tailcoats, a sword, and Mother's hat with a plume? Suppose I did. You're still not my sister. Don't worry, Anthony. When poor father dies, I'll support you. Archie. Sir? I made a mistake. A mistake? You? I thought I wanted to talk to these young people. I don't. Take them away. Take the young lady to a nightclub. On my salary? As part of our investigation, it will be charged to Mr. Horace Crail. It was no hardship at all. In fact, it was a pleasure. We dropped Anthony George off at the Crail place, and Magda and I went on. And on. You're a wonderful dancer, Archie. You can't make enemies that way, honey. Archie, why did Mr. Wolf want you to take me out? To find out whether you really are Crail's daughter. How did he expect you to find out? I don't know. Do you think he knew? He probably had some idea, but I don't know what it could have been. Honestly? Honestly. Archie, do you think I'm telling the truth? No. But wait a minute, baby. I I don't think you're lying either. I just don't think. Give me my handbag, Archie. Thanks. I've got something here that might interest both you and Mr. Wolf. Here. Those are snapshots that were taken of me before I was six. Ah. Yeah, cute. Now look at me. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, can't you see those pictures are of me? Kids that young all look the same to me, but uh, suppose they are pictures of you. What of it? Well, just this. I found them in one of Mr. Crail's old photograph albums. My father, I mean. Oh, here's something. Well, one lying on my tummy on the white bearskin rug. All babies get their pictures taken that way. Here, give it to me. Wait a second. What's this mark under your shoulder blade? It's a little birthmark, like a strawberry. Ah, it's clear. Uh, look, honey. Why are you so interested in babies, Archie? Because I always thought I should have been a mother. Now, look, have you still got that mark on your back? Of course. At least I suppose so. They don't go away, do they? Uh, Where are you going? I'll be right back. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie Goodwin. I'm with Magda Crail. No doubt. What? No doubt, I said. But never mind. What do you want? I want to ask a question. Go on. You don't think Magda's Horace Crail's daughter, do you? I don't think anything. You're stealing your lines from me. Never. All right, then, no. I don't think the girl is Crail's daughter. That's just what I hoped you'd say. Why, Archie? Because for once, you're wrong. She's pretty, isn't she? Yes, she is. Also, she's got a birthmark. You have seen it? No, but nobody's going to be fool enough to claim a birthmark. It isn't there. It's too easy to prove. Good night, Archie. But you deserted me, Archie. You know Hugh Gaines, don't you? Hello, Gaines. Hello, Goodwin. Making hay while the moon shines? You know, if you work that into a routine, it could be pretty dull. You don't like me, do you? Do I have to? No. No, not in the least. Well, that's good. Mr. Wolf and I feel it's wrong to like any of our clients, especially a nightclub. Really? Why? Because they might sit down at your table while you're making a telephone call. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Never I... mind. Finish your drink. Once again, I'm sorry. Forget it. 
Mr. Crail seems to think that uh, Magna's trying to rook him. Apparently. What do you think? Boys. I'm here, too, you know. Why? What do you think, Mr. Gaines? Well, to me, it's a matter of no importance one way or the other. As for Mr. Crail, what he wants is absolute proof. And, of course, there's no such thing as proof that is absolute. Do you want me to add it up for you? Yeah. That's exactly what I want you to do for me. Add it up. Thirteen years ago, Mrs. Crail and her small daughter, Magda, boarded a chartered plane in St. Louis to fly across the Ozarks to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. They took off. And that's the last that ever was heard of them, or the pilot, or the plane. Okay, add some more. Mr. Crail had the whole area searched for months. The search itself cost almost $50,000. And the plane was not found. They finally decided that it must have fallen into the Mississippi, where it would sink to the bottom and uh, stay forever. Now, wait a minute. Magda. Yes, Archie? Don't you remember anything about this trip? Nothing. Not a single thing. The last I remember is Mother putting me to bed in a strange city, in a hotel. And that's all. Okay, what's the next thing you remember? Archie, dear. Yeah? Didn't my father go over this whole business with Mr. Wolf? I suppose he did. Then do we have to do it again? There must be some reason why he wanted me to take you to a nightclub. Because I might say something I haven't already said a hundred times. Maybe. What's the next thing you remember after your mother put you to bed in a strange city? Archie, I have a confession to make. This I believe. Go ahead. Ten million dollars is a lot of money. So I've been told. I don't really remember a single solitary thing before I was six years old and going to school in Rogers, Arkansas. Not Anthony George wearing tails and a sword? It was one of the pictures in the album. Not your mother putting you to bed in a hotel in St. Louis? Ten million dollars, Archie. So you're not Magda Crail. Well, of course I'm Magda Crail. Oh, I may have tried to make the story sound a little more convincing than I should have. But I'm Magda Crail just the same. How could I be anybody else? So far, I can't see why you shouldn't be anybody else. Miss Crail will now bring up the matter of the diary. Won't you, Miss Crail? The diary? Oh, you don't know. Then Mr. Wolf has told you nothing at all about this case, has he? He probably told me all I needed to know. What about a diary? Well, you see, Mr. Goodwin, Miss Crail's memory begins at about the happy age of seven. A black-haired, green-eyed, pigtail brat named Maggie Lomax. Only child of Walt and Mabel Lomax of Rogers, Arkansas. Am I correct, Miss Lomax? Uh, Miss Crail, I mean. He's a sarcastic character, isn't he, Archie? That he is, that he is. What about this diary? To cut a long sob story short, Walt and Mabel Lomax died in an automobile accident a few weeks ago, leaving them only Maggie. Take it from there, Maggie. There was no money. I looked through the house to find anything I could sell, and I came across a hidden box. The diary was in the box, along with some clothes that might fit a six-year-old girl. The clothes look like what the girl was last seen wearing. How do you know? <laughs> well, there's a photograph of one of Mr. Crail's albums taken in St. Louis the day before the flight. But for uh, ten million, those clothes could be reproduced, stitch for stitch. Archie, dear. Take him out in the alley. It would be a pleasure. <laughs> oh, now, wait a second, Archie. With one arm tied behind you, I think you could probably beat me into a pulp. Is it all right if we uh, don't prove it? We were talking about the diary, Archie. Okay, what about it? Archie, I don't even claim the handwriting is mine. What's handwriting when you're six years old? Still, the first page is one of those things that has name, name of parents, home address, and like that. Color of hair, eyes, you know. Sure, I had one myself. Certainly. Every child had one. One or a dozen. Maybe they still do. You fill in the first page and then you never write another word. Honey. They were cheap. I doubt if they cost a quarter and... There was a place that said, my first date, favorite pastimes... Look, baby. Oh, he calls me baby, Mr. Gaines. Yes, I noticed that. I think he'd believe your story no matter what you told him. Get lost, will you, Mr. Gaines? What's that? Get lost, drop dead, turn blue. Well, I can take a hint. Good night, Archie and Miss Lomax. Prissy, isn't he? Prissy is the word. He doesn't seem to believe your story. He believes what he's told to believe. It's his job. Sure. You believe me, don't you, Archie? Honey, you're beautiful, just the way you are. Now, let's talk about the diary. I hate you. I hate you, too. Shall we dance? The diary. Oh, dear. Where is it? Do you call this romance? No, I call it working overtime. Where is it? Here, in my handbag. Here. Push over. We look at it together. I'm not crowding you, am I? What's a little crowding? Cozy, isn't it? Now, look at the cover first. My Diary, 1934. I suppose somebody gave it to me for my sixth birthday. Let's just not suppose anything, shall we? All right, Archie. 
Page one. Name, Magda Crail. Date of birth, October 11th, 1928. But you read it. Or can you read? Anything you can write, honey. Uh, date of birth and so on. Father Horace Crail, Mother Mabel Crail. Hair black, eyes green. My favorite pastime, playing with dolls. Playing has a Y in it. You know what I think, Archie. You wouldn't call that writing, would you? Not real writing. It's more like printing. I think my mother guided my hand when I wrote that. Yeah, that's the way it looks, all right. Well... Dance now? Dance now. While we danced, while I held that disturbing girl in my arms, I tried to believe the case was just as simple as it seemed. Somehow she'd survived a plane crash, a head injury, and then a normal life with a couple who naturally wouldn't tell her that she wasn't really theirs. I tried to believe it. I was trying hard when... Archie, don't look. There's Anthony George. Oh, yeah, alone in the corner. You've had a lot of experience, Archie. Do you think he's a killer? A what? Do you think he'd commit murder? I don't think anything about him, but why should he? For ten million dollars? I see what you mean. Are you worried? Not with you around, Archie. Not with you around. It was like that, maybe even more like that, until the waiter told me I was wanted on the telephone. I asked her to keep the table warm, that I'd be right back. Hello? 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 This is Archie Goodwin. Archie? Oh, hello, Mr. Wolf. I have been talking to Mr. Crail. Wonderful. A little less humor, perhaps? Okay, what about Mr. Crail? He showed me some pictures of his daughter. Baby pictures? Unfortunately. Some of the pictures were missing from the album. Those are the ones I've been looking at. Archie, I'm interested in that birthmark. So am I. Do you think you could persuade the young lady to have a picture taken of her back undraped? Wait a minute. Just one moment, please. Well? You mean that? Clear picture in a bright light. How would you like her posed, Mr. Wolf? I am not amused, Archie. Okay, I'm sorry. All I want is a clear, sharp, focused picture of that birthmark. And I expect you to get it for me. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Hello again. Dance? No. Talk. More talk? Lots more. What now? That birthmark. So I've got a birthmark. What about it? I wish I had one that was worth ten million. So do I. But this one is worth nothing to me. Since my father doesn't believe I'm his daughter, and he's blind, that kind of identification doesn't mean anything to him. You're forgetting the people he trusts. Hugh Gaines, for instance. If the birthmark is there, couldn't he look at it, compare it with those awful baby pictures, and say, yes, here is your daughter? I've got news for you, Archie. He has looked at it. He says it looks the same as the one in the baby pictures. Has he told your father that? Yes. But he also told him he thought I was a fake. That somehow I found out that the six-year-old daughter of a millionaire had died in a plane crash 13 years ago. And I found out she had a strawberry birthmark on her back. And I had one, too. So I decided to say that I was Magda Crail. That's absurd. Of course it is. You can see how it's going to work out, can't you, Archie? Frankly, no. How? My father went to Mr. Wolf simply to have him prove that I am his daughter. Whatever Hugh Gaines says. The only thing I'm afraid of, though... What are you afraid of, baby? I'm afraid my darling half-brother might kill him... before he has a chance to change his will. Isn't that a somewhat mercenary view to take of the matter? Maybe it is, Archie. And maybe I'd feel differently about it... if my father had found me instead of waiting for me to find him. He tried, didn't he? I wonder. Let's get back to that birthmark. Are you allergic to floodlights? I know a photographer who has a studio. Confound it, Archie. How did you know it was going to be me? Because nobody else would dare to call me this late. What do you want? I got the pictures. They're drying now. If you come home, bring them with you. They may be important tomorrow. Have you heard that Horace Crail was murdered? No. How? Who? Where? Tomorrow we'll talk about it, Archie. Good night. At 4 p.m. the next day, there was quite a lot of confusion in Nero Wolf's office. 
At his direction, I'd set up a picture screen at one end of the room, and on his desk at the other end, a rather strangely constructed projector. At 4.30, the guests arrived. Magda, Anthony, George, Hugh Gaines, and of course, Inspector Kramer, ready to make an arrest if he could figure out whom to arrest. Hello, Inspector. Hi, Goodwin. Magda, Anthony, Hello, George, Hello. you. Yeah, Mr. what's Goodwin? this all about? Uh, what's going on, Archie? You got me, Inspector. I think Mr. Wolf wants to show slides of his trip to Yellowstone Park. But here he is. Ask him. Oh, say, Wolf, you want to know what I think? Not in the least, Inspector. Sit down somewhere, won't you? Mm. Archie, will you turn out the lights? Thank you. Now, this is a picture of Magda Crail lying on her stomach at the age of six months. I changed the focus so, and we have a close-up of a birthmark. A smooth discoloration that looks as if it might have been painted on. Now, look, Wolf. You said if I came here, you'd give me the guy who killed Horace Crail. And you show me a picture of a baby's back. Inspector, if you open your mouth again, I may not keep my promise. Go ahead. While we look at this enlargement of a birthmark on baby's back, let us remember that the late Mr. Horace Crail was blind and never saw it. So what? What's he getting at, Goodwin? Inspector, if I knew, I'd tell you. Listen. Mr. Crail had a trusted secretary, Hugh Gaines. I'm here. Of course, Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea. He knew the tragedy of Mrs. Crail and her daughter, and he decided to bring Crail's daughter back to life. What makes you think so, Mr. Wolf? You had access to the photograph album, and only you. Hardly enough, Mr. Crail didn't even know his daughter had a birthmark until you told him. That may be true, but what of it? It's unimportant. Now I want to show you another picture. Archie, explain this picture, will you? A rating from left to right, this is a picture of Miss Crail's back. Very pretty, too. As you can see, there is what appears to be a small birthmark, somewhat under the left shoulder blade. I change focus, and as it becomes larger... That's not a birthmark. That's tattooing. You can see it. Tattooing, of course. And Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea how to make use of a tattooed birthmark... And Miss Magna to help him out. Blind as he was, Horace Crail saw through it. That's why Hugh Gaines had to kill him. No, you don't, Gaines. <laughs> Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Well, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Gaines is your man. Another bottle of beer, please, Archie. It's right there in front of you. You know, I was thinking, a girl can get herself tattooed, can't she? Is that a crime? What does it prove? Archie, Archie, have I ever told you I love you? <laughs> I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. <sighs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Martha Shaw, Vic Rodman, Peter Leeds, Gray Stafford, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case in room 304. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Fran Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. Remember, Tallulah Bankhead stars in her wonderful Big Show Sunday...